Grave Walkers. Book 3. Thunderhead. Chapter 1. Radio City. An hour after sunset just as a light rain began to fall accompanied by distant thunder from the south, Fat Jack loaded his foragers, guards, and laborers into the Big Joe transport to take them over to Foragers Castle. It was a short journey that Andy drove without any complications. The number of infected that wandered the streets near the tower, remained higher than was the norm. Jingle Bell's attack on the tower lobby they repulsed still had many of his trained freaks prowling about agitated. Upon their arrival at the castle, Colonel Hiram Davis with his Grave Walker platoon, Tony Banjo with his crew, and many of the construction workers with their guards all continued on foot to board the light rail train at the Rook. George and his crew took the Big Joe truck back out onto the streets for their night of ghoul fighting and the pillaging of ruins. While Gloria went to prep the milk wagon for travel, Henry approached Critias to ask, What's your plan for the television studio? Critias told him, Carmen and I will go in first on foot to reconnoiter that building Kevin is interested in looting. Once we have secured the lower floor and found a place to bring the truck in, we will radio for you to follow. With that plan in mind, he turned to order Carmen, I want you to plot us a path to this radio building we're seeking. When you have one, you can lead us there. As an afterthought, since he had sounded so demanding with her, Critias touched the chin of his helmet with two fingers and then made a gesture to her that meant he kissed her sweetly. She squirmed inwardly such was her delight over his attention, discipline and romance combined were her idea of heaven. Carmen quickly composed herself and then thumbed deeper into the castle while informing him, there are service tunnels that we can use to get up into the park. They are off the back hall in the northwest and southwest corners. The northern exit would take us up into the air conditioning and mechanicals building, which is up on the surface in the park. The southern tunnel connects to the old shipping and receiving dock near to that old cathedral. Either of those exits would get us discreetly outside in the direction we need to be going. Once we are up in the park, it will only be about 250 meters to the broadcasting station. Most of that distance will be under excellent cover. That's my girl, Critias praised her. You planned ahead. I had a conference with Kevin about your intentions, she meant that it had just taken place near instantaneously. He made many significant contributions, but my input was also noteworthy since I am more attuned to your preferences. We'll be ready when you call, Henry promised as he headed off to join his wife as she prepared their milk wagon vehicle for the expedition. Fab Jack escorted Carmen and Critias to the sloping passage out of the northwest corner of the back hall. That way led into the old air conditioning mechanicals building where they kept their electrical generator. This side will be easier for you, Jack advised them as they walked. There are paths you can follow, you won't have to force your way through the undergrowth to reach the streets. The path out from the other side goes around to the south behind the old church. That would take you out of your way. The surface building that Jack led them to was one that the foragers had thoroughly reinforced and insulated to conceal the noise of their natural gas fuel generator. When they reached the heavily barred door that would let them get outside, Jack told them, this building sits down in a hollow deep in the woods of the park. Just follow the curving roadway up until you reach the pedestrian walk. Follow that path to your right and it will lead you out of the trees to the street off the corner of the garden building. I'll wait here for ten minutes just in case you run into trouble and decide you want to come back inside. Carmen assembled the two heads of her bite staff to have the weapon handy. At the same time, Critias adjusted the velocity setting on his Tesla Flux rifle for operational silence. After they gave a final check to their grave walking disguises, Jack quietly unbarred the metal door to let them out. Trees and thick underbrush enclosed their drab cubicle building. The park had grown wild since the time of the outbreak, but even before that the landscaping had intentionally surrounded the place to keep it hidden from the view of passing tourists when they visited the National Monument. A nearby pond of water made certain that the area always had sufficient moisture to encourage the growth of healthy vegetation. In addition to the other defenses, the area also occupied a sunken sort of low valley that made it all but invisible to outside observers. It's this way, Carmen communicated by radio as she went ahead. They followed Jack's accurate directions until the single roadway circled up to deposit them onto a cement sidewalk that ran past. She followed the sidewalk in the direction of the garden building, which at times they could see where it stood tall beyond the trees only 130 meters ahead. The lofty business tower that was their actual destination was nearly as close only further south. Their path stayed hidden in an alley of ornamental trees until they reached a low fence of cement stalagmite bollard cylinders that were old security features supposedly impassable to vehicles. The bollards also clearly defined the boundary between their park and the concrete roadways of the city proper. The rain continued light and steady. It generated a good cover noise as it struck the leaves and pavement. 
Another advantage of the rain was that the ghouls generally disliked being wet or having to hunt for food during unclement weather when the prey animals were themselves in hiding from the uncomfortable downpour. There was no cover on the first broad roadway that ran parallel to their course. Beyond that was a deep concrete moat that contained the recessed highway. It had been the construction of that highway project that had sealed off smugglers' passage from its path that had once continued down closer to the river. Even if the highway had not closed off the tunnel, the construction of the Forger's Castle Monument would have done it instead. At least then they would have, remained close enough together that Jim could have connected them with a tunneling project of his own. Two nearby roadway bridges spanned the deep-set motorway. They were the only way across in either direction for a good way north or south. Carmen led the way across the bridge to put them at the southeastern corner of the garden building. At street level on that same corner was the garage door that Jim had used to get his truck out for his attack on Denver. The garage offered a convenient access for the milk wagon if that should later become necessary. The garden building had a complexity of levels, ledges, and balconies. One of the GNP men on duty atop the garden building was on the lower rooftop right at the corner. He was close enough to the street to be clearly visible in his hooded rain poncho when he leaned out over the edge to make himself noticed with a wave. As he watched them passing below him, the guard spoke over the radio, This is Gardener 2 atop the beanstalk. I have a visual on two milk wagon hikers. Gardener 2 is on alert and standing by. Fire support upon ground request. Over. Critias and Carmen turned left to walk south along the sidewalk at the edge of a brandly block of what was yet another overgrown city park. This is Gardener 4 to hikers, another guard transmitted. That whole park is a swimming pool with a mud bottom during rainstorms. Advise you avoid. Over. That inhospitable city block between the garden building horticultural outpost and their target building had a dismal look about it even before they got the radio warning. It was so densely overgrown with thorny berry vines, tall prairie grasses, and immigrant saplings that visibility into the place was poor at best. Should anyone ever venture into it, they might find that it concealed untold numbers of infected. Critias took the lead as they approached the tall communications building of perhaps 20 floors. He cautiously avoided the park's unknown hazards and certain discomforts. Its prairie grasses were tall enough to conceal infected to be sure, tall enough to conceal most anything besides the upper half of an abandoned armored personnel carrier that sat out toward the middle of the place like a great steel hillock. As they continued by, Critias commented to Carmen, that seems like a lot of building there for just one radio video broadcasting center. It would be, she agreed. Most of the building is dedicated to other business interests of no consequence to us. Based on the nature of their street-level garage access for their satellite vans, I'm operating on the assumption that the place we are seeking will be on or near ground level. Critias reached the south corner of the park. He paused there and then carefully crept into the border trees that lined the edge of the sidewalk where they would have some cover while they examined their target building directly across the street. Just ahead of them on the edge of the roadway were mounds of headshot infected and some old cars. Big Joe had plowed them aside into that position when the truck had cleared the roadway in years past. The office tower's front entrance had once been an elegant facade of glass and revolving doors until an outbreak fortification of sandbags and machine gun positions took it over. The shattered entry currently contained what amounted to a dedicated military redoubt. Rather vigorously defended for being nothing of special consequence, he commented with a note of sarcasm. They picked an unsuitable location to attempt such a defense. Carmen harshly evaluated its feasibility as she also pointed out that there were more sandbags along the balcony of the second floor. Every floor had exterior walls of glass plates surrounded by narrow open balconies. Much of the safety glass on the lower floors was either smashed out entirely or it had sporadic bullet holes in it as testament that there had been plenty of chaotic interior gunfire when the ghouls finally wiped the place out back in the day. Since that main entrance was an impassable tangled mess of razor wire entwined with headshot ghoul bodies, Carmen suggested, let's jump up there, we can enter by the second floor. No, Critias declined with a better idea. We go around the building. He pointed that they should go back out onto the street and then continue south, they could go around to the other side of the block. We are being watched closely by those guards from the garden, he cautioned her. I think it best if they don't witness you performing any superhuman vertical leaps. That would be a problematic explanation, she agreed. The garage is on the opposite side down that way. Do you want to try entering through there? He did, if it's a secure place for us to bring in the milk wagon, that's our first priority. Carmen acknowledged his commands within, as you wish. She affectionately brushed a breast against his arm when she moved ahead to creep back out through the tall grass and shrubbery until they reached the corner. She entered the open roadway grave walking. Carmen stayed hunched over in an imitation of a foot dragger as she jerkily slewed her way south. 
The west side of their building had no glass along the ground level. It was just a smooth face of stucco cement that verged to the sidewalk. From there they saw that the tower had a long rectangular extension of extra building that jutted out the back, which was only two stories in total height. Crytea stopped at the single steel fire door on that long blank side of the low building. Open this, he instructed her. There is no way to get those garage doors open from the outside while the power is off, not without breaking them. Carmen's amorphous skeleton key easily withdrew the deadbolt, but the door remained firmly sealed. When she pulled on the door handle, it didn't even rattle. Her explanation was, they must have barred it from the inside as an extra precaution. He looked up to consider the possibility of getting them in through the roof, but then a group of ghouls came around the far southern corner of the extended garage. The infected clearly saw them manhandling the door. All six of the fiends had fresh flamethrower burns they had gotten from the passing Big Joe transport less than an hour earlier. They were still pained and full of vengeful sentiment. If nothing else, they had been out in the rain just to have it soothe some of their misery with its cooling therapeutic touch. You get the door open, Carmen said as she advanced to dispatch the infected. I'll take care of them. She readied her bite staff to knock the interlopers down and then break their necks. The ghouls hesitated when they sensed no humanity in Carmen. Seeing that they were uncertain about what they should do with an android, Carmen called to them, Come to Carmen, you crispy vermin. I'll put an end to your woes. The infected unexpectedly took fright when they heard Carmen's words. The ghouls cringed before her and then turned to flee back around the corner from whence they came. Some of them even made furtive backward glances as though they worried she might pursue them or somehow strike them in their backs from range. Critias braced one foot against the wall to pull on the door so hard that he snapped a piece of lumber within that had barred it closed. They all ran away, she reported as she returned to his side. What do you make of that? I saw, he acknowledged while he also peered into the lightless area beyond the open door. Didn't you say that Jingle Bells could tell at a glance that you weren't entirely human? Maybe they think you were a watcher and thought better of bothering you. He stood aside and then gestured for her to go and before him, after you. A moment before she stepped inside, he had her take pause, check for trip wires first. Some barricades are never meant to be opened. To test for possible trip wires that former defenders could have left for extra security, Carmen swept around the doorway with her bite staff as though she removed cobwebs. I don't recall them ever reacting to me in that way before, she said about the ghouls. As she walked into gaze about in the total darkness using ultraviolet and infrared vision, Carmen reported, This is a stairwell. The lower floor here has a door that leads into the garage parking area. If we take these stairs up, they will probably get us closer to the media broadcasting studio, which I suspect is on the upper floor of this section. Take us into the garage first, Critias instructed as he followed her inside this stairwell. He closed and relocked the outside door behind them. Thusly secure from any new exterior troubles, Critias explained his plan, first we need to see about those garage doors to get the milk wagon inside. I also want to see these satellite uplink vehicles you mentioned. Critias readied his Tesla Flux rifle as he added, we can use regular lights while we're away from any windows. He switched on its underslung lamplight. Carmen shined the diode flashlight from the transparent strip at the crown of the bite on her staff. One of the first things she noticed was the amount of rubbish on the floor. She alerted him to her observations. I see signs that this building was inhabited before experiencing a rapidly unfolding hectic downturn. Photographs. Critias said as he reached down and then picked one up from the floor. There were six of them for him to choose from just at their feet. After a glance at the photo of a young woman in an officer's uniform, he handed it to Carmen, Old Earth Continental Military were in here. That explains the fort they built at the front entrance. She went ahead into the parking garage and then used her staff slight to illuminate all the tightly packed vehicles right in front of them. It was readily apparent that the larger military vehicles closest to the entry doors had pushed the many lighter automobiles forward cramming them tightly together in an effort to create more available floor space. They made an outpost in here all right, Carmen agreed as she inspected one of the four rugged Humvee off-road military cars that were present. There was also a behemoth eight-wheeled striker armored personnel carrier that sported a somewhat rusty 50 caliber mounted machine gun. Critias recognized the enormous battle wagon as being much akin to the one he had seen mired in the overgrown park they had passed on their way in. He also noticed a fair number of luxury sedans among the herring-boned vehicles. The garage seemed like a desperate effort by the vehicle crews to get off the streets. It was hard to say where they went after that. Perhaps they died defending the building. He asked her, is this the spore of a hasty retreat? She considered it. The sound strategy would have been to maintain control of the light rail system from where they could perform an orderly withdrawal by train to the Air Force base east of the river. 
Why retreat here when there is nothing here to withdraw to anyway? Rooftop air extraction, he guessed. They were leaving by their primitive flying machines. Perhaps they wanted to maintain control of the news broadcasts to have management over the people during the crisis. While she approached one of the military cars to check it out, Carmen reasoned, there will likely be abandoned valuables inside many of these vehicles. Her amorphous passkey perfectly unlocked the door on her first turn. A full camouflage backpack was on the passenger seat. It contained some binoculars, a collapsible camp shovel, a touchscreen battlefield radio, and some various other unimportant knickknacks. She discarded all the clothing and other personal effects that were of no interest to her and then shouldered the backpack as she closed the door on the vehicle. We have all night, he said as he climbed onto the hood of a car. Critias realized that it would be easiest for him to get around if he just walked over the top of them. As he went ahead, he told her, you can search them all later if you want. They found that the western half of the parking area had a larger garage door of sufficient height to receive tall vehicles like their Big Joe semi-tractor transport. Carmen illuminated three of the news team vans she had spoken of with their articulated satellite dishes mounted on them. There were six more armored cars jammed in there with a second of the angular-plated personnel carriers. This is not good for getting the milk wagon in here, he commented to draw her suggestion. There is barely room to walk as it is. Carmen recommended, Gloria and Henry can bring a crew of drivers with them. She and I can get some of these larger vehicles started and then they can drive them back to the castle. They are in perfect condition from being in here out of the weather. The two larger damnation battle wagons impressed Critias enough to make them worth taking. He ordered her, call Fat Jack on the radio and describe your plans to him, see if he will go along with it. If he is willing, you can get us started. Critias headed through the garage to locate the entrance going back into the main building. If mechanics were going to work on engines for a while, he would need to close the area off for their safety. He found the entry into the main tower easily enough. Critias saw surprisingly little evidence of ghoul battle damage. He kept going to explore further. The real show didn't appear until he had reached the main lobby. That was where he found the interior side of the razor-wired defended street entrance that they had seen from the edge of the park when they first approached from the castle. He counted at least a hundred headshot infected littering that portico with their undead bodies. Their immortal tissue made for a mushy carpet that had a generous seating of spent brass cartridge casings. There were inert bodies flopped over the reception's counter, in the filthy cushion chairs, and hanging puppet-like in the spiraling concertina wire that spider-webbed across the entry gaps. To reconstruct the final retreat of the last lobby defenders, Critias expertly read the bullet patterns that swept the walls in discernible head-level suppression, the soldiers had left the lobby by ascending the tower's internal fire escape stairwell. It was curious because Critias did not get the impression that the retreating soldiers were overly concerned about ghoulish pursuers. He saw that much of the shooting they had done in there had aimed upward and forward as they had frantically climbed the steps that were slick with infectious blood and stumble-trapped with accumulated bodies. Carmen radioed. Gloria and Henry are coming in twenty minutes. We are meeting them at that same door we used. After a pause, she asked, How high up are you going? Critias used semi-in movements as he climbed up the core of the stairwell, staying up on the hand railing so that he could avoid treading on all the headshot bodies of which there were many. He radioed back, How do you know where I am? Are you looking through my helmet cameras? Yes, she confirmed it, but even if I couldn't observe your progress by tapping into your visor's video feed, all your transmissions carry a global positioning tag along with the timestamp as part of their diagnostic packet. When we upgraded your mech suit, Kevin recalibrated your systems to monitor the primitive positioning satellites of this era. I suppose, even if I could not do any of that, I could still triangulate the direction and distance to your transmitter by crude computational insight. He told her, the last survivors here were shooting their way up through descending ghouls in considerable numbers. What do you make of that? Carmen needed a moment to consider such a scenario before she surmised, my first guess is that they were having problems similar to what you encountered in Beijing. The most probable scenario is simply that they were suffering under the classic military principle of having their enemy outflank them. A significant force of ghouls attacked their unprotected rear, severed their lines of resupply, and cut off the forward defenders from their avenue of retreat. Right, he agreed with all that, but if I'm going up a building, they would get in here how from where? Are they coming in through the windows? She didn't think so, the most probable explanation is that there is a connection on an upper floor with the hotel building adjacently west of this one. It should not be up any higher than the seventh floor of this building since the hotel is not tall enough to accommodate anything more. I'm on the landing of the fifth floor, he reported, and it looks like this is the one the bad guys came in through first. Critia saw battle-damaged bodies sprawled in the doorway off the stairwell so that the undead meat propped it open. 
The dehydrated mummies of headshot ghouls lay four deep across the whole floor space. The clothing on their bodies told Critias that they were ghouls from during the early outbreak. The women still had ribbons in their hair, necklaces, and even remains of makeup they had applied in normal life. A good percentage of them wore an assortment of monochrome or camouflage uniforms, often with sidearm holsters. Another variety of bodies that shared a common appearance were naked or in medical inspection gowns, but invariably tagged with plastic hospital identification bracelets. Since Carmen already had a video link to the images, Critias asked her, What does all this mean to you? Carmen interpreted the codes on one of the bracelets, the writing says that they came from a federally managed medical rescue station. Medical rescue station would mean medical supplies, he reasoned for her possible objection. She advised, If you're determined to keep going, go up the stairs first. Presumably, any survivors would have retreated higher where it was cleaner. Furthermore, we are still assuming that you are correct in your estimation that they finally evacuated by some form of air transport, which means they went to the roof. He continued his climb up the central spiral of the stair well as hastily as he could skillfully manage since he wanted to make it back down in time for the milk wagon's arrival that was only minutes away. His ascent ended at a barricade between the 8th and 9th floors. It was a sort of crudely entangled jumble of accumulated office furniture and filing cabinets. The defenders had hurled all that junk down the stairs from above so that it accumulated into such a depth that it would be a time-consuming labor to dig a way past it and even then, doing so from below invited the unstable heap to simply collapse down upon the laborers. Strong barricade just below the ninth floor, he radioed to Carmen. I'm coming back down now. Meet me at the door, she replied. The rain fell much harder by the time Critias made his way back to street level where the truck would arrive. According to Jack's instructions, Carmen unhinged the door from the wall while Critias held it for her. She popped the pinch from the hinges using a screwdriver, which caused the door to fall free from its frame. They positioned the loose door down on its side, propped against the outside wall to form a barrier across the bottom third of the open doorway. It was in position just in time for Gloria to back in the milk wagon as she drove swiftly through the stormy darkness. She pinned the truck's rear door firmly against the building right at their doorway. Direct pressure from the rear bumper held the detached door in place as a shield across the lower part of the entry. The back hatch of the milk wagon lined up perfectly with the remaining upper portion of the doorway. Henry clipped a pair of grapple hooks to the insides of the door frame so their electric chain winch could lock their hard docking into place. After Henry disembarked, Fab Jack followed after him, then came two aspiring road mechanics and two volunteer drivers they had come over from guard patrol, also counting Gloria, it made for a total crew of seven. Fab Jack instructed, show us to this garage. We'll get the two armored carriers started and three of the Hummers. We can load each of them with as much forage as they can carry and then caravan out of here. One of the crew, a female, she carried her own toolbox, which revealed that she was a road mechanic. Snips, she gave her name as a polite greeting as she passed. A second mechanic who lugged his own box of tools followed behind her. He offered only a nervous wave as he slunk sullenly past, as though perhaps he wondered just how long he had to live while working out in the wilds. The last two, arrivals were armed GNP drivers who would also perform guard duties around the working mechanics. Carmen removed the portable electric generator from the milk wagon and then handed it to Critias. Once he had it, she selected the right cargo straps that she could use to ratchet the burdensome machine onto his back, which would make it slightly less inconvenient for him to carry. As she rigged him up, Carmen filled him in on her plan, you need to hump this up to the top of the building so that we can install it over the main elevator shaft. We will be able to find the drive motor and control unit there. I can use my key to activate the fire service override panel in the car. We'll be able to direct the lift to any floor you desire. While she prepared the straps on the generator, he told her, I think I have a good idea for getting around that barricade I ran into. Once she had strapped the generator snugly to his back, Critias handed her his Tesla Flux rifle since there was no longer any way for him to sling it. He instructed her, You carry this for me. I need my hands free to climb. Critias led her by the same route he had used before. They climbed the stair well until they reached the 8th floor where the impacted office accessories created a blockage that closed off the stairs. From there, he took the door onto the floor off the landing. They followed a damp breeze of fresh air to the nearest broken window that provided them easy access out onto the very narrow ledge of balcony. Once outside, Critias climbed up onto the thick cement guardrail and then held one of the vertical pillars to steady his stance. She asked, what do you want me to do? He told her his plan, climb up here, stand on my shoulders and then hook your bite onto the next ledge above us. She nimbly obliged and once standing on his shoulders, she found the next level of balcony was within easy reach of her hook. 
After she had a solid hold, she told him, climb over me. He was doubtful that was a reasonable notion, are you sure? Carmen even used a free hand to ease his ascending, I'm stronger than I look. He reached the higher ledge to discover that the windows on the floor were still in firm condition. A pair of sandbags on the railing down to his left led his curiosity that way. There he discovered a narrow window washer's access door that went inside from the ledge. There must have been a sniper keeping watch from here, he said to explain the presence of the sandbags on the railing. After climbing up her staff to join him on that level, Carmen picked open the simple lock of the window hatch and then stood back for him to go first, after you. The floor inside was an unusually barren smooth concrete. Only the many support columns and elevator stairwell core interrupted the continuity of the single open space. In that area stripped for remodeling was a warren of tunnels and tents and transparent medical plastic sheeting to form a maze of decontamination stages. Sealed plastic garbage bags containing dirty paper towels, blood-stained clothing, and other trivial rubbish lay in piled heaps at several points. They continued onto the stairwell door and then opened it to see the barricade of hurled piecemeal furnishings choking off any access from the landing below. They ran the twisting stairs upward for the next eight floors, all of which were conveniently clean of gore or bodies of any sort. Carmen used her speed key to pick the lock on the final door that led into the windowless uppermost level of the tower, which was the domain of the many unseen mechanical support systems for the whole building. She quickly found her way to the elevator drive motor and its control panel. It took her only a few minutes to connect the generator to power the elevator and then she started up the muffler engine. Once she confirmed that she had the elevator functional, Carmen informed him, we're ready to go. She had the control panel unlocked and open. Carmen jabbed at some of the switches with the tip of her screwdriver to trigger jump close the electrical contacts. Once satisfied with her tinkering, she closed the panel. I've sent a command for the car to recycle to its top dead center for calibration. We can board it one floor down. He was curious about the equipment she had so expertly fiddled with, explained to me how they powered this lift before. She pointed out the electrical fuse boxes on the wall, that box is the city electrical grid and that box is from their secondary backup generator. He thought that sounded promising, I want to see that backup generator then. Where is it? Carmen followed the insulated conduits with her eyes as she navigated through the mechanical chaos. Deep in the back around a secluded turn she stopped at an ornamental boundary chain that supported a plastic placard that read, Keep out. She unclipped the barrier to continue past while she still examined everything high and low. When she found the generator, she pointed it out, This is their emergency broadcasting system backup generator. It is quite nice now that you mention it. A rather sophisticated electrochemical device, for this era anyway. The fuel comes in as natural gas via that pipe there to generate about a hundred kilowatts of electricity. Critias found a sheet of paper with handwriting on it taped to an overhead valve. He pulled it down to read the message. She located the analog incoming gas pressure gauge and then tapped it with her finger to test if the needle had sprung. Carmen called his attention to it. Here is the fuel pressure gauge and there is no pressure at all, unfortunately. I think I know what we should do. Critias told her. If we go down into the basement of the hotel next door, that building shares a common utility wall where they both have their main gas service lines connected. There is a disaster emergency shut-off valve at that spot. It simultaneously disabled the gas service to both these buildings. If we went down there, we could manually reactivate the pressure to only this emergency generator. The primary gas reservoir for this whole city comes from underground caverns that store enough liquefied natural gas to supply unlimited use for centuries. His astute understanding amazed her, Master. You're so brilliant. Don't be so impressed, he handed over the paper he had found. This note was written by the last guy who came here to get this generator running again. He says we need to go down into the hotel basement and then turn the valve back on. Carmen studied the diagram and then understood, our private emergency gas line here goes down through the building to connect at the primary gas main coming out of the headquarters of the city gas works that is only a few blocks away. Those automated disaster protection core lines could still be functional. He asked, how much power comes out of this machine once the gas is on? A lot, she said before she searched her thoughts for a reference he would be able to relate with. It could power our apartment and a couple hundred more just like it with ease. That is taking into account that we don't actually consume a lot of power with our conservative lifestyles. He liked that, I see, so, this is as much again or even more than what Jim is normally consuming citywide already. Not really. Carmen disagreed. Jim powers a lot more things than just some light bulbs and a television. The labor departments have a lot of machinery like the laundry service and the arc welders. The whole city is a very busy place. Carmen pointed the direction for leaving, that way goes up to the roof. 
she pointed back the way they had come, that way to get back to the stairwell. At that moment, Kevin sent her some information, Carmen told Critias, Kevin says that the generator you discovered will be extremely useful once they get it operational, you should feel good about finding it. I want to see the roof first, he decided. If they did airship off the roof of this building there should be some clear indication of it. We may as well solve the old mysteries before accumulating any new ones. As she led the way to the roof, Carmen reasoned, the appropriate aircraft available at this time would be a helicopter. Such flying machines as those are notoriously fickle in their weight allowances. If the people here did escape off this roof by helicopter, it suggests that they left behind all their heavy armaments and bulky food supplies in that final evacuation. When she reached the staircase to the roof, she paused to say, I think it would be wise if we searched the top floors of this building before taking the elevator down to the fifth floor to see this dangerous connection into that adjacent hotel. On their way up, Gritea said, if they converted your hotel into this federally managed medical containment and rescue station, I doubt they accomplished much containing or rescuing. He broadcasted on his radio before they exited out onto the roof, this is Critias and Carmen, we're about to expose ourselves on the rooftop of our tower. Any shooting will be coming from us. This is Gardener 1, Commander Stig answered the call in his distinctive Finnish accent. Your safety is all jolly. Over. Critias opened the final door out onto his rooftop to go out under the unrelenting rain. The space was a cluttered landscape of communications dishes and air conditioning compressors. He walked out a ways to discover that in the center of the roof was a crudely constructed helicopter landing pad. Multiple touchdowns for receiving evacuees had left evident scuff marks on the sandwiched plywood surface. The top floors did evacuate by these helicopters, Critias sought her agreement with his deduction. The only way up here was by having control of the elevator. Based on that, it seems to me that only the people with the right connections ever left here uninfected. Critias went to the north edge of the roof to see the fairly near and slightly lower roof of the garden building across the way. Two pairs of guardsmen were on lookout upon that nearby rooftop and they waved when they saw him. The views are magnificent in every direction, Carmen told him as she twirled merrily while she caught rain on her covered face. The monument, the old cathedral, and King's Tower is right over there. These old cities make so much more sense now that I have seen one before it decomposed into a vegetated honeycomb tomb. He considered his options and then instructed her, give me a risk versus reward evaluation on all this. Starting the generator immediately would be of minimal value in the short term, she advised, since you have no ready means to consume the electricity you would be creating. He had her pause on that, how far is it to the garden building from here? We could even go down some floors to a more advantageous altitude. A hundred meters, she rounded off an average. He asked. What was a long span between transmission towers when we saw the transformer farm in Houston? She awakened to his thinking and then walked to the edge to look more intently at the garden building. Power transmission lines frequently crossed spans in excess of 60% wider than this gap. Installing high-tension wires would be fraught with technical difficulties, but it is quite possible and would be most advantageous for moving electricity generated here to over there. They may wish to lay an overland cable to the castle as well assuming they could not just drill down to reach the underground passages that the city uses. Critias had other ideas, I'm thinking something grander, more of a bridge actually. Wouldn't that be convenient? She offered more advice, even if you don't need any electricity at the moment, going down to open the valve would allow us to determine if gas is still available to this location. That simple evaluation will be critical in all the other decision making that should follow. That aside, we do already have a functioning elevator. I think it would be profitable for you to locate any readily transportable salvage available within this building. The others can load those supplies into the new vehicles for when they depart for the castle. Those vehicles were already in excellent condition, it won't be long before they're operational again. The remaining variable I see would be your decision on involving the two guardsmen that arrived with Jack. They are of unknown quality, but could increase your overall efficiency should they prove reasonably competent. The risk is that their lack of experience could lead to a potential disaster on the overall safety front. However, you should not overlook the fact that they did volunteer for this hazardous duty. Whatever it is those two men are, they are not cowards. Critias knew his way back to the main stairs. Along the way he radioed to Fajak to fill him in on the natural gas fuel cell generator, the working elevator, and general goings-on. He exited from the stairwell onto the uppermost inhabitable floor that had the highest access to the elevator. Unlike the mechanical floor above, his current level had outer walls that were all windows with that narrow ledge of a balcony that went around. By appearances, that floor had formerly been the royally appointed offices of a prestigious design and engineering firm. 
Their most impressive appointment was a granite slab table of extravagant length that dominated the room in the northeast corner. The windows there allowed for such a stunning view of the monument and riverfront entirely. The table was so large and heavy, it led one to wonder how they even managed to get it up into the building in the first place. Neat rows of black rubber body bags covered that stone committee table. They were mostly flat and all had zippers that kept them closed. Underneath the table and along the walls were many plastic tub containers, assorted backpacks, and duffel bags, many of which were tactical black in color. Discarded bulletproof vests and other body armor made a laundry mound at the far end of the room where it heaped at the intersection of back wall and floor. Carmen boldly approached a body bag on the table and then unzipped it to cast the lapel open wide for exposing its contents. Many pistols, she said in a tone that sounded unsure if celebration was in order. She unzipped the bag next to it. Carmen tossed back that flap to reveal a nested row of combat shotguns. The next bag contained long rifles with scopes. They were working rifles personally tuned for ranged marksmanship, loved by their owners until sadly abandoned with what care they could offer them, perhaps rooted in some impossible dream that their owners would one day return to collect their property. Critias said, much as you predicted for weight allowances, they left behind a lot of their choicest personal weapons. He knelt down to open one of the duffel bags to find a combat knife, some full boxes of premium pistol ammunition, and some dry survival rations. Another pack held a laptop computer, a compact automatic handgun, and a sock holding a trio of fragmentary grenades. She reported on her further findings in the weapon sacks, here are some automatic masking pistols, assault rifles, and these appear to be barrels for an anti-tank rifle in 14.5 and 20 millimeters. Here is the rest of the anti-tank gun, can I have it please? No, he promptly refused. That thing is an accident waiting to happen. I will take it for myself. If you have a good reason for using it later, I shall happily lend it to you. Good enough, she agreed to those terms, which in the end meant she was still going to get to play with it. Carmen reminded him, if you encounter the cases of ammunition for it, be sure to set them aside. She carried the main stock and breech of the barrel removed cannon for his inspection. While he watched, she swung away the movable trigger guard that allowed men in winter mountain mittens to fire the portable cannon a useful feature for Critias to operate the weapon with his sausage-fingered gauntlets on. Carmen described it as if she had it for sale, with optional swing-away trigger guard, a 30-kilogram rifle with high explosive rounds. It has spring buffering, hydraulic dampers, and a side-drafting muzzle brake. This could kill a beta brute android with his full supplemental armor on from two kilometers away. Getting back to business, Critias instructed, you take your artillery down in the elevator and then stash it in the milk wagon. While you're down there, Get those two drivers. Bring them back up with you, they can help move all these guns and bags down to the new armored cars. In the containers under the granite table, he discovered one filled with gigantic anti-tank bullets in assorted varieties. Here is your ammo. He picked up the heavy tub to carry it to the elevator for her. A bell sounded when Carmen opened the elevator. Some quick work with her screwdriver disabled that audible alarm. They quickly loaded the car with forge and then Carmen used her key to unlock the fireman's emergency override to take the elevator down. While she was away, Critias returned to the large office to search through the heap of discarded armor. Working quickly, he tossed what he didn't want further aside while he rescued the useful items like riot boots, reinforced gloves, and protective pieces that likely belonged to prison correction system rumble squads. He found knee and elbow guards, shoulder pauldrons, shin greaves and forearm bracers. It was typical of the ignorance they had found in the building. The most cowardly defenders least willing to put themselves at risk had taken for themselves the equipment most valuable to the frontline defenders. In the end, a whole wardrobe of zombie bite armor ended up discarded as excess weight, still clean from lack of use, while at the same time down below, valiant defenders had died without any armor to protect them, not even gloves, which were critical in that defensive wound hand bites were exceptionally common in that line of work. After he threw all the armor he would take into the various plastic tubs with the extra space to hold it, Critias checked the other corners of that floor. He found some cargo cubes. Each came shrink-wrapped in plastic and riding on extravagantly over-engineered pallets of robust reflective yellow plastic with stainless steel wheels. They were perfectly sized for making maximum usage out of a single trip in an elevator. Their transport labels all read in large letters that they were federal emergency relief materials. Attached over that was a paper manifest that detailed the exact contents of each. Critias went about to vise or record all the manifests. He flipped through them in a clear view without actually taking the time to read any of them himself. Once he had all the documents digitized, he transmitted them to Kevin so the android could make better sense of them. 
he explored a smaller office that contained some chairs and tables. It had a wide selection of laptop computers, handheld cameras, cell phones, and photocopying machines, all gathering dust where someone had abandoned them nearly four years past. Since Carmen was still not back from her trip down the building, he took the stairs down another floor to explore that level too. Half the level turned out to be clean and comfortable short-term living arrangements with many sleeping bags along with abandoned clothing and personal toiletries. The other half served as a canteen a mess hall where the defenders had heated water to rehydrate food and make instant coffee. He found more of the abundant supplies packaged on those rolling yellow pallets courtesy of the emergency management system. Near the supply pallets he found an open plastic bucket of clustered grain nuggets with a scrap of packaging cardboard that said it was rat poison not for eating. The distant hum of the elevator as it descended alerted Critios to take the stairs back up a floor to meet them when the car arrived. It dawned on him that the lift was anything but silent. If he could hear it moving up the building, it was likely that the ghouls would be able to hear it too, if there were any in the immediate vicinity. He hoped that the stormy weather outside was loud enough to suitably cover for it. This would be faster if we could use the elevator stop in the lobby, Carmen told him as the door is opened. It's just so totally unsecure and there are all those bodies everywhere. It's a hassle getting off on the second floor and then detouring around. The two drivers that came with Jack were with Carmen. Critias waved for them to follow him. We're taking everything down in the elevator to the second floor for now. We want all the guns and baggage from that room. There are supply pallets down there and some more on the floor below us. Carmen asked, what do you want me to do? You seem unhappy with our progress thus far. Critias asked her in return, am I wearing my trepidations too openly? This is all too easy, too tempting, and too precarious for my liking. The garage downstairs is bustling with activity, we have these supplies to move, and we still have to collect the equipment Kevin actually sent us here for. Everything hangs on us maintaining secrecy. Once the ghouls discover we're in here, the whole city might come crashing down around our heads. As much as I would like to go and see if the gas is still working for the generator, that is not what we came here for. I will help these two take down all the supplies from these two floors. I want you to work your way down by the stairs extra quietly, checking each level until you can locate everything Kevin wants us to take. While you are searching, you can see what else is around that might be worth taking. Carmen pushed the rain-soaked rag of her grave walking hood up her forehead so he could see her eyes through her plastic safety goggles. She wore them to help disguise herself as human since she didn't actually need them. Carmen could not catch the infection from ghoul blood getting into her eyes or in any other way either. I won't disappoint you? She pledged with a reassuring smile that suggested she approved of his strategic reasoning. The safety of the others will be my mode of priority. I shall be swift but silent. If anything unexpected arises, I'll contact you immediately. The older and burlier of the two drivers said to Critias, maybe I should go with the lady to make sure she has some backup. You can stay here and keep an eye on the kid. In fact, the man was more than just burly. He was large enough that he stood about the equal of Critias while in his mech suit. That wasn't going to happen, but it made Critias curious about the quality of the two men they had taken into their company. He didn't know any of the men of the GNP very well in general and their concealing costumes only disguised their natures even further. Critias asked the younger driver, what do you think about all this? I can't see all that well with these night vision goggles, the younger man answered, and I'm not here to think, sir. Critias liked the teenager's answer. There was something about the kid's voice that made him seem familiar. Carmen can take care of herself, Critias told the older guard. The three of us will stick together and move the cargo. If the shrieking freaks start singing and the tribes come crashing into here, we will need to work together to shoot our way back down to the garage. If you think she can handle this place all on her lonesome, the just modestly older than the teenage driver said as he glanced over to look at her, only to discover that Carmen was already gone. She had stealthily slipped away so unexpectedly that the man turned to look with his night vision goggles in every direction not even knowing in which way she had departed. Only then did it dawn on him that Carmen only wore plastic safety goggles, so he lifted up his night vision rig to test how dark it was in the building like perhaps he could go without them too, which he couldn't. Just relax, Critias advised his two helpers. The ghouls can't see at all in complete darkness. Even if one shows up, you just keep your heads cool with your mouth shut and it won't even know where you are. You could kill it with a rock if you just stay calm. He glanced over their weaponry. The younger driver carried a combat shotgun. The big guard had one of the common military assault rifles. Critias asked, did the outfitters supply you with suppressed weapons? Both men showed him that their automatic pistols had sound suppressors. Critias instructed, use those if you have to shoot anything. Any loud shots will bring us trouble we don't need. 
The three of them worked together to load a roller pallet into the elevator for the trip down, and then they added bags of weapons and other tactical gear to make the most of the available space. Since there was no known way for ghouls to reach the upper floors of the building because of the blocked stairs, Critias felt comfortable when he left the two drivers up there alone to move more of the supplies into position while he took the lift down to unload it on the second floor. As the elevator doors were about to open on the second floor, Fat Jack radioed, Elevator check your fire. The door is parted to reveal Jack as he stood there in night vision goggles waiting for the car to arrive. When Critias was before him, Jack said directly, Carmen tells me that you think our position here is more precarious than it seems. After a pause, he added, more precarious than the ever-present usual I mean. Critias gestured for some help to unload the cargo. As they muscled it out, he told Jack, she thinks there is a connection into the hotel next door up on the fifth floor. There is that as well as the lobby being as wide open as a cheap whore. It's just a matter of time before they get wind of us and then come swarming in here just like they did last time when it was legitimately defended by old world military and police. Jack lifted some baggage that he carried clear of the elevator, I think we can weld shut the doors into the lobby. That should be easy enough with the mechanics I have with me. As far as that hotel is concerned, that kind of thing is what you and Carmen are capable of surviving. You need to check it out and then go down into the underground to find the gas valve so you can turn it on. Critias lacked enthusiasm for that plan, are you asking me, or telling me? If you were saying that Carmen and I could get out of most any jam alive and uninfected, I would agree. On the other hand, if we stir up a hornet's nest in there, it might come down on your end too. It's a substantial risk, especially if it turns out the gas is long gone. I already know the gas still works, Jack informed him. We used the natural gas to fuel our steam boilers and for the generator building you went through coming out of Forager's castle. The gas main pipe passes through down in the underground tunnels. We tapped into it again when we moved into King's Tower. It took a moment for Critias to visualize the tunnels he had seen and their relationship to the buildings on the surface. When the smugglers' passage ended at that north-south section of old railway tunnel, the north line went up under the garden building, which meant that the unused south line was somewhere straight down beneath their feet. Critias asked, Do you think the basement of this building connects to the south end of that abandoned railway tunnel? I know we are above it, Jack confirmed it. For there to be any connection, we will have to cut one ourselves like we did for the garden building. Based on that node you found, I'm feeling certain that the gas pipe here connects with the main line down there in the tunnels. Given time and safe opportunity, there are many things we could take from this building and from that hotel next door. We can't profit immediately from that bloom generator you discovered, but I do need to know if we can get it operational. For us to do that, we need the gas turned on. That hotel sounds like an unholy death trap to me, Critias cautioned. Carmen says they were using it as some kind of emergency quarantine hospital. From the bodies I have seen in this building, I get the impression that they collected so many of the infected that they finally overran the place and then flooded into this tower too. That hotel might be knee-deep in spilled guts. One thing is for certain, I've seen that building's ground floor from outside and it's more broken glass than brick. How wise is it to have a connection between that mess and our own tunnels? Jack was determined to proceed, we won't know what can be done until somebody goes inside for a look around. You can film everything as you go. We can take our time studying the options later. If you get us GPS references, we can compare those with the tunnels below. This is not an all or nothing proposition. There is a lot to gain if we only secure a few safe rooms from where we can forge into the rest. Staying off the streets is the real issue and running power cables underground to the garden building would be a real luxury too. Luxuries and necessities, Critias said as he gave a firm shove to make the pallet roll out of the lift. I forget, which one of those was the one worth risking your life for? I forget myself, Jack confessed. I do recall it is from the luxuries that you can sneak a little extra way down your pockets when nobody is looking, it's your ass that gets bit when things go wrong. You deserve an extra cookie from the jar. That made Critias chuckle, is that in the forger's code? Jack confirmed it was, I penciled that one in on the back cover. Critias went to his radio, where are you, beautiful? Carmen radioed back, I'm still exploring the upper floors. I have found nothing of special value or interest. These rooms are quite clean and free of battle damage. It is my estimation that the upper half of the building became isolated before the civil collapse. He instructed his wife, I want you to tell those two drivers to keep moving the cargo on their own. After that, you keep on with what you've been doing. I'm going down into the hotel to check out that gas valve we talked about. If there is any trouble, your job will be to make sure that everyone else makes it to the vehicles and then gets out of here alive in one piece. Do you understand me? But... 
she complained, my place is by your side. Critias didn't like it much either, but he had already made up his mind. His stern tone was more act than serious. Your place is where? My place is where you need me to be, she conceded with a sense of reassured satisfaction. She's a good girl, Fad Jack affirmed. If anything goes wrong, she will get us safely out of here. I'd take her armed with only that hockey stick of hers against any hundred ghouls. Carmen told me something, Critias confided. She never appreciated what these cities were like until seeing them in this time. I have to admit it helps me imagine what it was like, and from watching your cinema too of course. It will be a long time before anyone has that good life ever again, a real long time. Carmen deserves better than this and now that I've married her, I'm wishing I could give her something. There needs to be more for her than just the slaughtering of ghouls and feeling lucky to get an uninterrupted night's sleep. Jack nodded with understanding, now you know why I'm telling you to go down there and check on that gas valve. Things could be a lot worse for a lot of people than they are right now and maybe we can make their lives a little better. There is a lot to appreciate about having your own apartment, some hot food, and running electricity. This is the lifestyle of the rich and famous compared to being huddled into one room while starving in the dark. Critias removed the last plastic tub from the lift and then went back and ready for their ride up to the fifth floor. Before leaving, he advised, you watch yourself around the lobby. If even one screamer takes notice of you, things are going to get a whole lot worse sooner than you would like. I'll be careful, Jack assured him. You just do the same and good luck. Chapter 2. The Mad Mirror When the elevator door is finally opened on the fifth floor, a leathery ghoul body fell inside the lift. The face shot undead quasi corpse wore a military helmet and body armor over a soiled camouflage uniform. Critias paused to examine the insanely featureless head that had regenerated closed absent any eyes or nasal structure. The undamaged mouth hung walled open and parched as if it waited patiently for some of that rainwater to fall inside. He stripped the body of its ammo belt with the handgun still in its holster to leave them inside the lift as more salvage. Critias then gripped the disabled ghoul at the back of the vest to then toss it away from the elevator car. Just before exiting, he pressed the button to send the elevator on its way upward to the top floor so that the two guards could use it as they moved more cargo. The fifth floor was a disaster area seen from a major standoff between the civil defense forces and the outbreak era infected. A moist rainy wind came in through all the blown out windows. There was hand grenade damage that marred spots on the floor. Bodies lay strewn all about. Plenty of bones were around too that had come from the defeated uninfected that the victorious invaders had devoured before they eventually departed. It was unskilled engineers not ghouls that had torn a crude hole through the common west wall, breaking into that hotel next door. The floor on the hotel side was not at the same level as the radio building. To make up the elevation difference going down, they had shoved through an equally primitive aluminum ramp, one they had presumably confiscated from some loadable truck. A drapery of transparent plastic strips formed an air dam across the threshold. Blackened blood splatter ruined most of its transparency and all the bullet holes made it a poor barrier against the traffic of air. Critias slung his rifle over his back and then drew his panga bowie blade, which he used for parting the plastic drapes as he passed through. The hole emerged into the sitting room of a formerly luxurious hotel suite. It was likely an inferior room for the establishment since it was on the windowless side of the building. Gory footprints on the carpet made a clear trail that would undoubtedly lead out into the main hallway. He paused to pick up a brochure that advertised the amenities of the hotel's expensive accommodations. Jack, Critias radioed. There is a big hole going into this next building just as Carmen predicted. When they advertised this hotel as having spacious rooms with an elegant decor, I think that was before the ghouls remodeled it for them. This place is a giant maze of dark corners and spider holes. That was not an exaggeration. Each hotel room came with a plethora of closets and vestibular antechambers, any one of which could shelter some famished lurker. Fad Jack radioed back, when you reach the main hallway, look for a fire evacuation plan on the wall that will show a simple map marking the stairwells and emergency exits. That hotel has its own underground parking garage. You probably saw the pair of roll-up vehicle doors from the street on your way in. When you reach the ground floor, follow the signs to get into that garage. The common utility area you are looking for will be down in there, likely just straight down from that hole you entered through. Critias considered searching the hotel room in order to make sure that he didn't leave any live ghouls to skulk around behind him. There was an adjoining boudoir. A master bedroom with its own lavatory, plus other rooms and many closets. He decided against making the search for the sake of expediency. At one time, a grand dirty army of infected had surged through that space to enter into the adjoining radio building. They had left the carpets all black and spongy from their traffic of congealed blood. Their path was utterly obvious, 
even if he didn't have the visor sensors to reveal contamination areas and ultraviolet highlighted clarity. The outer hallway was spaciously broad with a high ceiling and ornamental hardwood trim. Critias took a moment to see that an oil painting still hung on the wall even though the quarantine workers had thrown up plastic sheathing right over it along with the rest of the place. It struck him odd in the statement that it made. Perhaps they thought things would return to normal someday, or they were merely too hurried to bother with something as unimportant as pausing to take the painting down. In either case, the painting remained pristine while the men that had covered it up were long since in ruin. Critias liked to think that they wanted to protect the painting. It was of a wistfully beautiful young woman who stood in a flower garden as she held the hem of her peasant's outer field work skirt. In a sad way, it made him worry about Carmen. He didn't find Jack's fire emergency map until he had already followed the bloody footprints to the main stairwell. There was a pair of elevators there and their doors stood open, only the lifts were nowhere nearby, the precariously open shafts had plenty of bloody drag marks that led up to their precipices. He rightly assumed that at the end of their downfall, the defenders had just flung their bodies down the shafts as a simple yet efficient expedience. Nearby down the hallway there was a door that had some dramatic yellow plastic bands that closed it off. Critias thought the side demanded some curious investigation. He tore down the plastic, which was something of a good sign that suggested that the interior beyond was unspoiled by previous looters. The locked door used some sort of primitive swipe card technology to open it, so he set his shoulder against it, dug in his heels and then forced it as Grendel might. To his surprise, the elaborate lock was more ruse than intention because it casually broke apart far too easily, especially when compared to his invested expectation. Critias was hard to nauseate but what he saw upset even his iron stomach. That hotel suite was an impromptu hospital ward. Its rows of beds had rows of bodies that were all children. Each was a mummified dehydrated infected with a gunshot wound to the forehead. The first of them suffered execution in their own beds, but then the weight of other bodies that the wardens brought in from elsewhere collapsed the plastic containment tents over the initial victims. Over time, the small room had become a morgue that brimmed with undead children. Critias didn't think that was the horror that had prompted them into putting tape across the door. The nurse who hung herself from the ceiling by an electrical cord likely had been what they wanted hidden. She had pinned a note to her blouse reading, God forgive us. Critias doubted that God had forgiven anyone yet or that he would for some centuries to come. He pushed the thought away when it led to the notion that somehow he was mankind's forgiveness when he took a cure back to the future. Critias was no savior, just the person that fate had taken a shit on, as was so often the case with history. The martial part of him nagged that it was just as likely that some men had raped and murdered the woman. When they finally finished with her, they had just strung her up to make it look like a suicide. Denver had taught him that men certainly could snuff rape some woman atop a pile of children's gunshot bodies. People were capable of more insanity than that. After they had found out that they were already infected or only had hours to live before an unstoppable army of unkillable ghouls broke down the last of their barricades. As Critias turned to leave. He saw that there was a plushy teddy bear inside a plastic package that hung from a hook on the back side of the door. The bag made it seem as if they had let the children see a toy they couldn't really touch, maybe even let them hold it for a comforting moment just before they put a bullet through their head. Most people had the luxury to live, in their private fantasy world that didn't glow in its full techno-color putrid truth, but Critias wasn't one of them. The madness of it all only settled on him more as he took the bear down while at the same time he left the suicide woman to hang by her neck like a gamey pheasant. Her lack of decomposition demonstrated that she had infected herself by accident while trying to give aid to others or perhaps she had contracted it from the infected bodily fluids of her crazed rapist. The point was that Critias did feel at home in the vividly obscene insanity. He could offer some kind of future to a toy bear. For the woman, he could do nothing but walk away as a witness that she had ever lived at all. He closed the door behind him on the way out. It was his way to close out any thought about if what had happened even mattered. The magnitude of the outbreak catastrophe was too much for any one mind. Each little montage of misery was only a single piece in a jigsaw puzzle that contained billions more sections just as wretched. In a tragic irony, even as Critias understood that, he was too stupid to understand that it would be his responsibility to protect Carmen from it. It was too much for a human mind, but not a computerized one. Jack radioed for an update, find anything interesting yet? Only some Edgar Poe creepy darkness of the human soul. Critias answered as he sat the toy bear down in the hallway for him to retrieve on his return trip. This medical center thought they could help some people. They were wrong. Some of them really tried their best to hold off the inevitable only to have it drive them insane. Carmen transmitted a quotation, the sweet imperious mouth, whose haughty valor defied all portents of impending doom. Even in such dark moments, Carmen felt no depression. 
she cared about herself and her love for Critias. Everything else was just data, work, and war. The bioengineers did not create her to weep over the histrionic destruction that had eaten the planet, for the most part literally. Critias asked, did Poe say that? No, she replied. That was his estranged girlfriend. Please tell me, master, what is it that you have seen that makes you dread unseen floating shadows? Carmen didn't spend every waking moment consciously monitoring her husband's visor. She sometimes needed to ask. It is not shadows that float, dear wife, but the dangling feet of a self-hanged woman, or so I assume it was by choice. In any case, her soul keeps eternal watch as guardian spirit over a morgue of slain children. There is no mystery in that, Carmen explained unmoved by any hint of tragedy. I found much the same here in this tower up on the eighth floor. It appears that those without privilege to use the elevator to escape hire for helicopter evacuation had barred themselves into the last secure chamber where they euthanized their helpless dependents before taking their own lives. Critias asked sarcastically, rather than pointlessly suffering more in futility? Precisely, she confirmed in an unsympathetic tone with a hint of self-satisfied intellectual arrogance. I told you this was a strategically unsound location for a command center. At least they had the good sense to self-terminate rather than endure maddening dormant only to become one of the enemy to further perpetuate the outbreak. Her insensitively obtuse obliviousness to the human suffering involved irked Critias, not because that kind of emotional armor was inappropriate for a marshal, but because it was unflattering to his precious and quite selfish mental image of what he desired to have in a gentle doting feminine wife. Mission Radio was not the place for him to lecture her about it, so Critias said, I'll stay in touch. To sign off he added, Let's keep the ignorant commentary to a minimum. The newly wedded Carmen felt the cruel sting as he called her statements ignorant. Critias didn't understand just how influential his desires were, especially when he took the time to direct them at her and words, which in a way were like directives that she analyzed with meticulous seriousness. The verbal slap didn't help her understand what she had done wrong to offend him. The bioengineers had gifted her with a profound understanding of tactical practicalities and situational necessities. Those things were clear to her but the sublime strengths that resonated from within the frail human spirit as it defied adversity, strengths like universal compassion and pitiable self-sacrifice were absent from her comprehension. Even that was not so great a flaw in her since it was true that very few humans ever attained that enlightenment either, where they could feel compassion for a whole world. In Carmen's case, she actually did have the mental processing power to start solving that ultimate puzzle. Because Critias disliked her as she was, her ignorance as he had called it, she would fix it. Critias descended through the hotel by the stairwell, that ever-present spiraling column of steps that had been so critical to fire evacuations when the world had been alive. That same egress had later become the proverbial arteries of invasion as the infected ghouls exterminated mankind, only to then finally come full circle to become the forager's best friend as they navigated through the ruined architectural labyrinths. He was glad not to know what was on the floors he passed by unexplored. The bloodstains, bullet casings, and frequent bodies on the stairs were clues enough that he wouldn't miss anything besides the further demoralization that he had inadvertently ordered Carmen to collate and comprehend to the finest degree. The ground floor lobby tempted Critias to take a brief glance beyond its door. That grand gallery was almost baroque in its lofty use of space and tasteful display of wealth. It made man's last age seem quite the classical treasure compared to his own future developments that distinctly lacked in architectural exhibitions of affluence. His age was one of resourcefulness, ingenuity and longevity, but it had little pride for haughty manners. It was false humility only suited for its makers since it merely cheated the generations that followed out of some admirably ostentatious splendors. The storm's winds blew rain right in through the smashed frontage where it soaked everything and gathered into puddles on the floor. He was about to move on, but then Critias paused, having felt that something had just happened unseen. Nothing dangerous seemed readily visible to his spectrum of visual senses, so he listened to his amplified audio for some clue. The external microphones of his helmet had extraordinary reception with secondary enhancements. At first, he just heard the rain and the dripping that gathered into the pools of loose water. After he filtered out those sounds of chaotic nature, he heard the sonic chalkboard pings of bats and then he heard the distant soft shuffle and slow breaths of many infected. This hotel might be one of their nightly safe houses, Jack, Critias transmitted. I'm on the lobby level now and I can hear them sheltering out of the rain calmly enough, but clearly in strength of numbers. I think they are huddling together in one of the ballrooms in an effort to stay warm. It is not their way to divert too far from the light, Jack said meaning that they would not venture deep into the structure where total darkness would blind them, they have no love of a soaking in a cold rain either. If they are confining themselves to the large rooms near the main entrances, perhaps the dingy basement will be free of them napping. As to that place, 
There is the matter of these bats, Critias reported. If my guess is right, that dank pit is much to the liking of their kind and so they have made a home of it. Where there are bats, there is their guano and the bugs that it nourishes. Carmen agreed with the dangerous implications of bats. A large population of bats could support a whole troll of file ecosystem down in the lower recesses of that structure. Your respiratory filters will protect you from the inhalation risks of the foul air in such a moldy and putrid place, but where there is edible filth there are hungry mouths to sup it. Jack radioed, if you think further trespass is unwise, we could wait till another time in daylight hours when the inhabitants are prowling the streets rather than lurking idly nearby. If danger was an excuse to retreat, we might never leave our beds a single morning, Critias replied. I'll go forward until some matter of substance denies me. If only, Carmen pined. I would relish a world where morning beds need never be abandoned. I would be content in that kingdom. Mindful of business is what you need to make yourself, woman, Critias answered her. Your laziness had best not be the cause that you are still present at your own duties that you should have long since finished. We are not paid by the hour and I would rather be done with all this and relaxing at the captain's table. I will redouble my efforts to hasten our departure, she pledged, and yet this night I will serve you at your table. It is by no lack of devotion that I offended you with ignorant words, may an excess of that same virtue prove my remedy. Business, Carmen, he reminded her again. Have your mind on nothing else. I have located the television studio, she told him in an even tone. All of the equipment that Kevin requested will be ready for transfer to the vehicles within 15 minutes. Critia slowly closed the stairwell door from where he looked into the lobby, ensuring that it did not make a sound. Placard signs clearly read that the parking garage was just below him. He continued on that way. The door into the garage stood wide open because a stray shotgun blast had mangled its uppermost hinge as well as peppered its steel along with the cement wall. The damage jammed the portal into a permanent wide position. The sound of the bats was closer as was the sound of water that dripped as it leaked into the garage. Exploring the hotel had given Critias a clearer understanding on just why Jack wanted the building. There would be enough plastic sheeting, respirator masks, and other decontamination supplies to meet the city's needs for a long time to come. That was if they could manage to retrieve them. There were many more goodies about the place besides. With so many broken windows that allowed the storm to blow in the rain, it was no wonder that the interior of the hotel flooded so readily. Combined with the freeze of winter, the building would not last many years against the decay. Much like an egg, man's world didn't have much of a shelf life once the shell had cracked. When the hotel had emptied all of its guests by eviction or consent, they had taken all their fine automobiles with them. In that regard the garage was quite unlike the crowded one next door. Critia saw a squadron of parked cars that wore the painted markings of civilian law enforcement. There were five of the burly military cars that Jack had called Hummers, and there was a dozen ambulances. A few luxury sedans and a shuttle bus were also present. The standout vehicle was an armored currency transport van parked obtrusively center floor space with its rear doors wide open. Bat droppings covered everything and the leaking rainwater mixed with it in the other filth on the floor to make a slippery slime. Critias didn't understand what an armored car even was since it had no equivalent in his time. It seemed more like some kind of bomb-resistant military vehicle. So much of the bad droppings made a smearing drape down the side that all the writing there was illegible. Being careful not to slip in the greasy muck, he approached to look inside the rear open doors. It contained mail sacks of their worthless carnival chit currency, just comical strips of paper only useful for sinful usury scams, toilet wipe, or campfires. There were also some women's leather handbags that had spilled over to show their burglarized jewelry, watches, and rare coins. In total, it appeared to be a collection of police confiscated plunder that they had taken from other looters. The worthless treasure had made its way up a moronic food chain of misguided greed that had led nowhere. The sum of it reminded Critias of something Fajak had told him. People were free to load their pockets with all the gold they could carry, especially while swimming. The energy that men had placed into the acquisition of the worthless wealth had also very likely been the excessive burden that eventually dragged them under. A cluck and gurgle sound from a ghoul drew Critias' attention away from the armored car. A naked and legless crawler was ten meters away as it blindly dragged itself to belly slither through the muck. It advanced about a meter at a time because it frequently paused to raise its head as though it tracked by scent. It must have smelled something when it bared its teeth to make the obscene gurgle again before it crawled ahead once more. Just seeing the thing by the monochrome of night vision made Critias remember who he had been before Carmen changed him, a cold and indifferent instrument of principle. With a practiced shrug he unslung his Tesla Flux rifle so that it slid down his arm by its sling. The pitiful crippled ghoul either heard the motion or just felt the Lorenzini field of an uninfected human. 
it scrambled toward Critias at speed while it huffed out breath of excitement. Critias wirelessly checked the computerized selector on his rifle to be certain that he had it on the silent velocity setting and then he fired a round into the thing's forehead. The bullet impact made a wet smack of a sound as tungsten slapped through meat and bone. It was a loud noise in the tight acoustic confines of that underground parking garage, sound enough to instigate a chorus of infected grumbles from all about the putrescent water garden. Water dripped from the ceiling in many places so that the echoing sound became a meditative mantra. The slippery filth underfoot was like the trap of an antlion that immobilized edible prey for the many crawlers who lived in that cavernous vault. The ghouls kept themselves well fed on the dropped dead bats, the manure bugs, and other unfortunate small critters that blundered into the place. The crawlers even found their form of locomotion prosperous. They sheltered under cars from where they could snake out on the oily glot to seize their prey. That foul underground garage really was one of those places where crawlers gathered in numbers as Governor Kashi had suggested at Critias's inquiry trial. As a true lair of those repulsive legless creatures, it was an inarguably far different habitat than just being an elevated highway in the relatively pleasant woods. In his computerized mech suit armor that scientists had grown from the DNA code in his own genes, Critias had the balance to walk a tightrope. The slickness of the floor did not concern him any more than did the crippled ghouls that glided smoothly through that slime as they came at him from all sides. He was more mindful of the global position application on his visor display than of the infected as he shot them in their faces. The pressured exploding of their heads made a sound that distracted the crawlers and made it difficult for those encircling creatures to locate him in their night blindness. The wretched ghouls were not even certain that he was there at all as they probed their territory with justifiable suspicion. Each of them hoped to stumble upon some definite sign of an interloper, which Critias would not provide them. The ghoulish bat-eaters were masters of skulking. Where at first the place had seemed abandoned, when roused, the crawlers revealed themselves to number at least two dozen. Critias shot them in a deliberately staggered pattern. He killed some at a distance and some closer up, from one side and then the other so that the sound of their bursting heads would not lead the others his way. Even that staggered discretion could not conceal the frequent repetition of his shots or the grotesque death rattles of the ghouls with their shattered faces. With each one down, those who remained became increasingly certain that something was amiss in their filthy lair. The general alarm drew more of them out into the open from their hiding places so that they too could embrace their destruction in turn. At that moment, a dreadful realization just popped into Critias's mind. He thought about when he closed that stairwell door upstairs after he had glanced in on the lobby. Despite all the care that he had put into closing the door quietly, the spring-loaded lock lever had still made the slightest metallic click. In hindsight, he realized the true source of that humble sound. Critias had been sufficiently careful to make sure that the door hadn't clicked. In his time there were no archaic doorknobs or gunpowder firearms anymore, just as they had no mechanical iris cameras. Not that he disrespected the engineering that had gone into those primitive technologies. The click Critias had heard upstairs was not from any door lock. It had been from the hammer on a well-oiled handgun. He had not the least clue whose gun it had been or where his armed stalker might be at the current moment, but he, remained mindful of all the serious implications. The most probable explanation that came to his mind was that he had caught the attention of some watcher who lived in the hotel or maybe one had even been following him around all night. Critias didn't believe any one mortal could grave walk with the skill necessary to follow him around outdoors, successfully avoiding the infected and him at the same time. When he checked his sensors and found the bats because he sensed that something was wrong, something had been awry. Critias had felt someone watching him, something close and dangerous, but he was unable to discover what it was. He still didn't know, but he felt certain that he wasn't alone. No longer feeling in control of his destiny, Critias shot the rest of the crawlers in rapid succession. Even as his bullets punched in their eyes with their subsonic masses, he pondered where his real danger lurked. Something bad was close and he felt it in his bones. Critias found the gas valves near the center of the east wall between two butteresses in the concrete. A padlocked steel cover protected access to a utility niche where the main gas line came in as well as what appeared to be service for the garage's overhead fire suppression sprinklers. He could tell all that because someone had already cut away the padlock and left the panel open. A workman's bag of tools still rested on the hood of an adjacent luxury car where the repairman had last left them some years past. All that was missing was an explanation as to why the technician hadn't finished his task of resetting the triggered safety shutoff valve, aside from the obvious, which was that he had died and the ghouls had torn him to pieces before he had gotten the chance. That he had been so close only to then fail at the final moment was uncanny timing. Critias reached to examine the tool bag on the hood of the car. He abruptly withdrew his hand when he saw a faint point of red light flash for the briefest instant from somewhere inside the car upon the dashboard behind the filthy windshield. 
There were no car alarms in his distant future nor was there surviving cars capable of having a functional alarm, but like the bright colors of a venomous snake or toxic spine fish, Critias instinctively recognized their universal symbol for don't touch this extreme danger. As he looked down at the tool bag on the car, he got the idea that touching the vehicle had brought about the mysterious doom of the technician, without him understanding exactly why. What am I looking at here, Carmen? He radioed to his wife while he also sent her a visual image of the gas valves. The one on the left, she answered. Just pull that brass ferruled nipple out until it locks into place. The solenoid has lost all residual charge, it won't close itself ever again. Critia told her, I will give you a few minutes. Hurry up and move what you came here for and then get back to those two drivers and help them move the cargo to the vehicles. We have overstayed our welcome and I want to be out of here as soon as possible. You keep an exacting track of where everyone is at all times. If you bump into anyone that you don't know holding a gun and a radio, you shoot them before they shoot you. From Critias's mentioning of a radio, Thajak correctly assumed Critias suggested that someone unfriendly and armed possibly listened in on their radio conversations. Jack transmitted, are you expecting to leave for Chicago soon? Probably not, Critias understood the coded meaning for disaster. Sometimes you can never know about such things but I have a feeling that the necessity may come up suddenly. A man can wear out his welcome and trust and luck one time too often. If I do have to go there, I will call you from the road. The vehicles are ready to start, Jack informed him. All of us are on task and will have the cargo loaded up shortly. Critias made a careful glance about and soon located the last two crawlers that still skulked in the garage. After he shot them both, he studied the gas valve once again to be certain that it wasn't booby-trapped. There was nothing unusual about it at all. He reached out, grasped the brass nipple, and then easily pulled it out to lock it in the open position. Before he could turn around, a woman's voice spoke to him from somewhere across the garage. She said, I don't know who sent you, but you shouldn't have come alone to put a hit on me. I'm not that easy and you only get one life. You should have guarded yours more carefully. It seems I already have the drop on you. You never even knew I was coming. Critias wasn't all of that surprised that someone had followed and more specifically watched him. I knew you were around here somewhere, he answered calmly. I heard you cock that pistol of yours up by the door to the lobby. Whether Critias suspected his danger or not, he was still in a bad spot and likely at the woman's mercy. He didn't overlook the fact that she could have just shot him in the back if that had been her real intention. Then again, since she assumed he was there to assassinate her, it suggested that she was still ready to defend herself if he gave her due cause. I don't even know who you are, ma'am, Critias said without turning around. Why would I want to kill you? If you were here just to fix the leaking water faucets, she reasoned, you wouldn't be carrying that rifle you have there and wearing that hip holster too, now would you, tell me who sent you to kill me so that after I kill you, I can look them up to return the favor. No one sent me, he told her with some tone of annoyance while turning around slowly with his hands in a gesture of peace. Critias hoped his bullet-resistant armor would carry the day if she took a shot at him but thankfully she didn't. When he could see, he only saw that the woman stayed cleverly hidden. He asked her voice, why would anyone want to kill you anyway, ma'am? Doesn't everyone have enough problems these days without shooting at complete strangers? Though he couldn't see, it had to be the woman who switched on a flashlight and then shined it into his face from near the stairwell across the garage. She blinded him with the light and made it impossible for him to see who was behind it. Critias stood still while entirely illuminated by the beam. After a moment of inspection, she said, you're the one who battled Goliath, not once but twice. I've heard of you, stranger, a great pistolier he said of you. Where is the sword angel who spoke with Bellman? My guess is that she is here too somewhere close by, since you seem to have this habit of getting into trouble together. This hotel is in the territory of the Wharf Street Yakuza gang, if you didn't already know. I'm surprised those gangsters haven't come after you already. If she is here and they find her, it won't be good for her. They may only be petty ruffians smugglers of heroin and pirated kids videos, but they have also been known to mistreat young women too, maybe even kidnapped her for sale to the White Tigers Sex Slavery Guild. From her words, Critias understood that the woman was some kind of utter lunatic that rambled in half-truth fantasy nonsense not unlike Jingle Bells. It now made sense to him about why some of the infected had been afraid of Carmen and why the woman he spoke with was not afraid to walk among the ghouls. The woman was a watcher and the ghouls had mistaken Carmen for her. Critias explained. That Goliath character attacked us of his own bad tempered accord, both times. We only defended ourselves rather than be killed by him. She did slay him with her sword, but only out of self defense. We gave him a respectful funeral to honor his legendary might and ferocity. 
your story is likely true, the woman agreed. He did die inside your house and uninvited to be sure, not inside his own. That you showed your respects to a fallen enemy is commendable as well, but I don't see how those things will make much difference to Bellman or to you at this point. We're not in your house now and Bellman is not the forgiving sort despite all his talk about faith in such matters. Critias heard whispers from a male voice that he couldn't make out in any detail. Presumably a second watcher was with the first and spoke into her ear. His radio erupted to drown out any chance for him to learn more as a guard from the garden building spoke, we have buku migration on the streets. The guard's voice was somewhere between nervous and excited, a large tribe is moving south in silence along the highway in a loose formation. I recommend you exfiltrate from Radio City immediately. We will observe. Awaiting orders. Over. It seems that Bellman is coming now to resolve his personal business with you, the woman disclosed the information she had received in the whisper. She offered it as his fair chance to escape before Jingle Bells arrived rather than to gloat over his doom. His Templar soldiers will be here momentarily, I suggest you run while you still can. I know they're coming, Critias replied. Even now they're marching south along the highway coming from the sports stadium I suspect. I imagine Jingle Bell still thinks he is secretive and cunning. My name is Critias and I don't run from fights. Let me have your name, ma'am. If I manage to get home alive this night, I would like to spread the fame of the woman who shot me in the back for no good reason as I tried to walk out after equitable parley. I don't run from my battles either, Mr. Critias, she retorted having felt the insult, and I don't shoot my enemies in the back either when their fragile glass face would suit me better. Anyway, According to you, we're not yet enemies. Goliath was no friend of mine so your business with Bellman or his wrestler is really none of my concern. It is Bellman you should worry about now since he will be taking his revenge on you soon enough. Too bad about your lady though. You admitted it was she not you that killed Bellman's bodyguard, and with a sword no less. She must truly be magnificent, worthy of appreciation even from me. Bellman guessed as much to the outcome after you made him flee for his skin and now he wants to make a special example out of her. It seems he may yet get his opportunity. The male watcher whispered something again that Critias didn't catch. The female snorted a sort of derisive amusement over what he told her. She asked Critias, did you set aside this stuffed toy bear to give to her? Just how romantic a fool in love are you, Mr. Critias? She couldn't see through his helmet to notice the dangerous way he narrowed his eyes, nor could she see how close he was to throwing caution to the wind, drawing his pistol, and then taking his best chance to put a bullet in her brain. Critias thought he had better than average odds to kill her where she likely stood behind her flashlight. I did, Critias answered coldly. What of it? The woman laughed out loud with unnerving merriment, I'm going to leave it here for you on the stairs. You can pick it up on your way out, but I want something from you in return. Critias agreed, and what is that? She conversationally challenged, I want to see if you two are really all that he said you were. Her light source backed away toward the exit door into the stairwell. It sort of bobbed and circled to confuse just where she was in relation to it. Critias called after the woman, how do I go about providing you with that demonstration? You'll think of something, I'm sure, was her answer before she threw the flashlight in his direction, but I'll help you get started. Critias quick drew his pistol, but was still too blind to see anything to shoot at as his visor tried to switch from normal light to night vision and then back again as the flashlight tumbled to sweep over him repeatedly like a little flying lighthouse. He wasn't sure if he would have pulled the trigger on her even if he had seen the mysterious female watcher. She had treated him honorably enough such that shooting a woman in the back after conversation was beyond the boundaries of his manly fate even if she was an extremely dangerous weapon understanding watcher ghoul. Critias doubted that many of the other foragers would agree with his principles, fraught as they were with potentially deadly consequences, should he ever have to try to explain it to them. He was duty bound to keep Jim informed and he suspected that the king would be pissed about it, since for all they knew. She was familiar with explosives and could just dynamite the whole king's tower right out from under their feet. Fortunately, he never saw her clearly enough anyway to take the shot. Letting her go was not a problem that he would need to explain. A moment later, about the time his vision had properly adjusted, the flashlight finally crash landed into the car's rear windshield. The impact set off a shrieking anti-vandalism alarm that signaled the dinner bell for every ghoul within a kilometer. It was in that moment that Critias realized just how stupid it was of him to not have shot the damn flashlight out of the air and thus saved himself a considerable amount of trouble. Then again, the Watcher woman may have misconstrued such a shot as an attack on her person, which would have turned the situation into a gunfight that he didn't really need either, even if he hadn't stood before the live gas pipes at his back. Get everyone out of here, he radioed to the others as he skated impressively fast for the exit despite the floor being slicker than snot on ice. This mission is over. 
I've blundered into a trap car that sounded a siren. Jingle Bells knows where I am and he has a tribe headed this way. I'll take care of myself and get to the castle on foot just as soon as I can. They don't know about you or your building, just keep quiet while you evacuate and make sure it stays that way. Carmen urgently pledged, I'm on my way to help you. Critias shouted back by radio, you will make sure everyone gets to their vehicles and then safely inside the castle. That's a direct order, Carmen. If the ghouls overrun that place, no one may ever get out of there. Chapter 3. Thundercaller. Garden patrol sounded off on the radio, this is Gardener 3. There's a car alarm chirping from the south. I think it is coming from the hotel garage. Over. Gardener 1 confirms, the Finnish guard commander seconded the observation. There is a loud siren coming from the hotel. The stinkers are swarming like ants down there and making hard for it. Over. Just as the watcher woman had promised, Critias as plastic shrouded plush bear sat upright on the first step where it awaited him. He tucked it up under his arm as he vaulted up the stairs on his way to the lobby. If that mysterious new pair of watchers wanted to put him through hell over a damn toy bear, he surely wouldn't suffer all the slings and arrows of misfortune without also getting his humble prize to show for it. By the time that he reached the door, the shriek of the alarm siren faltered as the exquisitely expensive battery in the luxury car gave up its last spark of life. It had powered the treacherous klaxon for the last time. No doubt the drop two bag on the car's hood had set off the alarm years before when it took the life of the gas valve repairman. Critias could only wonder at how many people had died over the years for that very same reason, murdered by an automated betrayal of cries that only ever summoned ghouls. Critias paused at the lobby door where he evaluated his situation. The upper floors of the hotel had concealed a sizable population of formerly resting infected. They undoubtedly heard the car alarm going off inside their comfortable fortress habitat and would want to investigate. Critias already heard them snarling and thumping about as they rushed down through the building. If Critias continued up the internal stairway, he would soon find himself slogging through those ghouls only to lead the whole growing catastrophe right into the Radio City building as they pursued his escape. The hotel's street-level banquet rooms apparently did serve as nightly sleep shelters for wild runner tribes. It was a typical behavior of ghouls to cluster together in a dry place to share their body heat and conserve calories. Perhaps infected also valued companionship and that it staved off some tragic sense of loneliness. For whatever reason, teamwork was prolific among the damned. That warped sense of community they shared while at rest didn't leave them in their moments of agitation either. The whole ballroom horde remained together as those vicious creatures ushered forth from their dark chambers with wrathful intensity. As Dante had said, there was no greater sorrow for the damned than to recall in lingering misery the times when they were happy. Since Critias didn't want to shift his problems onto any of his friends in Radio City, he decided to fight the ghouls from where he was without trying to sneak away. To get things started, he made his best loudspeaker roar an imitation of Grendel while he also kicked the stairwell door open. The steel fire door was strong enough to take the blow even if its locking latch was not. The door was never supposed to be actually locked since it served as an emergency exit. Its latch only served to keep it closed and as such it shattered away to let the door fly open with a bang. Critias wanted the ghouls to mistake him for a berserk hunter that would not hesitate to maim his own kind if they foolishly wandered too close. He was off to a good start. Critias charged out into the magnificently appointed and spacious front lobby with its antique imported marble floor and regal forest of classical pillars. He roared again with feeling to take advantage of the chamber's better acoustics and it sounded more genuine. For the plan he had in mind. It was important that the ballroom ghouls noticed him. Critias realized that he needed to make an example out of some of them. What he did to a few could impress upon all the others just how much of a threat they had to contend with. Critias really was a whole heap of trouble like they had never known before. Since the infected were always of a mind to investigate disturbances, Critias needed the hotel ghouls around him to make more noise as a ready replacement for that faltered car alarm. He actually wished that the car alarm still worked. Critias also had Jingle Bell's horde out on the streets that he had to deal with. Luring that approaching army of infected into the hotel was critical to Critias's overall plan. If he captured the attention of all the hotel ghouls and Jingle Bell's infected too, he would prevent any of them from attacking Radio City instead. Fab Jack and the workers with him still needed time to get away to safety. Gardner 3 asked on radio, what the fuck was that? Over. Gardner 4 answered, I heard a hunter howling in the hotel when the alarm cut out. Over. Gardener 1 asked, Did you see that hunter? Over. Negative, Gardener 4 responded. It was loud and pissed off whatever it was. Over. A dozen infected already sniffed about for prey in the wide lobby space. 
Critias didn't put them down easy because he wanted the vocal drama that the creatures could provide. With his rifle's accelerator setting ramped up well into multi-transonic, he one-handed the weapon to boom out slugs into their guts. The muzzle energy impacts were comparable to light cannon. He needed all of his mech suit strength and his practiced experience to not have the recoil knock him back off his feet. The Tesla Flux rifle had more functionality than his handgun in various ways. In particular was its longer electromagnetic rail that allowed for much better kinetic drive influence over the projectiles. Critias grossly overstepped the axial rotation parameters so that the bullets tumbled clumsily as they left the barrel. The air was a comparatively dense medium at such incredible speeds. In other conditions, that same programmable virtual rifling allowed for phenomenal accuracy over extreme ranges. Under the present settings, the tungsten bullets stumbled through the air like drunken dummies that crashed into their targets with a mushrooming fratricide of kinetic transfer energy that blew the ghouls in half at the waistline. Albeit they had sections of stringy tissue still holding their mutilated parts together. Such massive injuries left the freaks helplessly immobilized while they still retained their capacity to scream in agony over their deplorable conditions. All the noise they made along with the deafening cracks that came from the sonic booms of his bullets gave others of their kind the opportunity to consider if they should stay away entirely or pursue the agonized wailing into the ground floor lobby of a dilapidated hotel. The rifle's technological sight fed information into his visor's holographic HUD display. With the weapon set as it was for extreme velocity, the software tried to use future technology positioning information that would mark friendly targets in the distance so that the wondrous range of his bullets didn't accidentally strike any friendly combatants or vehicles. Only Carmen and Kevin among his companions transmitted the proper location signals for his software to receive. His computer knew the others existed as radio sources and did its best to protect them too. The final result was that his heads-up display flashed confounding safety error messages in abundance. The warnings were genuine enough and that he needed to be mindful of where everything friendly was if he didn't want to stray around doing some unintended harm. He had spent all of his adult life doing work inside of a mech suit such that all of the displays were second nature to him and none of them was wasted space. With simple eye movements, Critias interacted with the applications or sent wireless commands to other equipment like his Tesla Flux rifle. When the application enhancements all worked properly, it was just second nature to him as were his guns that nearly fired themselves. Critias had the skills to shoot and screw the old-fashioned way. Even without all the computerized sweetenings, he could efficiently make close-range rifle shots one-handed from the hip. The north side of the hotel lobby with the sentry and exit garage doors below the windows was not the main entrance of the hotel. A shield of portable military prisoner of war barricades formed from interlocked pipe and razor wire blocked off all the north side entrances. The real main entrance was to the west in a direction where Critias wasn't interested in going. The storm rained hard outside with a fierce wind and frequent lightning accompanied by thunder. The air was static charged and the visual light intermittent at best. Even the blinding rain worked to Critias as advantage. His overall plan required that he exploit the grim environmental conditions. The car alarm had been short-lived. It lasted only long enough to stir up the violent nature of ghouls and lend them a brief sense of direction, but it hadn't been enough to act as a reliable guide. Critias knew that many of the ghouls would search the adjacent Radio City building too if they felt frustrated in their efforts to locate a clear source of human activity. All those details ran through his mind and together they told Critias that he needed to get the full attention of every ghoul anywhere in the nearby vicinity and do it immediately. His mech suit monitored his vital signs and adrenaline levels, which climbed steadily. Stress was part of a man's profession and that a skilled surgeon was less overwhelmed by the open chest of a patient than would be a local delicatessen having to perform the same operation. Critias was no stranger to fighting ghouls, but the daunting avalanche of the creatures he would try to yodel down onto his own head had his heart really pumping. He crouched behind a pillar to set down his toy bear and Tesla Flux rifle onto a rotted Davenport couch. He needed both hands free to load specialty rounds into a pistol ammunition clip. One of the skills that differentiated a martial captain from a mere pistol marksman was the practiced calm grace needed to load weapons while surrounded by the bloody hell of a shrieking army of flesh rending ghouls that bore down on him in the flashing stormy dark all without any nervous fumble in his hands. When he had his customized selection ready, Critias holstered the loaded pistol and then took up his rifle again for stirring his pot of trouble. The ghouls that dashed into the hotel lobby from the banquet halls had first-hand experience with the building's layout and thus they had a route of travel already in mind. As they entered from the southern hallways, they headed to the northwest corner where there was a wide entrance into the hotel's attached tavern restaurant, which had its own clear exit out onto the streets that they knew well from frequent use. Jingle Bell's private army of trained freaks that advanced outside had heard Critias's rifle shots and the agonized cries of his shooting victims. They followed those sounds in closer, but still couldn't localize the source as the hotel's lobby. 
Critias rolled up into the soggy lounger with his head on the armrest and the barrel of his rifle nestled in the cross toes of his boots as a sort of impromptu bipod posture that had been popular with the first muzzle-loading sharpshooters. Once comfortable with the back of the couch to conceal his sly position, he rebalanced the axial rifling and then triggered off rounds as fast as he could take each aim. His rifle had a 60-round magazine of non-sabot infantry slugs. He had spent half of those already down in the garage and also as he had entered the lobby. What he had left, he used to cut down the ghouls that headed into the restaurant's doorway. The loud sonic cracks of his shots went off in a broken rhythm and each perfectly spiraling transonic bullet splashed off a ghoul's head as if he had popped a water balloon. The super-velocity rounds hardly noticed the impacts as they flew on to slice up the interior of the restaurant as well. As his bullets slashed through at meteoric speeds, they shattered stone surfaces, pierced stainless steel appliances, and scattered loose small objects. Within the confines of the wide lobby, the distances were too short for the air cracking of supersonic rounds to reveal his specific location. The distinctive sound of vaporizing heads was no less useful than the sonic bullwhip snaps of tungsten slugs or the property damage in the restaurant. It all combined nicely to make a glorious symphony of war and chaos that got Critias the attention he craved. Infuriated ghouls rampaged in from off the streets through both the hotel's main westward entrance and also the street access to the restaurant. The ones coming in promptly collided with the outpouring infected who used those same routes on their way out from the hotel's interior. As they bustled with one another, Critias swapped his empty rifle magazine for his remaining full one and then rolled off the Davenport sofa. He grabbed the stuffed toy bear on his way to make his own hasty exit. A 50 kilogram carved granite planter in the shape of an urn proved useful to him. Critias lifted it one handed and then threw it through the razor wire net of barrier in a straight armed hip driven twist similar to hurling discus. The weight entangled in the web of security barrier barbed wire and then ripped it away as it continued on to smash out the remnants of an already broken glass grand window in the northern wall. With his exit so prepared, Critias made a low base stealing run to then slide across the wet marble floor. His eventual dive out through the jagged window opening finally landed him outside on the rain pelted sidewalk. Jingle Bell's tribe of runners was larger than Critias had hoped. The army that the Mad Watcher woman had referred to as Bellman's Templar Knights had run under the east wall of the garden building, continued down the roadway past the overgrown park by the same route he and Carmen had come, and then they had turned up the street to advance right past the main entrance of the Radio City Tower. The ghouls had arrived at the hotel in a drawn out line. Only the aggressive vanguard had actually entered the hotel lobby in pursuit of Critias while the majority of their force still remained out on the street. Many of those stragglers had joined up with a small band of wild ghouls who had been present when the car alarm went off. Those enterprising vandals had started trying to force their way through the pair of rolling metal garage doors to get closer to where the car alarm had sounded. As Jingle Bell's minions arrived, they noticed the activity and then joined in to help. It was in the nature of ghouls to imitate each other. When more of them arrived, they just naturally assumed that the ones already on scene had treated the prospective prey. Critias as loud rifle shots from inside the hotel had been more or less just above the garage. They had done little to draw the surging and fact it off from that effort. As the ghouls shoved at the flexible steel curtains, they strained out the slack with each combined rush such that they would soon break through. The hurled stone planter made a considerable ruckus that drew the attention of those infected most on the periphery of the garage assault. The great carved stone had dragged a considerable mess of wires out the window before it impacted into a signpost, that sign had levered over so severely that it cracked up its cemented anchorage. The stone planter had then shattered into several large chunks and spilled out all its earth and contents onto the rain-soaked sidewalk. The ghouls at the near edge of the garage mob came about to stare straight at Critias. He had leaped out from the cleared window to land right in front of them at a crouch. In the rain and the dark. Critias as Hunter Persona de Mech suit had them hesitate in a moment of fervent trembling confusion. A flash of lightning overhead provided the momentary illumination the ghouls required to see that Critias was anything but one of their infected comrades. Because Critias remained in a low posture, all those ghouls deeper in the ranks of the pack could not see anything aside from the backs of their own keen's men standing in front of them. So many of them made feeding howls to celebrate the general revelry of violence that was their attack against the garage that all the ghouls heard cries of excitement from many different directions. Only that nearby few who saw Critias up close actually penetrated his painted hunter disguise. For all the others, the darkness of night and the foul weather made it no simple matter for them to recognize his true nature from any distance. Critias momentarily put down the plastic package toy bear to free himself for drawing his pistol with the off hand. He also raised his rifle toward the ghouls confronting him. He first pistol fired a cherry red phosphorus signal flare into the trunk of a tree along the edge of the park across the street. 
that glowing projectile had just the right penetration to lodge itself into the greenwood where it blazed and hissed as a beacon despite the rain that instantly steamed off the fiercely hot ember. The bloody glow of radiance illuminated and reflected off the rain soaked old corpses and wet leaves so that it generated an unmistakably obvious display like that from a decorative holiday lantern. Crytea tweaked the setting of his rifle down to silent subsonic even as those first ghouls broke into a race toward him. Most of the other infected, remained engrossed with their frenzied aggression against the sagging garage doors. As to the others who were too far back to join in, they came about to witness the distraction of the crackling hissing red flare. Any ghoul unfortunate enough to see Critias for who he was, promptly received an upward angled rifle shot into their throat or under their chin. Choking on their own blood or blown away outright, none of those he shot down had any capacity to cry out the alarm. With so much wild action going on, few other ghouls took any notice of their misfortunate comrades as they dropped in rapid succession. As his first flare began to fizzle out, Critias planted a replacement from his pistol that impacted only a few centimeters above the first. He then holstered the weapon off a deft gunfighter's spin, which was doubly practiced coming across from his offhand. Crytea snatched up his carnival prize toy animal to tuck it under his rifle arm. Using that free hand, he grabbed the loosened signpost his herald flower pot had uprooted. The sign's chest-high stand-folded metal shaft supported a thin rectangular plate of steel that had formerly displayed instructions for patrons concerning the hotel's valet parking. He shook the sign once as he kicked the base, which loosened the fractured cement. With a firm yank. Critias pulled the whole sign up from the sidewalk and then he held it like an awkward axe or a protester's sign. Critias radioed, Garden Rifles, do you have me marked in front of the hotel? He distinguished himself from the general chaos by holding aloft the sign as he started to run for the nearby park where he had placed the flares. The garden building gunmen had radio chattered in their lingo about having heard loud gunshots inside the hotel and then having seen the red glow of the flares from their post on the opposite rooftop. With the visual aid of the sign Critias carried. The rifleman on the garden building roof soon identified his exact position. We see the fox heading for the bushes, was the thickly accented radio answer that came from Gardener 1. Pack hounds are hunting hot on your six. We advise command expedite vehicle X full. We're initiating cover fire on ground request. We'll thumb frag or smoke on demand. Over. Critias swung the steel sign on edge to swipe the paint off the head from a ghoul as it leaped at him. Once it was out of his way, he shouted by radio for them. Fire at will. Rifle shots came in from the garden building to drop several ghouls that nearly took Critias down from behind. With no time to waste, Critias vaulted over the hedgerow and berm of debris that formed the border of the Parkland city block in between the garden and Radio City buildings. The four guards on the garden building ledges repeatedly unleashed iron sided rifle shots. Though they were not true Annie Oakley masters of aimed accuracy, they had comfortable rested positions against targets under a hundred meters away, such favorable conditions made them talented enough to get torso hits on even the fastest runners and clean headshots on anything infected unlucky enough to stand stationary. As a team, the guards efficiently harvested shrieking freaks that were near Critias without any of them hitting him by accident. Cement sidewalks crisscrossed the center of the park grounds. There were some wrought iron benches and heavy cast concrete trash bins with plastic domes. Plenty of small trees and bramble had taken root throughout the interior at least where the sidewalks allowed invasive plants to take hold. None of those little trees was nearly as large as those that lined the outer perimeter. A shallow pond of rainwater gathered throughout the majority of the park because the central ground was already sunk in land compared to the streets that surrounded it on all sides. Plowed debris clogged up the normal drainage so that it was no longer sufficient to remedy the already notorious flooding. The cold murky water was hardly more than shin deep, being more impressive because of the breadth of the swamp that it made out of the area. When Critias and Carmen had walked into Radio City from the castle earlier that night, they had passed along the side of the park. Critias had seen one of those striker eight-wheeled infantry fighting vehicles out in the middle of the swamp, its upper half still readily visible above the tall prairie grasses. The enormous war machine had a fold-down deployment hatch at the rear, which stood half open to stick out like a horizontal deck. The open hatch had exposed the interior to the weather which thus ensured that the impressive vehicle was beyond any hope of recovery or that any of its onboard weapon systems might still be functional. All of its technology had long since succumbed to the harsh rigors of rust, moisture, and winter freezing. The driver had deliberately positioned the machine at the center of the park during those tumultuous days of outbreak when the lawn had been short and tidy. The original crew had either abandoned the vehicle or carnivorous hostiles had overrun them at their ill-fated guard post. Their loss was Critias's gain because the great steel behemoth was the focal point of his entire strategy. Though the aging juggernaut had already lost all its offensive glory, it still had formidable defensive value in battle as a bunker. 
cried Tia sloshed through the marsh water and tall grasses at a sprint and then jumped up the slope nodes of the carrier. He stood upon the summit of its thick armored carapace where he would hold his ground as king of the mountain. To challenge his supremacy would be the entire slavering horde of brainwashed infected who had trained under the goo wrangling watcher jingle bells. Critias as heads up display friendly fire errors cleared up right before Kevin contacted him by radio. The android said, your HUD errors should be corrected now. Jack is moving out his vehicles as we speak. He says they're experiencing minimal hostile activity. His caravan should be clear of the building momentarily. Those ghouls that had seen Critias rush into the park stayed in close pursuit. The tall grasses helped conceal many of them from the aim of the garden building guards who couldn't hope to have clear shots at even half of them. The vehicle commander's top hatch stood vertically open. Critias positioned himself over that circular pit and then dropped the toy bear out from under his arm. It fell down the hole to be safely out of the way. So relieved of that burden, Critias brought up his Tesla Flux rifle. He needed only moments to drain the ammo drum by blasting down those ghouls who seemed on the verge of successfully scaling his tank vehicle. When that weapon ran dry, he dropped that down the hatch to where it could join the toy bear as one more useless encumbrance. Kevin asked, do you have a plan for getting out of there? No, Critia snapped in sarcasm. I just thought I would stand here with my dick in my hand waiting for them to eat me. He drew his pistol to shoot a searing flare into the plastic dome of a nearby trash can. The design of the container did an admirable job of keeping the rainwater from filling up the wastebasket's interior. His flare easily punched through the plastic cover to ricochet around inside the cement body where the fearsomely hot phosphorus ignited the old trash within. Kevin radioed, Is there some way that I may be of service? Critias instructed the male android, Access my mission records. Check out the Galsing incident when she floundered north of Brandenburg Gate back in 82. That shouldn't take you long. Let me know when you've watched it. Kevin didn't need to research it, I'm already familiar with all your mission records, Marshal. What particular aspect of that expedition would you like to bring to my attention? Critias used kicks and hacking blows from his street sign to pummel back ghouls as they climbed up the armored carrier to attack him. When one ghoul managed to get a solid grip onto the battle wagon, the others rapidly scaled over the freak using him like a slimy mud-covered meat ladder. The suppressed 30 caliber rifles of the garden building guards continued to drop infected as the ghouls swarmed in around the army vehicle in ever-increasing numbers. The gunmen managed to maim more ghouls than they actually killed with brain-busting headshots. The wounded ghouls fell back into the muddy wash where they thrashed and screamed until others of their kind just trampled them down into the sticky mud beneath the surface of the progressively bloodier water. The hideous screams of misery from those ghouls that convulsed on their way down to deathlessly drown only served to call in more infected. Ghouls on all sides only needed to glance in Critias's direction to see that he still stood tall upon the hull of the armored personnel carrier at the center of the swamp. As Critias shot his fourth red flare into a second garbage can to set it afire, he also kicked in the face of a ghoul as it tried to scale the tank. He told Kevin, calculate the altitude and all the tweaks on a Tesla Flux rifle grenade to simulate that grounded drive engine on the Gaozing. Out of loaded red flares, Critias shot his first starburst signal flare into the face of another infected at the center of a charging group. That futuristic munition detonated like a firework and sprayed long tendrils of white liquid sparks that seared burning nodules into the nearby ghouls too. The creature who took the hit directly got a smoking crater cooked into his forehead. That epic wound toppled the ghoul out right from the severity of the roasting to its feverish brain. The blazing freak floated on its back in the watery weeds while a volcano of white flame sputtered out from its bursiform skull. Critias cradled his parking sign axe in the crook of his arm as he pulled a parachute flare cylinder from his belt. He stamped the butt of it on his hip to start the fuse and then he held a tube aloft to launch the signal rocket skyward. At the same time he told Kevin, you have two minutes. His flying illumination flare was a greatly improved version over the similar devices that were available in the Forager's era. The projectile streaked up to 300 meters before it burst into a red flaming berry that used its rising heat to fill a small parachute that dramatically slowed its descent. The flying flare generated a grandiose display that was easily visible from a great distance while it also illuminated the ground beneath it. As the storm's wind tossed the little vehicle about, it intelligently redistributed the shape of its winged chute. It swung and turned like a twirling pendulum to pilot itself back into proper position overhead. The flare even gained an altitude at times by navigating available updrafts. While Critias stood ideally illuminated under the infuriatingly flagrant luminous dot of his flare, all the ghouls around the hotel blitzed into the park grounds with a mad passion to drag him down and then bite his face off. 
Critias says other flares inside the trash cans had melted in the lids and then ignited that molten plastic along with all the other rubbish inside them to make rising flame that served as extra incentive to lure more ghouls into the swamp battle. The ground around the military battle wagon gradually churned under so many grapes stomping feet that it became a deep bog of slippery mud. The muck completely coated all the ghouls as they dragged one another down, flopped about, and scrambled forward as would so many drunken wrestlers. The infected splattered more of the mud onto the sides of the machine which made it all the more slippery and thus harder for them to scale. The newly arrived ghouls that came up from the rear of the battle generally preferred to pull down the ones in front of them to make their slow progress. Ghouls that could stand, did so by trampling down any that had slipped in the mud. The ghouls who managed to make any progress as they climbed the muddy carrier had those who clutched at them from behind pull them back down again. As the mayhem grew ever larger in scale, so did their frustration and the volume of their voices. The terrible roar of their orgiastic viciousness became like gladiator fans at an ecstatic bloodthirsty celebration when they demanded a final killer blow. The excitement was not lost on Critias. He had a plan to survive the day or at least he believed that he did. His plan was really more of a runaway scheme that had seemed more sensible before it started to unfold. The software in his mech suit that monitored his vital signs went into crisis mode. Since it was Critias's own subconscious mind that determined his level of desperation, it demonstrated an underlying lack of faith in his own ability to survive even one more minute, which would be the appointed moment of Kevin's able assistance. The mech suit injected Critias's bloodstream with adrenaline, methamphetamine derivatives, and other combat-enhancing chemicals he couldn't name so that their mutual metabolic functions peaked for a last-ditch effort to survive against impossible odds. Critias emptied his pistol clip into the savage cannibals, he pumped searing flares or exploding starbursts into them so that it all erupted into a fireworks display that was certain to garner the attention of any ghouls in the vicinity. Once his pistol ran empty, Critias kicked at the climbers while he changed magazines. After he holstered the freshly loaded pistol, he two-fisted the steel parking axe to unleash his chemically enhanced inner barbarian. The cocktail of battle drugs had him feeling superhuman, even more than he actually was. Critia spun about as he hacked the steel edge through the freaks. His merciless blows swept them off the vehicle when they somehow actually managed to scramble up the slick mud and also free themselves from the tenacious clawing of their own furious allies. Lightning flashed, thunder rolled, and the rain drenched down in sheets. A thousand muddy black faces with white gnashing teeth seemed close enough for him to slap and more still came to join the insane revelry. The watcher woman and her male companion observed the battle from a hotel window on an upper floor. They had a splendid view of the conflict, which had them thoroughly enthralled and entertained. It appears that Bellman has him now, the male said to her from his post behind her shoulder. You expected too much of the man, I think. No one could mistake that she was in charge and he was her loyal sidekick. You speak in haste, Professor, she disagreed. That man is no fool despite appearances to the contrary. Besides, it's not the man that interests me so much, at least it wasn't before seeing him act so boldly standing alone and defiant against Bellman's entire army. That too may yet prove of value. What I wanted to see was this fearsome sword angel that Bellman said could even match me. Now that is something I would love to behold. If they are linked as Bellman claims and that ridiculous teddy bear suggests that they are, what do you think she will do when the man is about to die? He said, she will not let her lover fall in battle while she still draws breath. Of that, he felt certain and his instincts didn't lead him astray. In natural life the professor had been a university scholar of romantic literature. In his afterlife, he felt even more attuned to the magnetisms of love. The tragic cry of distress from a ghoul sounded on the floor below them as Carmen hurled the creature bodily through the plate glass window to fall two stories and then smash on the sidewalk below. From that location, she could surely see Critias's battle with the same clarity as the Watchers did. We speak of her and she appears, the Watcher woman whispered. Now we shall see what they are truly made of. The din of storm and battle was a horrendous noise that quite overpowered all other sound in every sense. It daunted the ear with continuous ferocity and agony. Even so, Carmen's voice carried above it all with a battle a cry of women warriors not heard in the world in some thousand years, not since the days of sword and horn, and it was no jest. Hoyo to ho. She sang with the power of a trumpet. Hoyo to ho. Many a ghoul paused to gaze her way as they wondered what new foe was about to set upon them. They heard her sing. Hi ha ha! As Carmen leaped from the broken window to land on the box awning that graced the hotel's restaurant entrance. It absorbed much of her impact as it broke and snapped the twin hangers that fastened it to the wall. Carmen landed on the street standing with her bite staff at the ready. She did not pause there, but dashed forward to fight her way to her husband without any hint of doubtful hesitation. 
Critias clearly heard her calls and so shouted at her by radio, Get clear of here, you fool of a woman. I ordered you away. Gardener 1 transmitted for his crew, check your fire. We have a second fox approaching on foot from the south and the natives are really thick down there. That must be Violet Wand. Over. Gardener 3 jibed, who else could be that crazy? Over. Gardener 2 added, that's her hooked pole. Confirmation, Violet Wand on scene. We have two still alive needing the textful. Over. Gardener 1 sent out, this is Gardener Actual, belay that textful. Extraction area is no joy. Our box is full. Repeat, the box is full. Anything rolling into there is rat fucked. Gardener 4, bring up the heavy rockets. When the foxes go down, we rain all hell. Over. Carmen hooked the first infected that got within her reach. She caught it through the crotch with her staff and then flung it skyward like a farmer pitching hay. As the goo flew overhead, she shouted, let the fire blaze up. With a twirl of the staff, she caved in the skull of a second that charged her way, killing it to her call of, round the rock let it burn. She jump kicked a third in its chest to send it cartwheeling, all while she shouted, with flaring flames. The butt of her spinning staff slashed the nose and upper lip off the face of a fourth to her song, let its tongue flicker. She staved in the mouth of yet another as she pressed forward to the shout of, its teeth devour. As the ghouls got thicker, she pitched them overhead or smashed them underfoot, but nothing would slow her progress toward his iron hillock. Charging and she cried, any coward who rashly dares to approach the fearsome rock. The professor moved nearer the window for an unobstructed view. The passion and valor of Carmen moved him deeply as he knew well the source of her words. Look at her, he gasped. The enemy makes way for they are afraid. The ghouls were afraid of Carmen and many attempted to flee her wrath rather than have her plow them under by it. With nowhere to go, their futile retreats only made them targets that were more vulnerable. They are afraid, the woman agreed, knowing the truth of it. They think she is me. What is all the nonsense she is shouting? Can you make any sense of it? The male wiped away a tear. I, I know the words. If you may no longer ride beside me, or bring me meat at table, if I must lose you whom I loved, you the laughing joy of my eyes, then a bridal fire shall burn for you, as it never burned for any bride. The female watcher reached over to pick up a high-powered scope trifle that she raised to her shoulder. Through the scope, she easily maintained the crosshairs on the back of Carmen's bobbing and then dashing head before she moved to study Critias's face through his transparent helmet plate. The woman asked, she is speaking words from one of your poems? What do you make of it? Are they members of some new gang trying to seize territory in the city? Should I kill them now before they become trouble later? As answer, the professor put his hand on the window frame and then raised his voice in operatic song using the Germanic tongue, a blaze of flame shall burn round the rock. With devouring terror let it scare the faint-hearted. Let the cowards run away from Brunhild's rock. After a mournful pause he told the female, there is no need for you to kill them. They're already doomed. The fates have no pity for battle-worn lovers. Let them have their brief time in the sun. Hoon, the woman snorted as she lowered the rifle. I wonder about you sometimes, Romeo. You may not have the hardness of heart required for our line of work with the agency. Romeo looked at her without expression though he had a tear on his cheek. He disagreed with her criticism, those who love the most devoutly can have the hardest hearts of all. It is a pursuit that comes with many heavy disappointments that toughen the spirit. Critias repeatedly hacked the ghouls off from the top of the armored personnel carrier with his battered steel parking sign. The vehicle was long as a bus, which forced him to rush back and forth from bow to stern in his defense. He batted off infected from both sides as he made his way stem to stern. The sloped nose of the machine did not prove to be any more or less vulnerable to their ascent than was the rear end with its deployment hatch that hung half open, which gave them something to climb on. He saw that there were too many ghouls in the park for Carmen to get through them, not that he had even the remotest suspicion that she would decide not to try anyway. Once she got into the mud, her progress would grind to a gooey halt. At that point they would literally bury her and then trample her down into the mud by sheer overwhelming weight of numbers. Critias had also had enough of the infected using the rear gate as a purchase for ascent, he sought to resolve both problems with a single action. Kevin reported, I'm sending the grenade detonation package now. Your firing elevation won't matter because it's self-correcting. As he readied a liquid catalyst variable blast grenade from his belt, Critias told the android, I want you to close this hatch for me. Kevin could observe everything by live feed from Critias's visor sensors. He transmitted a thoughtfully calculated mixture concentration to the explosive device that would accomplish Critias's request without blowing him up in the whole octotank too in the process. 
cried Tia Stoss the grenade into the scrum pit mud water directly behind the armored carrier. He had just enough time to run forward and then grasp the lift handle on the cap of the commander's hatch in a rodeo hold before the blast went off. The finely tuned explosion disgorged a great blooming vomit fountain of blood, bodies, and muddy water matted with soggy long grass. Its pressure wave lifted the rear wheels of the carrier clear of the ground as it also slammed the rusted hydraulic hatch completely closed. When the back end of the war wagon fell back to earth, it generated yet another impressive splash. The blast also hurled more than a thousand ghouls off their feet and mutilated plenty more in the process. Even those ghouls that remained uninjured found themselves blinded by the explosion of mud and hurled debris. Gardener 1 howled, check that fucking ordinance. Fox 1 is down. That fire wasn't Garden, Gardener 4 reported with great anxiety that befitted the crisis. He must have fragged himself out. Over. That's a negative on the casualty, Gardener 1 cheered. Fox 1 is still clinging on to the striker and standing active. Give him all the fire support you've got. Carmen followed the sidewalk to the carrier, but mostly she ran atop fallen ghoul bodies. When she was close, she speared the butt of her staff into the chest of an infected to pull vault up and then land on the roof of the machine. Victorious in her arrival, Carmen started screaming, Fuck you, bell ringer. Is this all you've got? We're coming for you. Do you hear me, bell ringer? We will have your lumpy head on a stick, you son of a thousand drunken bachelors. Critias flung his bloody sign away with a power swing that sent it slicing into the ghouls that swarmed off the nose of the machine. With his hands now empty, he took a Tesla flux grenade from his belt. Make yourself useful, he ordered Carmen, since you're here when I told you not to be. I could not run away while leaving you to fight. She pledged while she twirled and smacked with her staff to knock ghouls away from their vehicle. If you survive this and one of the others dies this night over your disobedience, he threatened, you will work in the kitchens and never come out again. I swear on my marriage to you. The ghouls recovered from the explosion and then renewed their assault in force. Their help hardly mattered since the rest of the multitude throughout the park simply poured right over the top of those who had fallen. The parachute flare extinguished as it finally settled down into the muck. That caused a dramatic change of lighting that left the park as a field of tightly packed ghouls with flailing arms that all glistened black face from the wet mud. The whiteness of furious eyes and bared teeth was the only striking contrast. Even in that poor light, bullets continued to rain down from the garden building rifles as they tried to prevent any infected from mounting the armored vehicle. Critias as mech suit wrote off the situation as hopeless. The target track application highlighted so many viable enemies that it had to shift into maximum transparency just to allow him vision. His automated software had already begun a countdown for a full-scale self-destruct where it would arm and then detonate every munition he carried. Grim as his circumstances were, it was still the exact situation that Critias had tried to manufacture from the moment he started it all back in the hotel stairwell. Everything was just as he imagined it except for one important detail. He hadn't wanted Carmen to be anywhere near him, and in all truth, he wasn't entirely sure that what he had to do next was something she could survive. Critias pointed at the commander's hatch while he shouted at her. Now get your ignorant ass down that rabbit hole. She didn't obey, instead, Carmen just stared at him in wide-eyed disbelief as he clicked out the potato masher stick from a nuclear fuel Tesla flux field grenade like he had popped the blade from a stiletto switch knife. Carmen wailed in fear at the armed miniature atomic bomb in his hand, you can't do that, master. Not here in weather like this. Carmen understood that if he set off the weapon it would kill all the ghouls and then take them out too right along with them. It would be his final act of mutual destruction suicide. He screamed at her to get down the hole, obey me now, woman. With all the combat drugs in his system, he would have bodily grabbed her and then slammed her head first down the hole if only the situation would allow him the opportunity. That was how angry her stupid disobedience made him. She was never supposed to follow him out there in the first place and now she was probably going to die. Carmen knew him so well that she did read his mood accurately. She quite fully understood just how little patience he had left for listening to her back talk. Carmen bisected her staff with a dexterous twist and then used half in each hand to strike down some clambering ghouls with a flurry of her escrimis strikes before she finally dropped down through the hatch with graceful Pharah on a Carm's crossed fluidity. As he followed Carmen down into the hole, Critias drew his pistol and then ejected its clip with a press of his thumb. Even as that happened, he also stuffed the rod of his flux grenade down into the barrel. Without them up there to kick back the ghouls, the infected surged up the sides in hot pursuit. Critias radioed, Garden Building. Take emergency cover. At the same time he used his Mexus wireless transmitter to command the grenade's computerized fuse to detonate according to Kevin's program package. The moment the bomb confirmed that it was ready, 
Critias punched aside the wickedly leering face of the first ghoul that stuck its head into the open hatch and then once cleared, he pointed his sidearm out the hole to pistol propel the grenade straight up into the stormy night sky. The microfission bomb detonated just above the height of the adjacent buildings. Deprived of any ample solid matter and the grounded field of the Earth's surface, the bomb expended itself by super-ionizing the moist air. The Tesla flux field it generated would have normally flowed along the electrostatic contours of the ground. Being so far above the Earth, the fluxing lines reached outward into the ionosphere for kilometers in all directions while at the same time it generated an electrical step leader that ran straight down to an electromagnetic streamer that it attracted upward from the great water-immersed steel mass of the striker armored personnel carrier. Critias dropped onto his back to lie on the rubber traction mat that was their floor inside the war machine. He pulled Carmen on top of him as completely as he was able while at the same time he clamped his palms over her ears as he yelled out, Keep your mouth open. The thunderclouds over the city dumped more than a billion volts horizontally along the flux lines and then the charge descended the step leader streamer connection that had formed to the ground after the grenade's detonation. Once that circuit between the earth and the ionospheric sky completed, a cascade of lightning formed that was quite unnatural in its usage and severity. The barrage far exceeded even the worst oceanic displays and was totally unlike anything that had ever formed so far inland over the continent. Like hundreds of lightning bolts that congregated into one ultimate ribbon, the lightning strafed the whole of the swampy park grounds. The torrent of lightning strikes concentrated principally onto the armored carrier itself, but they also arced and forked wildly from there. They struck any standing objects and also continued down into the soggy mud pond where they electrocuted the entire marsh as if it was the victim of some ungodly Van de Graaff generator. With that godlike lightning smite came a thunderclap of heat shattered air that detonated with the sound of a horrendous blockbuster bomb. The blast shook the very ground, rocked the armored carrier even as its massive rubber tires cooked right off their rims, and it blew out windows in adjacent buildings, all to the illumination of the most brilliant white light. Carmen screamed continuously as tears streamed down her face. She honestly expected to be dead just as everything returned to a beautiful ghoul free silence that was so quiet that the falling rain became a predominant sound. We're not dead, she elated when her mind returned. As he hugged her fiercely, Critias was her god and she was tight in his arms. I didn't want this to be our tomb, she sobbed with you for your love for life. Are you still alive, my master? Please speak to me that you are alive. I'm fine, Carmen, he assured her as he moved her off and then got up. He made it sound like it wasn't even a big deal. Critias grabbed his Tesla Flux rifle and the teddy bear because he was already eager to get the hell out of there. He told her. See if you can kick that ramp open enough to get us out of this toast oven. Carmen sat up to check herself while she was still half in a state of shock. The air was hot from the heat of the vehicle around them and its stank of ozone, but they were quite unscathed. This armored transport acted as a Faraday cage, she realized aloud. The lightning went completely around the outside skin. Her husband's multiple levels of cunning elated her esteem of his intelligence. She told him what he already knew, by detonating the grenade in the sky during a storm. You called the lightning to strike down every single infected that had surrounded us, while we alone were completely safe and signed here. Yeah, he agreed absently and that he saw she was too overwhelmed to be of much help. That unbelievable explosion of lightning had utterly flabbergasted the Finnish Stig Ardener one and that came out in his radio message, by Per Kella God of Thunder. Stig had seen the whole thing from his rooftop ledge. The electrical strikes were so close that it had energized the standing hairs on his thick arms. To his eyes. It had seemed to come down right in front of the tip of his nose. One moment he had seen where Critia stood atop the striker APC while all those shrieking ghouls sloshed up around him from all sides and then that massive flash came down directly atop his head as though it had blasted Critia right out of existence. Critia was very much alive as he worked his way to the rear of the vehicle's interior and then rammed the deck ramp with his shoulder and hip. His first blow felt so solid that he wondered if the lightning hadn't welded the plate shut or if the explosion had jammed it in place under tons of force. His second hit not only moved the folding wall of armor, it made it fall loose on its blown hydraulic rams to freely drop with a metallic groan to slam into the muddy water with a body submerging splash. He held out his hand for Carmen to come to him, it's time for us to go home, princess. If you don't mind, I'd like to be gone before they regroup. It was possible that some of the ghouls were only unconscious even though they still had extensive burn damage. If they did ever recover, it would only be after they had done some extraordinary regenerating. Most of the infected had actually cooked as the lightning had electrically burned off whole limbs or just exploded them outright as their internal fluids instantly transformed into steam. Much of the area did steam, as did the striker. The lightning strike had wiped out Jingle Bell's entire army to the last freaking a veritably biblical display that would leave even that insanely religious zealot in contemplation about the true meaning of God's wrath.
The milk wagon appeared out of the storm flashed darkness when it rammed through the bushes with a flying bound. Gloria navigated along a sidewalk for traction as she pushed deeper into the park grounds. The milk wagon ran lightless and nearly silent through its magnificent mufflers. The four-wheel drive truck seemed to leap out of the nowhere like a great breaching shark. Henry hung out the rear open door as he watched out for them. He wore a visor-faced full motorcycle helmet so that he was ready to deploy on foot if the situation called for it. Even without night vision goggles, he could make them out readily enough as they emerged down the rear ramp of the military transport. Critias supported the emotionally traumatized Carmen on his arm as the steam rose up around them even as cold rain fell. Numerous thousands of defeated ghouls littered the landscape with many a twisted face or claw-handed arm that protruded up from the filthy pond with deathly frozen poses, as would so many traitorous souls remanded in Cassidus, the frozen lake at the bottom of Dante's hell. This way, Henry shouted as he waved for them to climb in through the back hatch to safety. Critias thought better of that suggestion because the two of them were terribly filthy with blood contaminated water and mud. We would be cleaner if we had fallen inside an outhouse, Critias told Henry. We will ride on top for the short drive back to the castle. As Carmen went up first, Critias pretended that she moved too slowly since he was annoyed with her. Move your ass, he told her with a gruff shove of his hand on her rump that lifted her up that much quicker. He still had all those battle drugs in his system and it showed. I was hurrying. She complained over his unfair treatment since she didn't realize his true reason. He harumphed at her, after all your crybaby screaming back there, one would think you would be in more of a hurry to get back home. Carmen had been genuinely terrified in that moment. Lightning in general frightened her and having it strike her was one of the few surefire ways to kill something as virtually indestructible as she was. Having a sustained cascade of super lightning fall atop their highly conductive metal box where she would die helplessly together with her beloved husband and master, while wrapped up tight in his sheltering arms, was just about as traumatic an experience for her as she could ever imagine. He climbed up to join her and then Gloria started to drive them home. Chapter 4 Devotions The garden building guardsmen squawked away on their radios about their shocked amazement. Critias and Carmen had emerged unharmed from the remnants of the armored personnel carrier after a supernatural bombardment of lightning had eliminated an insurmountable megatribe of infected. The witnesses had no ready explanation for the events but that in no way left them less ecstatic about how they celebrated the outcome. They gushed reverentially about the two foragers that had attempted the impossible and then succeeded at it by doing something utterly unbelievable, except that the gardener team had seen the Perkella miracle with their own eyes. They had more than seen it. Stig and his team had been active participants from the very onset. Who was to say how important their rifle support actually had been? Perhaps one of their bullets had made all the difference. It was their victory too. After she had listened to the radio network sing their praises for a moment, Carmen said to Critias, My master is the greatest ghoul fighter ever. I thought you were going to make that armored wagon into a perilous brazen bull. They didn't design my internal hardware to withstand the lightning strike. I might have ended up mentally retarded or worse. I think you must already be mentally retarded, Critias scolded her. I told you, no. I ordered you not to follow me, and you just damn well did it anyway. Don't even bother trying to be adorable or flattering to me because I'm beyond angry with you. Anyway, what the hell is supposedly so perilous about a damn bull? You had no problem jumping into a whole herd of the things back in Houston. Perilous, she corrected him, not perilous. He made a hollow bull out of bronze so an evil tyrant could roast victims alive inside of it. The mouth was a kind of horn so their hideous cries of pain would sound like a roaring bull. Critias considered that before he commented. That perilous guy was quite the charming bastard then wasn't he? If I were the tyrant, I would have stuffed his demented ass in the thing just to test how good it worked. Hard to find a more deserving victim than some engineering genius who squanders his gift by using it to make people roaster machines for evil kings. Where did eggheads ever get the ignorant notion that evil kings were unaware of their own ironically vicious dispositions? Anyone that smart should know better. Carmen grinned immensely, then you would make a splendid tyrant, master. That is just what happened to Perilous as the story goes. When he scowled at her, he tried to appear despotic despite his helmet, just wait till I get you alone. You are going to see me be a tyrant. You had orders to help Jack get his people back to the castle, and you didn't follow them. If I had a stick right now, I would beat you with it, so just shut up. Carmen offered him the straight half of her bite staff so that he could beat her with it, would you like me to bend over too? She found his threats emptily amusing rather than genuinely worrisome. You just wait, he threatened. Laugh it up while you can. She shrugged unperturbed. No matter how angry that he became with her, she didn't share the hostility. When he calmed down, 
she would want to love and comfort him as much as ever. There could be no making up moment when she refused to depart in her affections in the first place. Gloria crossed the park to exit on the opposite side in front of the hotel before she turned left to head for the castle. As they passed that way, Critias watched the windows above them in the hope that he would see the faces of the two watchers. He rightly assumed they would live up to their names. They had watched everything that transpired out on the street that night. The woman had deliberately set it all off as a test for him. Critias couldn't deny that it was Jingle Bells who actually wanted to kill him. In a twisted way, the Watcher Woman sort of helped him by making certain that Critias and Jingle Bells came together. Critias certainly preferred that over the horde sieging the Radio City Tower and killing all his friends instead. Whatever her intentions, Critias had not only passed her test, he still had the damn toy bear safe inside its plastic package. As he held the bear aloft to make it visible, Critias shouted up at the hotel, Sorry about all the noise, ma'am. Those Templar knights were every bit as ordinary as you said they would be. The watcher woman laid back in the dry bed of a street-side hotel room that had unbroken windows. She rested with her nested fingers behind her head and appeared to be asleep while she was actually only thinking. Verloc, Romeo spoke to her from where he stood at the window to watch the milk wagon pull away. Do you think he knows where we are? No, she answered without any extra movement. She had heard Critias call out to them clearly enough, even over the storm, and she had taken in his message on all its myriad subtle levels. He knows we're still in this hotel, she explained. And he knows that we watched him work. It was not a threat that he plans on coming in here to have a go at us next. He was just making light of how casually he annihilated Bellman's men. I'm sure you agree on that point at least. He did wipe out Bellman's entire army single-handedly. Verloc said that as a demonstration that she was astute enough to realize that Carmen's presence had been entirely unwanted. It was Critias who had done the deed and he had done it in spite of Carmen's interference, not because of it. Romeo wasn't so certain about their intentions. His first priority was to ensure Verloc's safety. While the extremely dangerous humans knew that she was in the hotel, Verloc was at some measure of risk. When he took in all the facts together as he knew them, Romeo guessed correctly that Verloc had never been in greater danger. Romeo knew they were both watchers just as he understood what the humans were. He just didn't care. All he cared about was protecting Verloc and there was some chance that the Sword Angel would sneak into the hotel to kill them both even if the Pistolier had formed some kind of ceasefire truce with them. He asked Verloc, isn't that a threat? It sounded to me like he was openly inviting a confrontation if you wanted to step outside to meet him halfway. No, she dismissed his excessive caution. Verloc knew that they were entirely safe for the time being. She understood the Pistolier to be a fellow superhero and their rivalry came with a certain code. Verloc tried to reassure him, if the gunfighter ever comes to kill me, it won't be in a roundabout way. He has his honor to think about just as I do. People like him and I don't go around making enemies. We have enemies because it can't be any other way. We already have another way. If I went out of my way to provoke him, then yes, we better be ready to take it to the wall. A man like that would never stop until one of us was dead, and as you saw, he knows how to make people dead. Romeo posed with his hand on his chin to look introspective. What does that mean for Bellman then? She chuckled with harsh amusement. You heard what the sword angel said. I think Bellman needs to find himself a quality barber to get himself a nice haircut. His knobby head should look its best for when they display it on a pike. You notice that she wears both a sword and a pistol by her side. That bride gets froggy all right, but not to go according. She drew neither in the battle that I saw, Romeo meant that he kept abreast of what weapons they carried. She prefers that sheep herding staff from Mother Goose and she wields it with extreme martial prowess. My guess is that an Amitabuddha ninja clan raised her from birth as a top corporate assassin. That would explain a lot about her, Verloc agreed. Bellman's infantry were unworthy enemies of her drawing the blade. She is every bit as dangerous as Bellman said. They both are. What do you make of that mushroom cloud of lightning he called down on their heads? I think he is an officer of the Time Space Police, Romeo fabricated the fiction on the spot to keep her entertained. Conversely. His own insanity prevented him from even being able to care less who Critias really was. The male watcher continuously legitimized and romanticized the environment to make her utterly insane life as flamboyant, beautiful, and exciting as possible. Romeo continued, he must have a geostationary space station hovering overhead and that blast was from the Electron space cannons. Yes, she agreed again as though it all made actual sense. That also explains his bionic space armor and those weapons that he carries. We have never seen a rifle anything like the one he has and the unique pistol of his that fires flares and bullets both. What other tricks do you imagine he might have up his sleeve? A laser sword perhaps, Romeo guessed. 
maybe even combat teleportation. She nodded like that would make sense too, which in a freakish way it did sense incredibly enough, Critias was a marshal from the future in space armor that carried future tech weapons. Madness lost much of its meaning in a mad world. Verloc asked with accentuated action drama, then what does he want in the city? For someone like that to come here, it must be for something important. There are big things still waiting in the shadows. I sense that I will be getting a call soon about my next mission. Romeo speculated, my guess would be that they are looking for something or someone. Normally, I would think that they were here looking for you, assassins hoping to eliminate the legendary agent shield or maybe the space police wanting to recruit you for a special mission. I think we can agree we have ruled out that he wanted to kill me, she said. Down in the garage, he didn't have any clue who I was and when he found out, it didn't register as being of any particular interest. No, they are here for a reason, but it's not to kill me. If he wanted to recruit me, I think he would have said something at the time. Romeo wasn't so quick to diminish the importance of Verloc. Can we be so sure he was unimpressed when he realized who you were? After all, you did conceal yourself with masterful skill and you never offered him your name. He took a tobacco pipe from the breast pocket of his fine suit, fingered the ash a bit and then lit it with a match. Yes, interesting indeed. Romeo puffed a few times as he stood in a pose of contemplation. Yes, my dear Verloc, I do believe there is a game afoot. The space policeman seems reasonable enough a fellow, Verloc thought aloud. We must have quite a bit in common. This woman though is an Amitabuda ninja assassin and you know what my history is like with assassins. Not even the city is big enough for a woman like that and me. It's just a matter of time before we cross paths and I'll have to put her down, then you know he won't be able to let that slide, so I'll have to fight him too. Perhaps, he agreed only reservedly, but then again, perhaps not. He puffed on his pipe to seem professorial before he asked, what now? Verloc stretched comfortably content in her mad world, call room service and have them send up some dinner. I could use a good meal after such a fine bit of theater. Romeo did not see the world as unbroken as Verloc did. He was fully aware of the utter lunacy of their shattered lives. Romeo humored her because in his own psychotic way he loved her beyond all reason and wanted her to be happy. She would get her dinner, because he would go out to prepare one for her as he always did. He walked over to pick up the phone that had not functioned in years. After play acting the gesture, he said, Hoon, it seems that the line is down. I'll walk to the front desk and tell them directly. While I'm there, I'll see about getting a maintenance man up here to see about the phone. He lit a second candle on the dresser to improve the light before he headed out of the room to forage up some victuals. As one of the last intelligent beings free to move about in a major city, Romeo had plentiful supplies. He knew where to find them and the ghouls were no adversity to a watcher in love. Carmen couldn't make any sense of Critias' shout at the hotel, who are you yelling at and what does it mean? When Critias had repeatedly ordered her to focus on her duties and stop screwing around, she actually had obeyed him and done it on a self-imposed inhibitor level. Her immense intelligence existed almost entirely on a subconscious stage, just as it did with normal humans. Carmen had not been actively spying on him during his mission so she had no conscious awareness of what had gone on between Critias and the Watchers. Unless he gave her permission to check, Carmen would not pry into her own core data to find out. She did respect his leadership and his privacy, even if he couldn't see that. Critias gave her a slow cold look, never you mind who I yell at or why. Didn't Jim say that when you screwed up, he was going to take it out on me? Her sudden realization of that potential consequence struck her like a slap. In all of her disobedient impetuous haste, Carmen had never considered that eventuality. After she heard him say it aloud, she realized it to be the Achilles heel of her situation. Carmen had no worry that her overprotective and pampering husband would punish her. He was too soft for that despite all of the hot air that he blew to the contrary. No matter what she did, Critias would keep her, love her, and protect her, even from herself. What she did actually fear and dread was that Jim might asperse Critias because of her willful dereliction of duty. She had disobeyed her direct orders from her superior officer while in a combat emergency situation. If Critias suffered for her disobedience, Carmen would feel worse than punished, she would feel devastated. I just, she stuttered. You were in danger and my place is defending you. Your mech suit went into crisis mode. That is proof that you really did need my help. She considered that and then added, even if you actually didn't. He just nodded and it came across as him being unimpressed just as intended. Not that Critias was in the least concerned that it was actually true. The last worry he had in the world was that Jim would take the time to dress him down over an internal squabble within his own team, least of all when it involved his own notoriously quirky but otherwise trustworthy and extremely capable wife. 
It was just a way to petty torment her, partly because she had nearly caused him to accidentally kill her with the lightning and mostly because of his resentment about how blatantly indifferent she was about his genuinely empty threats of punishing her. The rainstorm grew in severity as the night progressed. The torrential downpour was so severe that it admirably washed the couple clean by the time Gloria drove them to the gate of the castle's tunnel. The epic slaughter that Critias had inflicted upon Jingle Bell's troops along with the ghouls from the hotel had effectively cleared the local area of wandering wild infected. His lightning had calmed the freaks down even more than the cold rain had already done. The GNP exterior action gate personnel had an easy time when they brought in the milk wagon, the only real delay was when a mechanic inspected the undercarriage to make sure that no ghouls clung underneath or had bound up in the German manufactured off-road racing drivetrain. It was a legitimate concern, especially after Gloria drove across the swamp park, which actually had been a giant carpet of infected bodies that was multiple layers deep. Fajak's caravan had made it to the castle unscathed and they had already unloaded the supplies from their machines. Since parking space was not readily available inside the tunnel for the storage of so many new trucks, they had left them outside along the railroad tracks of the rain-soaked vineyard cage. As the milk wagon crew disembarked, two young women dressed for the work of decontamination staff approached them. They were the same two girls from Denver whose clumsy attempt at seduction had caused Carmen and Amber to beat the handsome young guardsman for his indiscretion of paying them too much attention. He should have fled their presence immediately for his own good. The blunder and bolder of the two girls saluted Critias as she said, Alice and Mandy, reporting for duty, Captain Sir. She was the same underage pajamas girl who had turned up in Critias's bed back in Denver when he and Carmen had stayed in the President's apartment. Mandy was the strawberry blonde who tried to offer him a folded paper note. When she realized that Critias was too wet to handle it, she unfolded it herself and seemed eager to prove that she had education enough that she could even read it for him. King Louis orders Alice and Mandy to be the personal decontamination assistants for Captain Critias and Lady Carmen, until further notice. Swell, Critias groaned because he guessed the rest of the story from mere intuitive understanding. Carmen was no lesbian because he was the person who had selected her sexual preferences from a checklist of them when the bioengineers had manufactured her. Furthermore, Critias sure as hell would never sully himself by imitating the capital crimes of the wretched precedent. Critias understood that Jim rightly knew that Alice and Mandy could not possibly be safer anywhere other than under the care of Carmen and himself. Carmen had rescued them once already with the guard beat down situation. Jim had proof that she would go to extraordinary lengths to keep them safe. When it came to that, no one could sneak around Carmen when she was of a mind to guard something. Even more, Jim had known that they would demonstrate a loving family atmosphere that involved plenty of intimate relations properly undertaken in all reasonable married decorum. Those two girls definitely needed to see wholesome lives in contrast to the degeneracy they endured back in Denver. Lastly, Critias had no doubt that Jim simply found the whole matter to be a fine laugh because on top of everything else, he would get what he really wanted. The two young women had useful work assignments and reliable chaperones, which would go a long way toward keeping them out of mischief. Critias could even imagine Jim saying that Critias already had plenty of experience when it came to supervising emotionally immature females who had a taste for stirring up trouble. Jim had dumped the whole problem in Critias's lap to solve every aspect of the situation, and his move even appeared legitimate as opposed to being some kind of prank. Alice had a long plastic tub with her that she held out as she said, Swords please. We have a new decontamination directive for all edged instruments that only designated personnel are to handle or clean them. There was a cut finger recently. Fortunately, it happened after the cleaning. Carmen removed her sword from her back and then held it out one-handed. With a clever snap of her wrist, she flipped it edge up before laying it inside the container. I have not used it, she informed them. I'm sure it is still positively filthy with contaminated water. Critias added his panga bowie blade to the container, same here. The two guards that had volunteered to be drivers and had also helped Critias move cargo were still in the tunnel. They enjoyed the modest upgrade of status that came from having supported a forager operation that they also returned from successfully alive. When they approached the milk wagon to offer Critias a congratulations, the younger guards stopped short to avoid being near the two girls who were their new decontamination aides. It was only then that Critias realized where he had seen the younger guard before. He was the same man that Alice and Mandy had flirted with down in the chamber of the Monument's Leg Foundation and then he had caught a beating from Carmen and Amber for his trouble. The second guard that Critias called older only seemed so because the first guard was so comparatively young. The second guard was no older than Critias and even after he had removed his body armor, he was still a big man. Larger than Critias to be certain. He was big in the same way as Henry and Stig were, big enough to be known for the quality. Critias overheard the younger guard say, Give it a rest already, Yeti. 
The man prodded the kid with an elbow nudge. Aren't you going to say hello to your girlfriends? He had said it as mockery that he at least found amusing. One of the vehicle washing teams came up to clean the milk wagon with their pressure washer. They wanted to blast clean the exterior of Critias's mech suit first, which would encourage him to move on and be out of their way. Before Critias let them escort him behind the plastic splash shield sheeting, he instructed the two new assistants. I want you to take Carmen and get her scrubbed up and find her some pajamas to get her ready for bed. I am grounding her for misbehavior, make sure she doesn't do anything else. If she back talks you in the least way, you come tell me immediately. I will set fire to her ass with a belt and then we'll start all over again. He glowered at Carmen, maybe if you do as you're told for once, I won't make you eat dinner alone in your room. When we are out in the field, you will respect ranks and proper procedure. Just because we are married doesn't mean you are some special case who gets to do anything you please. Critia told the two girls, talk to Jack about what quarters he is assigning us. When you're finished getting Carmen decontaminated, leave her in my room and then come tell me. Carmen frowned in silent distress that he had demoted her to below apprentice decontamination assistant. In contrast, both girls saluted with gleeful smiling assurance that they would carry out the commands to the letter. They felt rather proud of the responsibility. Carmen was after all, a hero of the First Order, especially for anyone that came from Denver. After Alice and Mandy took away all of Carmen's dirty field gear and then put it into plastic tubs for decontamination, they marched her to the showers for a thorough cleaning. At first, Carmen felt downcast about being under house arrest, but she soon discovered that it did have some advantages. When her two decontamination assistants used lots of shampoo to vigorously scrub all the nasty swamp water mess from her violet hair, Carmen momentarily forgot all her troubles and just relaxed. It really had been a long nerve-wracking week for her. The hair on Carmen's head was just about the singular thing that she felt no reason at all to complain about, save perhaps its inhuman color. Critias had let her grow it out longer than was permissible under tactical regulations. Field service androids had no business wearing hair of any length and schools had a natural inclination to pull hair in a fight, so much so that they frequently even did it to each other. Beyond that, long hair also collected contamination, hence her vigorous swamp water removal of the moment. Critias had gotten her the hair exemption and she much appreciated it, even though he had only done it because he preferred her that way. He had wanted her to appear feminine and pretty during her service in his bedroom. Having a crew cut hair do would not be something Carmen enjoyed. Being buxom would have pleased her too, but Critias had never exempted her in regard to that. The Amazonian code that sleek women were preferable in war had successfully prevented that bit of abundantly protruding vanity. That Jim would penalize Critias because she had disobeyed a field operation order was the issue that gnawed at Carmen. While she sat on a plastic stool getting a four-handed dog wash scrub, she contacted Kevin by internal modem to have him ask Jim about it for her in the hopes that she could head the problem off before it arose. Kevin's eventual answer confirmed Critias's private expectations. Jim says he does not involve himself in the internal politics of the Forager crews. If the captains can't resolve such matters on their own, they have no business being the captain of a crew in the first place. He also says that Critias is your husband, while Jim is your king not your damn marriage counselor, unquote. Carmen sort of liked the answer in that it confirmed that nothing would come down on Critias from above. She asked, what about Jack? Ask Jim what Jack will say about this. Kevin returned none too quickly with the answer, Jim says that if he knew what Jack would say about his forager teams, he would not need Jack to be in his job either. If you want to know what Jack thinks, you can go ask him yourself. The two girls gave Carmen a pedicure and a manicure at the same time. During their indulgently thorough service, they asked questions about Critias. Mandy broke the ice because she wanted to know, is Critias going to hit us if we make mistakes? Back in the garage. Critias had threatened to take a belt to Carmen, and in general, he seemed gruff and abusive. Based on her past experience, Mandy never took such threats as idle talk. As was her norm, Carmen found it difficult to step outside of her self-involvement, so she interpreted the question to mean that Mandy wanted to know if Critias would hit Carmen for her mistakes out on the street earlier that night. Carmen sounded somewhat amused when she answered, no. She was obtusely unaware that Mandy had alluded to the abuse she had personally suffered as a slave in Denver. Critias is a big softy, Carmen continued in a tone that proved she adored her husband. He would never hurt me because he knows I mean well even when things don't exactly work out as he had planned. Alice was a survivor and as such, she never let her guard down because the only good defense was a strong offense. With that in mind, she wanted to know if Carmen was as naive as she appeared to be. Alice's old life had been among cannibal murder rapists, while Carmen seemed to have the perspective of a pampered socialite who had never even seen horror much less endured it which was in fact a rather accurate appraisal. 
to test just how sheltered Carmen actually was, Alice asked, is he a good kisser? I've never kissed anyone else, Carmen commented innocently such was her genuine intent to tell the truth. She considered that she might compare the places Critias kissed her and the sensations she experienced because of it, but quickly dismissed that idea. Before Carmen could think of anything to say, Alice already knew that she was onto something. So she jumped ahead, is Critias a good lover? When Carmen blushed in embarrassment, the two former enslaved concubines of the precedent glanced at each other with the knowledge that Carmen was naive as a proverbial pigeon. Just as Jim had spent his formative years surrounded by tradesmen in the foraging arts of apocalypse survival, Alice and Mandy had grown up immersed in kill or be killed brutal realist adversity. It was fortunate for Carmen that the two girls had a special fondness for her. If they had seen Carmen as a threat or a rival, they would have conspired against her to their own defense. As it was, Alice and Mandy would never forget the way that Carmen had arrived in Denver without any selfish interests, like to steal food and weapons. Carmen didn't desire slaves or power, even though she had the strength and talents to acquire those things if she had. After she helped people, Carmen never asked for any reward. She had done it only out of kindness. Even when Carmen got angry with them for their attempted usurpation of a guardsman, Carmen only showed them concern and generosity. Far from having any desire to harm Carmen or take advantage of her, Alice and Mandy set it in their minds to provide her with some experienced assistance. They were only together at that moment because Critias had been of a mind to punish Carmen. Those were exactly the kind of troubles that they could help Carmen get out from under and even reverse to her own advantage. When Critias was clean from the showers and had dressed in fresh clothes, he headed to the captain's table in the back hall. His crew was the first back to the castle while most everyone else was still quite busily afield. Because of the close proximity of the Radio City building that he had explored, and then their sudden but necessary evacuation triggered by his encounter with those two watchers and Jingle Bell's army as complicated by that car alarm, they had not been away from the castle for very long. Tony Banjo would not come back at all that night since he camped out at the East Airport. George and his crew were still at work as well. Jack waited at the table expecting Critias. The first Grand Marshal had some papers, a pencil, and a laptop computer before him with which he made his notes for future operations. Bob has uploaded the record data from your armor's cameras, Jack told him. He says the resolution of your data makes our high definition look like the painting La Parade by George Seurat. Critias sat down across the table. I'm not Carmen, Jack. You have to talk to me like I'm stupid. Jack laughed, I had to ask myself. It's a painting made from crude dots in a style called pointillism. That Bob was behind the endeavor impressed Critias, Bob has been familiarizing himself with data technology from my century? That's pretty amazing since I'm from there and I don't even understand it well enough to hook up my own visual screen. Not many people in my time can test their way through our educational system to get that kind of egghead career. I do know that the pictures my visor takes allow me to zoom in real far to study distant little details. If you want to take the time to look deeply enough into an image, you can find the flea on a dog's butt a kilometer away. It only really helps after the fact though. At the time things are happening, it is all going too fast for me to take time out to nitpick the images for details. Jack said, Bob has always been consumed with his soldering guns and microscopes. He never even comes out of his laboratory much. I suspect even Kevin has a thing or two to learn from him when it comes to thinking science outside the box. I imagine they don't teach duct tape dynamics or afro-engineering where you come from. We're getting ready to check out what happened to you tonight. Jim is on the new network back in the city. It seemed appropriate to wait for you to be present before we watched it, so it seems less like spying. Critias shrugged unworried, I don't recall doing anything too embarrassing. I didn't document jumping Carmen's bones or anything. Jack glanced about, where is Supergirl? Critias frowned about the topic. I sent her to our room with those two assistants that Jim assigned us. When that siren went off, I ordered her to escort your group back to the castle. Instead, she came after me. As happy as I am that she has attained her sense of independent judgment, I can't risk her getting the idea that she needs to start ignoring everything anyone tells her. It's a delicate balance, and to be honest, I'm not that confident I know how to handle her on this issue. She knows I have no real power over her besides what she willingly allows. In my time. A male marshal never beats a woman and androids are never disobedient. Jack considered what Critias said and had some advice. If there was anything in this video that required emergency action, you or Jim would have said something already. If you don't mind me saying, I think you should go see her now. I was married for a long time to a woman I loved. Since you say you're unsure about what to do with her, take some advice from me and go talk to her about it. He adjusted the computer's angle to remove glare on the screen, 
Come back later tonight for the regular meeting when the other crews return from their runs. In fact, I'll send someone to get you when the time comes. You're still technically on your honeymoon after all. I'll do that, Critias got up from his seat. To be honest, I'm still feeling a little tweaked from that fight and I could use a chance to unwind. The war drugs that his mech suit had jacked him up on when it was in crisis mode still coursed through his system. If Kevin were around, he would take an antidote from the medical supplies they brought back from Dr. Kine. As it was, he had little choice but to let them run their course, not that he was in any real hardship from them anyway. The drugs could even become addictive if he had access to repeated use of them. His mech suit would never allow that and it had the only discretion that counted in the matter. The little apartment they had use of in the castle was one of the nicer ones that was years old dating back from the time before King's Tower. It took up part of the space of a compact movie theater that used to be part of the complex before the downfall. The room even had its own functional toilet, which was a massive improvement over having to trek to the communal one adjacent to the showers in the front hall. Critias had to knock because when he tried the handle he discovered the door locked. He didn't wait but a moment before Mandy opened the door. Sorry about that, sir, she excused. With so many men wandering about, we didn't want anyone walking in by mistake while Carmen was dressing. It seemed a reasonable enough excuse to him, so he didn't question it. He told her, we want to be alone. You two take some time off as in go watch a movie or something. I won't need you again until our gear is decontaminated. You can deliver that when it's ready. He shrugged to adjust his shoulder holster that held a chrome handgun. I'd like my pistol back, so I can discard this abominable piece of crap. Excuse my French, young miss. Alice checked a little notepad from her pocket. It was her handmade copy of the couple's ration allowances. She asked, could I bring you something to drink, sir? You have hardly dented your beer allowance. Perhaps you would like a cigar or a glass of whiskey. He shook his head no, maybe later at the captain's meeting. I'm fine for now. Carmen sat cross-legged in the middle of a double bed. She said, I would like an orange drink, please, and some banana chips if there are any available. Critias thought he saw Alice shoot Carmen a conspiratorial wink as the girls closed the door on their way out. It may have only been a simple display of friendly comradery and not the signals among a bevy of thieves that it appeared to be. He plopped himself down into a soft reclining chair to relax with a sigh. Tilting his head, he admired Carmen who wore a clean maroon silk pajamas with her hair and twin ponytails. The girlish yellow bows contrasted with her hair color nicely. As she gracefully slipped off the bed, her silk pajama pants found no friction against their fine threaded sheets. Carmen made quietly conservative geisha movements as she stepped toward him in gleaming white cotton socks. She approached his recliner to stand before him just beyond his knees. Carmen had no expression that revealed her inner thoughts as she made a give it to me gesture with her fingers. Critias, remained confused at first until he came to realize that she indicated his uncomfortable shoulder holster and its automatic pistol that the decontamination guys had given him to wear while they undertook the elaborate process of cleaning his Tesla Flux pistol. He leaned forward in his chair to work it off and then handed it to her. Carmen promptly placed it aside on a nearby lamp table. I want to talk to you about tonight, Critias told her as he leaned back again to get comfortable. He took a greater comfort from just admiring his wife which was a far superior sensation to just gazing upon a beautiful woman. Carmen was more than eye candy. She was his intimate possession that he could appreciate with more than just his eyes and more than just ones to be sure. I want to talk to you about tonight, she repeated his words in a feminine way that deferentially insinuated that it was she that should go first. Critias shrugged with his expression that she was welcome to do so if that was her preference. He wasn't in any particular hurry. She began. I have put a lot of thought into it since you told me that you thought my comments earlier tonight were ignorant. The commanding officers in that tower were supposed to be loyal to their office, their subordinates, and to the civil defense of the common people. They accepted their ranking positions by making solemn oaths. When disaster arrived and those they served needed them most, they abused that authority to fortify themselves on the highest floors while securing for themselves helicopter evacuations. They were cowards and traitors to the same sort of profession you hold so dear. Abandoned and trapped, their brave soldiers fought and died as best they were able. Eventually, the advancing infected tribes overtook them from behind. The few who remained, still true to their principles, fell back until they only had their last room in the tallest accessible level of the tower. There, hopelessly cornered, they mercifully executed the women and children before finally turning their weapons on each other. Their last acts were a desperate effort to preserve their dignity rather than having an unstoppable army of demons devour them alive. All of them are dead now since the helicopters only delayed the inevitable deaths of the cowards who surely fell in some other place. 
that I failed to respect the valor and tragedy of the brave over the cunning and self-preservation of the dishonorable truly was ignorance on my part. You envisioned me with a noble and courageous higher self. For the callous venality I made of that chivalrous character you gifted me within my very conception, I do sincerely apologize. You deserved better, just as I deserved better, and our community deserved better. No less shameful is that I did it for all to hear on the radio where everyone would witness me behaving like a cad and reprobate. My very existence is an extension of yourself both in fact and principle, as both android and wife. In that brief and terrible moment, I actually made you ashamed of me. At that final admission that she had deeply failed him, Carmen choked up with tears. In closing, she added, in the future, to myself, you, and our community, your wife will be a model of feminine virtues and martial gallantry. He had planned on talking about Carmen obeying orders while on mission, not that minor event that took place in the Radio City Tower. After having her explain it so succinctly, Critias had to agree that he didn't like it at the time and genuinely didn't want to hear more comments like that in the future. Since she had apparently learned her lesson and committed herself to moving forward, Critias had nothing really to say on the matter. When he declined to comment, Carmen walked to the foot of the bed to pick up a casual clothes men's leather belt that she had hung there from the corner poster. After she brought it back, she placed it to hang over his knee. Carmen knelt down before him humbled in submission, even so much as to place her forehead to the floor. It took Critias a moment to realize her intentions and once he had, he immediately stated, I'm not hitting you with this. He held out the belt for her to take it back. Yes, what you said at the time bothered me, but now I see that you're blowing all this completely out of proportion. I was never officially ashamed of you just because I didn't appreciate something you said. We routinely discuss school war strategy and I am thankful for your candid opinions. That was just the wrong time and place for it. She raised her head to look at him seriously, you don't yet understand. I still have no intention of blindly obeying your orders out in the field. In that matter, nothing has changed. I am committed to defending your principles as you command, but that does not mean that I have taken them to heart. In my truest self, I still don't feel any actual pity for any of those people who died in the outbreak disaster. Of everyone involved, it is the avariciousness of the villains that so closely mirrors my own true feelings. If you wish me to be chivalrous, then that is the face I will show to the world. If the time comes that you feel differently, and if everyone in the world drew breath through a single throat, I would gladly cut it to serve you. You are too much of a gentleman to ever test my convictions with genuine necessity, but if you ever called for it, I would kill anyone on your behalf. It would not matter who since I don't really care, be it Jim, or Jack, or whomever. When he didn't seem to believe her, Carmen took on a sneering expression of the truly ruthless. You ordered me to escort the others to safety, so that is what I did within reason. I got them safely to their vehicles and then I closed the garage doors after they departed. I then saw the milk wagon safely away too, after that, I cared not for what became of them. You were fighting for your life so I rushed to your side. I did it then and will certainly do it again tomorrow. After he genuinely frowned over her sudden dark turn, Carmen put her head back to the floor. From that position, she pledged, I would do it all over again the same way without any hesitation or regret. I would rather die, suffer a thousand beatings or even have you believe I betrayed you, than for you ever to think it is even possible for you to be in danger and I would not do anything imaginable to fly to your side to fight for you one last time. If I had died in a lightning storm, it would have been a good death, just so long as you had lived. I am truly sorry that I embarrass you at the radio building, but I will not obey you in the other matter. I refuse. Critias wanted to think she joked, yet it was clear to him she had not spoken out of sick humor. He stood up from the chair because the combat drugs allowed his untempered emotions to get the better of him. Because it happened to still be in his hand, Critias harshly gestured with the belt at her on the floor below him, Are you saying if I wanted to do something extraordinarily evil, like try to set myself up here as king, you would kill the others for me until they all obeyed my authority? We could live here as tyrant king and queen of all the enslaved earth? Carmen didn't raise her head as she answered, If that be your wish, you need only command it then woe to any who stood against your absolute rule of this world. In anger and frustration, Critias swung the belt through the air while he shouted at her, Have you learned nothing from all your damned books? Don't say treasonous things like that, not ever, not even in jest, and certainly not to me. At the same moment, the door opened as Alice and Mandy came in with Carmen's snack. They observed the scene as it appeared that the tyrannical Critias had whipped his tearful wife down to groveling at his feet. Critias flung the belt away across the room. Have you two never heard of knocking? He cursed, damn it all to hell. This is not what it looks like. Alice gestured for Mandy to put the tray down on a table. You don't need to concern yourself about us, sir, 
she assured Critias, undisturbed in the slightest. Have you forgotten? We are not strangers to calling a man master or to the stain of a belt after genuinely being disobedient to him. Critias stood speechlessly unable to dispute the unfortunate comparison between himself and the crimes of the twisted precedent. Alice waved for Mandy to come close and then she turned the girl away to raise the back of her shirt. She showed Critias the brown lines of scar that marked Mandy's back. As you can see, sir, your wife is not the only woman in this city to have lost her virginity against her will. Alice corrected her friend's shirt and then they stood together at attention with an intimidating lack of emotion. Will that be all, sir? Seeing that it was from his stunned silence, they headed out. As she closed the door, Alice said, If you want any service, just anything at all, you need only call for us. We understand how to obey and how to keep secrets. We will be close by. Critias didn't even need the war drugs to be furious. The whole situation was just entirely unbelievable. Not only had his two new assistants, his adopted wives, or whatever they were really supposed to be, not only did they just accuse him of being a rapist and wife beater, he hadn't even denied it because it was at least partially true. It was as if the universe had conspired against him to dump him into a trap, which in actual fact it had, if only Alice's calculated scheme could be confused with the whole universe. He snapped at Carmen, I'm not a wife beater and I sure as hell am no damn rapist. Having her cringe there before him like an oriental slave certainly didn't make his proclamation seem more legitimate not even to himself. Carmen sat up on her heels with her hands flat on her thighs just above the knees. She calmly asked, How old am I, master? The girls asked me my age and I wasn't sure what my lie should be. I don't even know myself. He just sank back into his chair as if a heavy weight was on his shoulders. Critias answered, Physically, you're about twenty I suppose. Chronologically, you know the answer to that down to the second, but suffice to say well short of even a single year. Mentally, as Bob said, intellectually, bookwise anyway, you're a prodigy old sage. Emotionally. He sighed unwilling to lie, you're about twelve, and a sheltered twelve at that. They gave you to me without any instructions or expectations, like a reward or a plaything. I know that is not a valid excuse. The sins are all mine, Carmen. I had a choice to love and raise you as a daughter or a friend, but instead I ravished you like I was a drunken pirate. Now I made you my wife because I cannot bear the thought of sharing you in the least way with anyone else. Carmen demonstrated her fantastic core strength as she trembled like a spring, like a cat about to pounce, she nearly rose off her heels while seated. Romantic zeal lilted her voice, you dread the thought of another man touching me with his lips, his hands, or climbing atop of me and having his way upon me. The mere thought was enough to make Critias want to kill the fictitious man. He turned that malice inward to harden his heart. Whatever wrongs I have done, the time is gone and there is no undoing them. I came here to be angry with you and I have not forgotten your words about a world with one throat. I told you once before, Carmen, if you take the dark path and become a murderous monster, I will not hesitate to kill you. When you put on that ring, you gave your oath to honor me. My codes are yours now. You will honor them even if it costs you your life or mine. She crept forward a little on her knees, if you would not hesitate to destroy my body for my evil. Why would you hesitate to only punish it when I am only bad? Should not my punishments be in proportion to my crimes? Carmen put her ringed hand over her heart then sheltered it with her other. I will not take this off while I live, so if keeping it means that I must make your values my own, then I will make it so, as long as you understand that I do it for this ring and in support of you my only love, my trusted partner in battle, and my one husband in this life. I don't relinquish the jealous desire to possess you at any cost. That still dwells secure in my heart. I am the jealous one of us, he disagreed based on the thought of what he might be capable of to keep Carmen rather than lose her. She crept even closer, you are so wrong. Our new assistants asked me many questions about you, made me think in ways I have not done before. They said that in time a woman grows accustomed to her man, but for me that is not proving true. Each day I regenerate to be as I was the day before. She raised her hands as if her fingers would be on his abdomen when he lay atop her. Sometimes I push you away when you are too much and it causes me a pain. Her gaze burned into him, sometimes I pull you hard against me, because that feeling is gone and I need it returned to me. He shifted his eyes away as he recalled her performing both of those behaviors from frequent personal experience. I am angry with you, he said mostly to remind himself. Stop trying to seduce away my intentions. If something had happened to those drivers when you abandoned them, this would be a lot more serious. The only difference is that we got lucky. She couldn't see the import of his phrase, angry with me. You who would kill me for sufficient villainy, yet would never punish me for any lesser offense? What danger is it to me that you are angry with me? 
Carmen crawled up close enough to kneel between his knees where she slowly unbuttoned the top half of her pajama blouse. She revealed just the centermost white of a cotton bra bright as her socks, a functional garment as far from lacy or erotic as imaginably possible. Even so, she was aware that vulgarity didn't arouse Critias. He preferred her demure purity that was his alone to steal away, which it was. She asked again, are you really angry with me? When he didn't deny it, she said, give me your hand. She reached out to take it when he failed to comply. Carmen forced his fingers across her chest until they brushed the edge of the fabric. He willingly had to assist, which he did to let his fingers slip inside the cup. She questioned seductively, am I not still warm, while you are angry with me? In your anger, do I not remain delightfully soft? Do my thighs not still wet and welcome you with their gentle embrace? Is my breath not still sweet, my lips hungry for you to taste? In your fuming anger, are not my arms anxious to hold you without recrimination? Now tell me, what do you feel, your anger, or something else? Critias couldn't resist expertly rolling her nipple between his brushing fingertips till he felt it harden, which made her loll her head back with eyes closed as she purred a sigh. Carmen gasped, is that the lie you tell yourself, my master, that you should hold back from your urge to dominate me with brutish disregard because it is your forbidden desire, but not mine too? I do dread the thought of the least cruelty from you. It would be unbearable to me that I had failed you so grievously. And yet to be forced by your gentle persistence to perform in ways that I already long for if I only had the courage, that is what I want more than anything. That is my greatest pleasure. She stared unwavering into his eyes again, right now, do you want to grab my silly hair to force me down to satisfy that urge that even now stands out so aggravated before me? Do you think you could want to do that more than I am already hoping you will do so? Do you already know that I would use all of my will just to turn my head away, to pretend it is not my deepest desire? Only so I get to savor the exquisite pleasure of your strong hands making me comply with my own aspirations? We are married now, so we can put the pretty pretenses behind us, I want you more than you want me. I am not the naive victim of a seducer. You are my master and I would not wish it otherwise. I could not be happy if it was otherwise. Critias glanced at the door when he heard the subtlest creak of wood. He promptly reached over to the side table to grab his pistol. As he cocked the hammer back, he called out, Open the door, Mandy before I shoot you through it. The girl immediately opened the door she had leaned against while she listened. She bore a sheepish expression of guilt, how did you know it was me, sir? Critias demanded, you come in now too, Alice. I knew it was you, because Alice is too clever a footpad to lean against a door while eavesdropping. Alice came up behind her friend and then smacked her on the shoulder, I told you to stop putting so much weight against it, knucklehead. Critias put the gun away and then added a glance at Carmen when he realized that she surely had known that they were there, her cunning little co-conspirators. He was man enough to admit that they had played him masterfully. He took a deep calming breath before saying, Now that your scheming has done its work, and I am about to make up with my wife, in our room, on our honeymoon, would it be too much to ask for you two to get away from my door? Not at all, sir, Mandy agreed eager to depart with her painless reprimand. Alice gave Carmen a bolder wink combined with a victorious grin, have fun. Critias raised his voice, out. They closed the locked door behind them as they departed far from it. Carmen nuzzled him as if it were accidental, now where were we? She tossed her horse tails to invite him to seize them like handlebars with properly acted male gruffness. He rubbed his eyes instead, what do you know about those combat enhancers my suit puts into me? Do they have any known side effects? It can cause nausea. She offered with a frown since the erotic mood was obviously fading away. They can cause irritability, aggressive tendencies, insomnia, a loss of empathic communicativeness, and frequently a loss of appetite. In some rare cases, they can trigger psychotic episodes of uncontrollable rage, paranoia, and extremely violent homicidal fantasies. She put her head on his thigh in genuine sympathy, I should contact Kevin and have him come give you a medical examination. No. He pushed her back callously so that she tipped over to land on her bottom as he got up from his chair. I just need to walk it off. I have some work to do anyway. Jack wants to review my mission data from tonight. As he reached the door, Carmen dashed up behind him desperate to change his mind. You could lie down for a while, she pleaded in disappointment. I could give you a massage, or walk on your back. When Critias felt completely certain that she had fallen for his cruel deception, a bit of payback for the ringer they ran him through. Critia spun on her with the intention of acting out of control with aggression. It was a ruse that came across as being all too real because of the drugs he had in him. Carmen genuinely squeaked in her fearful uncertainty when he roughly snatched her up at the armpits, easily lifted her right off her feet, 
and then carried her over to their bed where he tossed her down none too gently. I'm going to call Kevin, she told him like it was a threat intended to make him stop. Critias already had his shirt off and tossed it away as he kicked off his second shoe. Tell him he had better hurry, Critias advised her. If he intends to save you from me, he has about twenty seconds. She scrambled backward across the bed like a crayfish only not soon enough to stop him from catching her by the ankles. Carmen managed to get the question out, twenty seconds before you what? He just dragged her back to his edge of the bed, which her silk pajamas made that much easier with their low friction. Before Carmen even had a chance to think, his second rough tug jerked her pajama pants and matching white underpants most of the way to her knees, which in so doing bound her legs together. Critias was not interested in her complaints. He had a long jousting tournament in mind for her and welcomed her faux refusals. She struggled to escape, so he caught up her bound legs to pin them over his shoulder with one arm. When he couched his lance, she took fright and then reached around her thighs to shove him away before he attempted too much too abruptly. Critia smacked her hands aside and then lifted her legs to haul her into him for a decisive coup de grace. Just as he expected, all her seductive antics had worked its magic on her too. With her ankles tied to his shoulder, the knuckles in Carmen's toes cracked loudly in Critias's ear as her feet along with every other muscle in her body clenched into fists around the lightning bolt of a climax. Even her diaphragm shuddered too erratically for her to cry out a sound as her mouth only managed to form a long silent scream. He let a moment linger in her until she regained some semblance of consciousness, at least enough to start breathing again, and then having her completely enthralled to his will, he let her go and then rolled her out across the bed with a shove so that he could fully remove his pants. Carmen had just enough time to try covering herself since she felt genuinely embarrassed. She had not been consciously aware of how much she would enjoy it when he yanked away the sheet to deprive her of even that small shred of a violated damsel's dignity. He set upon her again, only he took a hold of her ponytails to make good use of them. It was all the will that Carmen could muster to force her head to turn away only to then relish how insistently he reoriented her back to the task poised before her. It would be a ferocious hour before Critias as battle drug amplified libido gave her any respite and she would never find cause to regret it no matter how many times she pretended otherwise. Chapter 5. Kings and Castles Colonel Hiram Davis and his Grave Walker platoon returned to Forager's Castle at a couple hours past midnight. They parked their best tandem pair of armored light rail cars on the track at the Rook, which was at the top of the boarding ramp from the Northern Vineyard Tunnel. There was more work for them still to do. But the heavy rain downpour and their accumulated general anxiety from performing the dangerous labor, had stressed the grave walkers to their safe limits of attentiveness. Hiram's team had cleared light rail track out toward the West Airport as Jack had assigned. While performing that duty, they salvaged the highest quality light rail subway train cars to add them to the community's growing fleet. The grave walker platoon returned home triumphant, though soaking wet, emotionally exhausted, and decidedly hungry. They were all alive, uninjured, and uninfected. Andy drove home the Big Joe transport only a little after the return of Hiram. The timing was intentional so that the colonel's gunman would be in the deployment area to help them bring the truck inside the garage. George had a full load of supplies of great variety and high value. Everything came from a home improvement warehouse superstore they had thoroughly plundered. Including his master gunner Malcolm, George only had a three-man operation. That the few of them had accomplished so much, in such a short period of time, all while under threat of infected attack demonstrated just how talented a forager Captain George actually was. As before with Jack's caravan of vehicles from Radio City, the heavy rain and Critias as major battle with the infected had cleared the local vicinity of wild goons that might have otherwise have caused trouble for the GNP gate control teams. Tony Banjo, Penny Welder, and Wolf, remained out at the East Airport to supervise the hot zone construction teams that worked there as they upgraded the place into a fully fortified field operations and maintenance outpost. Critias managed to get a little rest after he had coitally trounced Carmen into an emotionally exhausted but blissful sleep. She awoke him some time later when she stirred to adjust her cuddle. Her hand unconsciously reached for him to see if she had somehow lost the key to her bliss. Carmen was well beyond the need for another round of marital horseplay, but she dreaded the thought of being without him all the same. Once Carmen felt certain that Critias had not abandoned her, she passed out again. As she drifted back into deep sleep, she mumbled a whisper that, Proximity trespassers are non-hostile. An instant later, Alice and Mandy entered the room with their own key. They delivered a rolling shopping cart that contained all of the mission gear that the decontamination staff had sanitized. Critias guessed correctly that the organic portions of his wife's mind had been the one groping at him in her sleep. 
It was the technological counterpart of her brain that never really stopped making sensory observations or being on guard. He didn't let the girls know he was awake, partly because he actually trusted them, and also because he didn't entirely trust them. Critias wanted to know what they would do. Mandy quietly crept up to their bed then carefully placed their Tesla Flux pistols on the small bedside tables. At the same time, she took away the backup pistols for return to the weapons locker. Alice carefully arranged the pieces of Critias's mech suit across the couch cushions where it would be safe. They hung the Tesla Flux rifle on the wall's gun rack, and then properly unpacked all their other possessions. The girls had no other interests in the room other than to genuinely perform their assigned duties. Because Carmen remained comfortably asleep, without the least concern for their presence, it made Critias's act of being asleep too plenty convincing. Mandy whispered, What about this? She held out Carmen's katana. If I put it down in the wrong way, won't she be angry? I can't remember. Give it to me, Alice said as she took it. When Mandy handed it over in the wrong way, Alice complained in a whisper, No, not like that. Try it again. The note said to use both hands from underneath. The edge should always be upright and toward ourselves when you hand it to her. When Mandy did it right, Alice praised her, Yes, like that. Think of it like handling the guns. Would you hand a pistol over while pointing it at them? It's not a gun, Mandy grumbled. It is in her hands, Alice corrected her. If she handed it to you with the edge out, she could draw it faster than you could blink an eye and then swish your blood would be squirting like a water fountain, like when she killed that pig Rupert. I'm glad she killed Rupert, Mandy hissed, and his five dirty boyfriends too. All of them at the same time, Alice added as she got a throw pillow from the couch to place it on the main table. Mandy whispered with a tone of inner hatred, I hope Rupert died trying to hold his guts in. I hope he died real bad and slow, with his guts in his hands crying for his mommy. Quiet. Alice hushed her when she got too loud, when Rupert tried to feel Carmen up, she quick drew this sword chopping his arm right off. Then she made him crawl around on the floor like a raggedy dog, begging for his life. Then Carmen said, this is for Mandy. And she shot him in the liver with her gun in the liver so he would die nice and slow with enough time to think about the bad things he had done. You're joshing me, Mandy whispered back. Am not, I heard it from Olivia, Alice swore honesty. She was there and saw the whole thing like you're looking at me now. You can go ask her if it's true. She had embellished about the tribute to her friend's name. Alice saw no harm in that small lie. It was factual enough in spirit and besides, the rest was truth and Mandy would never check with Olivia anyway. Alice carefully displayed the sword on the table, balanced in a proper arched pose within the crease of the pillow. When she had it right, she explained, the note says it must always be resting with the edge up or the magic drains out of it. As a final touch, Mandy placed Critias's plastic bag teddy bear in a chair at the table as if for playtime tea. Alice headed for the door, let's go. Mandy hesitated to follow, go where? I don't want to sleep in the front hall. That is how we got into trouble last time. People keep looking at us funny and I hate that. I want to stay here. We're not going to sleep in the front hall, Alice assured her. We can drag our stuff back here and sleep right outside in the hallway. If anyone tries to make us move, we can just say we wanted to be close if he needed anything. If anyone gives us any trouble, Captain Critias will let Carmen be the crap out of them. In agreement on that, the two left, locking the door behind them. Round about the witching hour, Carmen nudged her husband repeatedly, Critias wake up. I had a dream. He rolled over and then pulled her against him to trap Carmen in his embrace, arms around her and his chin on her shoulder. He tickled her at the belt line to make her smile, tell me about your dream. She told him, we were in our time, I think, because everything was green the way it all becomes as soil accumulated in the big cities. It was a big city. I could tell even through all the cover because of the geometric shape of it. We were going for a walk, but I don't know why. There were many pretty birds singing. Little animals, but not a single ghoul anywhere for kilometers all around. It was beautiful and peaceful really. I was happy. When I walked too far ahead we became separated. When I turned around, I didn't know where you were anymore. Carmen squirmed and rolled until she faced him. I called for you over and over, as loud as I could shout. You would never answer and I started to cry. It was horrible. Critias rubbed her back. You said it was a pretty place and there were no ghouls anywhere. Why would you be afraid like a babe to be alone in the woods? Her eyes narrowed and her expression became vengeful. I was never afraid to be alone. Why didn't you just answer me? You were just around a corner and heard my calls plainly, but you refused to answer me. You just stood there listening and watching how I would react. As my cries became more desperate, 
you grew only more interested in what I might do next. I never cared about being alone and I was never afraid. Carmen sat up suddenly and then backfisted his abdomen in a sharp smack, why would you do that to me? She was about ready to cry over the imagined betrayal, I trusted you. You are the only person in the world I should be able to truly trust. I could never have imagined it was even possible that you of all people would be able to betray me like that. I thought you had vanished or were dead from a falling rock, because it was inconceivable to me that you could actually hear me and would just torture me with your silence on purpose. Crytea leaned up to undo the last button in her pajama top to take it off her. As he worked, he explained, that wasn't me. You are dreaming and don't ask me what dreams mean because no one anywhere really knows. Maybe you think I'm not spending enough time with you, or you think I'm neglecting you on purpose when I'm not. I have things to do, and generally so do you when you were going with me. I used to leave you alone in the gunship for hours while I was working and you didn't like that either. I never did it to hurt you, or because I didn't want to be with you. She pleaded, then have Kevin make the dream stop. Absolutely not, Critias, refused accentuated by his toss of her pajama top to join the bottoms at the foot of the bed. Your bad dreams are no worse than the real world and you need all the practice you can get in dealing with both. Now, were you calling me Critias or Master? She entirely missed the reference that he realized that what she called him revealed her mood. Being at a total loss, she asked, Critias? Hoon, too bad, he replied amused while he got out of bed. His response confused her, what would you have done if I had answered with master? Critias went over to retrieve the bag teddy bear from the nearby table, on his way back, he said, if you had said master, I would have spanked you until you cried and then given you a two-fingered purple mustache that wouldn't stop until you begged me for mercy. He tore open the package as he returned to the bed. Critias took out the toy bear, which was luxuriant in its artificial fibers of tremendous softness. Carmen was uncertain what it was he had described doing to her but it sounded fabulously naughty. After a moment of consideration, she could recall having looked down during his first kissing lessons back in Denver. She had seen him with a furry purple mustache that graced his upper lip when she had peeked downward through her cleavage. Once she understood, Carmen blushed prolifically and then concealed her pristine white underclothes with the sheet. He climbed back into bed and then offered her the bear, I got this for you tonight to show you how much I love you. It wasn't easy. I know it's not poems and flowers, but I would give you those two if I had any. I love you, Carmen, more than I know how to say. She cherished the romantic gift even before she understood the extraordinary lengths he had gone through to acquire it for her. When she leaned in for a kiss, he took the toy bear away and then set it aside. Critias cradled her in one arm while his other hand caressed her throat in a demonstration of his total control he knew he had over her. He gazed into her eyes to let her know he was serious, you are like one of those that will not serve God, if the devil bid you. For all of your noble qualities. In my hands you are a secret harlot. She swooned on his arm to abandon herself to his devilish appetites, treat me in ways that would cause me to despise myself, if any hand but yours had played so coarse a tune upon this instrument. Critias put her down on her back to shadow over her like a cloak. This time I'll answer every time you cry out my name, he promised her as he started to kiss a trail down her torso. I want to show you the difference between your dreams and reality. About the hour of sunrise, Carmen awoke Critias again. He sat up to see that she was also upright, only wobbly still more asleep than conscious. Your meeting is about to start, she talked in her sleep. Jack is sending someone to tell you. Nothing else seemed to be amiss so he assumed she got the radio message in her head or something similar to that when she intercepted the invitation. Thank you, he replied as he got up to get dressed. She neither moved nor spoke so he directed her, go back to sleep. I won't be gone long. I want you, she pouted. Stay with me. He picked up her bear and then tucked it into her arms. His name is Virgil and he is me, he whispered to her sweetly. While you're holding this, I'm right here with you. She flopped down into his warm bed indentation. Carmen wore a happy smile as she gathered in a sheet around her along with the bear as well, and then she passed back out into peaceful sleep. By the time Critias had dressed, put on his boots and pistol belt, he heard voices outside the door. What sounded like a patrol guard said, you two are not supposed to be back here. Drag this shit out of here and don't let me catch you here again. Mind your own business, Alice, remained politely bold in her defiance. I'm not telling you twice, the guard snapped at her. You'll move it or I'll, he cut off as Critias opened the door. Captain, Jack wants you to know the meeting is starting in a few minutes. I know about the meeting, Critias told him. I was just on my way there. He looked down at the sleeping pallet the girls had made along the wall beside his doorway. They wore drab flannel pajamas and from their expressions, 
Critias could tell that they had been asleep before the guard kicked them out of bed. It burned Critias's pride that he had known they would be there. He had overheard them plan how they would seek him out as a harbor of safe shelter. They would make a nest outside his door so that they could feel safe from a community that both protected and shunned them as untouchables. He had known all about it, that they would camp at his door, but he had not done the right thing. Carmen especially had the senses to know that they were there too, and she had not even thought enough to mention it, much less do anything about it. Because evil men had abused them as children, two young women had to feel ostracized. The community judged them as immoral persons that they had to supervise accordingly. Critias had done no better because he had known more than most. They had even sought him out and that was after Jim wrote out a specific order that he and Carmen should look out for them. Critias had left them out in the hallway like a pair of dogs. It was then that Critias realized something even worse. Alice had come to him for help before back in Denver. She had actually sought him out to offer the very service she currently provided. Not only had he tossed her out without a second thought or one moment of compassion for them, he and Carmen had actually discussed with amusement that Carmen put them out gently as opposed to putting a boot to them. He had no doubt that he had shamed himself. If he had done something sooner, they never would have gotten themselves embroiled in any trouble at all, certainly not with that young guard. Critias gestured for Alice to move her things, take your stuff inside. You two can sleep on the floor, on the couch, or in the bed with Carmen if that would please you and she doesn't mind. I have to go to the captain's meeting or I would help you. Mandy could not believe her ears, you're going to let us stay with you? I can even share a bed with Carmen if I like. He played it cold with her, you have trouble hearing, soldier? Mandy snapped to attention, no, sir, message received, sir. At that she bent down to grab the corner of her mattress and then tug it away inside through the door. She beamed all the grateful enthusiasm of a ghoul as it dragged away its fresh kill. As Alice followed Mandy in, Critias caught her by the shoulder to say, Now everyone can talk behind both our backs. Alice stepped over the threshold, but turned back, Why are you being a friend to us when no one else wants to even be seen near us? Critias shrugged, Does it matter? You protect your friends and one day you will be sitting at the captain's table. I see that in you. Then again, if your friends can't trust you, you will probably end up like this stupid asshole, wandering hallways at night trousting young women for doing nothing at all but getting a shitty bed assignment, because it makes you feel like a big shot. That kid you gave a hard time has more balls than this. He volunteered to walk the blood in Radio City last night. Alice giggled as she shot the guard a vengeful look and then she closed the door. Critias sighed the guard and could read his expression, you're thinking I'm not the same overkill son of a bitch without my armor on. You pull the pistol on me and I'll take it away from you and then slap you with it. I'd never do such a thing, sir, the guard answered snidely. If I did, your wife would come out here and beat the ever-loving shit out of me. I'm wondering though about what you're planning on doing with those little cherries in your bed. Not a damn thing, Critias answered readily. Which do you think is more likely? I would want to cheat on my perfect goddess of a wife who calls me master with absolute devotion, while on our honeymoon no less, or that she would let me live after I did it. Try and remember that they're just a couple of hard luck kids looking for a home. The problem is that people like you can't keep their wicks in their pants long enough to give them the time of day. They're not the offenders here. They're the victims, so get off their backs and stop thinking about getting them on theirs. The guard wanted to say something clever, but he failed to invent such a comment. The logic was irrefutable that there was no problem that the two girls might physically force themselves on anyone. Their crime was being beautiful, seeming too willing, and being around a bunch of horny men all too eager to take advantage of them. It weighed heavily on his mind that he had secretly desired the two girls to throw themselves at him, if only for the erotically flattering satisfaction of getting to turn them down. The guard stepped aside for Critias to go on his way, my apologies, sir, in the moment it seemed like they should be in a public space not alone in a dark hallway where anyone could get at them. I should have been polite about it. It won't happen again. Critias privately blamed himself for the incident since he had overheard their plans. He could have intervened then, but passed the opportunity by. He had a meeting to get to, so Critias told the guard, sorry about calling you an asshole. The truth is that I'm the heartless dick who locked them outside to sleep in a hallway. You bruised their feelings and I wanted to put them at ease. You got a little ruffled in the process. Surely. Those teenagers are more entitled to emotional coddling. You can already take care of yourself. The guard nodded in agreement. Good morning, Captain. He continued on his way to perform whatever other duties were in his purview. On his way to the back hall, Critias thought to himself about how his inner guilt over mistakes he made with Carmen paralleled the two young women. Alice and Mandy didn't mean to cause anyone trouble, and in truth, 
they were desperate to avoid it. For Denver women, trouble among men meant being on the receiving end of violence. They had arrived from Denver prepared to repeat the only survival strategy they knew. With everyone so afraid of the king's wrath if they touched them, and sadly, after Critias had coldly refused to help them in Denver, they plotted to corrupt into their service the only young man they could find dumb enough to participate. Even then, the kid had only stood by as he watched their staged antics with shocked disbelief. When deprived of even that recourse, the girls ended up hiding outside his door and were grateful to have that much. Critias felt ashamed of himself that he let them sleep outside his door like that. It was one of those events that never went away. He would always recall the time the two abused orphan girls huddled at his door to seek protection from a martial captain of Virgil Lidus and he had refused to open it. In his time, the first order of the martial service was to deserve respect from the people, as paragons of honesty and chivalrous character. For one of their own to besmirch the service always brought down the wrath of all. To take a beating of the legion was the best a dishonored brother could hope for to win his pardon. Critias felt like he deserved a good beating from men who knew better. He resolved himself to work harder. Grand Marshal, Wayne once told Critias a story that when, Wayne was still a boy in Lydis, a marshal whose name became stricken had committed the drunken rape of a woman he tentatively dated. Before even the Praetorians could hunt him down for the crime, his only Lydis brother's judge lynched him. They left his battered corpse to hang near Governor's Park where no person of Alphurs would deign to remove the body or investigate its circumstances. Everyone knew by common whisper just how the fallen marshal had come unto his fate. That disgraced marshal began to rot. The stink finally forced the Grand Purifier himself, the supreme head of decontamination services, to remove the body personally for necessity of the public health. He alone commanded the respect and station sufficient to put an end to the defrocking of that fully disgraced marshal without drawing reprisal. It was not lost on Critias that those were memories of a future past. It was his duty to make sure those standards began where he was, to arrive in the future as the service's uncompromising Bushido code of manly conduct. He wondered how he could even go home eventually without leaving his replacement. There was a grand marshal and fat jack, but he still needed his first loyal soldier of King's Law. The front hall was a barracks of sleeping pallets and ordered rows. A female guard cradled an assault rifle as she sat in their center on a one-legged stool to keep watch over everyone as they slept. Should she doze off herself, she would invariably fall over to reawaken. The woman waved a silent greeting as Critias crossed the near corner of sleepers to pass into the back hall. Hiram's grave walkers played poker at one long table. For gambling, they wagered all manner of small foray items from quality nail clippers and digital music gadgets to single cigarettes taken from packets that they had either found somewhere foraging or traded other items to attain. Roland called to him as he entered, Yo, my man Critias. Have you been listening to the GNP channel? He tapped a handheld field radio on the table before him. Roland had attuned to the GNP general station where they did their conversational semi-coded banter. Can't say that I have, Critias admitted. My radio has been in decontamination all night and I was otherwise occupied declaring martial law on the honeymoon missus. The patrol boys are telling some tall tales about you, Roland continued. They say that you called down the thunder from the sky like some Scandinavian lightning god, if you can believe that. He laughed, where's your hammer, Thor? His is probably in his pants, Amber said with a shake of her head in contempt for his befuddled storytelling, but yours is in your skull because you're as dumb as a whole bag of them. It wasn't Thor or Scandinavian. Jufus. It was Finnish from that GNP commander who was in charge at the garden building. Stig is his name. She added emphasis on, the handsome one with those big muscles, saying it just to irk him. Finland is a Scandinavian country, you frigid trollop, Roland cursed her, and if it wasn't Thor then who was it? Perkella, Critias offered. He remembered since he was there. It is their thunder god it seems. Aye, that's the name, Roland confirmed it. Stig says that you used a sky flare to call them all in on you until you were totally rat fucks around it. He had his men bringing up rockets to frag the whole place into next week's shit so that at least the biters wouldn't get to drag away your bodies to pick the bones for food. Stig saw you lean down to strike the deck with your boot blade or something like that. And it summoned down this big shoesam of super lightning right atop your head. The flash was like so bright that nobody could see and the thunder was so loud it was blowing the glass out of windows. When they could finally see again. You had bug zapped all those shriekers into deep fried monkey shit. A minute after that, they saw you and Bluebeard come strolling down the back ramp of some rusty striker APC just like you owned the damn place, like lovers he said, holding hands while taking a stroll through the park on a summer's Sunday. Critias laughed at the dramatization of the actual events, which in his mind were more foolish than heroic since he honestly hadn't been sure it would work at the time. In truth, 
he had operated on a flimsy unscientific stratagem that mostly hinged on the mythological assumption of destiny. Since fate had already decreed that he would eventually return home to his own time alive, it stood to reason that he wouldn't die if he deliberately called the lightning down onto a metal shell bunker like a perkella that they named him. That the word also meant damn more hell as a curse of amazement sort of tied it all together in a single exclamation. His real tragic flaw was that Carmen had followed him to the battle site at the risk of her internal technology shorting out or ending up magnetized in the electrical superstorm. Her foolish love for him had nearly cost them everything. In that instant, it struck him just how everything she had turned out to be. Critias loved Carmen that much. Carmen staggered in from the front hall with her hair crazy from bed. One of her ponytails remained mostly intact while the other had fallen loose. The buttons of her pajama top were one place out of sequence. She carried her bare and wore pink furry slippers on her feet as she shuffled into the back hall. Carmen appeared every bit worse for wear after a night of war drug enhanced sex than too little sleep afterward. That's just how it happened, cried T.S. cockily bragged euphemistically as a way to hide his true feelings from public review. I stood there with my dick in my hand, banged it once on the hatch cover before dropping inside to a booming thunderbolt that had Carmen thrashing in my arms thinking she was about to die. I am the one true god of thunder. Still unknown to Critias, Carmen stood behind him with her face in shocked disbelief. Based on his story she overheard out of context, Carmen exclaimed, You're telling everyone about what we did last night? She arrived only in time to hear his boasting without having heard any of the preceding conversation. In her confused state dominated by other more treasured memories, it sounded to her like he was telling everyone how he had seduced her that evening. Critias turned around to see his wife and had to smile in adoring amusement over her disheveled late night fucked silly appearance. You were there in my arms when it happened, he reminded her. Critias didn't comprehend at all why she would care about him talking about the battle in the swamp park since everyone already knew about it anyway. Stig and his garden building rifleman had told everyone in exaggerated detail as they extolled their prowess as being deific. There were no grounds for secrecy even if they hadn't seen it. Critias had video recorded the whole affair for Jim to review along with Fat Jack and all the captains. Her shocked reaction made no sense to him at all. In fact, he would have expected her to be proud of the whole issue since once again they were legendary heroes, him especially. Of course I was there in your arms, she railed at him in growing offense. How could I not have been? How can you be in here telling everyone about our most private moments? He shrugged at her since he didn't understand her concerns, isn't it true, at least in a manner of speaking? Anyway, what is so private about us making the fur fly? We're great at it and everyone wants to hear about the exciting parts. She unraveled by the second. You give me the greatest orgasm of my life with a single, she broke off too timid to say the word, you know of your, then still unable to say it, she pantomimed a quality imitation of her husband from a moment before, standing there holding your dick in your hand, one bang on her little anvil before slamming it home to make her think she will die from the thunderbolt. She dropped the loudish impersonation to return to her own persona, it's going to take a lot more than those twelve thunderbolts to make me start calling you god of thunder, mister. I'd never have let you teach me how to have them at all if I knew you were going to be frat boy taproom bragging about our lovemaking, if that is even what we have, you kiss and tell Cat Hamite. He could only grin at her self-destructing sleepy-headed confusion as he held out his arms for her to step into, come here, Carmen. You belong in bed, not wandering around. I didn't tell them anything about you, princess. We were talking about the fight outside when the lightning struck the tank electrocuting the ghouls. Carmen lacked the experience that allowed her to make rapid conversions of real-life events into whimsical similes. Her mind needed only a moment to compute out and then absorb the gravity of her confusion. She had told the room everything herself in the process of accusing him of having done it already. It was apparent to all when she finally understood because she blushed in abject mortification and then wanted to hide. Her only refuge was to bury her face in Critias's shoulder as he folded his arms around her. He had known what was coming and stood ready to shelter her. Roland was first to guffaw. The Thunder God story was more believable. I would sooner believe that Critias really could actually call down lightning strikes to save himself from a tribe of ghouls than believe he can ring Violet's bell with the first swing of his hammer. The total figure had more impact on Amber, enough that she asked for confirmation, did she say twelve? I'm sorry, Carmen whimpered into his chest, I've really gone and made a mess of things. Worse things could be said of me, Critias told her to be comforting. I think I'll survive the rumors. In reality, he could not be less offended over her humorous gaucherie. She had been in his thoughts at the time and so secretly he was glad she had arrived how and when she did. Having people romanticize him over battle was not altogether a good thing. While it gave people confidence in the overall mission, it also set an unreachable standard for those without his mech suit and advanced weaponry. 
some people might easily confuse such heroism with merit of leadership beyond the actual calling. Since he was the exception, Critias understood it was the enduring brotherhood that was important, not the individual glory. The danger lay in that for some of the more common persons, glory had the greater luster, for they had no comprehension that it was also fleeting and often fatal. Indeed, Carmen had changed the topic from war to love play, at least for the moment. What the community knew of her apart from her great beauty and exceptional range of skills, was her masochistic devotion to Critias. Her submissive fetish for being dominated by her lover had earned her the GNP call sign, Violet Wand, in reference to her colorful hair, and it also being the name of an electrotherapy device popular in bondage stimulation. Carmen also wore her emotions close to the cuff. They knew her as many things, but never duplicitous. Her unnecessary remorse and blushing embarrassment were enough to convince everyone she had spoken truthfully, much to furthering her husband's virile reputation. Amber had to rub a hand around the base of her neck to cool her fluster. When Roland witnessed the gesture, he told her, I could do twelve, maybe not in one blow, but I could do twelve. She eyed him in consideration of his boast, and then burst into laughter right in his face, You? Ah! You couldn't manage one, with Stig's help. She mocked him with more laughter. He didn't hesitate to press her with, Wanna bet? They stared at each other to read the moment, and then Amber used her arm to swipe all her gambling loot into a basket of her blouse. Roland did the same with his treasure, and then they dashed off for a friendlier contest that required some privacy, and preferably but not necessarily a mattress. The back hall of the castle was roughly as spacious as the front one only less regular in shape. The officers gathered at the captain's table on the back westernmost side nearest the kitchen. Critias escorted Carmen across the room to sit her down there and then he summoned one of the kitchen assistants to bring her some food. I'm not hungry, she complained. I'm just tired. You'll eat because I wish it, he told her conversationally. If you're tired, why did you leave your bed? Did they run you out of it? Carmen leaned against him from her adjacent seat. No, they don't bother me. You've changed your mind about keeping them at a discreet distance. Do you want to keep them? Both of them were snoring before they had even warmed their pillows. It is as if they haven't had any real rest in weeks. Yes, we're keeping them, Critias said with a twinge of concern that Carmen hadn't come to the conclusion herself only sooner than he had. In Critias's opinion, women were supposed to be sensitive about that kind of thing. Carmen noticed his reservation. Have I been ignorant again? He confessed. I believe that I should have stepped up to help them when Alice first came to me back in Denver. I assume you had considered it, but then you never brought it up with me. She shook her head no, I was under the impression that those women made you uncomfortable and that you wanted me to keep them as far away from you as possible. Somewhat thoughtlessly, Critias was blunt, I think that a woman without the maternal instinct to protect a child in need is not worth the rope needed to hang her. I want you to scan through your books to put some thought into the concept. Simply put, we are going to do the right thing for the girls whatever adjustments we need to make. As far as being sleepy goes, I doubt they have had a full night's sleep without worry in many years. Carmen had a fascination with sleep, that did garner some sympathy from her. She did somewhat understand the sublime importance of it to one's emotional well-being. Critias explained, when you're not in a safe place, sleep only comes in short shallow doses. You can't really sleep because some nervous part of you is always wary that a loud confrontational thump can come at any moment. That has never happened to you yet, so I don't think you can appreciate how unsettling it is. His explanation made Carmen think of one of her own experiences. Is that why you keep telling me to watch out for booby traps? Do people place traps so that they can have the security they need to sleep properly? Yes, exactly, he agreed that she understood that lesson he had tried to impress upon her. Critias added, people can sleep better when surrounded by booby traps, they give you that increase in confidence so you can really sleep a couple of hours. That's why checking for trip wires is important if you think anyone was using a place as a sleeping shelter. Those girls must think of you as their ultimate sleeping defense system. You're their big hero from Denver, if you didn't know. Alice says that you chopped off the arm from some pig piece of shit named Rupert and then you shot him in the liver so that he died like he deserved. It seems that Rupert had been less than kind to them at some stage of the Denver debacle or more likely for a large portion of it. Alice convinced Mandy that you had killed Rupert specifically in her honor, telling him so before he died. That meant a lot to her, to Mandy I mean. His explanation inspired Critias onto a way that he could impress upon Carmen what he wanted from her. Alice and Mandy see in you a lot of like what you see in me. They will feel like you would feel if in return I didn't care about your feelings, you know, like you were only a nuisance to me and I just wanted you to go away. I never knew his name was Rupert, Carmen admitted in such a way as to confirm that the rest of the story was true enough. 
they were evil men who deserved punishment for their ghoulish crimes. She looked at him apologetically, I had your permission to kill very wicked men at the time. Now that I can look back at it, I think I should have only incapacitated them, so Jim could have passed judgment on them. Your pride in me will diminish if you perceive me as a sadistic executioner. It bothered her in a strange way she had yet to resolve. As to the matter of Mandy and her hero worship, Carmen had never actually seen it, so she didn't have any special feeling about it. Critias had only pride for her performance on that occasion, you did only what I asked of you on my behalf as well as others. Everyone is proud of you over that great day. If that's true, she asked, why has no one ever thanked me for the killings? They're grateful for their rescue and I could have accomplished that by taking the men captive. As you and Jim explained it to me, the mob dynamic bloodlust that they demonstrated was understandable and that they wanted and deserved their revenge, but it was inappropriate of me to feed their appetite for it. If I had taken them alive, you would not think of me as a man killer and the women would have gotten their revenge anyway, only in a more appropriate way. In more than a little way, Carmen was correct, but Critias brushed it off as unhelpful talk, speak no more of that and tell me why you're out of bed if you're tired and not hungry. Carmen sighed, Kevin told me that I needed to be here too, that the meeting would also be important to me. She leaned into him, it's not fair, master. Whenever we're happy, whenever we can finally sleep and I get to hold you, they call you away. It's always something. Carmen gazed on him wanting a solution. Is this what you mean about the girls? They can't lay down their heads in peace without someone coming along and taking the moment away, because that is how I feel and I'm tired of it. A cook's assistant brought a tray with some dinner. Critias placed it before Carmen. It's not much and I want you to finish it. You eat like a bird and I have to wonder if the way you starve yourself is bad for you, and don't bother telling me how efficient your metabolism is or that you nourish yourself from sunshine because you don't see much of that either. She winked a naughty expression at him as she picked up her spoon. Your greedy little bluebird always swallows, doesn't she? Those that had gathered already at the captain's table were Jack, George with his crew, and Colonel Davis. Henry and Gloria just arrived to take their seats too. Now eat your supper, Critias insisted, before I make your bony titania mass into a bicycle. She scooped down a large spoonful of rehydrated porridge and then said, My titanium mass is not bony. And don't talk with your mouth full he instructed as he offered a napkin. You're my wife, not queen of the barbarians. That happens to be my wife's honor to have that title, Jim spoke of Queen Jessica as they arrived together. Jessica kissed his cheek not wanting to part as Jim continued to the end of the table while Jessica sat beside her father and crew captain, the Colonel Hiram Davis. The men were quick to stand to be mannerly as the queen took her seat. Once comfortable, Jim said, I would have been here sooner but the tunneling operation for the new light rail access has been proving more resource intensive than our first projections had predicted. I think the major problems are resolved at this point, perhaps they will have it operational this week. Critias realized it was improbable that Jim would come out to the castle without an especially important reason. It meant he had to leave command of the main city in the hands of some subordinate. With Fat Jack and Colonel Davis already present along with all the heavy hitters of ghoul fighting. Jim had left the main city poorly defended and in the hands of a lesser authority, presumably Sally, Bob, or Kevin, all the while Jingle Bells still crept around with the hope to destroy them somehow. As to that, Critias guessed that the bell ringer had to be running short on trained minions considering how many of them they had already slaughtered. A minor meeting of the captains that Jim could have easily attended by radio or some other form of teleconference was insufficient reason for him to relocate. Since Critias had encountered those two new watchers and also Jingle Bells was a recurring primary threat, he guessed what might be serious enough to bring Jim over for a face-to-face -face confrontation. To test the waters, Critias asked Jim, how did you get here? I went to pick him up in one of our new striker infantry carrier vehicles, Jack answered. The mechanics gave the best one a complete checkup and I used it to take some of the supplies George collected back to the city. Alfred is in charge of tunneling the depot over there and he had a mess of problems with his electric jackhammers breaking down on that last century iron hard concrete. George brought us some brand new ones back from the hardware super center. They're quality Japanese heavy industries models. That doesn't explain why he came back with you, Critias told Jack. Is there something big going on here that I do or don't know about? You mentioned that you were going to watch those recordings I took inside the hotel. If I'm in trouble for screwing that up. I'd rather you didn't keep me in suspense. Both and neither, Jim answered for himself. Everyone tells me something of what they know. I don't tell anyone everything that I know. We will get to all that later. For now, I want to hear from George. Tell me what is still back at the hardware store you busted into and what you need for going back to take the rest of it. 
George explained from his seat with half his supper still on a plate before him, it's a rare deal, Jim, just like Kevin's satellite overshots predicted. Some survivors were in there from day one. Maybe they went for supplies only to get stuck inside. Either way, they barricaded the place up with chain-link fencing and strong lumber from the yard there. Andy did an ass back onto a clean wall facing an open parking lot. We plasma torched our way through the outer wall and then locked ourselves on with a winch dock. While we did a quick bug hunt, we saw that the place was really cherry. The details are unfit for saying before these ladies. But the first people there didn't last long before turning on each other over what little food they had. After a thorough policing of the entire barricade with a couple minor repairs, we hot-wired the propane forklifts, appropriated some garden department wagons, and then went shopping. The place has a cargo truck ramp and strong walls. They have plenty of shipping pallets, so we stacked all the loose stuff up, shrink-wrapped it into cubes, and then fork-trucked those into Big Joe. All in all, it was a ladies' day out. I'd say we could get six more loads of stuff worth the labor, after that it would be a lot of junk. The time my crew could spend on the jetsam would make much better profit hitting new places. Jim listened to it all thoughtfully before asking, could you back up more trailers to the other truck gates, load them all on the same trip? Absolutely, Andy confirmed as their cruise driver. We pot riveted over the hole we made docking in. We own plenty of empty trailers parked around from previous adventures. The labor for all of that loading would be something else. We could use a couple guys at least just for the wrapping and another to run the fork. Loading up the pallets for shipping is backbreaking and time-consuming. With that confirmation, Jim turned to Fat Jack, send them back tomorrow night. We'll give that place one more spin, then leave it locked up for later days if ever. Send a night vision digital camera along, they can shoot some video of the place just in case we ever need anything else from there. They need at least two extra hands, even six if you can manage it. Ask my lion if he can drive a forklift again. Crytea said he was a steady hand when they moved that copper pipe with one. By the sound of the place, short of the roof caving in, the men could work all night for hazardous duty credit without even seeing any ghouls, much less earning their kudos for having to run from them. Ask around for volunteers from guard and patrol, see if any of them are feeling bold enough to step up a notch. Jack took the notes even while he listened. With that taken care of, Jim looked to his wife's father, how goes the light rail, Colonel Davis? Hiram reported, we salvaged two new rail cars of the superior model that were in excellent condition, parked them out past the East Airport crossroads. If we don't run into any unforeseen bad luck, we can have one of the railways cleared to the West Airport with one more day's labor, two on the outside. Until we get a chance for actually exploring the west end of the tracks, I have no way of knowing if there is any kind of troublesome jam up or derailment out there that would be a serious delay. If our track were foo barred for some reason, we would have to back up and then clear the tandem instead. Jim wasn't worried about that, Kevin has taken a satellite survey of the light rail course and assured me there were no signs of derailments, major fires, or anything of that nature. We can expect the rest will be much the same as you are familiar with already. As far as that tandem track is concerned, we will definitely clear that at some point. Two will be more than twice as useful as one, especially when the time comes that they will need to support one another. That, being the case, the colonel continued, so far, We've been lucky that none of the transports has been a bloody massacre scene. The quality cars we saved for future use were all surprisingly clean in their interiors. Aside from that, Commander Derek's inflatable barrier bags are proving extremely useful. If he is waiting for a captain's recommendation before making more, you can include mine. I rate them as most excellent. That is more good news, Jim praised the effort. It will all come together nicely once Alfred has the city side depot in good order. Let's go ahead and give your operation a second day as well. He looked to Jack, talked to Derek about getting more of his inflatable barriers. In fact, have him talk to our Colonel Davis as well. Perhaps they could collaborate on some improvements since Derek has never actually seen them applied in the field. After giving Jack a moment to make notes, Jim asked him, what is the potential of the new building next door? What are you calling it now, Radio City? Jack nodded that the name was sticking, the place has more ups than downs. It has upper floor access into the adjacent hotel. While the hotel is quite dangerous and extremely contaminated, it has a treasure trove of biological contamination management supplies and other emergency medical materials. The feds were in there during last days setting up some kind of medical rescue station. It has bagged mattresses and steel bed rails for welder construction use. I suspect it will also have a stockpile storage tank of chlorine for their general purposes that we will be taking. From what we saw, it appears that special police unit survivors barricaded off the upper floors of Radio City from the 9th upward. Those levels are all pretty clean and totally habitable. 
The lower stories are a shot up body farm, but they do have concrete floors. Those will be hot areas until they get extensive cleaning. In the short term, the best we could do is corpse removal. The elevators are functional. There's a Bloom style emergency electrical generator on the top floor that gets its fuel from the same natural gas supply we already tapped into for the community service. From the GPS readings we took, it seems very favorable on us cutting down from the basement into the old railway passage the same as we did for the garden building. The parking garage has excellent street access. Their television crew vans have onboard lithium backup power cells that will be useful for our own vehicles. In total, the place is a real gold mine. The shoulder up busts of Kevin and Bob appeared on the biggest video flat screen that faced the table. Presumably, they sat beside one another in chairs before a live feed camera. They were fully interactive, with their own camera that watched the captain's table. They could interact with the conversation as casually as when they sat with them at the board. Welcome, gentlemen, Jim greeted them magnanimously, he even stood up from his seat to do so, with some added arm gestures. It was a king's welcome that clearly bestowed a community decree of honor only received by the most favored. To their credit, Bob and Kevin were inordinately smart and more than essential to everyone's interests. Jim continued, I'm sure Kevin has been paying attention from his end thus far and is fully briefed to the moment and more. Please give us your analysts' observations and overview of the Radio City operation so that we can all say we are fully up to speed. Kevin said, I am about to show you movie recordings made by the Milk Wagon crew on their mission. Most of this footage and audio comes from the high-quality recorders built into the helmet of our very brave but sometimes reckless Captain Critias. I offer congratulations and I think I speak for all of us when I say I am pleased you did not get yourself killed this evening, dick in hand as you say. Carmen blushed as the origin of the phrase that had led her astray made itself known. The genuine words flattered Critias, respecting Kevin as he did. Your munitions calculations were spot on of course, Critias complimented Kevin back. When I had to rodeo that wagon, just for a moment I wasn't sure I was going to get my 8 seconds. It couldn't have worked out more perfectly and I never could have done it without your help. There is something I would like to see again, that will also make explaining easier that I'm not a thunder god. Except maybe in bed, Carmen tells us, Queen Jessica jibed him with a quick comeback that made first her then many smirk, she had heard Carmen's revelations while she sat down at the poker table with the other grave walkers. Carmen still blushed over her mistake. So long as she thinks so, Critias knocked on wood. Kevin. Show the gals in disaster so everyone can see the inspiration. I believe that would be premature at the moment, Kevin delayed the request. We will come to it however. For mission video, Kevin played footage from Critias as visor, Carmen's own prosthetic wireless weapon interface eyes, their gun cameras, another inter-officer's grade by staff, and some more attached to the milk wagon. An exterior security camera picked them up as they left the maintenance shack above the castle's cooling towers. Kevin showed brief location shots so that the audience understood where they were going. As the movie showed Carmen scare away a group of infected while Critias opened the side door, Kevin stilled the image on the frightened face of a male infected. The motionless cell of image was in sharp detail. It revealed that the creature was strikingly handsome despite some recent flamethrower burns. When one had time to admire a ghoul, they were generally supremely physically fit and graceful athletes. In that rare case, an infected showed an expression of fright over impending suffering. When they heard Carmen's voice, Kevin explained, they believed she was someone else they already know, someone they're afraid of, a female watcher. Displeasured grumbles went around the table at that troubling news. Kevin displayed more footage until Fat Jack sent Critias down into the basement of the hotel to disable the emergency cutoff to the gas line. As Critias walked down the hotel hallway with the oil painting, surveying the carnage, Carmen stood from her seat having seen something too terrible to believe. Stop it there, Kevin. She told him in a panic as she pointed. Look at that one there. I only discovered that discrepancy after some lengthy comparative study, Kevin praised her perceptions. He stopped the movie to a still single well-focused image and then said, Notice this headshot ghoul in the upper right-hand corner, this one wearing the police insignia bullet retardant vest. In night vision, it likely appears to everyone as just another incapacitated ghoul, only it isn't. He continued the movie to play through the grim exploration of the children's marg with the hanged nurse. As Critias exited that room to return to the main hallway, that toy bear in his hand, the body with the insignia vest was no longer on the floor where it had been before. It was simply gone. Kevin stilled the image again, that headshot ghoul has gotten up and left while Critias was in the other room. That clever bitch, Malcolm declared. She knows she can play dead in a pile of corpses. When was the last time that any of us re-headshot every ghoul in a meat pile we passed by? 
Fajak said, I've never heard of anyone second shooting the meat piles. I wouldn't have considered doing it and neither would anyone else. Carmen gave Critias a desperate look, there was another watcher and that was her? She was watching you and following you? Why didn't you tell me? Did she try to hurt you? Did you kill her? What happened? Critias replied, you'll see soon enough. He gently ushered her back into her seat, this is the first time I've seen that myself. I never knew that was her when I passed her in the hallway, not until seeing it now. I don't normally walk about using thermal imaging because it doesn't show anything but active meat. If I had checked for heat, I don't doubt that she would have showed up as warm-blooded. The video continued with Critias as he went down to clean the garage of crawlers. His conversation with the mysterious watcher woman had everyone in a serious mood. As the male watcher whispered to the female, Kevin paused on a specially enhanced single frame that crudely showed the male as the one who held the flashlight. There are two of them, Kevin confirmed. Based on their interactions, I believe these two are companions and she is the leader. He carries no weapons that we can see, so perhaps if we're lucky, he is not combative. Verloc in the movie asked, did you set aside this stuffed toy to give to her? Just how romantic a fool in love are you, Mr. Critias? Carmen nearly swooned over the romantic gesture. She leaned on Critias and then kissed his neck, did you hold on to that the whole time just so you could bring it home to me? Carmen picked up the bear from the empty seat to her left and then embraced it covetously. After they had played out their banter, Kevin paused to an enhanced still image that showed the flashlight as it tumbled in flight. Kevin captured an ideal instant that with patience to study the photo of a millisecond, one could make out a humanoid figure that held a large handgun and also a mirror torn from a bathroom vanity cabinet. The person that studied Critias in the reflection of the mirror, remained safely covered from his possible attack by a cement support pillar. In the same moment, Critias had locked the sight of his pistol on what he believed to be the head of his opponent. The colored kinetic graphic of his finger pressure on the trigger surged up to fierce orange, but then steadied there without him taking the shot. Jim told Critias, you were right not to have tried killing her. It would have killed her reflection in the mirror she was holding and then we would have an enemy infinitely more dangerous than Jingle Bells looking for revenge. Carmen snarled, that bitch thinks she can threaten my man and get away with it? She has another thing coming. That is whom you were calling out to on the way home. We should have gone in after them right then, taken them both out inside that hotel. You would have been wrong to try, Jim told her. We don't know anything about her other than she is clever and likely has been living in this city as long as we have. She never came after us before and I heard nothing in what she said to indicate she wants to start now. By all indications, she was offering to help Critias survive Jingle Bells. Gloria said, it doesn't seem to me that she even knows what she is. She sounds like a crazy. I suspect that she is insane, Bob seconded the observation. All the evidence so far seems to indicate that whatever the circumstances are that makes watchers, it doesn't leave their brains with a firm hold on sanity. Jim spoke up, before we concern ourselves with what to do about this new competition, I would like to remind you all that I ask you to feed the populace, not to manufacture warring vendettas unnecessarily. That position made Carmen growl with displeasure. She would much prefer going after the strange woman to eliminate her. I'm sure you're a wealth of wise quotations on the vice of vengeance, Jim told Carmen. You of all people should know that it isn't something to enter into so lightly. It is best served cold, Carmen replied to make it something in her favor. Kevin paraphrased Moby Dick to make the point, we came here to hunt for supplies not for making war on the insane locals who act out of blind instinct. With that in mind, how many full bellies would your vengeance yield? Carmen, remained unchanged. She had heard the watcher cock her weapon in the stairwell, even then, the witch had considered making her move to kill her husband. She answered, full bellies are not my measure. It will fetch me a great premium, here. She tapped over her heart as Ahab would have done. She threatened Critias, either in deed or by implication, making her an enemy of mine. Colonel Davis offered up the Chinese proverb, he who seeks vengeance must dig two graves, one for his enemy and one for himself. Critias said in his turn, I have a poor memory for the exact words of my schoolboy lessons, but I have a great recollection for the lessons themselves. In so many words, Machiavelli said, never wound what you can't kill. The wounded take their vengeance in turn. When I act, it will be decisively where no reprisal will ever be forthcoming. No one was there but me, so she offered offense to no one but me, and I took none. She could have dealt with me far less amiably and I did not stay my trigger for doubt of the kill, for at the time I felt confident enough, even though now I see it was another of her clever tricks. I didn't shoot because there was no justice in it. This is all very educational, said George, but what is the verdict on this policewoman? If she knows how to use guns and cunning strategy, 
What happens if she decides to come after us? All she would need is a sniper rifle to have us completely by the balls. She finds some kind of military rocket and she might just blow us out of our holes. Critias glanced over to his left to see Mandy and Alice approaching along the outer wall. Alice had fully dressed into her work clothes and had Carmen's sword held over one shoulder. Mandy was not only still in her sleeping pajamas, but she also carried her blanket like she planned to get back to it when the opportunity presented itself. They stopped at a polite distance after Critias noticed them and then they waited there. Jim noticed too, prompting him to ask Critias, how are your new assistants working out? They are great kids with a lot of heart, Critias answered as he got up. Carmen and I are adopting them. I don't know how long it will be before we have to leave to take those samples back to where we came from, but until then we will be responsible parents. He got up to go speak with them. Excuse me for a moment. After he walked over, Critias asked the girls, Is something wrong? Mandy stood blurry-eyed from her intermission in sleep when she asked him, Was Carmen angry about me sleeping in her bed, sir? Mandy assumed she had driven Carmen away. That's not it at all, he answered sweetly. Carmen has bad dreams. She told me that she wonders if people think of her as a murderer in some way because she punished those men in Denver so harshly. There was a man named Rupert there. She sliced off his arm and then shot him in the belly while he was down to make him die like a thirsty dog. She made those other villains pay for their crimes too. Carmen finds killing people ugly and told me that no one ever thanked her for it, so it must have been wrong of her. The idea so offended Mandy's reasoning that it seemed unbelievable. Rupert and those others deserved everything they got and the same forever under the fork of the devil. We know that, Critias agreed with her. Carmen doesn't believe me. If you go over there and tell her what she did to Rupert was a good thing only to be proud of, I'm sure she would feel better. Mandy held back tears as she asked, She really did do that for me? Without any need to wait for an answer, Mandy went over to speak with Carmen directly. She had to tell her hero that she had truly done the greatest thing in Mandy's life ever. Once she was gone, Critias looked to Alice, What's your story? As your assistant, my place is assisting you. Sir, was her simple answer. Alice displayed master cunning as she subtly moved her shirt to show him that she had Carmen's Tesla Flux pistol. Carmen had left the room unarmed in her muzzy state. Going around unarmed was technically a punishable offense even though it shouldn't really apply to Carmen since she was supremely deadly under all circumstances. In any case, Alice intended to get Carmen her weapon and thus prevent any issue from ever arising. True enough, he accepted her reasoning as a covert agreement with her pistol plan. You can't sit at the table. But you can pull up a chair just behind me. No one would complain about that. You have to start learning the family business somehow. When Mandy arrived, Carmen saw that she was emotional, so she asked, What's the matter, sweetheart? Mandy blurted out, Rupert was a terrible man who did the most awful things, and you killing him the way you did was the best thing ever. It's the nicest thing anyone ever did for me and you should never feel bad about killing people like that. Nobody ever deserved it like they did, and I'm sorry if I made you get up and leave. The gratitude washed away any doubts Carmen had about being an executioner, thank you for telling me so. When I left to come here, it was nothing like that at all. Kevin called me on the radio to tell me that he wanted me to be at this meeting. She handed the girl her toy bear. I can watch everything fine from over there, she glanced toward the nearby long couch that the captains sometimes used when they watched videos on the large screens nearby. Carmen got up taking the girl's hand, you can stay with me until we go back to our own room. With that said, Carmen walked them over to the couch where she stretched out and then pulled down Mandy to sleep in front of her while she still held her stuffed animal. In the back of her mind, Carmen's combat computer games were still trying to process through her conundrum about why Critias found her to be ignorant about various subtle things. He had only just recently given her the directive that she should cultivate a strong maternal instinct, a protective love for all children as would befit the feminine wife of a great marshal. Critias had also explained to her that what Mandy wanted was really much the same as what Carmen wanted from Critias. To have loving acceptance returned by some great personage that you admired above all others was a glorious joy when received, but an aching hollow pain when denied. Carmen would not neglect Mandy's hero worship, instead, she would revel in it. Critias returned to his seat with Alice. As she went to get an extra chair that she could pull up to join him, Alice used that opportunity to slip Carmen her pistol in such a way that no one cared enough to notice. With that out of the way, she went to sit with Critias. When they were comfortable, Jim told Alice, Critias tells me that he and Carmen want to adopt you for the time being, be your chaperones as it were. What do you think about that? After a glance over at how content Mandy was, Alice answered, I think that is just what Mandy would like more than anything. He asked, but not you? 
I don't think anyone really cares what I want, sir, Alice answered in a cold tone. It seems that I am the outcast of the city as the only person cheated of equal law. Jim didn't know what to make of her argument, how am I cheating you then? She asked, may I speak freely? Please do, Jim agreed only more curious. What's mine is mine, Alice spoke the law. By what right do you deny me that? I haven't taken anything from you, Jim replied. Yes you have, Alice shot back. What are you supposedly protecting me from? Do you think you can preserve my childhood innocence? I think everyone here knows all about my past, so we can dismiss that reason. Are you thinking you can shelter me from the cruelties of men? I suspect I know more of such things than you do. Are you saving me for a future husband? Who might that be? Am I to be part of your harem? There are no boys around near my age. Do you want me to wait for one of the toddlers to grow up into a man? Or maybe you will be handing me over to a husband of more than twice my age. Now that our two groups have joined into one, are you not plotting against me? By the time that I meet your age requirement, all the men that women desire will be long gone in the arms of others. What chance is there that Captain Banjo will still be single and want anything to do with me, when the likes of Nadia or the other talented beautiful women flock around him? Jim considered before he answered, the odds that Tony Banjo is still unmarried and willing to take you to bed when you are of age is as close to any certainty that I would ever want to wager on. He is not the sort to marry, while he very much is the sort to take you to his bed. How long you might be staying there is another matter. I assume it would be an intermittent luxury at best. As you say of other men taking wives before you have your chance at them, I'm sorry to say that you are likely correct. Yes, you will likely end up marrying a man twice your age or waiting for one of the toddlers to grow up. You certainly will not be joining my harem since I will never have such a thing. Jim gestured with his arms to say it was all beyond his control, it appears to me, when you say, what is mine is mine, you are speaking of your freedom to choose who you sleep with. Did you have someone in mind if I were to say yes to you here and now? Yes, sir, Alice said as she stood up to make her declaration. I want permission to give myself to Captain Critias. You can't be serious, Jim dismissed her idea casually. Of course I'm serious, she snapped over the insult. Surely you don't think I'm the only woman here who has been thinking the same thing. Why shouldn't I want him? He is brave and handsome. Doesn't Carmen sing his praises with her every breath? Are you suggesting that he would treat me badly? that he would take advantage of me? I am no stranger to the company of men and I have yet to enjoy a single one of them. I really want Critias and I have never wanted anyone before. She looked to Critias for the first time since undertaking the matter, I would be faithful to you and listen to what you say. Before you refuse me, I know that Carmen will always be first in your heart and I don't even care. I'll be a lesser wife, or your concubine like the president used to call us, anything you wish. Make me nothing at all and only let me stay with you and be with you. I have a life too and what you're all planning for me against my will is that I live, in rejected misery while everyone else is free to find happiness where they can. Life is not worth living by simply being alive. If there is nothing more for me here than what our king has said so far, then I'm not sure I want to live any more at all. Please say you want me to, then it won't matter what anyone else says. Critias knew it would never happen, so his thoughts and emotions never bothered to linger upon the matter. He still had other interests in Alice that were even more important than her silly romantic fantasy. She couldn't possibly know him well enough to love him. He also thought it both obvious and understandable that she might think she did simply because he was a pretty swell guy that showed her some kindness for the first time in her tragic life. Critias knew he had to be cautious about how he phrased his refusal because if he offended Alice, that wound could easily drive her entirely out of his influence. Critias told Jim, I think she makes some sound arguments. If the only thing we are protecting her from is how we feel about her living as an adult, maybe we are cheating her. What's hers is hers is the law. Ridiculous, Jim replied. He looked to Alice, it doesn't matter what Critias says. It is not his decision. It's mine. I am king and he is not. For the moment, Alice retorted. He is the hero around here, not you, and I'm not the only person thinking it. Hatchet reached for his pistol holster, but Malcolm beat him to the punch. He pulled his own gun and then pointed it at Hatchet. Malcolm warned him seriously, think twice. You're not shooting any kid while I'm around and you won't live long enough to point that in my direction either. Jim waved for Hatchet to calm down and then he calmed Malcolm with an uncompromising glance. Once both men disarmed themselves, Jim told everyone, let's assume I clutch my chest this very moment and drop over dead. Who is next in line to be king? Fat Jack, George answered. Jim looked to Jack, you want the job? Jack had to laugh as if it was a joke, 
I already live all 24 hours in the day. When would I find time to do more than I'm already doing? I have precious little free time as it is. Give it to Bob. Bob was still on the video screen and the notion made him uncomfortable, I have all my work occupying my time. I don't see how I could drop everything to be king. Critias is new around here, but if he wants it, he should have it. Critias readily shook his head no, Carmen is already in tears at night that we can't have time to ourselves on a single day without you summoning us from our bed. If I had that much more responsibility, it would break her heart, I already give more of myself than I have to spare. Colonel Davis proved himself in my estimation to be the only man here worthy of taking over the crown of a king, just as he proved himself as the only man worthy to honorably depose one as he already has. He has the kind of unshakable principles and command experience to be successful at it. Hiram gets my vote and I'd be honored to follow him. There you have it, Jim told Alice. No one sane would want to be king. He looked to Critias, you asked why I came here tonight. You were wondering if I was going to be angry with you for not making an all-out war on this new watcher you encountered, or you wondered if I was going to command that we undertake such an operation immediately. The truth is that I came here to be with my wife, your queen. It is rare that two hours pass without some unwelcome interruption. You just explained yourself how taxing it is on your marriage to be so constantly in demand. Well, I can tell you from experience that it is even more difficult for me. In the short time I have known Jessica, I have, well, Suffice to say she means a great deal to me, as does her company. Alice said, while it is my fate to be a leper here, unloved, not meaning a great deal to anyone at all, biding my time before I undertake my marriage of convenience when I am of such an age that the community feels comfortable being rid of me. She, remained strong and kept her emotions contained, I apologize if I offended anyone in the heat of the moment. It wasn't my place to question who is king. Critias is already that to me and it just came out. Alice sat back in her chair to gaze down at her knees. Everyone stared at Critias since they felt enthralled as to what he would say next as it was all very dramatic. Critias glanced over to see that Carmen stared at him too. As he watched her, she made a subtle smirk with a wink. Carmen knew that Critias would never marry Alice, that issue wasn't even great enough for her to consider. She found it all quite romantic though, and more than a little amusing. Carmen liked to see Critias in the hot seat. To Critias. Carmen's whimsical attitude seemed like she dared him to make a raise on her. Critias told everyone, I think after this, we can all agree that Alice is capable of demanding her rights as an adult. She is old enough to argue her case before the captain's table and make a good show of it as well. He turned in his seat to face Alice to tell her, look at me. When she did, he said, if on your 16th birthday I am still alive and here for you to still want, I will marry you. Alice's face lit up with the happiness of an impossible dream come true. But, Critias challenged her, not until your 16th birthday and not a day sooner. Until then, you will not kiss me, have marital relations with me, and not practice doing any of those things. If you can't prove that you love me as a friend first, say so now and we can put this matter to rest. Before you consider arguing with me or attempting some renegotiation, I swear an oath on my honor before king and captains all that I will not take you to my bed in that way any sooner or under any circumstance be it choice or faulty passions. Since her 16th birthday would not be soon, Critias felt certain that he and Carmen would have already returned home before then. Until he did leave, Alice could have her adulthood, preserve her celibacy, and still stay with them just as he had already planned. If nothing else, he felt sure he could talk her out of the impulsive idea later rather than never. Alice asked him hopefully, would it be permissible for us to hold hands sometimes? Carmen made an audible chirp as she tried to choke back her emotion over the adorable scene. She had the extra confidence that came from the knowledge that the Watcher woman had the same chance of getting to marry her husband that Alice did. Critias was hers and no other woman would ever get between them. The darkest selfish jealousy filled Carmen's heart on that issue and it was lethal if need be. Yes, Critias agreed to those terms. If the king will grant you his special dispensation for an arranged marriage when you come of age, you can live, in my home as my ward until such a time and you also decide that you still want to go through with it. We can even hold hands if that would ease your loneliness as the forsaken leper of Forger's castle. Alice jumped from her chair to kneel before Jim's seat. Please, sir, say yes. I'll do anything, work, study, anything at all. I love Critias and I want to be his. Now everyone stared at Jim as they waited for his word that would destroy the poor girl or concede to her request. Jim looked to Critias, are you absolutely certain about this? When Critias nodded that he was prepared to go through with it. Jim called Carmen, what do you have to say? She is the feisty little minx, Carmen chuckled. Critias is a great man and a splendid husband. 
while I do not want to go out of my way to share him, I already do it daily for the good of the community. There are more women here than men, so if good men don't take more than one wife as a matter of masculine duty, many ladies will end up homeless and abandoned as Alice already feels she is. If this is what Critias wants, I will stand by him as his devoted wife. Her 16th birthday is many months away. That is time enough for us to learn to love one another as a family. Jim asked Alice, Do you agree to all his terms, to the letter? I do, Alice quickly answered. I grant you this arrangement and nothing more, Jim decreed. You are not free to sleep with anyone you please until you come of age, and anyone who does have you will suffer the full wrath of their king. If it is within your wiles to seduce him before the allotted day, I promise you that no good shall come from it. Regardless of what I do to either of you over such an occurrence, I promise you that I will have the guards see to it that the two of you never occupy the same room ever again, not even fun land. You would come to find seeing him pass at a far distance as a rare luxury. Do you understand me? I understand, sir, Alice pledged. On my honor as his future wife, I promise to prove myself a woman worthy of such a knight. Don't disappoint me, Jim warned her, and you still have all your previous work duties, plus I assume more since you want to play house too. I won't be playing, sir. Alice said before she shot a smile to Critias in celebration of her victory. Anyone else likely would have overlooked her secondary glance over to Carmen, where they shared the slyest of conspiratorial winks. In that instant, Critias realized that their sisterhood of conspiracy went deeper than when Alice coached Carmen in how to seduce him out of his anger with her. Critias' theatric bluff while in the garage tunnel that he would set fire to Carmen's ass with a belt had inadvertently provided Alice the theme they used to work his nerves. For her part, Carmen had coached Alice in the proper style of tactical argument that she could use to position herself for getting one over on the king and himself by association. It even explained how Alice knew what a leper even was. They had fast become thick as thieves and Critias couldn't say he disliked it. Alice was on track to become a truly formidable forager, one that could get the goods by hook or crook. Failure was not in her inventory. Alice returned to her seat to sit quietly as before where she rested Carmen's sword securely across her thighs, only with a more self-assured posture. Back in Denver, Alice had tried to get Critias to be her protector only she had failed. She had failed again when she tried the same thing, only more desperately, to get the protection of that young guard who she still thought was kind of cute. With Carmen's help, Alice had used legal debate to win what she could never have attained through less reputable methods. With that business out of the way, Kevin continued, this next footage leads up to the skirmish in the park grounds. He showed the car alarm going off after the flashlight struck the rear window followed by Critias's exit up the stairs into the lobby. After his brief shooting spree and exit through the window, the battle steadily increased in severity amidst the numerous flares and tremendous noise of both storm and howling infected. When Carmen appeared at a hotel window and then hurled a ghoul through the pane of reinforced glass, Kevin paused on that image taken by Critias's visor. As Jack had mentioned earlier, the resolution of Critias's cameras was nothing short of extraordinary. The male android continued to zoom as he focused upon a different hotel window that was slightly higher up and to the right. Even from so far away, Critias's mech suit helmet had captured everything in clear focus. Kevin showed everyone the detailed picture of Verloc and Romeo as they stood at that window and watched the battle take place. They sure live up to their names, Critias meant ghouls who like to watch. Presumably, Kevin reasoned. If they had wanted to interfere or cause you any extra difficulties, they could have. For now, they seem content to merely observe without further interference. Carmen made a fine show of herself as she orated Wagner while she battled her way to her husband's side. Lady Carmen is fearless, Alice whispered to Critias both in truth and in wanting to be supportive. I wish I was a great ghoul fighter like her. In time you will be, Critias pledged not as a boast, but from his calm predetermination. Your training will begin right away. I hope you're ready for that study and hard work you just promised. Alice just sat up straight in attentive silence as proof that she was ready. The viewing audience sat spellbound as they watched the battle unfold. Kevin included radio traffic from the guard patrol to highlight the suspense. Malcolm asked Critias, you carried that damn bear the whole time? The policewoman was right, you are a romantic fool. So it seems, Critias didn't disagree. The disappointment he set up Alice to take when he eventually went home gave him some uncomfortable doubts. Critias couldn't be sure of course, but it seemed likely he would abandon her broken-hearted when he went away, returning her to the same circumstances she complained was her unfair fate already. Perhaps she would even think him a dishonorable fraud for having made a promise to her that he knew he had no intention of ever keeping. He reconciled it to the notion that even if she was ten years older, he did marry her, and they actually were in love, he would still have to leave her, 
so in his mind, his choice was to do what he could while he could, or let her have nothing at all. It was his new plan to make her into a marshal. Focusing on that seemed his best course of action for the time being. There are so many, Alice gasped. Is it always like that? I had no idea it was so terrible out there. Critias turned around to look at her, they're always out there, but rarely in such large numbers. Do you think you could keep your head out there in that? Maybe not alone, she doubted her mettle. But I could be like, she paused and glanced at Carmen. If you were out there, or Mandy, people we care about, then I could do it. We have to stick together as a family or have nothing at all. Alice perked up with accomplishment when Critias graced her with an expression of approval. Critias chose his words carefully, the team is everything. We follow orders, protect our crews, and then come back alive. Showboating is not the example I want to set for you. Just sometimes, it can't be avoided. Sometimes you just have to do the right thing, even if you might get killed, Alice offered as help. Critias nodded approval again, when you choose the path of being a marshal, a go fighter, you have to be ready to make some tough choices if it will save lives. Never show off or go off by yourself just to impress people. You might get killed or even worse, they might get killed trying to come rescue you. Like Carmen, Alice answered with two minds on that matter. She understood Carmen was reckless, but she also understood that Carmen was in love with him. She wasn't sure if she would have been any different, not when they truly believed that it was the only thing that they had in the world and to lose it would make life not worth living at all. In the final moment, when the recording showed Critias as visor display red line threat levels and his combat's computer priming all his grenades for self-destruction, Kevin stopped the show to a round of disappointed booing. Before I show you the rest, Kevin informed them, you need to see an event that Critias already mentioned. During the downfall of Berlin, an experimental top-secret government vehicle had crash-landed. Critias and his rescue team went in to recover the crew. For matters of brevity. I will just show some critical moments to make what is to follow more easily understood. Bear in mind that this involves a lot of experimental equipment you are unfamiliar with, but I assume you are already aware of it from seeing Critias's equipment as it is. The next video was exclusively from Critias's point of view. Kevin avoided showing everyone any panoramic scenes of the centuries decayed city that would be too difficult to explain. The weather stormed quite like what was outside at the present moment. Not even their downtime had made any difference in the weather that raged on unabated. The Gaussing was a massive Tesla flux drive carrier ship that could deploy or recover an armored bulldozer in addition to quartering a large crew with ample storage bays as well. When the great spaceship bottomed out in a stony ravine, the impact had split the hull with irreparable damage. As Critias and his team approached by a Marshal Service assault ship, the camera view watched out the open side door. He gazed down at the chaos that raged below as thousands of ghouls swarmed over the dying hook of the gal's zing, as would carrion birds on the bloat-ripped carcass of a beached whale. The crash had demolished three of the ship's four main drive engines. The fourth that stuck up on the ship's highest corner continued to function. The flux field it produced while locked in high-frequency emission could not form a Faraday entanglement around the busted ship since it had partially embedded itself into the muddy bottom of the ravine. Unable to function to its design, the massive engine flung Van de Graaff lightning bolts at a nearby high-tension electrical tower that acted as a sort of grounding rod. Critias turned to look back at his comrades. They were five mesh-suited marshals along with a beta brute android. The beta was much akin to a mesh-suited marshal only he was decisively larger and he didn't wear a mech suit. The intimidating armored form was his actual body. The combat android also had removable pieces of supplemental armor and various gear packs. The name on the beta's chest read as, Bud. A marshal that wore the twin bars of a captain's insignia was in command. He shouted in order to Critias who was still only a first lieutenant at the time. Critias, he commanded, take Bud with you and disable the field drive. The rescue bird can't get directly over the wreck while that backlash is spitting off from it. We'll do what we can to draw the meat off. Critias grabbed a dropped heather strap and then asked, You ready, Bud? Stood ready, sir. The android answered in a strong baritone as he took one of the handle loops in his free hand. His weapon was a tri-rotary Tesla flux medium entrenchment machine gun that he wielded battle carry with an easy style. See you on the ground, Lieutenant. They jumped out the door as the flying personnel carrier passed over the high ground of the ravine on the lightning tower side. The repelling cables decelerated their falling rate sufficiently to prevent them from hitting the ground with injurious velocity. As they touched down, they released their retractable tethers. The carrier continued flying in a counterclockwise orbit of the crash scene while it started to shine spotlights and launch flares onto the ravine's opposing slope to draw some attention away from the crashed ship. 
Critias's visor zoomed in to examine the action on the Gao Zing while he called her on the radio. Gao Zing, Gao Zing, this is your martial ground team on station. Can you power down your number two drive? It's slashing discharge and blocking our approach. A highly stressed voice answered, negative. Negative. This is Chief Engineer Zane. We have a complete failure of all internal systems and are operating on battery lighting. Captain Gardner is dead. All our surviving crew have barricaded themselves inside the ship. We're tending wounded and suppressing electrical fires. The good news is that the damage seems to be letting in enough fresh air for us to hold out. External visual is all down. What's our situation? In magnified enhanced vision, Critias already studied their exterior situation. Around 5,000 ghouls had followed in the lightning beacon the runaway drive engine threw off. Most of the freaks had climbed up onto the ship in their search for a way to tear through to the inside. It was as if they could smell a goodly number of humans in the wreck and it had them in frenzy. You're covered in ghouls, Critias answered plainly. We will be lifting you out of the top. Your ride is here. How do I shut down your runaway field engine? It's a complex machine, the man replied, encased in a lot of armor. We've been spotted, Bud spoke up. Orders, sir? Critia sounded unconcerned as he answered, let them come to us and then kill them. Bud clicked the manual safety off on his machine gun as he asked, what are you going to do, sir? Critias pulled a Tesla flux grenade from his belt as he said, first I'm going to whip my dick out. He activated the button to make the grenade pop out its long barrel rod for rifle launching to extreme range. Critias loaded the grenade into his Tesla flux rifle as he added, then we turn off his engine. He took aim, got the exact range by laser, and then fired the grenade at the buzzing arcing engine 200 meters away. The fuse was supposed to set the grenade off when it was in contact with the drive, only it never made it that far. The extreme forces of flux electromagnetism around the thrumming engine radiated an invisible electronic envelope that polarized incoming matter like the grenade and then repelled it upward at far more velocity than Critias had used to launch it. As the grenade ricocheted straight up off the repulsion force field, its safety features recognized it as a lost egg. Upon detecting it was not in proximity of any friendly agents, it exploded in the sky. Oh hell, Critias groaned as he watched the heavens seem to tremble with godly displeasure. The storm dumped lightning down on the gousing like a waterfall of light. The bolts seemed most attracted to the flux engine that failed instantly under the bombardment and then promptly exploded. All the ghouls that climbed over the wet metal skin of the gousing got a full taste of the lightning. The infected either burned or just steam pressure exploded by the thousands. It was both a grotesque and amusing sight not unlike a chain reaction of meat popcorn. The thunderclap that followed was so overwhelming that the pressure wave blew Critias right off his feet to knock him down flat on his back. Bud stood resolute against the thunder blast while unfalteringly gunning down ghouls that managed to survive the lightning bath by simply being too far away from its epicenter. Even those that had survived the lightning went down in the shockwave of the thunder cataclysm. Bud had a gift for not wasting ammo from a weapon that was capable of an astounding rate of fire when called upon. The hulking war android asked dispassionately, Did you just kill the entire crew of the gal Zing, sir? As he was getting back to his feet, Critias groaned, Sure looks that way, Bud. Based on what happened to the infected, it was a safe assumption it had also happened to the men inside. There was a loud explosion, the ship's engineer reported by radio. The engine vibration is gone and everything is quiet now. Critias asked him, did you suffer any additional casualties? The man replied, negative, we did not suffer any additional damage. We're making our way to the top deck escape hatches now. The rest of the Marshall team began to clean up the surviving ghouls and they slayed the stragglers who came new to the scene. There wasn't much left of the local ghoul population. Critias had already incinerated thousands of them quite by accident. Critias radioed to his captain, mission successful, sir. The engine is off as ordered. Bud and I figured we would wipe out the whole tribal assault force too since we were already down here. Bud shot some additional machine gun bursts that went out with the sound of ripping fabric, blowing apart more ghouls as they ran about off in the distance. During the pause, he told Critias, I think you'll get a medal for this, lieutenant maybe even a promotion. If the brass wants to spread any reward around, Critias replied, we'll get the whole unit commendations. He slapped the giant warrior on the back, hell, bud, if there was any justice in this world, you would be a field marshal by now. I'll see what I can do about getting you some upgrades or something. Kevin stopped the movie to say, I will now show you the conclusion of Critias's battle in the flooded park grounds. His extremely dangerous stunt of calling lightning is in actuality a matter of sound scientific principles, if one also has the proper equipment to take advantage of them.
having seen the phenomena before firsthand, our good captain was confident he could duplicate the conditions here. The footage displayed Critias and Carmen as they defended the top of the striker APC until she went down inside first and then he followed. Since the images came from Critias' own perspective in both cases, the audience saw him prepare an identical grenade and then launch it up into stormy skies to trigger an aggravated counterattack through repeated lightning strikes. Kevin had a splendid capture of the event taken in panorama by the milk wagon from where the truck stood off in the distance waiting for an opportunity to drive in for a rescue pickup. Once the fulgurous deluge had subsided, Kevin's video showed the dramatic arrival of the Forager vehicle as Gloria jumped the berm into the park. There were also some portions of them riding on top during the drive back home to the castle, like his final words of farewell to the two watchers he rightly guessed were still close enough to hear him. That is where the presentation ended. I would call it unbelievable, Colonel Davis exclaimed, if I didn't already know it all to be true. I for one don't want every move my men and I make to be on film for a by the moment review in public debriefing. That's a lot of pressure to perform under when any mistake you make is movie of the week. Jim stood up to say, for a man of many heroics, I think this occasion has truly stood Critias apart as a man worthy of special recognition. Where Critias came from, his organization referred to itself as the Marshal Service, and through him, we on occasion refer to Fat Jack as our own Grand Marshal, the principal conductor of all our non-civilian affairs. Some at this table are undisputed masters of foraging, like our good friend George and his former protege Tony Banjo of course. Others have another great talent, fighting ghouls and confronting these watchers who exist in unknown numbers. Critias is one of those, and so in his honor, I commission a new title in the community, King's Marshal, being those foragers under Jack's command who specialize in the weapons and tactics required to battle the infected on their own ground, taking the fight to them when need be. In recognition of defeating Grendel and her many other exemplary acts of courage and heroism, I hereby grant Carmen the title of King's Marshal Lieutenant. Everyone clapped to distinguish the promotions even where they didn't mark any specific change of responsibilities. Jim gestured to Colonel Hiram Davis, just as Critias is a Marshal Captain and Carmen is his Lieutenant, I declare you, Deputy Grand Marshal Colonel Hiram Davis, second to Jack in my confidence and esteem. Though you are a recent arrival here, that is just our lucky gain because your qualities are second to none as a command level officer, a platoon leader, and as a devoted father. After a pause, Jim added, and on the off chance that I should unexpectedly drop dead, I also believe you should step up as the new king. At that point, it would be something you would need to secure for yourself, but I think you would have what amounts to unanimous support from this table. Your personal experience from both before the outbreak and after makes you an ideal candidate. Critias only had tea to drink, but everyone had a cup of something available even if just water. He stood up for a toast, to our new deputy grand marshal and loyal service. It was a good cause for all of them to stand and then drink to the toast. Jim called to Critias, I sought to reward you in particular while it seems that recognition of Hiram Trump your celebration. I assume you received the gesture with all the merit intended, ask something of me as reward for your accomplishments. I would not have it said of me that I was not generous in return for the loyal service to which you toast. Critias considered that then raised a finger to say he needed a moment. He turned to look at Carmen and then told her, the excitement of the day has worn off of me and I need sleep. Put the girls to bed and then come give me a bath so we can talk about all this. I want to stay with you, Alice complained. He gave her an unsympathetic glare, you will go now, young lady, and do as Carmen says. My room, means my castle, means my rules, now go. Carmen planned to pick up Mandy to carry her as a pampering gesture, but Critias called an end to that, she's more than old enough to walk. Just wake her. Carmen could carry the girl except Critias much preferred not having Carmen display before everyone that she was so unnaturally strong. Quickly enough, the three of them departed holding hands to return together to Critias's small temporary apartment inside the South Theater. Once they were out of earshot, Jim asked, Do you have a request in mind? Critias got up and then walked to the end of the table so that they could speak privately. He said, Once that thing in Bob's lab wakes up in his fish tank, Carmen and I are going home with the sample we came for. I won't be here when Alice turned 16 and I knew that when I agreed to what she wanted. I hardly pushed you into it, Jim said to his own defense. I tried to prevent it, and as I recall, you did phrase your pledge to her in a cunning manner. If you were still here, you would go through with it, and you won't be here, so, problem solved. Such deceptions made Critias feel dishonorable, which it probably was. He told Jim, I want to make Alice into a marshal, not rip her guts out and have you find her after she slits her wrists. After he said that, Critias was sure he had made up his mind. He confessed, I made a false promise to her today. 
a marshal should never make a promise with cunning false intent. I'm not going to be one more man that betrayed Alice. You need to understand that I have to show her a better world and I don't have a lot of time to do it. I'm pretty sure that I know what it is going to take. The problem is that you might not like it. Jim asked, what exactly is it going to take? Crytea Slade bear his intentions, I need my hands untied where her safety is concerned. Everything that I need to teach Alice begins outside in the wilds. While she lives trapped in here, she feels like a shunned convict. Out there, she can learn what it means to have confidence in herself. I want her to learn how to be proud that she is even alive. Malcolm was willing to shoot hatchet over her, Jim reminded him. Stay focused on the fact that everyone wants her protected and to have as happy a life as we can provide for her. We have a lot of experienced GNP who don't have what it takes to run with foragers. I can see why you asked because a lot of people are going to think you are wrong to throw her into the wolves without any background for it. You have my permission to do whatever you must, just do your best to keep her safe and keep her happy under the circumstances. That is the substance of what you promised to us and to her. Jim paused a moment to glance away before saying, look over there. Crytea's turn to see it was Nadia as she cleaned dining tables on the core level. Jim asked rhetorically, you know how she got here? Twice when we crossed paths, she asked me about Colonel Davis and how things were with him. The third time she asked to be assigned to forager kitchen detail. If she asked to follow the other foragers around, Crytea guessed at her reasoning, that means she wanted to follow Hiram around. That means that they're having a little something we don't know about. Jim shook his head no. I don't think so and I have hinted that she should go ask the man about his day directly, but she refuses. It appears that she feels he is unattainable and that they are both from Denver. He is now an important man here, and she sees herself as a passed around soiled dove that now cleans our tables. It offended Critias to think that either Nadia or Alice would have to carry around that stigma like they felt they were nothing more than well-used whores unfit for respectable men. Critia said to Jim, if some nutcase raiders ever kidnapped you, and then they took turns raping you in the ass? Would you think you had learned something about love, or sex, or life as a homosexual, or would you feel like some evil shitbags tortured and humiliated you? Jim understood that Critias's point was that as men, they could see it as torture and humiliation, but when men thought of women undergoing such abuse, they generally spoke of it as forced whoredom instead. With that in mind, Jim replied, those men brutally tortured Nadia. She must be strong to have endured so much without giving up on life. That summed up what Critias thought when he called out to her across the hall, Nadia, would you come here, please? The young Russian woman arrived swiftly all too happy to be near the captain's table and Hiram. Critias asked her, did you hear about Hiram's promotion? He is deputy grand marshal now, second to Jack in field operations. She cautiously eyed the man as he sat with his daughter their queen before she said, he should be celebrating such a fine and well-deserved advancement. Critias nodded. I agree and I would like you to perform a small favor for me if you would. Of course, she readily consented. Go over and tell Hiram that battle is the test of character, Critias quoted a saying from his latest days though its origins were far more ancient. She didn't understand, why? Critias dismissed her question, just do as I ask, and then tell him it's the men who get the blessing of dying quickly. You can tell him I sent you if that will make it any easier. Nadia considered it all a moment before she answered, I would not know what to do with Easy if it ever did come along. She went right over to Hiram and then whispered the phrase into his ear. Hiram had heard Critea summon the woman from across the hall and thus understood who was responsible for the words she uttered. Only a few would readily understand their meaning as intimately as they did themselves in that some people had the iron in them to face hell without being spiritually destroyed and some others just didn't. Hiram never actually had any grudge against Nadia as being a soiled dove. Until the advice from Critias, he had never admired her either for being an indomitable spirit thoroughly tested by that brutally slow death that women endured during the dying time nightmare. Her flesh had healed and her tortured memories faded a little more each day. Nadia had never embraced the evil that had consumed so many others in that place as they slowly grew into willing collaborators with the president's devilish madness. Nadia and Hiram were both veterans of Denver, him a decorated soldier and she the defenseless woman. They both did what it was in their means to do in order to survive, so long as they never willingly gave up their humanity. She had kept her feelings hidden from him, and for his part, Hiram had never thought that young beautiful Nadia, the cellist of refined upbringing would have such thoughts for a coarse soldier old enough to have been her father. Regardless of their pasts, Hiram was a seasoned worldly man and not an inexperienced youth who would hesitate to snatch up good fortune when its blessings deigned to rain upon him, deservedly or otherwise. After a polite gesture of appreciation toward Critias, 
Hiram excused himself from his daughter and then led Nadia away where they could sit together in private over glasses of wine from his hazardous duty rations. They toasted his magnificent day that Nadia would eagerly make a whole lot better before it ended, once she got him to his bed. Jim was ready to depart with his wife, he said to Critias upon standing, I grant your request as your reward. Alice is yours to handle in whatever way you think wisest. She has suffered enough for ten lifetimes, so I hold you to your duty to her above the rest of us. I can't even imagine how I would feel if Jessica was mine now after she had endured the horrors of the harem rather than joining her father on the surface. I have to wonder if I would love her more or less after suffering such endless abuses from so many unworthy hands. When Jim saw Critias as stomach sink in self-doubts, he added, Alice is now your second slave that you will have too much guilt and honor to ever abuse. You said that if you had Carmen to love over again, you would have done it differently, now is your chance to prove it. Jim got three steps toward his wife then turned back to say, Just for the record, we have had women commit suicide who suffered less than Alice already has. Give me another marshal when you leave us, not another corpse. If you need to be hurt to attain that goal, then that's just too bad. Pardon the phrase, but it's your bed, so you sleep in it. Critias returned to where he had sat to empty his drinking glass before he started the walk back to his room. He almost continued straight to the showers, but instead he turned right into the theater entrance to head for his room. When Critias took his next right turn into the narrow back hallway, someone snuck up behind him to press the barrel of a pistol into his spine. Don't speak and don't move, Verloc whispered into his ear from behind. You move and you're dead. After a tense moment, she added, Okay, you can speak but keep it nice and quiet, or I'll plug you, see? Critias thought fast and tried to focus. He knew that Verloc was more crazy than violent, so he attempted a reason, if you wanted to talk, there were easier ways to get my attention than sneaking in here. When the others find you, there is going to be a world of trouble. A lot of innocent people are going to get hurt in the crossfire. Drop your pants, she ordered in a hiss. Put your hands on your head and your back to the wall. I'm going to interrogate you with my tongue. Don't try anything funny and nobody has to get hurt. As he was about to make his desperate move, Critias's nostrils picked up a scent in the air that he had long since burned into his brain. It was an aroma of fresh peaches and lavender that Carmen radiated when she was aroused. Realizing that it was Carmen imitating Verluck's voice she had heard in the recordings to play a prank on him, Critias felt tempted to be angry with her since she had genuinely fooled him, but the scent of her being inflamed over her lewd game changed his mind of that. Critias spun on his captor deflecting the gun with his elbow as he turned. Carmen had dressed all in black from a sweatsuit to a black t-shirt that she had cleverly pulled over her head to just below the eyes. By folding the back of the shirt up over her head and then tying it back headband style using the short sleeves, she had a black ninja mask with only a narrow slit for her vision. After a brief struggle, one she desperately wanted to lose, he got her pinned against the wall where he forced their clothes apart and then had his way with her then and there standing in a brief but mutually unrestrained encounter. Critias finished with her in only a few savage minutes that brought a guard running to investigate Carmen's ecstatic cries in the moment he concluded her interrogation. After only a glance, the guard turned back then radioed, false alarm, just Perkella and Violet Wand calling thunder in Area 4. Over. A male guard radioed back with a chortle, did it strike her in the ass? That's what it sounded like. Over. After an easily accomplished straightening of clothes, Carmen led Critias to the showers. The girls were just on their way out in their terrycloth robes. Brush your teeth, Carmen told them as she went by. I'm going to check. She sat her husband on an aluminum pool bench and then stood behind him washing his hair under a light hot shower. I bet you thought you were pretty clever pretending to be that washer lady, Critias commented. She hummed delight in his ear as she remembered what she got for the trouble. It was good advice. Playing dress up really can refresh your enthusiasm. That was Alice's suggestion. He needed a moment to consider just how much trouble Alice could lure Carmen into joining. What did you offer to teach Alice to argue effectively this time, in return for this advice? Don't be that way, Carmen said as she pressed her breasts into the back of his shoulders while she reached around to soapy rub her hands over his chest. Love is war and I gave her some help constructing a reasonable argument. She chuckled, what's mine is mine, after all. That part was my favorite. Men are so easily redirected when you use their own slogans against them. He said with skepticism, clearly you have not thought this all through. Oh, but I have, Carmen whispered in his ear. The last time I thought about killing you, it was because there is no real difference in men between love and rape. You say and do what you have the courage to try, to get females on their backs so you can inseminate them, thus your species reproduces itself. Despite the lies that humans often tell one another, in biological terms, 
they're both viable strategies to accomplish the same objective. That is what I saw in men then, animals with reproductive strategies and that the myth of love was just a cunning lure to make us females submit to fornication. That is what Alice sees in men now. She understands what men must be when they have only their base natures. You will show her what a real man is instead. Carmen hummed happily for a while and then told him, You know, in none of my tactical simulations of Denver, does a Colonel Davis ever appear to save the day? In none of my simulations at all, does the impossible hero rise up from the masses and then save everyone? Rat catchers don't transform into lions. Slave masters don't become adoring husbands. Boys don't become great kings. Software code simulation does not place much faith in the invested probability that an impossible hero will appear to change everything. In reality, great men really do appear, often from places we least expect, and that is the difference between probability forecasting and real life, my love. My heart tells me that you really are the hero I want you to be, against all logical reasoning. I believe in you that you really do love me instead of just having a biological need to bed me. Now that we have Alice and Mandy, I guess we will find out if my faith in you was misplaced, and you are just a baser man, like my computations believe they already proved you to be. He made an attempt to tease, I must admit that I do love you that other way too. You are a delightful bed slave. Carmen whispered seductively into his ear, I'm not really your broken whore. She changed ears to whisper, not yet. There is one thing left for you to do. He liked the sound of that, do I get a hint? Carmen washed his back by rubbing soap with her whole body draped against him. It is something selfish for you to do, something you swore to me you never did to me because you thought it too degrading, too painful, and too humiliating for me. It's not merely enough for you to be selfish and to degrade me. She leaned in to suck on his earlobe, if you truly want to own me, body and soul, you'll have to make me beg for it, and then you'll have to make me love it because it is you. Carmen stood up and then grasped the spray line to rinse his hair, in her normal voice, she ended with, until then, you can't really say you have broken me to your hand. Now that I think about it, I may stop calling you master altogether. It was a misnomer considering the true nature of our equitable relationship. I always despise that about your English language, so lacking in flexibility when it comes to showing social hierarchical relationships. She played him masterfully on many levels, and from that, Critias had to wonder, is this power play more of your tricks you learned from Malice? Always keep them guessing, Carmen said to herself amused. Perhaps as though it was a quote from her Alice advice or just as likely, her making him want to think that it was. In either case, she accomplished it because he wasn't sure at all. Just when he thought she was done, Carmen whispered, Have you ever wondered just how much I really do love you? Could it be that much? Critias got to sit and watch as Carmen showered herself and after that, they returned to their room to get some much needed and welcome sleep. Chapter 6 Bitter Cups At about noon, Critias awoke to the soft sound of beautiful song in what he believed to be the French language, which tended to be Carmen's favorite when she sang without an audience. Alice was still asleep where she had started out, snug against him wearing one of his t-shirts. He rolled her off without waking her. When he noticed just how rock-solid her comfort level was when in his company, Critias felt like he could forgive himself a little for having not taken Alice in sooner. It wasn't as if anyone would come beat on his door to get her back or to ask about what became of her. Alice had no one in the whole world, except for Mandy. Now she had him and she could finally get a restful sleep. Critias sat up to see Carmen where she sat with Mandy on their small couch. She brushed the girl's strawberry blonde hair while she sang in a sweet absent-mindedness. Carmen appeared happy, like having a little sister or daughter to take care of was a medicine that helped put her own life into perspective. There was only so far Carmen could go as a woman when her pride came from strength and battle. His wife glanced over at him and gave a winsome smile. It was a moment for Critias to realize it was an answer to his own. The sight of them together amidst the overall tranquility of their room had Critias more than a little pleased with himself. He had gone out on a limb with the girls and it had actually worked out into something really nice. As he got up, Critias asked, Is there anything going on? Carmen had monitored the distant voices and radio traffic enough that she was abreast of the day's news. Jack is making his preparations for taking out the riverboat, she answered, rightly assuming that he would find that interesting. She added, the mechanics are busily chopping up one of the new tanks we brought home from Radio City. I can only assume that they plan to build something new and better for foraging from the pieces. Go out and have a look around, get yourself something to eat while you are at it. They are serving lunch now. I could go for something to eat, he said liking the sound of lunch. The garage is not a clean zone. If we do decide to go there for a look around, that will mean having to get dressed for it. 
Alice sat up to rub her eyes. She had only one word on her mind, food? Critias pulled on some khaki pants over his boxer shorts and then searched for a shirt. We may as well all go get something to eat together, he suggested. If we are going to start being a family, we should have lunch together as one. When Carmen, Alice, and Mandy started to move around the apartment to get dressed for lunch, Critias noticed that they all picked through the same big basket of clean clothes. The three of them had selected a communal jumble of things from the castle's general wardrobe. Critias realized that Carmen didn't have much of her own things with her since that was all back at their real apartment in King's Tower. What clothes Alice and Mandy had ever owned back in Denver were unfit for salvage. All that had ended up left behind. As Carmen held up a bra with a light-hearted pattern on the cotton fabric, Critias came to a whole list of important realizations. His first and most urgent revelation encouraged him to state immediately, I am not at all comfortable with all of you getting dressed in front of me. From now on, you need to ask me to leave, to turn around, or you can suggest some other convenient arrangement. When we are going through decontamination, that is a matter of city business, so I am fine with that. While we are living together, it is a little weird for me. The three of them looked at him without complaint and then they made shrugging nods of silent agreement. It was not a matter of concern to them either way. They waited expecting him to have more conditions for the new situation. As to Critias's other problem that he saw, it stemmed from him having lived a sheltered life back in his future world. He and Carmen had not been together for very long and before that, all he knew was life at Lindis or as a bachelor. Critias lacked any experience being a father, or a husband for that matter. It was only after Critias saw the three of them together that he awakened to the fact that Carmen really was a strong beautiful woman. The point being, Carmen was not a lovely girl. He just figured out that it was not at all the same thing. He told Carmen, I now realize that I was wrong when I encouraged you to dress too conservatively. He gestured to the bra she held that had pictures of stars on it. Things like that. The young women clothes are for the young women. You are a grown woman and you need to dress like one. I honestly didn't know the difference until now, but there is one. I am making it your responsibility to teach them the difference between the two. They are absolutely not to dress up in adult Denver clothes anymore, and I don't want you to dress yourself like a kid either. They are not the same thing. I see that now and I trust you to take care of it. Carmen just nodded without complaint, she didn't mind availing herself of a wardrobe that was more on the sexy side. She did have a husband to appreciate it after all. With that out of the way, she said, of course. Is there anything else? Critias had one more fashion idea he wanted to explore, are you and Alice about the same size? From what he could tell, Carmen was only a little taller. Carmen nodded that they were roughly the same size. She gestured to their communal basket of clothes, she can borrow my things. My thought exactly, he seconded that statement. Other than height, they did have enough in common from their modest bust sizes to the narrow hips that it inspired Critias to a great idea. He asked Carmen, where did you leave your Delta tactical armor, your suit with the helmet and the traction gloves? Carmen rolled her eyes in distaste at that, you know how much I hate that stupid armor. They made that stuff for the field engineers. That android pride revealed itself in her disgust. Carmen despised the idea of her lofty Epsilon lineage having to dress in the garb of a less advanced Delta series android. When Critias didn't seem moved to drop his idea over her complaints, she added, All it does is slow me down, and I can't see a damn thing out of that silly helmet. Carmen paused to admire her fingernails that the girls had meticulously manicured, though the gloves were kind of nice, and I do love the boots. She wore the Delta Mech suit boots regularly. They were the one thing she had taken from the set and kept with her. Yes, he understood all that. But where is it? I don't recall seeing it back at the apartment. Carmen shrugged. It was with the other crates we had in the back of the truck we came here in. We took our regular stuff with us when we left along with the food and medical supplies. Jack locked up the rest here in their secure munitions room. That reminds me, you should get us some more ammo packs and grenades to replace what we've expended. Critias went into their little bathroom to shave. While he was away, he gave them the privacy to get dressed. Once they were on their way to the back hall for their meal, Alice held Critias's hand. In a low voice she told him, I slept beside you all night. I was there, Critias replied, a first of many firsts. His comment didn't bring her any joy because in her mind he was not the first. I have had to do it before, she reminded him with displeasure. Critias didn't make any ordeal out of it as he explained, all of that stuff only counts when you're willing. Anything else is torture and humiliation. If a wild dog runs up and then bites you when I take you outside for the first time, that doesn't mean you get to call him your first puppy. 
It would be like me asking you how many cars you have ever driven and you count the ones that ran over you. Dirty goo monsters like Rupert hurt people just the same as the infected do. If it makes any difference, it does make me hurt inside when I think about how they tortured and humiliated you. That said, you slept next to me. As for the rest, you survived all your ghoul attacks and life goes on, a better life now. Surviving has to be enough, at least for a start. I'm proud of you for that. You are tough. You already have the heart of a great marshal. The time has come that I teach you how to use what you have for more than just surviving monsters. You will learn how to fight back, how to destroy them. Alice liked the sound of what he said, especially because it came across as the way Critias genuinely saw the world and her by association. She wasn't a dirty person. Alice was a tough person who survived monsters. Just to accept that about herself had her nearly to start crying, you're saying I've never, she tested the reasoning on a long list of terrible thoughts, things she had never done willingly. Villains had forced a whole host of things upon her on many occasions, but she had never been a willing participant. You mean you could be my first kiss and everything? Slow down, he cautioned her. We have an agreement not to go there. You have officially slept next to one man and shared a passionate kiss with zero of them. But yes, it would be possible that I could end up your first, but it definitely isn't going to be today. He made her feel good, but she still harbored a dark secret that he didn't know about, something she wanted him to know when they were ready, so she alluded to it, I didn't say that I never fought back. Critias caught the hint, but he didn't want to spoil the felicity of their moment. Instead, he asked, do you and Carmen have any plots brewing that I should know about? I'm no snitch, Alice warned him off from that. Anything Carmen and I share with one another you couldn't get me to tell even if you threatened to feed me to the ghouls. Friends don't snitch on one another to the men. She sort of regretted her tone, so she apologized. I do respect you, but I just couldn't do something like that, even though you are not a bad man like all the others. True enough. Critias agreed with her honorable code attitude, he could well imagine that Alice had thoroughly tested her principles back in Denver where betrayal by one of the other women likely drew a reprisal similar to hardened prison populations. To be a snitch to the men in Denver was to invite and deserve an ice pick in the belly. When Critias finally got his three women to the table, they discovered that Nadia floated about the room nearly as a dance while she served lunch. Her mood was more than splendid and the thankful nearly tearful expression she gave Critias showed that she gave him all the credit. More credit than he deserved obviously, since it had been Hiram who had massaged some of the Denver poison from her great and noble soul. As a show of thanks, Nadia brought them all better than average breakfast trays. She had handpicked the choicest servings from what was available. You're looking especially radiant, Critias told her because she had the glow of the satisfied with life. People tended to have one of three modes. Depression, surviving, and satisfied. Nadia had gone through all three stages in the short time that Critias had known her. Thank you for helping me find the courage to go speak to him, she answered the compliment. I think you should know, the kitchen is packing supplies for a paddleboat expedition tonight. You may be going out later with Jack. Hatchet says there has not been a major river flood since before the outbreak and the waters are really high already. Word is that most of the rain is up north. I don't think we have seen the worst of it yet. Since the river flowed from north to south, it was the rain up north that actually caused the local flooding. We should be safe even if it does flood. Carmen reasoned. With no one around anymore to keep the levees repaired, the river will jump out into the floodplain. The lowland areas will be severely inundated, but we should be quite safe here in the city, even underground. That was good news to Nadia as she dreaded the thought that water might fill up the castle unexpectedly like from a broken dam, a disaster that would force them all out onto the surface among the monsters. She said, if you need anything else, just raise your hand and I'll come back. Critias tried his instant scrambled eggs and found them palatable. At least we won't drown in all this rain, he commented to Carmen. She sipped at her coffee and eyed the steam from the cup curiously, as she was for the most part unfamiliar with the beverage as the implants in her mouth analyzed its chemical properties. Coffee was a woman drink as opposed to a lovely girl drink, so Carmen was actively expanding her horizons now that she was an adult with adult responsibilities. Somewhere amidst her investigation she made an hoon sound that expressed her doubt that the rain was nothing bad to concern over. Yes. He pressed her for an explanation. Carmen glanced up at him, oh, I was just thinking that if I were to start kissing other women, I could find out if you're a good kisser or not. Now that we are married, I will never get a chance to kiss another man. A woman could fill in, and my suspicion is that you would fume a bit about it, and then do nothing. Your suspicion is wrong then, he threatened her. You cheat on me like that and I'll, he paused to consider the punishment before admitting, fume about it and then do nothing, but I certainly won't like it. 
Carmen shared a wink with Alice to tell the girl she teased Critias and did a damn fine job of it. He grumbled as he went back to his breakfast, you two think you're really clever, don't you? I know what you are thinking, and I am not prudish. I am cultivated. It is bad manners to have crass things rubbed in my face. He glanced at Carmen, unless it is with my own wife, in my own bedroom, with no one else to be the wiser. As an afterthought, he added, and for the record, I am the world's greatest kisser just as you suspected, so put it out of your mind. You can just enjoy your good fortune. As to your quandary about the rain, Carmen told him the genuine answer to his question, it seems highly probable to me that a considerable population of dehydrated lurkers will be rejuvenated by any severe flooding, when the various buildings, barns, and whatnot vehicles they are baking inside of get washed down. I think it unlikely any will appear in additional numbers to really impact upon us. The greater risk from the river would be barges coming loose from up north. They could quite possibly knock the piers out from under the main highway bridges and even collapse them. Likewise, they could impact the thunder child or the floating crane, sinking or damaging those. When Carmen saw that Critias contemplated all that with interest, she took another turn at teasing him. Disguised as circumspection, she asked, since you didn't think much of my plan to find out if you are a good kisser, I can imagine you won't think much of my plan to find out if you are a good lover either. Critias became so uncomfortable without even knowing what outlandish unconventional thing she might do to test the matter that all three women laughed together at his expense, he decided not to complain since everyone around the hall noticed how freely his women smiled and laughed. They were a fountain of mirth that made everyone who saw them feel better. Zombie Hell World never had a superabundance of carefree joviality, so like the good food, it wasn't to be wasted. When he finished eating, Critias got up as he told Alice, Come find me when you're done. We have some things to do before you start your training. Mandy asked, You won't leave us here alone if you go out on the paddle boat, will you, sir? I'm not sure, he answered honestly, but you'll do whatever we decide. I prefer you sat over dead. The munitions and arms locker was in the front hall on the north side not far from the communal toilets. The door had a strong lock, but the roving guard had a key to it in case of emergency. As a city captain, Critias needed only ask and the guard opened it for him. Similar to the storerooms in the main city, the locker was part museum, part tool shed, and part military armaments menagerie. There was an abundance of bottled welding gas stored in the room, explosives, and assorted ordnance that they generally never used at all like mortars and landmines. After a brief search, Critias located his other martial service crates that they had brought with them in their salvaged agriculture depot truck. He set out some boxes of ammunition for their pistols and rifles, which included assorted specialty rounds like flares, explosive tipped, and thermite igniters. Critias took a replacement for his expended parachute flare and he grabbed a box of Tesla flux grenades. Next, he located a small plastic briefcase that contained a new Tesla flux pistol. They had six of them in total, his and Carmen's plus four spares still in their boxes. He took a TFP-6 model, which was shorter and lighter, being the standard issue for marshals of non-mesh suited duty. His personal sign arm had an antique motif, engraved filigree, and some customized parts, but it was still essentially a TFP-9, the same model Carmen carried. The crates also yielded up a TFR-20 Tesla Flux carbine rifle, the shortened uniform version of the TFR-32 tactical rifle he typically had in his possession. Critias finally located what he wanted most. It was a black zip code that held a Delta Android supplemental field armor. Carmen despised the gear for assorted reasons, mostly due to the fact that it had originally been for a lesser service class of Android. By implication, she found the hand-me-down uniform to be an insult to her station. Such was the bigoted pride of artificial persons. Before he closed up the crates, Critias took an unassembled marshal's bite staff to complete the collection of equipment. As he locked down the last lid, Carmen came in and then let the door close behind her. There is only one thing that could ever come between us right now, she said seriously, as she closed the distance to stop at arm's reach. He eyed her curiously since he expected another of her teasing games, what might that be? My pants, she answered as she unzipped her denim jeans then shimmied them down to around her thighs. Carmen bent over the supply crate to stick out her butt covered in semi-translucent satin. He had been right that she had some teasing on the tip of her tongue. If I can't call in someone else to test to see if you really are a great lover, she teased him. I thought I could at least test your range of capabilities. You already proved you can do a wonderful job when it suits you. Now I am curious to know if you can perform on demand under pressure. She gazed over her shoulder at him with a genuine desire for him to act quickly. I'm a real person now, she reminded him. I can have inconvenient needs and everything. 
Critias settled his hands on her hips to admire her superlative derriere. Her body felt as familiar to him as the grip on his customized pistol. Just the sight of her like that was a hypnotic command to steer her like a gunship in flight. He wondered if they had time for such play before anyone interrupted. As he undid his pants, he asked, where are the girls now? Searching for you, she purred as she moved under his hands with anxious anticipation. I suggest you hurry. Having said it, she corrected herself, just not too much. By the time Alice and Mandy thought to check the armory for them, Critias was on his way out with a broadly grinning Carmen following behind. They had all the equipment from the crates in their arms. Critias led them all back to his room and then laid all the equipment out across his bed. Alice asked, who is all that for? Please say all that cool stuff is for me. It was just the reaction Critias wanted to hear because it was a gift for a novice marshal who should be excited. He showed her the pistol belt and then took out the pistol to hand Alice that. This is your new TFP-6 that we will teach you how to use and clean. Next, he showed her the light automatic rifle. This is your new TFR-20 carbine. Even though the carbine was wickedly deadly in appearance and exotically futuristic in its elegance, the best item by far was the helmet. It was an opaque black common shaped face with circular red lenses for eyes that peered from the ends of short prehensile aiming stalks. Critias handed it to Alice. This is your Delta Field Engineer's mech suit helmet. He handed her that while he picked up the traction gloves and these are your gauntlets. The rest of this body armor is bite-proof nanoprene cloth with carbon fiber feminine contour inserts that should fit you well enough. You need to wear this suit against bare skin to properly recharge the systems and use the lavatory access. The equipment was like Christmas morning for Alice, I want to try it on. Critias told Mandy, you need to learn all this so that you can keep up on the decontamination end of our little ghoul-busting family. The girl saluted him with enthusiasm before she said, you can turn around if you don't want to leave. Alice needs to get dressed. It was complicated enough of an outfit that they needed Carmen's assistance to figure it out for their first time. With them suitably occupied, Critias turned away to collect his own armor and battle gear for going out. Once he had his helmet on, Critias radioed to the male android, Are you busy, Kevin? Carmen's brother by Epsilon derivation answered him immediately, How can I be of assistance? Critias informed Kevin about what they had going on. I just gave Carmen's Delta suit to Alice and I want you to get her online. She has no clue how to do anything yet, so any help you can provide would be appreciated. Kevin asked, are those two unregistered weapons nearby for her use too? Yes, a 6 and a 20, Critias confirmed. The android suggested, I have a variety of holographic training simulations she can use for shooting practice if you would like those. Critias approved, those would be perfect and see what you can do about a virtual bind staff instructor. Maybe a figure she can imitate to get the key moves in her head. Here is an application you can run when you want a supervisory tap into her sensory uptake, Kevin informed him as he also transmitted the HUD packet to Critias as HUD computer. I have taken the liberty to censor out anything that would reveal that Carmen or I are different. He meant that the unedited Delta Helmet's sensory equipment could show that Carmen had an android's physiology. Good idea, Critias praised the foresight since he personally would have overlooked that little detail. It was best if Alice never learned that Carmen wasn't entirely human, an uncomfortable issue that he would rather not have to explain. Critias told Alice without looking behind him, Kevin at King's Tower will be explaining a lot of things to you as you go along. You should always be polite to him and listen carefully to what he has to say. In short, he outranks you by a lot, so be respectful. Once Alice had fully dressed with her holster on and the carbine slung, she walked around the small room to get a feel for it. Carmen had kept the boots because she wore them regularly, and wasn't in any hurry to part with them, so Alice asked, what kind of shoes should I wear? The Delta suit was essentially a onesie with foot booties attached as part of the legs. Her feet would still be puncture resistant even in regular footwear. Wear your regular boots for now, Critias instructed. We can look through the ones I took from Radio City to see if any of those riot boots will fit you. He doubted it since there was few if any riot teams that suited for women, but it was worth a check anyway. Alice reeled in amazement over the helmet's HUD with its extremely advanced sensory technology that far exceeded the meager night vision goggles that were currently available. I can see body heat like an alien bounty hunter, she cheered with a reference she had pulled from a science fiction movie she had watched recently. Critias was ready to go to the garage tunnel and gestured for Alice to come along. He told Carmen, you two get dressed. Come join us when you're ready. As they exited into the front hall, one of the patrol guards came up short in surprise when he saw them. Wow. Carmen, he gasped, nice suit. That is totally boss. This is Alice's new road gear, Critias explained to the guard. Oh yeah, he suddenly agreed, 
but only because Critia said it was the case. I thought she looked a little different than usual. The guard radioed, we have two coming out front. Over. Stationary guards passed them through the gates into the railway tunnel. Critias and Alice arrived to find an army of mechanics at work as they tore down one of the striker armored personnel carriers. Jack was there to supervise their efforts, which centered on the removal of as much of the exterior armor plating as possible while it still left the rest of the vehicle fully functional, even if exposed to weather and ghouls. We don't need her to stop rocket-propelled grenades, Jack explained as he already curiously eyed Alice's new armor. We will replace the body in carbon fiber and aluminum. We can get a lot more miles out of the suspension system and engine by not dragging around all that useless tonnage of battlefield plate. While we're at it, we can make it more spacious for crews and cargo. With the vehicle description out of his way, he asked, Is that Alice all dressed up for making trouble? It's me, she saluted, reporting for duty, Grand Marshal, sir. He nodded seriously, impressive. Even though no one there knew it, it was a great moment of history that Critias filmed with his visor. The day that Marshal Alice first saluted Grand Marshal Fat Jack in the old garage of Forager's Castle in the days of King Louis. Jack asked her, Are you up for this sort of thing? This isn't for everybody. Decontamination duty is just as important and plenty dangerous already. Yes, sir, she confirmed. I'm ready to protect the family, sir. Whatever it takes, you can count on me. Jack liked her committed attitude, We'll see about that, little trooper, because I have business out tonight on the Thunder Child. Critias and Carmen will be coming with me. We are leaving before dark to have enough night left when we arrive at our destination to get the work done. This mission needs the water up high so that we don't risk bottoming out on a sandbar. We won't be carrying a lot of weight either. The child will be running shallower than her normal four feet. According to Kevin's satellite pictures, I figure it's about 80 miles round trip. Critias had every confidence in Jack's ability to plan out the mission to the finest detail. His hesitation involved the risk of Alice getting a crash course in surface foraging life. The story of Colonel Davis came to his thoughts then. The man had taken his young daughter to the surface because he had no other choice. Hiram considered the ghouls the lesser death than what Alice endured at the hands of the humans infected as they were with their brutal madness. The very idea that Critias would risk exposing the girl to fear was ridiculous to him. She knew all about fear, torture, and humiliation. What Alice needed was a taste of accomplishment a chance to be strong rather than a victim, and the mindset to destroy anything that threatened her rather than resigning herself to only surviving it. I want to help you, Alice told Critias when she sensed his hesitation to say something about taking her with him. I know you want to help, he believed her, but this is probably too much for your first time. You have to be ready to kill anything that comes against us without having to think about it. Screaming and crazy or not, the ghouls are still a kind of people, and you may find it difficult to pull the trigger on them. I've killed lots of people, Alice replied in a conversational sort of way that made the confession uncomfortably believable. As though she regretted the admission, she added, maybe I should stay here. Someone has to watch out for Mandy. Jack needed to get back to work, he told Critias, I'll let you know when we have a departure time. I'm guessing we could be ready in a few hours. Most of the supplies we're taking are just in case something goes wrong and we get stuck out there. Aside from any unexpected disasters, it should be a simple in and out more or less. You will be working the security, so you don't need to worry about the little details. It could get a little complicated, but that's why I'm going along. I'll be there to make it work. You just be ready to call your thunder down to bust some heads when the situation calls for it. Critias took Alice to the southern end of the garage tunnel near the truck gate. He set up an old oil drum trash barrel on its side lengthwise atop two sawhorses and then stood a sheet of cardboard across the open top. It would serve just fine as a practice target for her to shoot at. The spent shots would gather in the bottom of the drum as they passed through. After showing her how to load the weapons, he explained some basic rules of safety and how to adjust the velocity settings, which he currently set at a quiet low speed. Critias just wanted her to get a little practice aiming and squeezing off rounds. Once all was prepared, he had her load up some zinc-plated ball-bearing training ammunition and then start to fire away. It took a couple of minutes for Alice to understand the computerized relationship between her helmet's HUD and the way it integrated with her pistol and rifle. By locking a target visually with eye focal movement, the weapons could release fire themselves exactly when they sensed the angles and pressures were in line with proper accuracy. Since her gun sighting systems were computerized cameras just like those in her helmet, Alice did not even need to turn her head to make it work. She could see through the gun itself, and even shoot behind her if a situation called for it. Having no previous experience with guns served Alice well as she had no bad habits to overcome. 
she would learn her methods properly from a fresh beginning. Her eagerness to please Critias as an expert instructor allowed her to pick up the techniques more quickly than he had expected. When she was comfortable practicing on her own, Critias asked, Who did you kill? He expected her to refuse to say and considered threatening to ask Mandy instead, but quickly dismissed that idea as being too treacherous and rightly ill-received. Alice surprised him with her quick honesty as she said, The President's guards were making this hooch drink in the kitchen. Their hooch is what they called it. They kept their nasty drink all to themselves and never shared it with anybody. They really liked it and it made them extra mean. I crushed up a whole case of pills and put the powder into their hooch juice. A bunch of them drank it. Some of them died right away, while others just got so sick that the president had to kill them too because they wouldn't just completely die or ever get better either. Clara had said their livers failed and men can't live anymore without those, so they all died. I don't know if she knew what I did. Maybe she told the president they had poisoned themselves making it wrong, but it was me that did it. I can sneak around real good when I need to keep a secret, and I wanted to get them back for what they did. I hated them so much and I hated their nasty hooch too. I knew no one else would ever drink any, so I poisoned it to kill them all. He suspected it was true since it was an invitation to check with Clara. You clearly didn't get them all, he reasoned. Why did you stop killing them? No reason, Alice lied and then shot several more times. Only like she meant it, as if she shot at the ghosts who haunted her. I just decided not to do that kind of thing anymore. He demanded, why? She stopped her practice as she turned to look at him with those red mechanical eyes. Alice blurted out, he cut up one of the other girls thinking she did what I done. He killed her real slow while he made us all watch. He wanted someone to confess. They punished her for what I did. If I had confessed, they would have let her go. She might be alive right now, here safe and free. Only she is dead and I'm not. I could have confessed to save her, but I kept my mouth shut and just let it happen when it should have been me. I was the murderer that killed them all, not her. The president said he would kill a lot more of us if anything like that ever happened again, maybe kill Mandy or me. He would kill anyone, kill them bad sometimes for no reason at all. He made these terrible movies where he killed people really bad just for fun. Is that what you wanted to hear, that it was my fault he killed people? She turned away to shoot more only she couldn't. So instead she came back around to stare at him. You're thinking I'm a murderer now, that I might poison people here if someone makes me mad. That's what you're thinking, that I'm a weak coward who let another person die for what I did. Critias realized he had opened a can of bad worms that wasn't going to close easily. I don't think those things about you. She slammed her pistol down into her holster. Well maybe you should. You're nicer than the others I've seen. Carmen says you won't beat me or make me hurt just for fun. I'll let you do anything you want to me but never to Mandy. You can hurt me all you want, but if you try to hurt Mandy, I'll poison you too. That is what will happen. You'll wake up one morning to start puking then fall down to never get up again. Agreed, cried TSW surprised her with his offered hand to shake on their deal. Alice took a step back on the assumption that he only wanted to lure her in close so that he could grab her and then start hitting her. All that came out of her voice was, what? He told her seriously, I said we have a deal. You will turn yourself over to me to be my slave that I do anything with as I please, and in return, no one will ever harm Mandy, least of all me. She will be better protected than the queen. Alice stood numb of ideas as if she had started something that was impossible for her to turn off. She just reached out to shake his hand. After a moment, she asked, What are you going to do with me now? I want you to practice, he pointed at the target. Make the most of this opportunity because it will never be this easy again, not even close. That drum won't hurt those blinking shot any, so when you run out, reload and then start over. You keep shooting until I come to get you or your finger breaks off. That is what I want you to do. After he took a few steps away, he paused to look back, and practice with both hands. You need to be able to use either one for shooting and for loading. The time might come when your arm gets broken, then what would you do, let the ghouls eat Mandy? He continued off while saying, practice, Alice, always more practice. When Carmen and Mandy arrived, there was plenty of work going on. Mandy got busy helping decontamination cycle people out of the area into the castle while Carmen went after Alice. Critia saw Carmen head down the tunnel. He intercepted her because he didn't like the humorless expression she wore. As he stopped his wife, Critia told her, I know that look. I warned her, Carmen dismissed him not interested in talk. Mind your own business. He guessed, you've been eavesdropping on the supervisory feed. She shot him a cold glare, Alice threatened to poison you, you will wake up one morning puking then fall over dead? If she wants to pretend she is me, 
I'll show her what kind of person I really am. You'll do nothing and like it, Critias threatened her. Everything is going perfectly and you're trying to screw it all up, because she is just like you. Go help Jack or something and just forget about it. Carmen posed with her hands on her hips. She wanted to hear that explained, how is she just like me? He poked gauntleted finger into her sternum, Alice is ready to do anything it takes to kill anyone who harms those she cares about, just like you. I'd never do anything to harm Mandy, so there is nothing for me to worry about from Alice. If you were in her situation, you would do the same damn thing. You wouldn't even blink over poisoning those assholes and we both know it. Then, after all your insensitive lectures to me about tactical necessity, we both know you wouldn't have turned yourself into the president just because that psychotic asshole threatened to butcher another of the women, since he was slaughtering them left and right anyway. After all the times you threatened to kill me, now look how steamed up you get over a threat she made in the heat of the moment. Alice is already lethal and already bold. All we have to do is channel that into something useful. Now promise me this ends here. She asked a coolly defiant, or what? Just to remind him of the equitability that he forced onto their relationship, she called him, Critias. This is business and personal, he warned her actually meaning it. Don't push me into a corner. Back down and go make yourself useful. You're right, she agreed. This is business and personal. She and I had an agreement. There would be no speaking to you in private behind my back, no trying to muscle me out of what is mine and she would never take a stand for anything or anybody against you. She broke her promise to me, but I won't break my promise to her. I told her that when she betrayed me, I would make her pay for it. That's it, I warned you, he grabbed her to put her over his shoulder. Critias had more than enough Mexu strength to hold on to her and she no longer had it in her to fight him, burdened as she was with the guilt of the time she had considered murdering him in a fit of rage. Critias carried her briskly over to the emergency decontamination dump shower then stood close enough to stick her head underneath the sprayer as he pulled the chain to douse her with a torrent of cold water that had her sputtering to disgorge it from her nose. After a good soaking, he asked, have you had enough? Yes, she whined. I promise I'll drop it. Mandy was the only person with the audacity to intervene. She rushed up to complain about him manhandling her hero, what are you doing to Carmen? Critias answered. Carmen was eavesdropping when Alice said she would poison me if I ever hurt you. She said that she was going to give Alice a smack for saying that, and I told her no. Asking her to stop wasn't enough, so this is us fighting. The complexity of it all stunned Mandy. At first, she blanched as proof that she knew about Alice's lethal capacity for poisonous revenge. Then it dawned on her that Alice was willing to kill Critias to protect her from him even though she knew how much Alice really liked him. Clearly. Critias had no intention of ever hurting her anyway and even more astonishingly, Critias took their side over Carmen. Lastly, she grasped that he would stick Carmen's head in a cold shower as his idea of harsh punishment. In her former world, the best Mandy could have hoped for was that her whipping wouldn't be severe enough to leave new scars on her back. Mandy got a clean towel from a nearby sack and then offered it to Carmen as Critias sat her back on her feet. Don't fight over me, Mandy tried to be the diplomat. Alice was just talking big. She didn't really mean it. She would never put anything in your cup, sir, honest she wouldn't. She really does like staying with you both, same as I do. It's nothing, Carmen assured the girl as she toweled her own head. I double dared him to see what he would do and I guess I had it coming. We want you both to stay with us. I was just being overprotective. Can I go watch? Mandy meant to see Alice practice with her guns. Of course, Critias agreed. Mandy was about to dash away. But instead she turned back to give Critias a hug around his armor, and then she gave one to Carmen too. Once she was away, Carmen asked him, why did you tell her all that? He educated her on his strategy, I told her so that she would tell Alice of course. Alice will know you don't like her talking that way. She will also know that if I came down sick, which I think is improbable in the extreme, that you would know who to look at first. Alice will know that you don't plan on confronting her harshly because I won't stand for it. She will also know that I don't hold a grudge over it either. They both will know that we care about them and that they're safe with us. Last but not least, Alice will stay on track to keep training. Carmen eyed him curiously, are you saying you plan on making Alice into a marshal? I am, Critias stated with certain conviction. I can see that Alice has what it takes to be a good one. Maybe even a great one, Carmen commented as though the idea somehow amused her and not in any mocking sort of way. It was more as if she knew some secret that she would withhold from him. Critia swatted Carmen across her butt to get her moving, go make yourself useful. You need to look like you actually do something around here. Jack told me we have some work tonight out on the river, be ready for that. 
Carmen rubbed her backside to pretend it stung when in reality she thought of it as foreplay. I hope it's a long riverboat ride, she told him before going off to help Jack. That rough shower has me all wet and I know a great way for us to pass some free time. Chapter 7. Floodwaters When Critias walked out from the castle's northern rail gate to have a look around the vineyard cage, it was only three in the afternoon, but already dark as dusk from the thick storm clouds that blocked out the sun. The rain was not as heavy as it had been, though it maintained a steady pelting. Small broken twigs with leaves still green and unwilted littered the ground where the wind gusts had ripped them down from the barrier growth. He was going out first to see if the watchers were anywhere nearby. They knew him well enough to recognize him on sight. He figured that if they wanted to talk or fight, it would be best if it were him that presented himself as their first target of opportunity. Critias carried a length of chain that had a bolt that doubled back a loop on one end to form a handle while the other end sported a steel meat hook. It was a modern interpretation of an ancient gladiatorial instrument ideally suited for its singular purpose, to drag away the dead. Guards had headshot a considerable number of ghouls over the years. Some freaks had gotten lucky enough to jump the gate and others had lingered too close for too long being simply unwilling to go about their other business. The infected were like bears in many ways, dominated by a quest for food, unpredictable, and in need of a bullet to the head when they decided to make themselves permanently comfortable around human inhabitation. Those disabled undead bodies accumulated around the truck entrance to make a nuisance of themselves, where at least they didn't rot to stink up the place. It wasn't any surprise that no one was in the habit of regularly going outside the vineyard barrier into the exposed wilds to haul the corpses away. He sank the meat hook into the armpit of the nearest body and then drug it off to start clearing the immediate area of troublesome mess. After Critias moved some more of the undead meat to be clear from the immediate vicinity of the gate, he made enough progress that he was in a position to see down the truck roadway. That narrow lane descended the hill between its twin steel barrier walls of beached river barges. The foragers had positioned the upper end of the defenses using their railway crane, the same one that had constructed so much of the vineyard cage, the rook gangway, and some of the pancake house vehicle ramps. The truck roadway eventually intersected with the river frontage road at the bottom of the hill, which also had high steel walls of canted river barges. That sheltered path led into the main dock area from where the forager trucks boarded a floating crane island and then went on to board the Thunder Child paddleboat. At the moment, Critias couldn't actually see the lower roadway. It was currently under the floodwaters. The river had risen up so high that it had drowned the lower roadway completely from sight. He estimated from the lamp poles and guardrail posts that still protruded up above the dark waters that the flood was only deep enough there to be above his knees, which wouldn't be enough to hinder one of their large off-road trucks. It was deep enough to be dangerous to a man on foot. If one were to lose their footing in the slippery silt, which they easily could, it put them at serious risk of having the old man sweep them on out into those turbulent waters from where they likely would never turn up again. When it seemed apparent that no watchers waited to ambush Critias, Carmen came out to join him with Alice by her side. Both carried their bite staves and wore some grave walking rags with tattered hoods to disguise their appearances from a distance. The traction gloves Alice wore gave her the enhanced grip strength she needed to use the crook of her bite staff to help drag away disabled infected. It was the rest of her body that lacked the physical strength to make much progress at the job. The wet ground did help reduce the friction somewhat, but it wasn't nearly enough. Carmen teamed up with her so that they cooperated on the same bodies for speedy removal. Between the three of them, they cleared all the headshot infected from around the gateway into the vineyard, and then down the barge road to the edge of the floodwaters. As a matter of excellent convenience, Critias used the river itself to dispose of the undead. The floodwaters readily carried the meat away perhaps to end up in the ocean eventually. Critias didn't really care where they ended up. Out of sight was out of mind. Gloria stealthily drove the milk wagonette from the garage. Her husband Big Henry was aboard to provide his usual excellent gunner armed security. The milk wagon's roof rack and back cargo area carried full loads of supplies and materials for Jack's riverboat mission. The duty of the moment was for Gloria to transport Critias and his two helpers through the treacherous floodwaters. They would go into the barge area to access the mammoth floating crane. Once they had positioned the heavy bridges, the other loaded truck would drive out to the ferry deck of the paddle wheeler, after everything was safely aboard, Jack would get them underway for parts unknown. Critias and his two women rode on the sideboards of the milk wagon as Gloria took them down the access road. They followed the submerged roadway into the loading yard that had its own barrier wall of tilted and spiked barge carcasses. Because that area was closest to the largest crane, there was no shortage of lifting power for the construction of those superior ghoul defenses. The floodwaters proved to be a useful environmental hazard that helped keep the infected out of their way. 
the ghouls had never liked to wade around in the river water. Those few that did play near the water quickly discovered that the fine-grained Mississippi mud was especially slippery. The river had infamous currents that reputedly had a malicious mind about them. The waters could surge suddenly without apparent reason to knock a victim off their feet and then sweep them out into the main waters to disappear. The river was so huge, dark, and powerful that whole waterlogged trees could be floating past just beneath the surface, ready to snag the unwary and then drag them down to their doom. Drowning was a mishap that an infected could survive since even after they did drown it wasn't lethal to them. In time, they would eventually reach some distant downstream bank to carry on with their misbegotten lives. While the main bridge remained undeployed, the only way out to their anchored crane barge was across a simple suspension footbridge that swayed and teetered so egregiously that it was not fit for the faint-hearted. To fall from it would mean to plunge into the river waters and its stiff current, likely to drown and surely to suffer harsh inconvenience. The crane itself was a mighty red beast of crawler-mounted latticework boom, which traveled upon its own custom barge of impeccable stability. The forgers kept the whole affair in an excellent state of maintenance. The control cab was like a small house or shack, dry inside and securely fortified against an infected attack. Crytea sent Carmen nimbly across the shaky bridge to get the crane started. Once she had moved the main vehicle bridge into place, Gloria drove across it to park on the ample lope and deck space available on the barge. Because Kevin monitored their progress from his control room at King's Tower, Fajag knew the precise moment to bring out the rest of his crew. They came down the roadway in the newly refurbished box truck that Critias and Carmen had first salvaged in their quest to find King Louis. Soon enough, that truck parked beside the milk wagon on the Crane Barge Island. Jack's mission was not a traditional forager run, in that he was not taking a fleet of vehicles. Carmen used the crane to retract the main access bridge once again. That left them entirely safe and isolated on the Crane Island, quite unreachable by any ghouls no matter how determined they might be. Fad Jack used a smaller winch with its cat's cradle of wire cables to position a small but sturdy footbridge between the Thunder Child and their barge island. After he walked over first, Jack powered up the paddleboat's diesel engines. His boat crew from the back of the box truck used the Thunder Child's onboard crane to place the second shorter but equally robust truck bridge. A driver moved the box truck across first so that the crew could unload all the other personnel and supplies it carried. Once it was empty, they returned the no longer needed box truck to the crane barge where they would leave it until missions end when it would serve them again only in reverse. Gloria drove the milk wagon over onto the paddle boat where it would stay as the only truck they were taking. Jack's able and experienced crew withdrew the bridges and lines in preparation for them getting underway. The Thunder Child's diesel engines had warmed up by then. As was common with exceptionally large equipment, the readily noticeable engines actually only generated huge amounts of electricity via a generator. The physical power that gave the Thunder Child its traveling motion came from railroad locomotive traction motors that turned the two gigantic gear chains connected to the paddle wheel. Mandy had arrived inside the box truck as part of the team that had volunteered to do the decontamination work aboard the Thunder Child. She didn't have to put up a fight to get her slot. Few people wanted to risk their lives in exchange for respect which in truth was the majority of the reward. The hazardous duty rations, like some sugar for your coffee was hardly incentive enough for anyone who didn't already act on some deeper motivation. Mandy's motive was that she wanted to stay near the people she knew best. She was not too young or inexperienced to understand how short life could turn out. Mandy understood that work on a forager riverboat in stormy weather was a risky mission, but no more risky than life in Denver as the slave to a murderous madman. Getting stuck out in the wilds would be dangerous. Boats sank, they ran aground, or they had engine trouble, even when the world was sweet and help could be a phone call away. Jack gave orders over the loudspeaker, all non-defense personnel are to stay below deck until summoned. It will be a while before you'll have anything to do, and where we're going, you'll have a lot of hard work, so rest up while you can. It should be about two hours before we arrive at our first station. Critias and Carmen stood out on the mostly empty ferry deck beside the milk wagon along with Gloria and Henry, when Carmen said, we're headed south with the current. I think I should go stand up front to keep a watch out for collisions. We might overrun a submerged tree or a loose barge. Mandy followed her orders to get below deck. She worked to help process everyone else on their way down into clean areas. It took a lot of effort to keep the interior disinfected, she would stay plenty busy throughout the night. Critias told Carmen, I want you to keep Alice with you, and please, neither of you fall overboard. I'm going to talk to Jack. The pilot house stood as the tallest part of the boat, but even so, it wasn't very tall. The riverboat had a low center of gravity to make it stable when there was a lot of weight on the end of the crane's boom. The pilot house was just tall enough to see over the ferry deck so that their pilot could know where the boat headed. 
Critias didn't want to track any dirty water inside. He just stood out in the rain beside the little pilot's window where they could hear one another speak. I do love being on the river, Jack told him before he spun the wheel to rudder their course left. He simultaneously radioed on a dangling pigtailed microphone, bridging stations. We have incoming meat bombs so cover your heads. With expert grace, Jack spun back long to the right and then throttled up. He zigzagged their course, as would a wartime convoy ship that tried to evade wolf pack torpedoes. With a little luck besides, the ghouls about to jump at them from the heights of the highway bridges would miss their target to splash into the river instead. Critias observed Alice through his tap into her Delta helmet's sensory feet. He wanted to watch her reaction to the strange spectacle. Just as he had warned her when she began her weapon practice, her training would only become more difficult. Alice could watch ghouls attack for the moment. It wouldn't be long before their regression would be more up close and personal. Alice's helmet sensors placed HUD threat icons on the infected as they clustered upon the bridge ahead. At times, she would telescope in at great magnification to understand better what she saw. When the first of the especially stupid goons heard the boat's approach, they gathered to stare as though right back at her. She watched them snarl and then she gasped as they began to leap over the railing such was their mad desire to come after her. It would be over a two-second fall down to the water. The first ghoul never got the chance because Alice raised her Tesla flux carbine, elevated the velocity to the recommended setting from the targeting computer, and then she squeezed the trigger. Her unsteady aim from the pitching of the boat made for a balk moment. Even with the trigger fully depressed, she continued to hold her carbine as if she held an antique matchlock rifle instead. It was if she needed to wait for a burning powder trail. Only after all the relevant conditions had properly lined up for optimal accuracy did the computer activate the real trigger all by itself. Her carbine released its copper-colored training ammunition sphere. That metal ball raced right over there to slam up through the creature's head from under its chin. In addition to blowing the ghoul's brains out, she also toppled it over backward onto the road deck above. Alice cried out in elation, I hit him. I really hit him, right through the head. Carmen got behind Alice to reposition the girl's feet and then also tighten the carbine to her shoulder to make her shooting stance more stable. Like Critias, Carmen also observed Alice's sensory feet, which was why she suggested, raise the velocity another 20% and then take another one from the next bridge. After Jack easily dodged several other skydiving ghouls, the boat closed on the railway bridge that came up next just under 400 meters past the first. It was an antiquated structure that remained serviceable to heavy rail traffic even though it was a century in age. Its pitted upper deck had lost its commission to traffic cars decades before. Alice saw some ghouls upon the old upper highway level only they were so far away that none of them had prepared to jump down at them yet. This is just practice, Carmen coached her. Even Critias could miss at this range using ball bearings. Just relax, lean into it, and then give them a whole bunch to show those ghouls who is boss. Alice zoomed in optically, locked target on an infected's head, and then took her shot. The carbine's virtual rifling did its best to put a spin on the sphere that would make it fly straight, but there was only so much it could do even under ideal conditions at such a distance. The rain and wind didn't help her accuracy nor did the way the boat rocked under her feet. That first shot recoiled like a punch into her shoulder as it sent the spherical bullet to whiz past the jerkily moving creature's head, which did alarm it with the snap. Alice, remained staunchly unperturbed. She at least understood from the recoil what Carmen had meant about her need to lean into it. She tightened up on the stock and then put some determination behind three more quick triggers. The first round hit the ghoul in its right shoulder to blow the joint apart, which caused that limb to point upward in a hooped overhead pose, and also made the fiend pirouette in a drunken circle both mad with agony and unable to determine the source of its injury. The second round missed entirely, while the third punched through its head in a puff of bloody pink mist that dropped the creature inert. Carmen and Alice cheered over another fine kill. Fat Jack eased back on the throttle once they had cleared the bridges. We don't want to get there too soon, he told Critias as he took off his glove to dig into his breast pocket for a worn aluminum tube that contained a precious cigar that was only a quarter smoked thus far. Jack explained. There are a lot of low bridges along the way where we'll be headed, be best if it was closer to dark before we start passing under them. If the ghouls actually knew to be waiting there for us, they could practically step aboard by the dozen. Critias imagined they're passing under low bridges while hundreds of ghouls stood on them ready to leap down onto the Thunder Child's deck. It was exactly the kind of thing Jingle Bells would love to do to them, if he only knew enough to set up the ambush. With that danger in mind, Critias asked, what happens if we don't start back in time? Can we make it home under those bridges in the morning sunshine? Jack sounded confident, we're recording a sonar map of the bottom as we go along. I should have a good deep course charted for making a quick exit, 
with the current at our backs the whole way we'll make top speed. Kevin took satellite pictures while the water was lower so that we would have some idea how to stay in the deep track without getting ourselves stuck. The explanation confused Critias, how can the current be at our backs coming home if it is at our backs right now going in? This isn't the river we need to worry about, Jack clarified. We're going someplace special. That river will be at our backs coming home. Critias didn't like the idea of their paddle boat ending up grounded out in the middle of nowhere along some minor tributary. He liked that even less than the notion of having ghouls drop off low bridges onto their heads. He asked, would we be able to get ourselves unstuck? Jack nodded, we could most likely drag ourselves free using the crane, if we can find something to short to cable onto. He shrugged, and if not, I guess we salvage some vehicles and make our way home any way we can. Keep the faith and the world will provide. You don't really believe that, do you? Critias was not a man of faith, but he had his moments of doubt. Like when Carmen told him that her best computer simulations didn't have a taste for heroes, but in her personal experience, they had a habit of popping up when least expected to make all the difference. Great things can appear from unexpected places, he told Jack based on Carmen's lecture, great men anyway, sometimes. Take it from the first Grand Marshal, Jack advised as he puffed his cigar. When you're working, you should always stay focused on doing good deeds for others and not being selfish about what you want for yourself. Critias wanted to hear the moral. What do you get for your trouble from that? Jack changed tack, how do you want to die? Do you want to be a respected old man safe in your bed or do you want to be surrounded by thousands of ghouls and go out in a blaze of hideous bloody glory? He puffed his cigar, you nearly did that already with your lightning stunt. Fighting, I figure, Critias decided. I'll win out in the end, only to be infected and know it, take up my pistol and then blow my brains out. That's my idea of how a marshal should go. From that, he thought back to Colonel Walker and his death dive off the tower. Fadjack had to laugh at the absurdity of their world, living forever doesn't have the same appeal anymore that it used to when the world was alive. Eternal youth is a bite away if you really want it. You should always be doing good works for others because when that last tower comes, when the ghouls finally got you pinned and you know you're all done, in that moment all you'll have is your sins and virtues to keep you company. If we die out here tonight, we die heroes, respected and remembered. It was a lofty notion for Critias. He thought of when Carmen killed Rupert and how she had given him the long death, ensuring that he would experience that terrifying slide down into the black with only his heinous crimes to keep him company. From that, Critias imagined his own death. In one version, he felt the pride of having been true to Carmen and having helped Alice make a new life for herself, an important life of principles and duty. In the other version, he imagined the self-loathing he would have had over betraying Carmen's devotion to him and abandoning to cruel fate some lost and confused girl. I'll die with a clear conscience, was his resolute answer for Jack. This is the life we chose, sort of anyway. Jack divulged, you probably don't know that I had two daughters around Alice's age when this first went down. Giving Carmen away at your wedding meant a lot to me and it still does. If she is a test tube baby as you say, maybe I am the closest thing she has to a father. So, if you die and she needed someone to turn to, I want you to know that no matter what her feelings might be, I would do the right thing by her. When a woman needs a man she can count on, it really is a father that knows best. He gave Critias a look that meant he should grasp some hard-won advice, a father is not a husband. Alice and Mandy need a father. The advice really resolved Critias's feelings about Alice. He had to be strong to guide her and the way that things needed to be. Anyway he rationalized it, the truth was that he lied when he said he would marry her. It was purely a tactical lie to get him what he wanted. He would never marry her even if he did somehow end up trapped in the past with no other option other than to stay, not when she turned 16 or even 26 for that matter. Critias loved Carmen and she was his one and only romantic interest. Alice would always be something else and after Jack's advice had clarified his mind, Critias knew what that would be. Being a father sounds better than an imaginary boyfriend, Critias told Jack to show his appreciation for the insight. Fathers don't always have to negotiate. Sometimes you can just put your foot down. In a perfect world, Jack agreed, but I think you'll find some negotiating will still be required. Teenage daughters can be as headstrong as any hunter when they get a thorn in their butt over an issue. Jack had a work-related detail that he considered. These images from Kevin show a likely refueling area along the river where we might just get the diesel we need for this thirsty lady. I'm hoping we can get it done with siphon hoses. If not, we also have a transfer trailer tank aboard for the job so long as somebody goes ashore with a truck to tow it. Will do, Critias accepted readily. If we're ahead of the sun with some hours to kill, we may as well spend them for profit. 
While he reached for his microphone, Jack said, I'll tell them to get the gear ready. The topic gave Critias an idea. What do you think about using the water hoses on the ghouls? I bet a high pressure line would knock those bastards off a bridge with no trouble at all. Jack considered it then replied, Sounds like it would be worth a try. The decontamination hoses are ready on the ferry deck for washing off the meat jumpers and in case of fire. Try them out if you like. He puffed on his cigar as he came up with an idea of his own. There was a big game park up ahead where we're going, had lots of elk and bison. We could get a lot of meat from an elk. One of their bucks can get to a thousand pounds and we have plenty of hungry mouths that would appreciate a fresh steak. Just the broth from some stew would make my day complete. Critias made a wave to say he would get some if the opportunity presented itself and then he headed back down to check on Carmen and Alice. The storm picked up a bit, at least the wind did along with the thunder, while the rain kept on at its same steady pace. When Critias reached the bow, he told Alice, that was some nice shooting you did there. When you have them on you much closer. I advise that you put them down first over trying to get them clean through the head on your first try. Once they are on the ground, they're easier to finish off with another shot. She asked, how much closer? Alice didn't enjoy the thought of having the creatures actually jump on her. This close, Carmen patted her sword. You'll never be alone. You keep your head and we will be by your side to back you up. Just remember not to scream or run without thinking. Yelling will bring in more and running around crazy might find you alone and lost in the dark. I'll remember, she promised and meant it. Alice was in no hurry to go solo and that was before she even understood that trouble could just appear in subtle ways other than by choice. It was about two hours before sunset when the Thunder Child reached the mouth of a tributary river that spilled into their big river from the west. The waters that flowed out were a greenish blue compared to the muddy brown they had seen so far. As Jack positioned to take the boat upstream in the new river, he radioed, it will be low bridges the whole way in and we pass under the first one in two miles. It is limbo time, so lower the crane boom to the deck and fold down the main antenna. Defense teams on deck prepared to repel possible boarders, loading team and milk wagon crew on deck. Prepare to deploy for refueling hop. Critias come up to the pilot house. He advanced at a modest speed beyond the excess required to overcome the current that flowed against them. The new river was only a seventh as wide as the great waterway they left behind. The sight of their new course made it clear why Jack had waited for the water to be in flood stage before they attempted to make a journey up into it. The paddleboat ran a shallow draft for a boat of its great size, but they would still need luck to avoid bottoming out if they ran into some shallows. As Fat Jack advanced cautiously, the teams deployed into their ready positions. When Critias arrived at his window they had spoken through, Jack handed him a plastic laminated map marked up with highlighted details. After a moment to look it over, Critias said, this fuel depot is not exactly on the river. How can you get siphon lines all the way to this yellow box marked here? Jack explained, worst case scenario is that you will have to use the milk wagon and that towable transfer tank I told you about. It can hold a thousand gallons and has its own fluid pump with everything else you'll need, all in perfect working order. It won't take long. That location has lots of heavy machinery you can see parked all over the place. The yellow box marks one of their two refueling storage tanks. It's possible that looters drank the thing dry already, but we're betting against that. I'm counting on driving up that canal you see there. It seems dry in that photo, but that's because Kevin took it before the river came up this much. By my calculations, it is our highway to the honey tree. We can go all the way up to that little bridge there and suck the fuel right into our tanks. Critias nodded a lot as he played out the scenario in his head and it did seem totally plausible, even easy if everything went in their favor. Only one aspect of it still rubbed him the wrong way. I'm leaving Alice with you if I have to take my crew ashore in the wagon. You'll take her with you, Jack insisted. It's too late now to baby her along. This will be a quick in and out. About as easy as things ever get. It will be a good opportunity for her to get her feet wet. The real mission might take all night and it won't be any kind of cakewalk. If things don't go as I hope, and the bad weather holds, we might sleep the day away on the river, and then spend two nights getting this done right. If Alice is going to crap her shorts when the locals scratch at the windows, I'd rather find out now than later. It's time for her to put up or shut up. No more games. Critias found it difficult to overcome his instinct to protect Alice, it might be too soon. Jack had confidence in her and the milk wagon crew. He asked, how old are your marshals when they first go out in the field? Sixteen, Critias answered with the thought that he had won on that point, after ten years of training. Jack waved that off as nothing. I have a king that old, take her. You can take one of the guardsmen too if you think more guns will make it easier. Hitching the trailer can only be done by hand. 
Yes, sir, Critias confirmed his orders and then headed off to get it done. The sir formality just came out, mostly inspired by the fact that Jack's orders overruled his own desires concerning Alice, but he would do what he was told. Just inside the river mouth was a pair of anchored barges that redirected the current away from the far bank and prevented it from eroding away the foundations of an old boatyard. Once they passed that, the first bridge was already visible up ahead, a long rusty overdeck truss and trestle for railway. From a distance, it lent considerable doubt that the paddle wheeler would have enough space to slip beneath it, and even if it did, there would be no difficulty for a ghoul to step right off onto the roof of the pilot house. Critias told Carmen and Alice, you two go up front and sharpshoot any pedestrians you see. Keep the noise to a minimum if you please. Let's keep the freaks in their beds if at all possible. While they went off, he showed his laminated map to Gloria. Critias wanted her to familiarize herself with the milk wagon aspect of refueling, should it come to that. They might have to drive quite a distance if they couldn't find a quality place to put the truck ashore. Gloria asked, this is from the new satellite pictures? Very nice, we never had it this easy before having to snoop and snatch the old-fashioned way. From the looks of this, seems easy enough to me. She swiped away water droplets for a clearer view of the satellite photograph, the place looks as lifeless as the moon. No self-respecting cannibal would want to hang around in a location like that. It seems really isolated too, with water and ravines on three sides, should work nicely to our advantage. The difficulty I see is having the crane set us down. If we end up in some muddy shallows where we have to attach the transfer trailer too, and the bottom is soft, we might not move an inch, since the tank is empty going in, we could be alright I guess. Get nasty about it, Critia searched. What should we do to make sure that doesn't happen? She harumphed at him as if he asked for it, you should jump over the side first and then stomp around in your boots a bit to find us some rocky bottom. This spot way up here looks promising. It looks like it was a concrete drainage flow or maybe an old boat ramp that could be good. And here, this looks like a recreational vehicle and boating storage park. Gloria started to count them in her head. The parking lot had at least a dozen large RVs, maybe 20 motorboats on their tow trailers still under storage covers, and some water jet bikes too. Maybe we need one of those speedboats while we're in town. They should be in good condition with their tarps still strapped. The two guards that had assisted Critias at Radio City were aboard and ready for action. They wore long plastic ponchos to keep the rain out of their clothes. Hey kid, Critias called to the younger of the two. You want to earn a cookie? We could use an extra rifle if we have to go into town for some engine juice. The guard needed to look behind himself to make sure Critias spoke to him. After his problems with Alice and Carmen, he didn't imagine he would receive any invitation from them. He asked to be certain, you want me? Critias waved him to approach, you got a name? Bean, the guard answered, everybody calls me Bean. Well? He asked. Do you want to ride shotgun? Or would you prefer to stay on the boat with the purse swinging ladies? Bean looked around again as if he wondered if any of the others took offense at being ladies when apparently he was a cut above by implication. Okay, sure, he agreed with a hesitation born of the flattery since he was not the nervous sort when it came to the infected. I'll do anything you need, sir. After a moment he asked, is Alice coming too? Critias gave the kid a deeper study as he tried to gauge why he asked, do girls make you nervous, Bean? Maybe you're thinking about rubbing your pecker up against her leg again? No, sir, Bean answered while reaching up to rub his head. He had a hat on and a poncho hood over that, so he quickly put his arm back down realizing that the gesture was a bit of a giveaway that she did make him nervous after some fashion. Bean, avowed, there was never any rubbing, sir. I swear, I never laid a hand on either one of them. I'd never seen anything like that before. I'm just pulling your leg, Critia told him. I know firsthand how cunning a little troublemaker Alice can be when she puts her mind to it. The lesser man dwells on the past. It would have been a damn shame if Carmen had not interrupted you when she did. If things had progressed, Jim might have hanged you over it. As far as misunderstandings go, I'd say Carmen actually did you a favor. Well, you're on the team then, Beans. Good to have you aboard. Bean saluted from the poncho brow, anything you say, sir. The paddleboat was just about to the bridge, and from a close perspective, it was clear that they would slip under safely enough, but only because the Thunder Child was all flat deck and near the water just like an ironclad she took name after. There was no sign of ghouls anywhere up on the track or anywhere else among all the flooded trees to either side. They went through without even a hint of opposition. Jack decided to pick up the pace a bit to take advantage of a deep straightaway that looked more trustworthy than what they had traveled prior. 
they advanced a kilometer to where the river started to bend its course to the right. Carmen called Jack on the radio from her position at the bow where she watched ahead. I believe we have trouble coming up, she warned. Carmen converted her metric measurements into his standard, one mile up is a roadway bridge and it has some activity. Visibility conditions are too poor at this time for me to be more certain aside from the conspicuous movement. It was reason enough for Jack to throttle the boat back to take a moment so they could make some sense of what their risk could be. Carmen stared ahead in her effort to glean details that were more specific. As she watched, a group of white-tailed deer distracted her with their movement. They came out from the trees on the edge of the river to starboard. Quite unexpectedly, they leaped right into the river in an effort to swim across to the other side. After Carmen witnessed their panicked behavior, she ran to tell her husband, something is very wrong here. She leaned back her head to sniff at the wind, do you smell that? He ran on filtered air. In all honesty, he didn't smell anything at all. On the other hand, his filters did monitor the air quality, if he bothered to look, which he did. The system reported there was some hydrogen sulfide in the air in parts per million under a point triple zero. He asked, you smell rotten eggs, right? Nasty old water is supposed to smell like that. Not like this, she disagreed. A moment later, the wind changed to come down from the north. That was the same area that the deer seemed desperate to escape away from. Critia says reading jumped up to two parts per million, then ten, and then dropped back down to the almost smelly range. He asked her, how much of that stuff can my suit take? She readily answered, you could endure 800 parts per million as I could, but not forever. That level of exposure for over eight hours would lead to various unpleasant problems, but I don't see that happening anyway, at least we better hope not. If we did enter a cloud that concentrated, you, I, and Alice would be the only people alive to talk about it. He pointed to where the deer came from, what is over that way that could release that much poison gas? Kevin contacted Critias after he received an interlink burst report from Carmen, there is a sewage treatment facility 1200 meters to your northeast. I believe that a combination of accumulated corrosion since the outbreak combined with pressures from all this rain has resulted in a catastrophic failure of containment. We have no way of knowing exactly how much of that highly dangerous gas accumulated in their underground storage silos or in the rest of the attached sewer network in general, but clearly there is a lot and it is displacing to the surface in your immediate area. My advice is that you continue on out of that location as quickly as possible. Because that gas is heavier than air, it will collect along the ground where obstructions can keep the wind from dispersing it. In my opinion, the danger will stay confined to the general vicinity of the leak, such as where you are now. If the wind had been steady or perhaps in your direction, you may have discovered this when the crew all started suffering symptoms. The good news is, with all this rain, it probably won't explode. After he realized they were in serious danger, Critias radioed to Jack, we need to get moving immediately. There is a cloud of hydrogen sulfide gas from a leak just northeast of us. It's driving all the animals out of the area and presumably all the freaks too. I'll bet my wife's sweet ass that many of the evacuating meatheads are fleeing over that bridge up ahead. They can handle the fumes a whole lot better than we can. I'm not sure what effect a good dosing would have on their behavior. It might make them more crazy than usual. Based on his own extensive knowledge in engineering and construction related hazards, Jack understood right away what Critias talked about. He pushed the throttle up to get them out of the area. Critias radioed Kevin, can you give us a sky's eye on this bridge coming up ahead? Carmen thinks she sees some activity on it. We can hardly see a damn thing from down here. Kevin answered, I can give you radar imagery only. Cloud cover is too heavy for visible wavelength photography at this time. He sent Critias the radio reflection data that revealed abandoned cars on the bridge's road deck. On the eastern side was a line of large vehicles that from their orderly formation suggested that there had been a military quarantine barricade with the river as an infection firebreak. Roger that, Critias confirmed the message. We'll kick up a survey popper. The cloud cover seems high enough for that from our side. He radioed to Carmen, when we hit 700 meters out, put up a big brother eye to see what's on that bridge. We can't stay here and we don't want to turn around and go home. That means we have to bust on through. Critias headed up to speak with Jack. Carmen hurried to the milk wagon while carrying her Tesla Flux rifle. She retrieved a surveillance pod from their equipment she had stored there. It was a device similar to a large rifle propelled grenade that launched by the same means. As she returned to the bow, Carmen loaded the pod seating rod into the barrel of her rifle. When they were 700 meters out, about half the remaining distance from when she first sighted the bridge, she elevated her rifle's aim for a high arc and then fired the pod up into the sky. When the device reached maximum altitude, 
it deployed a pair of wing shoots similar to Critias's aerial illumination flare. It flew intelligently to ride on the chaotic gusts of wind. The little drone trained multiple sophisticated cameras down onto the bridge and also at the nearby countryside for an intimately close inspection that it wirelessly transmitted back to them. Critias put his face to Jack's window and then used his helmet's laser projection system to video display the returned images onto the opposite wall. Jack could see everything that the drone did. Lushly forested urban centers were to both the east and west sides of the bridge. Thousands of residential homes with the usual support businesses assured that the territory had a heavy population of potential trouble. The low-lying areas along the riverbanks were strips of soggy woodland barely above lakes of inundated flood buffer zone. The sewage treatment plant was gigantic, the size of a neighborhood on its own. The wind direction pushed the toxic cloud mostly to the northeast where it inundated the wind-sheltered security of those thickly wooded suburbs. The high concentration of poison gas drove out everything that was capable of escape, animal and ghoul alike. Because rivers cut off all lines of retreat toward the south and the east, most of the fleeing inhabitants escaped on the bridge, situated perfectly as it was for egress. There was a whole bevy of crazed ghouls directly ahead of the Thunder Child. Thermal images from Carmen's drone detected many thousands of ghouls that were on the move and hundreds were already on the bridge. To make matters even worse, the infected from the western side also headed in the direction of the bridge as they chased and fed upon the retreating wildlife whose sharper instincts had put them on the move first. While the sun still shined enough for there to be dim light to see by, there was no chance that they would slip the paddle boat past unnoticed. There are a lot of them on that bridge, Jack growled already determined to make a run at them. He took his microphone to give orders. All defense teams prepare to concentrate fire off the bow against the bridge ahead. It's scrawling with infected and we have no choice but to hammer straight through. Once we pass under, about face and stand ready to defend our stern. Decontamination teams prepare the hoses. Jack pushed up the throttle to take the bridge straight on at top speed with no attempts at evasion. Critias knew from the maps that they were a long way from their target destination. Any trouble at the bridge would have no chance to follow them so much further up the river. In light of that, he saw no need to be quiet about how they cut a path through them. As he headed around the pilot house to where a pair of 50 caliber military machine guns graced the exterior corners at deck level, Critias radioed to Henry, come up here and man one of these heavy guns. He left the port side gun to Henry as he moved around to the starboard mount. When Henry arrived, they unzipped the weatherproof covers and then chambered the first rounds of their ammunition belts. The guns were not the lighter aircraft models that relied on high winds and cold air at altitude to cool them. They were the long and heavy models with the perforated heatsink shields along their thick barrels. The feeder cries of excited ghouls started up even before it became obvious where their voices originated. The freaks wailed mournfully with frequent peaks of shrieked emotional bloodlust. Infected who were still much too far away to make out individually had no trouble seeing a huge riverboat as it approached their positions along the riverbank at the furthest ends of the bridge. Even if they were crazy and stupid, ghouls had enough wits about them to readily recognize that a paddle boat was a human inhabited contraption. Whatever it was about uninfected humans, it made the creatures insane with desire. Perhaps they only wanted to kill something they hated or some lingering part of their humanity sought help from their tragedy and that sent the ghoulish parts of their minds into berserk resentment. Whatever it was, the enticement of the paddle boat was an attraction that went far beyond any mere appetite for food. The Thunder Child filled the damned with an irresistible need to kill, food or not. Their love-hate homicide vocally spread at the speed of sound from one spittle-frothing lunatic to the next. The thick pilings of the bridge footings narrowed the river's flow, which caused it to increase in pressure that would dramatically slow the paddle wheeler when it had to overcome the channel. Even when throttled up to full, the Thunder Child was still a rectangular barge at heart that handled like a pig always short on haste. Ghouls gathered at the near edge of the bridge along the central channel where the water was deepest. Since they knew the boat was coming, there was no more illusion of secrecy. A great multitude collected from either end of the bridge to make a fight of it and the boat was already committed to the passing. Critias used his loudspeaker to command the deck crew, get your goggles and respirators on. This is going to get bloody. If they get aboard, think before you accidentally shoot up each other or our boat. Henry positioned his ear covers and then waved to Critias that he was sent to go. Several ghouls spilled off the bridge as those behind them shoved up to get a better view. Some of them clung to the steel beams of the outer structure while others made the short fall to the water that left them swimming. The easy fall proved that any jumpers that did manage to hit the boat would still be able to get up unharmed to make a fight of it. The firing angle at the ghouls would ascend to vertical as the paddle boat got under the bridge. That would make their defensive fire the most difficult just as it became the most critical. Firing would become impossible for the mounted heavy machine guns that could no longer angle up to that high degree. As the final moment approached, 
Critias wondered if he wouldn't have sent all the guns to the stern where they might have been more effective, but it was too late for any redeployments. On the upside, from their slightly elevated positions alongside the pilot house, Critias and Henry had the most advantageous angle along with the two most devastating weapons. The whole crew stood gawking in stunned silence as they awaited the general order to open fire. Henry didn't need orders because he was already a professional expert at his job that had only one real technical skill, which as a forager gunner was to know when to pull a trigger. He shouted over the din of infected screams and then pressed the thumb toggle trigger of his weapon system, light these fuckers up. Bolts of flaming hot light along with a laser ray of tracers torched from the muzzle of Henry's machine gun. It spit out spent shell casings the size of sausages that tinkled around on the deck like so many falling bells. The concrete lip of the bridge disintegrated as the odd hit smashed up the cement like it was chalk. Most of the rounds cleared the railing to utterly mutilate the densely packed ghouls they struck instead. There was no mere penetration from such overwhelming energy. When hit, a ghoul just came apart, much as when Critias had been in the hotel lobby and amped his rifle up to 15,000 jewels to rip his enemies in half. Henry dished out that level of punishment, only worse, and at a belt fed fully automatic rate. The flying eye still provided a close overhead watch. Critias relied on its information to guide his own aim. He could literally place his tracers from a bird's eye view to lay bursts of bullets into the deepest assemblies of foes. From his advantaged view for observation, he could tell that a lot of the infected would not arrive at the killing zone until about the time the Thunderchild passed under the bridge. That was when the crew would no longer be in proper position to cull their numbers. When their boat emerged out on the far side of the bridge, an even larger wave of ghouls would flood over the railing like a waterfall to come down right on their heads. From that eventuality, Critias realized Jack's wisdom that had motivated him to amass their guns at the bow. From there, the mass defenders would be in the ideal position for repelling them. The real defense of the boat would take place on the more problematic side. As he thought quickly about what to do, Critias abandoned many of the potential responses available to him because either they risked severe damage to the bridge, perhaps even to collapse portions of it, or he might rain body parts onto the boat so as to expose everyone to a drench of contamination. He knew he had to do something clever and quickly. With that simplistic necessity in mind, Critias realized that he needed to call upon the most powerful weapon in his arsenal. Critias shouted over the loudspeaker in his helmet to be audible over his thundering gun, Carmen, get up here, Tiki Tavi. Carmen left the firing line at the bow. She sprinted up the nose of the milk wagon, ran right over the top, and then leaped down to stand ready next to Critias. He told her, this isn't going to work. Go up there and do your thing. I'll see you on the other side. She grinned at the opportunity to unleash her full talents. Carmen vaulted upward to grab onto the top edge of the pilot house where she flipped over to stand on the roof. For the moment, she made rifle shots from this elevated position to great effect. Carmen waited for the proper moment when the gunman would be too near the bridge for effectively repulsing the infected onslaught any longer. Her weight proved to be short as the Thunderchild thrashed ever closer to the bridge. The fire of the general defense continued for just long enough that Carmen had time to drain her rifle's ammunition magazine. After she put her rifle down, Carmen drew her sword in one hand and took out a fuel air grenade for her other. Just as the Thunder Child frothed its way beneath the bridge to enjoy a moment of safety like in the eye at the center of a hurricane, Carmen leaped up to the bridge's road deck. It was an easy jump for her since the roof of the pilot house nearly scraped the underside of the bridge's superstructure. Everyone but Critias started a hasty reload of their weapons, which included Henry who skillfully locked in a new ammo belt to be prepared for a second round. Critias left his heavy machine gun because he needed to be ready to climb up onto the roof of the pilot house the moment it became available. Being up there was the only way that he would dissuade the defenders at the bow from accidentally blowing away his wife when she eventually emerged on the new side of the bridge to jump back down to him. Critias also readied his pistol just in case he needed to provide her with some cover. He anxiously watched the action above through the aerial camera. Critias witnessed as Carmen tossed her grenade to the far side of the bridge even before she had first landed on the roadway. From the moment that it bounced off the inner edge of the opposite guard barrier, the handheld bomb began to spew out its oily mixture of heavy gas that spread as a seeping mist that clung tenaciously to itself like an evil fog. All the shooting had left the roadway awash with ripped apart shredded bodies. Hundreds more fresh replacement ghouls sprinted in from both ends of the bridge. The reinforcements would arrive before the paddle boats managed to get out of their leaping range. Several dozen minorly injured ghouls were still present and capably mobile having only lost an arm or a chunk of their face in the gunfire. Those wounded had just turned about to make a run for the opposite side to then leap in pursuit of the Thunder Child, only Carmen's sudden and unexpected arrival made them pause with a moment of indecision. 
The riled freaks sensed no humanity in Carmen for them to despise and they also saw no humanity in her grave walking rags. As Carmen began to hack the nearest of them apart with her sword while she made she shouts to focus her power, they only heard the natural, fury of an enraged predator so akin to a hunter of their own aggregation. Their doubts and confusion only ended as she carved flesh from their bodies. By then it was already too late for the ghouls to save themselves. Carmen slashed a murderous path of carnage straight through them like a whirlwind of malevolency. She hurled up blood and severed fingers that sprinkled down around her with the same tranquility as the falling raindrops. Critias climbed up onto the roof of the pilot house even as he saw from the overhead drone that his wife was about to return to him. Once he was up top, he turned back to wave down the rifleman behind him, hold your fire. Carmen is up there. The armed crew found it difficult to restrain themselves in all the excitement. They still got the message because Critias stood directly in their line of fire as he waved for them to hold. Carmen Summers alted off the near side of the bridge with pistol in hand. Even as she flew upside down at a twist, she used her handgun to blast down ghouls with precision shots. The instant she fell below the raised edge of the concrete guardrail, she activated the plasma igniter on the fuel air grenade she had left behind up above. The spark detonated the highly volatile mist that had first so efficaciously dispersed. The cement road deck and its guardrail lip barrier focused the fiery explosion along a path of least resistance. The energy expanded upward and outward from the guardrail, which reflected it away from Carmen. The blast wave flung up or away all those infected on that bridge section. The bodies and their parts flew through the sky to splash down in the river in the wake of the escaping paddle boat. Those ghouls who approached from the side directions of the bridge had the same energy fling them back to tumble aflame along the rough road surface. The fireball still grew in the sky over the bridge as Carmen came down to have Critias catch her on his arm to steady her landing on the wet roof of the pilot house. With eyes only for him, she asked, you wanted something like that? Perhaps a bit theatrical, he said pleased as he embraced her. They turned to see the crowd at the bow. All of them gazed up at them in slack-jawed astonishment. Critias told her, you were magnificent as always. The flying observation pod piloted down for recovery. It retracted its sail at the last moment as Carmen holstered her pistol to catch it for reuse as if it were a hunting hawk that had returned to her hand. Mandy was the first with the composure to speak, stay right there, Lady Carmen. You need decontamination. She grabbed up a soapy scrub bucket then rushed that way to clean her off. Fajag spoke over the speaker, what are all of you gawking at? This isn't a pleasure cruise. I want a thorough deck inspection and hose off any mess. We still have a job to do. While the rest of the crew made certain nothing infected had landed on the boat from the explosion on the bridge, Gloria held conference with Fat Jack in an effort to decide the best way for them to get the milk wagon ashore to gather some fuel for their boat. The Thunder Child advanced four kilometers in short order by the fading light of sunset and the growing music of frogs that sang to the chirps of insects. They rounded a bend in the river where they encountered another roadway bridge that was all but identical to the first they had just gone under. Rather than continue forward, Jack slowed into a starboard turn to enter a narrow canal flanked by flooded trees. The course was only half again as wide as their riverboat but it proved sufficiently deep to grant them entry. There was a strong outgoing current that revealed it was inland rainwater drainage as its source. Jack advanced them slowly ever mindful of the risk. He had several of the crew members keep careful watch off the bow to check for sunken trees or a sudden shallow. Their way was mostly straight with just an easy constant left curve that came to an abrupt end 500 meters in at a very convenient canal bridge. The bridge was especially stout for use by heavy construction equipment that had once serviced an exceedingly barren and lifeless rock quarry that dominated the whole of the immediate vicinity. A multitude of bulldozers and dump trucks sat parked in two rows only a stone's throw from where they stopped at the bridge. Crewmen promptly hurled grappling lines to the bridge guardrail to anchor the boat stationary against the rush of the current. After Jack had the crane crew start to move the fuel trailer onto the bridge, he gave instructions to Critias. You take the milk wagon to the maintenance shed over there while I get our siphon hoses to the fuel depot tank. Pump out the fuel tanks and these trucks to fill the wagon and your pony. We can deliver your carrier tank to the castle for our reservoir there. See what you can swipe from their tools and welding gear or whatever else they have that is worth claiming. He showed Critias his laminated satellite photo of their location again. The river, some canals, and multiple deep quarry lakes surrounded the whole location on three sides. The interior was a desolate landscape of hard compacted crushed limestone that trucks had beaten down until it was meters deep so that no plants could ever take root. It wasn't the kind of site that would garner much attention from hungry infected and nothing could approach them across the coverless ground without them being able to spot it long before it became a threat. Critias had to agree it was an ideal location and they couldn't have hoped for a better opportunity. 
they wouldn't even get any mud on their tires and there seemed to be more fuel and tools than they could ever haul away. We'll stay in close contact, he pledged as he headed to round up his people. Once he was down on the ferry deck, Critias told their new ride along guard, Let's go, Bean. We've got work to do and you're coming with us. The crane crew carefully lowered the fuel trailer and then the milk wagon onto the small bridge. After that, they hoisted the heavy coils of interconnecting hose sections Jack would use to suck the diesel out of the main storage tank that was only 65 meters from the boat. They would take their hoses by an indirect route, that was perhaps half again longer, just to stay out on open ground where it was safer, and even then, it would only require two coils they could readily deploy in the manner of firemen. Personnel crossed to the bridge over an aluminum gangplank. Two guards with suppressed rifles stood watch atop a massive dump truck's overcab loading shield while two others did the same atop the pilot house to watch the other side. The sun had officially set by the time Gloria got the milk wagon underway. The first line of large trucks they would procure fuel from was close enough to be under the watchful eyes of the guards on the dump truck. Critias had Henry escort Bean as he pumped their fuel tanks dry. He put Alice and Carmen on the roof of the milk wagon to keep a more distant watch with their superior night vision while Gloria stayed behind the wheel in case they needed to make a quick exit. The maintenance shed nearby was 700 square meters of interior space with a second upper floor. A line of bulldozers parked outside provided the remaining fuel they needed to top off all their tanks. After Carmen picked the locks, they moved inside to loot. Gloria had knowledge about the mechanical aspects of forager interests. She recommended, start with consumable stuff. We need grinding wheels, bolts, welding rods and wire, anything like that. In the hour that Jack spent topping off the Thunder Child's enormous fuel tanks, Critias's crew loaded the milk wagon with industrial supplies. The guards outside reported five shootings of ghouls they had dropped while far enough away that the creatures never knew what hit them. In addition to cordless power tools, pneumatic hoses, and an industrial quality pressure washer, Critias found an enormous rock-breaking jackhammer suitable for mounting on the hydraulic arm of a construction vehicle. It was ideal for the mining operations that were currently ongoing back home in their cities underground. They even found numerous extra replacement chisel bits. On their way back to the boat, Critias noticed Carmen pause to stare off at a truck parked alone in the distance. What's that? He asked her. More fuel? She told him, it has fuel tanks if that's what you mean. I was considering if we had any use for that much explosives. Critias repeated her answer, explosives? It seemed like just another large truck to him, aside from the fact that the tank it carried was rectangular rather than cylindrical. How much explosives are we talking about? She made an educated guess, 4500 kilograms of anfo I would imagine, assuming it is full. She shrugged on her assumption that it would be more trouble than it was worth owing to the difficulty of taking it anywhere. We know where to find it if we ever need that sort of thing. The idea caught his interest, how much damage could it do? How much damage? She had to consider that. If it went off inside the lobby of King's Tower, it would bring the whole building down on the spot. At the very least, we would be looking for a new place to live. That gave Critias a new thing to worry about, that watcher lady could park that at our house then blow it down? Carmen nodded, if she knew how to make use of it, she would need to mix it with diesel fuel or kerosene first and then provide a detonator. Critias glanced over at the diesel depot. Well, that wouldn't be hard to find. She stared at her husband thoughtfully before informing him of the reason why they should have let her kill Verloc when Carmen first suggested the idea. There are plenty of things lying around in this time that could be used to wipe us out, if she ever got it in her head to do it. I guess we just got lucky stumbling across this one. Carmen continued onto the wagon, or maybe you made a big mistake when you didn't go hunt that bitch down and then kill her when you had the chance of knowing where to find her. I guess we will have to wait around to find out. She halted to look back at him, right, Critias. He noticed how she used his name to make it sound derogatory. Her dislike for the Watcher Woman wasn't something that Carmen felt any need to keep hidden from him. Just the topic put her in an aggressive mood. Critias called Jack on the radio, we found a truck of explosives called Anfo. By the way they parked it when they left it, out by itself, safe to assume there is some in it. Leave it, Jack instructed. Let's load you up and then get moving. The crane crew reloaded the truck, trailer, and all the hoses without mishap and then Jack masterfully retreated the boat back down the canal. He made good use of the current to help carry them until they had safely exited back out onto the much wider river. Out of sight in the dark of night, Jack piloted them beyond the nearby roadway bridge. Later on, they passed beneath a highway bridge that had a steel fence atop the guardrail wall that prevented any jumper ghouls just as it had likely once prevented adventurous swimmers from attempting the same stunt. 
there was no moon and not a single visible star managed to shine through the heavy cloud cover. They ran entirely lightless as the Thunder Child snuck under seven more bridges without a single ghoul getting the opportunity to take advantage of their brief moments of vulnerability. Chapter 8 Brother A Wolf Under the cover of darkness and foul weather, Jack made careful watch of their GPS location to guide the Thunder Child. He piloted them into a barely noticeable canal that made an end around of a narrow wooded strip of levee that formed a faux riverbank. The canal allowed the paddle wheeler to enter an artificial lake that a river sand dredger had excavated out over many years of that resource harvesting enterprise. The hidden lake had gently sloping sand beaches that allowed the Thunder Child to nudge right up onto the distant shore. The support crews already had the milk wagon loaded with the tools Jack wanted. They craned the truck ashore the moment the boat made land. Once the vehicle demonstrated that the beach was solid enough to support its weight, they craned down two large pallets that they strapped to the roof cargo racks. Each pallet contained a meter-high bundle with a thick brown rubbery plastic that encased them. While the unloading teams did their work, the guards kept careful watch using their night vision goggles and suppressed rifles. None of them ever got the opportunity to shoot at any ghouls because Critius used his Tesla Flux rifle to dispatch the only three infected in the immediate area. His much superior sensory capabilities made the pitch black rainy night as serviceable as daylight. Critius could engage the ghouls at ranges well beyond the limits where other people could even see at all. So prepared, Jack left the Thunder Child under the command of the crane crew leader. The decontamination workers would remain behind, as would some of the guards needed to protect them. Jack climbed inside the milk wagon along with Gloria and Henry. He brought along two mechanics and two of the guards to watch over them as they worked. Critias clung onto the running board outside as did Alice and Bean. Carmen climbed up on top to sit on a pallet where she would use her suppressed MP5 to eliminate any ghouls unlucky enough to cross their path. While Gloria drove them off slow and quiet to avoid any unwanted attention, Jack gave his instructions over the team's radio channel. It's essential that our operation stays below radar. If we give ourselves away too soon and this turns into a major battle, we won't have any chance of getting this done. We can't have any unnecessary lights or noises of any kind. My group will be getting a bulldozer operational. Since we won't be able to try starting it until the last moment, it could mean that we will end up having to leave behind our principal objective. We won't have any way of knowing if it will run until everything else is complete. Critias will use as few people as he needs to escort Gloria in the milk wagon. They will hook up two towable trailers that we came here for and then deliver them back to the boat. The rest of us will be stuck out here alone without a ride while they're away. We need most of the guns to give us some protection in case things suddenly turn unpleasant. Barring any flat tires that Critias will have to repair, just hook them up and then quietly take them back to the boat for a loading aboard. The third trailer is 45 feet long and weighs about 75,000 pounds. That is going to be the really tricky part of this, and that's why moving it must wait till last, assuming I get that bulldozer operational at all. We will try to cut off as much of the unnecessary weight as we can from that big one. That work will have to wait too until the smaller trailers are loaded. Even with shields to block the view, light from the cutting torches could bring us too much trouble. I'm no engineer, cried Tia's told Jack. But it seems to me there is no chance in hell of getting something that big onto the ferry deck, and even if we did, it would weigh us to the drag ass bottom of the river. Exactly so, Jack confirmed the observation. That is why we have those fuel bladders on the roof. Each one could normally hold 10,000 gallons of fluid to end up looking like giant rubber hot dogs. They're quality merchandise, plenty puncture resistant to the exclusion of any serious accident like us spearing them onto a tree. After we fill them with air. They will be our outrigger pontoons for rafting the bad boy all the way home. The crane barge will take over from there and then Jim will have his new toy he sent us here for. After you drop off your second trailer, they will load you up with the compressed air bottles we will need for the next stage of our operation. The kilometer drive to their destination was pleasantly remote. Gloria took them through an unvegetated sandy wasteland and then between some heaps of waste rock that was the spore of the sand mine. From there. They passed through another barren landscape of many hillocks comprised of old tree material on one side and the fine landscaping mulch they ground up into on the other. That mulching process took place on that site at an industrial landfill scale. Gloria finally stopped beside the largest trailer, the one they would take last. It sat out in the middle of a large cleared work area, right beside it was the bulldozer that had once been its work partner. The trailer had a 3 meter plus diameter circular tub mouth so large that it needed the bulldozer's bucket just to keep it fed. At the bottom of the trailer's tub was a hammer mill of stump shredding grinder. The tree stump heating grinder trailer was an impressive apparatus in both its cumbersome size and its capacity to devour anything that fell into its cavernous mouth. Whether it was tree stumps, huge logs, 
or just leaves. Anything that went into the tub grinder would find itself consumed by the pulverizing rotary jaws. That Jai not only planned to take the giant machine, but also to float it down the river as if it was a boat unto itself, was a plan that seemed audacious in the extreme. The immediate blessing to the design was that the bulldozer was already nearby, which would allow the guards to protect all the mechanics inside the same area as a single force. Jack and his team quietly disembarked and then unloaded all their equipment from the back of the milk wagon. Everyone needed to work together to lift down the pallets with the heavy fuel bladders. While Jack and his mechanics started renovating the bulldozer by replacing all of its oil and fuel, Critias got his team ready for their own mission. Critias left Henry in the milk wagon to protect Gloria while he kept Alice and Bean by his side. He wanted to personally watch out for them because they were both novice teenage youths of limited experience. He told Carmen, I want you to sneak over there. Critias pointed out a now familiar sign that indicated one of the numerous urban convenient store gas and shop places. They had one that bordered right along the property with its back to them. The two smaller tub grinder trailers that Critias needed to take were each about the size of a small truck. They were both in sight, only about 75 meters to the east. Those towable vegetation grinders sat in paint designated parking spaces on the border of the property. The back door to the gas station he wanted Carmen to loot as a target of opportunity was about the same distance away, only to the south from the trailers he wanted. Carmen understood his intentions, but she asked, what do you want me to put all this stuff in? He looked around to locate a commodious solution to that problem and then said, let's ride over to hook up the first grinder, then I'll show you. The four of them rode outside on the running boards as Gloria slowly drove them over the short distance. She instinctively backed up their hitching ball to the tongue of the first trailer with her amazing accuracy. While Critias led Carmen toward the filling station, he left Alice with Henry to stand guard over Bean as the kid hitched the trailer to the ball on the truck. The mulching yard had numerous rectangular flatbed trailers that had previously hitched behind civilian pickup trucks for transport of residential quantities of the mulch product. One of those trailers sat in a parking space that was directly behind the filling station. With Carmen's help, Critias quietly pushed the trailer through the grass until they had positioned it right outside the gas station building's rear service door. He waited for Carmen to pick the lock and then go inside before he returned to the milk wagon to find them ready to deliver the first smaller grinder out to the paddle boat. Critias left Alice and Bean behind to help guard Jack while he went on ahead with Gloria and Henry to make their delivery to the Thunder Child. He climbed up onto the roof of the milk wagon where he could ride shotgun from an elevated position. Though his MP5 remained handy. Critias preferred his Tesla Flux rifle for that situation. It was the better weapon for sharpshooting any ghouls they discovered prowling through the area. By leaving the novices with Jack, Critias hoped to concentrate on the situation at hand without having to worry about anyone else. He was careful to radio ahead so that the Thunder Child's cautious and perhaps nervous rifleman knew that the truck was coming. With his rifle amped back to a silent setting, Critias had a limited effective range. The wind had died down as the rain slowed to a constant drizzle. He had Gloria stop twice so that he could knock down a wandering ghoul from 200 meters out. Both were clean shots through the head without a sound from the meat or the rifle. They were nearly at the boat when he spotted something else off in the distance. He saw a railroad spur about a half kilometer in from the river. The track supplied what was clearly a sizable lumberyard as he judged from the open side of roof shelters that kept the wood dry. What he found of interest there was a hill of halite rock salt that had apparently arrived by rail for the purpose of de-icing city roads during winter months. After the fall of man, that salt had become a point of interest for the growing population of elk that lived in the national park forest that was immediately off to their southwest. Critias counted a herd of elk there with 30 members, mostly cows, but with a fair number of calves among them, all of them licked at the salt pile. The cows, remained fully attentive, but otherwise did not seem nervous. Critias took that as a good sign because they told him there were no infected tribes in the area that hunted them. Any lone ghoul would surely take a savage beating if it tried to attack an elk on its own. A normal ghoul would pull out its own teeth sooner than it would manage to bite a hole through elk hide. An elk would simply stomp a ghoul as casually as it would a coyote. For the moment, an elk hunt was out of the question for Critias since it would require a loud shot and then a trip out to collect the carcass. Work came first, so he just had to hope the elk would still be around for later once Jack was ready to leave. The crane crew swiftly descended on the grinder as soon as the milk wagon arrived. They hoisted it up onto the deck by battery power and then in return, they lowered the first supply of compressed air cylinders for delivery to Jack. Mandy waved from on deck to indicate that everything was calm enough around the paddle boat. Much like the elk cows, her mood spoke volumes about the absence of local predators. The milk wagon headed back to drop off the first gas cylinders for Jack. 
Critias jumped down from the roof to unload them and also see how things were going. The mechanics busily installed a new battery, a new fuel pump, and new glow plugs into the bulldozer. They had already removed the starter motor to clean and then test it. That would soon be on its way back in as well. Jack told Critias, this is looking good, not much in the way of corrosion on this beauty. When you're finished with those two trailers, we'll need you standing by here while we trim some of the fat off that beast. By beast, he meant the giant main grinder trailer. I have Carmen cleaning out that fuel station shop over there, Critias informed Jack. After we drop off this other grinder, I need to pick her up and her flatbed of goodies. That should only take a few minutes. Jack gave him a curious look, going off mission a bit, isn't it? It officially never happened, was Critias's answer. Nobody back home sees us stuffing a little extra down our pants. Jack cautioned him, don't get greedy. Critias headed back for the truck, I won't. We will keep you up to speed with everything going on. The elk still licked salt as before when Critias went by with the milk wagon to deliver the second grinder. The crane crew took it aboard and then set them up with the rest of the air tanks for a quick turnaround. They also loaded them up with a large box of cargo straps to deliver as well. Critias radioed Carmen once the bottles and box of straps were with Jack's crew. You finished yet, princess? All done, she replied. I'm taking my last load out now. He brought Alice and Bean along on the milk wagon as Gloria took them over to the rear of the filling station. Gloria easily backed and across the grass for a perfect lineup with a hitch on the flatbed mulch trailer. They arrived to find Carmen sitting back against the trailer she had just loaded with everything worth looting from the store. It was a substantial haul indicative of a take-everything policy that made sure to make use of the trailer's capacity. At the moment, Carmen waited with her unsheathed sword in one hand and a human head in the other, presumably an infected one, dormant from lack of blood after she had sliced it off. There was no immediate clue as to why she just waited patiently with the head held by its hair. Displeased by her macabre display, Critias asked, What the hell are you doing? She held out the head at arm's length for him to look at the face, even telling him so, look at it. He complied because he loved her. It was a female child of perhaps ten years in age. All right, I've looked at it. Now, get rid of it. As Bean started to hitch up the trailer, he also did his best to act as if he hadn't noticed that Critias's wife had clearly cracked under the pressure. You need me to care, she said as she thrust the head at him. Carmen clearly implied that the one had everything to do with the other. I don't want to care she told him with another gesture of the head. They made me to do this, but not to care about it. You do this, and I did not need to care about it. Why do you make me do these horrible monstrous things, and then you tell me that I should care? He stepped up, took the head from her, and then flung it at the block wall to smash it, lest it someday recover and be tortured with existence. The act only made him seem extremely wicked and shockingly brutal to those not understanding his actual compassionate reasoning. In an absurd contrast to Carmen's anguished feelings, Critias did not even care if the others construed his destruction of the undead head as flagitious, which was extremely wicked in Carmen's manner of speaking. Totally self-absolved of concern, Critias lectured his wife, we only do what we have to if we want to survive. He offered his hand as a gesture for her to come along with him. Let's get that third grinder moved so we can go home, we can probably go back to the tower, to your nice apartment, to your bed. She whipped her sword with a perfect wrist snap that flung garish fluid from the wet blade. The blood scrolled a line along the wall that combined with the red spot from the head Critias threw. The accidental gore art they had made together seemed like a symbol or a frowning cyclops. As she gracefully sheathed her katana without looking, Carmen challenged him to be honest, knowing he wouldn't. What do these machines do, Critias? They make mulch, he was deliberately evasive just as she had expected. Carmen walked over and then stepped onto the running board of the milk wagon to leave. When he didn't move, she asked, make mulch out of what? She didn't bother to look at him. That was the broken head's job before he took it away from her and threw it. He told her, we don't care what they do or what they make mulch out of. It's not our problem what they do or do it to. We follow orders, not try to be the boss of everyone else. I'm sure Jim has his reasons. Our job is to bring them home, not tell him what to do with them after we do. Oh, Carmen said to show that she didn't agree with him on that. I very much have to care. It is you that need only be mindful of your duty. To really make the point, she added, no matter how many fat little lummox boys you have to toss into mulch grinders. Critias refused to banter philosophy with her anymore while on mission. He refused to even think about the worthy points she made. Instead, Critias admired her handiwork. She had placed much of the treasure from the store inside plastic trash bags to keep it all dry. 
You got us a lot of nice stuff here, he said as he picked up a can of ravioli to look at the label. We can have Italian for dinner. Alice abruptly drew her pistol and then pointed it at Critias. It was enough warning for Critias to spin about as he dropped to one knee with his own pistol already drawn. Even as he cleared Alice's line of fire, he put a bullet through the head of a ghoul that had just wandered around the corner of the building behind him. It had not the time to scream since it had accidentally blundered into them in the dark. An instant later, the ghoul would have called out to summon more of its kind. The ghouls who heard it would have also started to scream, and then all of them together would have called in thousands. Their whole mission could have just ended that easily. All while they argued like fools, off-task side looting amusing junk from a petrol station. It really was as amateur time as it sounded. While she fumbled to holster her pistol, Alice said, I'm sorry. He holstered his too, don't be. That was better than fine. You didn't think before you acted, and you didn't take a shot that would miss. He glanced at Carmen to speak of her, you were sharper than most of us. As Alice climbed onto the running board, she asked, do we do terrible things? No, he answered her promptly with certainty. The terrible thing is letting down the family. When you act for them, you are always a saint. When you hesitate or doubt, you are being selfish because that's caring only for yourself. He tapped the roof to get Gloria moving. When they stopped near Jack's crew, Critias got off with Alice and Bean. He sent Carmen ahead to unload her trailer at the boat. Before she left, Critias ordered his wife. I want you to stay there and make sure the Thunder Child remains safe. We need it to get home. Leave the trailer on the truck, we will use it to cart our tools out of here when they're done. I saw a herd of elk licking salt and I wonder if that might make them thirsty, perhaps to go down to the lake for a drink. Where game animals drink, hunters hunt. If we need you, I can call for you and you can run back here. Carmen said nothing, she merely nodded in agreement and then rode away with Gloria and Henry to carry out the task. Gloria returned a half hour later. She towed the flatbed trailer with two additional yet smaller fuel bladder crates to fulfill a request Fat Jack made by radio. After he and his mechanics had made a careful survey of the enormous grinder machine, they had agreed that to keep it afloat without sinking too deeply or rolling over on its side, they would need more of the buoyant bladders. Some nearby railroad ties that had escaped their fate of becoming mulched down the throat of the grinder got a second chance to be useful. The huge wooden beams helped in the laborious process as they removed the trailer's long and superfluous discharge conveyor that they would leave behind. It took two hours of hard work. At the same time, two of the mechanics went around the machine to jack the sunken tires up out of the mud and then fully pressurized them. Only after the trailer was up sufficiently on its own wheels did they have room to attach the fuel bladder bags around and underneath it at exacting positions. Even then, it was more labor to plug in all the various air hoses that they had to connect to the arsenal of mounted inflation bottles. Because Carmen could tap into the sensory signals from Alice and Critias as helmets, she stayed abreast of how their work progressed. As all the labor with the grinder neared its completion, Carmen arrived on foot with a precursory radio warning about her imminent approach. The mechanics had just stowed the last of their tools on the milk wagon and its tow trailer. I'd like to drive the bulldozer, Carmen volunteered to Jack. Critias can ride with the gas bottles to open them when the time is right. I can't let you do that, Jack refused her. This is my command and I can't bear the thought of leaving you here to do my job while I'm safe out on the river. Gloria can drive the boat as well as I can and maybe better. You and I can both drive this dozer, but only you can shoot the way you do. I can barely see at all in these damn goggles and the rain only makes them worse. I'll drive and you can sit on top keeping the hungry hippies off our backs. Jack radioed to Gloria, you get your truck loaded and then get the boat out onto the river. We'll need the crane to help lift while we inflate the bladders. The child will hold enough weight to keep the nose up for us. Gloria didn't fully understand the instructions. How do I hold her broadside in the current? Jack gave details. Once the bow crane has a bite on the trailer, it is going to keep the nose in position. Use the dredge anchor from the starboard side to secure the stern and make damn sure that you can cut the crane loose at a moment's notice. If this whole operation goes south, the full weight of this toppling behemoth plus the current will suck the child down with it. Copy that, she understood. Do you want to go as soon as possible? Jack told her, Kevin is keeping me updated on the weather. There is a new front moving in soon. I want to wait until the storm picks back up so that we have some noise to cover for this engine. We also have to scout out our exit route. You get the boat stationed and I'll keep you updated. She questioned, with no boat and no truck, what happens if you get into trouble? Jack answered calmly, I'm wearing a life jacket and I know how to swim. We can take care of ourselves. You take care of my boat. As soon as the milk wagon was on its way, Critias waved for Carmen and Jack to come with him.
Let's go scout out a route for this beast of yours. They searched out a path to the river that included a wide gap between the trees along the riverbank. Jack soon located a serviceable location where they could use the bulldozer to move the giant trailer into the water. Good fortune was with them because the best route went along paved roadway and then a firm parking lot area. They wouldn't have to traverse a lot of slick sinking mud, not that deep mud would have the remotest chance of stopping the progress of that tracked bulldozer. The entire distance of the trip would be about 200 meters. That was short enough for them to complete it before too many ghouls tracked them down because of all the noise. When they walked back to the bulldozer, Gloria called from the Thunder Child, We are loaded up and ready to depart. Do you have an ETA on that weather? Jack answered, We have a location about a hundred yards up from the bridge. It will be about sixty minutes before we try this. Then I want to wait here a while yet, she told him. Sitting that close to the bridge might draw some attention from that highway. I would rather not get them screaming at us a half hour before you even get started. Okay, Jack agreed. You hold tight for thirty minutes and then start moving the boat into position. We will lie low here. Chapter 9 A Pinch of Salt At the same time that Jack and his team waited for the weather to take its turn for the worse, the herd of elk still worked the salt lick. The cows remained acutely attentive to danger. They were not strangers to the place and well knew its underlying hazards. The salt was their motivation and necessity. It was worth the potential perils, as with any animal that had to risk predation to acquire some basic staple of survival. Likewise, nature, warped as it had become from its regular applications, had finely tuned their predator along those same principles, only that the necessity of salt back the hunter was to attain fresh meat in large quantities. For years, the enormous fiend had honed his strategy with success and failure. Salt back grew ever larger as the seasons passed and he fed on the animals that could not resist his salt lick home. Size was the gift inherent of the metabolic flaw that made his hunter kind, but only when they were able to feed it the many calories needed to sustain the body mass. Salt back had grown much too large to feed himself by chasing small animals. Running about burned up too much of his precious body fat, especially when the scramble only earned him mere morsels. In time, salt back had naturally drifted to a system based on what had served him best in the past. He preferred the art of ambush, which was hardly surprising for a huge predator with more in the way of deadly physical power than an endowment for sprinting. It had become the habit of salt back to burrow himself into the halite hill where the incrustation of salt had gradually burned his hide into thick armor plating worthy of a rhinoceros. From tunneling into the rocky heap on so many occasions, his regeneration had formed him bony claws on the ends of his fingers. They were like long enameled incisors that always grew anew such that he had to keep them honed down into keen blades not unlike teeth fit for a giant rat. By staying buried just below the surface of his salt, he would wait and listen as he felt every subtle vibration. Salt back would let his food come to him, as would some lurking crocodile. It was a large salt lick and his reach was limited, so he had learned to change his location and be patient until an elk, white-tailed deer, or tasty bison foolishly came close, often to browse directly over him. Only when he felt assured of a kill did he strike out, and when he did, only rarely did any prey escape his voracious appetite. Such was the unwitting mistake of the matron cow as her grazing finally blundered into the reach of salt back. She still bore the four parallel scars down her flank from where the two had met once a year before and she had survived, but not without injury. As the salt suddenly shifted around the emerging hunter, the cow instantly realized her mistake and then bolted, but not before salt back's hand gripped her around the foreleg at the shank like a steel trap. The rest of the herd dashed away like one organism of a single mind. They instinctively left their leader to her sad reality of being the next meal for the salty beast. The other cows had calves to protect and besides their own lives, those younglings were their only real priority. With the strength of frantic desperation, the great matron cow tore herself free of the death grip and then ran for her life. She had to endure the tremendous pain of her fractured cannon bone that grew nearer to maimed with every crushing impact of her full weight as it landed upon the hoof. Salt back burst out from his thin salt pile cloak to make pursuit already confident that the wounded cow would not be able to run from him for long. The hunter had also cleverly separated out his chosen victim by forcing her to the north where there was less opportunity to evade him on that open ground surrounded by many lakes and the river. The rest of the herd headed back south to their home range in the forest. They thought to their own safety while they abandoned their unfortunate leader to live or die according to the age-old code of nature. The pounding pain in her foreleg drove the cow for the nearby lake that she knew so well. She was a strong swimmer and that would be a far less painful mode of travel on her agonizing fracture. She had escaped salt back once before by reaching the water and she hoped to do so a second time. The water was only 400 meters away, 
a distance she could cover in a matter of seconds when galloping in her prime condition, despite her great size. Her leg was not yet truly broken, notwithstanding its worsening condition from how furiously she sprinted upon it. In time, the wound would heal and she could return to the forest to lead her herd and their spotted calves. Saltback found greater speed when he realized how his prey lacked in the same. He had wounded the cow, that was obvious by her faltered pace. He could not only keep up with the animal, Saltback would soon overtake her. Being a wise hunter, Saltback deliberately cut to the inside to get between the cow and the lake. His instinct alone was enough to tell him that the chase would soon cripple his meal, he much preferred to down the large animal without any risk to his own bones. All the mad thrashing that the heavy elk would do if he made a tackle takedown could risk some unnecessary injury. Saltback already salivated with the expectant taste of inescapable success. Only to his disbelief, the wily cow turned right across his path as though she had known he had lost his heart for a lion's takedown and instead had resigned himself to an exhaustive hyena chase. She leaped off a low rocky berm to splash out into the water only to discover it was soft-bottomed and shallow. The water was only the height of her shoulder. Salt back the hunter leaped right in after her. The noise of the water impact drew the attention of the nearby Thunderchild crew. The ambient light was so poor that the night vision goggles faltered at a distance. Only Alice with her superior technology managed to spot the elk as it clambered ashore in yet another redirection. The sand at the edge of the water was firm enough for stride yet delightfully soft on the cow's fractured leg. That gave her the confidence to make the river just to the north before she would swim across there. Critias watched Alice's sensory feed to pass the time as they waited in the unrelenting yet insufficiently intense for departure rain. When he saw the impressively large elk cow from the salt lick appear in her view, he knew something was amiss. That elk I saw is near the paddle boat, he told Carmen and Jack as he handed his rifle and MP5 to the man to hold. I have to go now and I can't run carrying these. Critias gave a final instruction to Carmen. You protect Jack, no matter how many kitty heads you have to slice off. You don't leave him alone so that you can come chasing along after me like my little sister. Jack wasn't sure why the elk was a crisis. What is so special about that elk? Critias fitted his holster strap to make sure his pistol couldn't fall out as he moved at his greatest haste. He clear jumped the 30 meter wide timber scrap pile then vanished off into the stormy night. Once he had gone, Carmen made a careful scan all about to make certain they were safe before she explained. In Denver there was a big hunter that Colonel Davis as people named Sabretooth. He was chasing the bison around for food before we had to kill him for coming after us instead. When Critias first saw the elk, they were a herd of 30 with their young. He correctly assumes it is unnatural for one of their prime adults to go off alone without a good reason. Unless it was being chased by a large predator, Jack understood. Let's hope he is wrong about this one. She glanced over that way while she watched the scene from Alice's helmet. I don't know about that, Carmen disagreed. Critias is not very good at being wrong. If he is wrong this time, it means he will arrive there too late. Alice didn't hesitate to raise her carbine when she first caught sight of the elk. Her assumption was that killing an elk was the same as killing a ghoul, which it actually was in that they needed the meat rather than a head for a trophy. She locked her HUD visual target reticule on the cow's brain and then pulled the trigger. Her computerized scope kept her desired point of impact indicator on the elk's head while it waited for her to finally hold the carbine steady on target. In an instant when everything fell into alignment, her carbine fired itself to capitalize on that ideal instant. The bullet struck the sprinting cow through the eye to kill it on the spot, crashing nose first down into the wet sand. I got it. Alice cried out a bit too loudly as she celebrated her first successful hunt. She didn't have any experience with the hunting or the eating of wild animals. Alice had overheard the various conversations of others and that had inspired her to the motivation. They had planned to seize such a prime opportunity, she felt certain that it was appropriate for her to do the same. Saltback heard Alice's elated voice before he had managed to extricate himself from the lake. He was a poor swimmer with no love of water in any case. From the unmistakable sounds of an elk killer's victory cry combined with the heavy impact of the felled animal, Saltback understood that the elk had taken its death fall into the beach nearby. The strong aroma of blood and brains confirmed it. Since Saltback no longer had to chase after his dinner, he knew that he could afford to put that aside for the moment. The hunter realized that the jubilant voice had been human as well as a competitor that had somehow slain his crafty prey. Since Saltback was a cunning and stealthy master of ambush, and a devoted enemy of all things human, the hunter settled down low into the water and then waited near the fallen carcass. He wanted to see what he could kill next as it came to feed on his stolen supper. Alice did not hesitate to jump ashore from the bow so that she could collect her prize. 
that she had no chance whatsoever of being able to move the heavy carcass by herself failed to register in her thinking, just as she failed to comprehend that the elk had likely been on the run from something dangerous enough to kill it. Bean leaped after Alice since he understood that she was being stupid beyond all measure. He didn't care about the elk. Bean's thought was to rescue Alice from her own excessive enthusiasm. He could not stand by while a young female member of their team went off alone into the wilds at night, as no one ever should. There was also the matter of him being in love with the girl, though he didn't consider that his primary motivation. With both of them away on the run and headed heedlessly into danger, Henry grabbed his 30 caliber suppressed rifle from the bow gun box and then went over as well to rescue them. When the rest of the crew saw three people depart after the elk, two of the guard patrol went next. They naturally assumed that with such numbers on the scene, what mattered most was to take possession of the fine meal to come. They would be able to handle any possible trouble. About then, Jack radioed to the boat, What is going on over there, Gloria? Are you having any trouble? Gloria was in the pilot house at the time, but she had at least seen some of what happened. She reported, They shot a deer that came near the boat and are now bringing it home for dinner. All quiet here. Get the men together anyway, Jack advised. Critias is on his way to you. He thinks that something bad may have been chasing your dinner already. Over. 10-4, Gloria confirmed and then she headed out to follow the orders. She notified the rest of her people to watch out for Critias incoming so that they didn't shoot him by mistake for appearing to be a ghoul in the rainy darkness. The fallen deer did not please Alice when she reached it. She found more of a sense of having slaughtered an innocent forest animal than having harvested a welcomed meal for many. Bean arrived behind her just then to grab her shoulder with appropriate urgency, you shouldn't go running off. It's not safe out here. We have to go back right now. Henry was more practical when he arrived, help me drag this over to the boat. He kept the rifle in one hand while he seized the thick leather radio tracking collar the forestry service had placed on the animal years before, which testified to the cow's maturity. Bean's oftentimes partner Yeti arrived and he was quick to help Henry pull the elk. It was Yeti's private hope to make himself seem an integral part of the hunting process to justify it when he asked later for a premium cut of the tasty reward. It wasn't until both Bean and Alice also helped pull that they made any progress at all with the heavy carcass. The other guard stood watch with his back to the false safety of the lake. The man assumed that he only needed to see in the landward directions just in case any ghouls came at a run from out of the dark. Pull harder, Yeti, the man joked at Bean's partner. I bet you would put your hairy back into it if that thing had a nice pair of tits, you lazy fuck. Fuck you, Danny, Yeti grumbled. This thing weighs a ton. Salt back positioned himself behind the back of the attentive guard and then slowly crept out from the water. He crawled up the crumbling embankment of silt that the dredging equipment's water discharge had originally formed. His only sound was the sucking of his feet as he pulled them from the silt, but that was sufficient to draw the attention of the cautious guard who turned to have a look. The man expected to see some sliding pebbles or other innocuous source for the sound. Not even in his wildest imaginings had he suspected the cause would be a 700-pound ghoul encased in rhinoceros armor. The hunter's long shovel-clawed toes were perfectly adapted for traction in loose gritty materials, so they served him well as Salt Back climbed up the final slope. He reached out with a long arm and then seized the man's poncho to which he gave a firm yank. Salt Back had intended to cast the unfortunate guard out into the water for an easy killing later after he had slaughtered the more mobile humans still on the land. The rain garment tore away according to its intended design. The grasping hands of ghouls were a well-known matter of concern for the city's outfitters who supplied the hazardous duty clothing. It was an intended failing that undoubtedly saved the guard's life, at least for the moment. Even so, the pull was enough to cause the man to lose his balance and footing, such that the guard slipped and then fell backward to tumble down the saturated dune. He finally plunged into the lake water with a substantial splash. His respirator muffled his cry of alarm, which made it seem fitting enough for a man who had merely slipped and then stumbled from the shifting sand, to fall headlong by amusing accident rather than by hostile action. Critias was nearly there as Yeti laughed at the man he thought had slipped and fell in the lake. Yeti was about to mock the fool when Salt Back reached the top of the embankment. The mere sight of the hunter in his dietary prime forced Yeti to release the elk, he fell back onto his ass and then started to scramble away backwards to the bemoaning cry of, Oh God, we're all going to die. A sound like a snapping dry branch was all that came from Henry's suppressed rifle as he fired it in a one-handed emergency gesture. Totally unmodified, the rifle was a big game-killing instrument. As it was presently configured, the soft-nosed subsonic bullet intended for the heads of lesser foes just flattened out to lodge ineffectually in the thick pectoral muscle of salt back after having done little more than penetrate the hunter's impressively resilient outer skin. Yeti's words of defeat injured the morale of Alice the hardest. In her inexperience, 
she misjudged the mature man as a figure of leadership. She took his cowardly lack of confidence as authoritative assurance that they had no hope against such a hideous giant. She stood up straight and just clutched her carbine unable in that terrifying moment to have the wits to make use of it. Alice froze solid in abject terror. As Henry cycled his next cartridge to fire again, Saltback sprang forward to land among them. The hunter was entirely unimpressed by the feeble wound he had received from Henry or by the timid ferocity of the elk poachers in general, most of which had already turned to jelly at the mere sight of him. Something about the red-eyed menacing helmet Alice wore lured the hunter to want to dispatch her first. Bean acted on instinct to knock Alice away and then take the attack in her place. He held up his rifle as a shield only to have Saltback's great ascending paw casually smashed through that feeble defense. Huge leather shredding claws ripped Bean solidly down his chest, putting an end to him. The second shot from Henry's rifle caught Salt back in the side of his head without enough energy to penetrate the thick encasement of bone. The bullet did blast away a layer of brine armored flesh in addition to causing a skull fracture. That painful wound was reason enough for the monster to turn on him next as the only worthy threat. Salt back was already mid-bound at Henry to tear him apart when Critias arrived, coming down from his own leap to plant both his boots into the hunter's neck and shoulder. The impact knocked the huge creature face down into the sand. Saltback made no pause of recovery, supercharged as he was by hatred and adrenaline. The hunter scrambled forward on all fours so fast that it flung up sand. Saltback used his size and weight to overwhelm the puny new opponent that actually had the audacity to confront him as an equal. Critias performed an acrobatic Minoan bull vault when he shoved both his hands down on the hunter's broad head. As Saltback reared up his neck, Critias let the giant's strength lift him clear of the reaching claws. Saltback gave the mistaken impression of being clumsy as the agile trickery caused him to plow headlong into the sand for a second time. Once again, Saltback recovered without delay as the hunter came about in a sand flinging spin to face his tricky opponent. Critias commanded, Get them out of here, Henry, while he also drew his hand forged sand my panga bowie sword from its shin sheath. Just from the look that came back from the hunter's hate filled eyes, Critias saw that the creature had enough crack smoking human sense left that it knew what it saw before it. Critias was a rival hunter with a sharp claw of his own and a mind to use it. After Yeti had managed to recover some sense about him, he rushed over to grab Bean's body by an arm. Using his size and the strength born of desperate crisis, he dragged the young man away from the fight scene. At the same time, Henry scooped Alice up over his shoulder to remove her from harm's way. Saltback made his next rush a more prudent effort. Mindful of the sly agility that Critias displayed in combat, the hunter repeatedly slashed at him with great arcs of its long yellow claws. The first swing was high, which allowed Critias to duck under, while he also thrust the sharp bowie point of his mongrel sword up into the hunter's armpit. The strike scored deep and then exited cleanly amidst a fine hot gush of arterial blood. The second swipe from salt back came in too telegraphed, such that Critias exploited the panga quality of his bastard blade to chop off the whole hand at the wrist. While some lesser creature would have hesitated after Rit had received such a crippling injury, Saltback just launched himself ahead on his powerful legs to leap horizontally along the ground. He caught up Critias in his good arm so that the momentum carried them forward off the sand ridge to crash headlong together into the waters of the lake below. The poncho guard was first to emerge from the water. He, remained unscathed apart from his pride as he crawled up onto the beach while he still clung to his rifle though nearly blind without his night vision goggles in place. Henry loaded a fully powdered and jacketed bullet into his rifle as he ran to the shoreline. He took aim for when he saw the hunter so he could rightly blow its head off. It was a long moment before the monster resurfaced. The broad pale skinned back of the hunter slowly emerged with an inactive bobbing float in the water before it gradually rolled over to reveal the panga bowie sword buried to the handle under its chin. The point of Critias's blade protruded out from the bullet wound gash that Henry had made with his rifle. Critias surfaced next only after he had taken a moment to find his pistol that had come loose during their brief aquatic struggle. He waved to Henry so the man would know that he was all right. More of the crew arrived from the paddle boat in time to see Critias wrench his sword from the skull of the hunter and then use it to hack the head completely off. It disheartened many to see the size of salt back and so know that such epic terrors prowled the wild places. It gave people cause to wonder if they had undertaken the proper profession. After Critias climbed ashore. He went to find Bean. He tore the young man's ripped poncho open to survey the extent of his injuries only to discover that Bean's bulletproof vest had taken the brunt of the claws. Only the crushing impact to his arms and chest had caused him injury. He would live, but some bed rest was in order. Bean coughed with an agonized expression. He gazed up from his back to see Critias stare down over him. Bean groaned, before you shoot me, did Alice make it out okay? Is she safe? 
The girl stood nearby traumatized by the experience, but she was otherwise unharmed. Crytea told Bean, Yeah, Alice is fine, thanks to you, kid. That hunter clobbered you pretty good. How do you feel? Lying back, Bean resigned himself to his forthcoming execution, it hurts. Crytea drew his pistol to shake some of the water from it. When Crytea holstered his weapon again, Bean asked, Aren't you going to shoot me? No, Critias answered, not yet anyway. My guess is that you have some cracked ribs is all. You should recover soon enough, unless you have some cuts we don't know about. If you have some infected scratches I can't see yet, then I can shoot you later. For now, it appears that your rifle and the friendly fire vest you have on saved you. He gave Bean a moment to painfully sigh with relief before he added, and for the record, kid, if I was going to shoot you, I wouldn't tell you about it first, know what I mean? Why drag out your misery? As some of the crew carried Bin back to the boat, Carmen called her husband on their private radio connection, Are you injured? I'm fine, he reassured her. Once the hunter was underwater, he panicked. Maybe he thought he was going to drown. When all he cared about was getting back to the surface, he didn't. I'll be on my way back shortly, just as soon as I help move this elk. All is still quiet here, she reported. I think I should have helped you. Both Alice and Bean nearly died because I didn't. You are protecting me. He educated her. How would it look if I left Jack out there alone and the ghouls got to him? Everyone would think I was asshole of the year. More like of several centuries now that you mention it, she agreed on that point. Alice is looking at you. Carmen saw it through the sensory feed. Yeah, well, I'm a pretty amazing guy, Critias replied. At least she didn't try to run or cry out for her mommy. At that last point, Critias glanced over at Yeti who had done both of those things as his first instinct when things went to shit. Carmen slyly commented, not all Vanderbeans are made in a day I suppose. I'm sure things will work out in the end. They did last time. He partly understood her reference. In Lattice, all marshals studied the written works of Marshal Chief Justice Vanderbeen. He was a legendary figure who wrote a whole series of treatises on the Marshal Service, the King's Law, and about the application of their philosophy of justice. All the writings had come about in the early days of the Marshal Service's formation. Marshal Chief Justice Vanderbeen had penned the standard code of marshals that then carried on for centuries. One of the more famous quotes he recalled was, After you have given your heart to the letter of the law, you follow your heart at the expense of the law. That is the true application of both. It also reminded him of the Marshal Chief Justice's nine merits of the service. One of them was the virtue of gratitude and another was of brotherhood. The nine merits did not include courage. The Chief Justice taught that courage or its lacking derived from the brotherhood itself. As his schoolwork came to mind, Critias also recalled that it was not in Carmen's nature to make baseless references, so he asked, What makes you say that? I'm just disappointed with Alice is all, Carmen explained. It was Bean who saved her life and she seems content to keep her eyes on you. Her lack of gratitude is appalling. He asked, Are you saying that Bean will eventually become the Marshal Chief Justice? I said nothing but what I said, she had a disappointed tone over his questionable education. Are you teaching Alice to be a marshal or aren't you? Critias wondered if the name Bean was a nickname the man used based on his full family name and that Carmen had hinted that the young man had a greater destiny. He asked her, How much of the future do you know about the names of these people? I know lots about what becomes of many of these people you care about, she confessed. It's obvious to me you studied your weapons more than your books when you were in school. As for why I don't tell you all that I know of their eventual fates, Kevin and I have yet to resolve the peccadillo of time travel. Everything that we do here has already happened before in exactly the same way, so technically, we're not even making choices at all. It is highly probable that all history works in this same way, and we were reliving a future past before we even came here. With all of that in mind, I can only tell you that it appears to be my destiny to love you and spare you such knowledge that could only bring you unnecessary pain over things you are powerless to change. Telling me this didn't bring me any pain, he reasoned. Then take that as your answer as to why I told you this much. Now hurry back. I miss you. Henry approached to clasp Critias on the shoulder. Thanks for the rescue. We were unprepared for that hunter. This rifle barely even got his attention. It got his attention when you hit him in the head, Critias disagreed. The same thing happened to me when I first encountered Grendel. It bounced right off his noggin and then he knocked the hell out of me. The important thing is that it didn't get the attention of anything else. There are thousands of infected in the city around us. Loud shots might have called them all in and then the mission would be lost. Let's get this elk aboard so you can get the boat going. Critias could have carried the carcass on his shoulders, 
but preferred not to display the true strength of his mech suit. In tandem, they moved it easily enough so that the crane could hoist it aboard. While the crane crew lifted the elk, Gloria came down to speak with Critias, you should get back to Jack. If we arrive home without him, we will really look stupid. I take full responsibility for this slip up. You really saved our asses. I don't know what I would do without Henry. I will straighten out Alice when we get home, he assured her. She should know better than to go running off half-assed into the dark expecting everyone to chase her. If it wasn't for Bean, she would be dead now. She wasn't the one I heard crying out like the little bitch, Gloria meant Yeti. She wasn't sure which guard it had been, but she did have accurate suspicions. Critias commented, people die in this line of work with or without someone to blame. We're not out of this yet. If someone needs blame, you can blame me. I'm the one who brought her into this without any training. Critias just shrugged that the situation was the way of war, shit happened. With a wave goodbye, he started back for Carmen. When Critias returned from the paddle boat, Jack enthusiastically patted his back in greeting, good call on that one. You did fine work as always. From what Carmen tells me, and all the radio chatter, I hear that was a real nasty hunter out there. Critias glanced over to Carmen and he remembered how she had shown him the head she had to take. She hadn't done it because she had wanted to do it. It was a matter of necessity to ensure the safety of everyone. Critias found deeper understanding because of her lesson. He philosophized, this is their world now and we are the invaders. We came here to collect the tools we need to destroy even more of their kind. Was that creature any less noble than a bear or a wolf? I don't think the elk begrudge this predator more than they do any of their others. The ghouls do not war on each other. They don't strip mine or pollute rivers with toxic waste. We are the cause of their problems just as they are the cause of ours. If I had the choice, I would rather it had just stayed away. To that, he made his point, we don't have a choice. Each according to its nature, Carmen said. Critias wasn't sure that was her approval so he didn't know how to take that, what does that make us? She answered, we take what we need and we kill whatever gets in our way without ever questioning why. We're violent territorial animals, a brotherhood of wolves, the same as them. And the pups back at the den are hungry, Jack added while he headed for the bulldozer. It's time to get back into the game. Gloria implemented her instructions flawlessly as she got the Thunder Child into ready position. Like an incongruously friendly omen to grace their final departure, the weather once again soured. The rain changed from a dreary drizzle to a thundering downpour. What would normally have been an evil portent for those going on water, the storm was a blessed event for those who desired to ship unnoticed by the flesh-pilfering hungry fiends that prowled the night. The bulldozer didn't start at first, just as intended. Jack cranked the starter for long enough to work in the special medicinal lubricants they had added to the cylinders, and then he paused to preheat the glow plugs before he switched on the new fuel pump. Only a few more cranks caused the mighty dozer to roar to life. The tracked machine belched dark smoke amid ampral noise. As a veteran driver of bulldozers, Jack quickly drove around the trailer to where he used the bucket as his impromptu fifth wheel hitch. He lifted the tongue weight securely, and then moved off backward to drag the immense trailer on its wheels toward the river. Carmen sat on the roof of the dozer's cab. She had used an extra cargo strap to make an anchor for her legs so that she wouldn't slip off while she shot at any infected that came in to investigate. Critias rode on the trailer surrounded by the gas bottles that he would open when the time was right. He also had his rifle ready to aid in their defense. The progress was agonizingly slow, which validated Jack's wise decision to wait on the storm to give them some auditory cover. The noise of the weather greatly reduced how the sound of the engine carried. Only nearby ghouls heard the motor well enough to recognize it for what it was, and there were few nearby buildings in which for them to make their lairs. Within a minute, the first ghouls came in from the buildings to the south. Those freaks found ample cover among all the vehicles, mulch equipment, and assorted structures, all of which allowed them to approach unexposed to clear lanes of fire. Some ghouls managed to get within 20 meters before being in the open enough to take a gunshot. Since both Carmen and Critias were exacting marksmen with unhampered enhanced vision, the ghouls didn't profit from the advantage as they might have otherwise. It took along several minutes for Jack to reach their river ramp location. Their plans would have failed then were it not for Jack's skill as a bulldozer operator. To get the trailer's tongue close enough to the water, he had to back away to the side at the final moment so that the dozer teetered on a steep and slippery incline that seemed impossible for the machine to maintain its balance upon even though it did. Jack thrust the trailer ahead by dragging it sideways from the bucket while the dozer spun counterclockwise in place to make it happen. Gloria brought the paddle boat in at that moment. One of the crew hung from the end of the boom to make the connection from the crane to the trailer's tongue. 
the additional rifles from the ferry deck opened up in support of the defense. That gave Critias the chance to put aside his weapon for long enough that he could open the valves that began inflation of the flotation bladders. After the crane connection took on some of the burden of the trailer, Jack lowered the bucket, cleared the dozer, and then drove around to the rear to push the trailer from behind. Even while he drove, Jack kept a submachine gun across his lap, and also radioed orders to both the paddleboat and to Critias with instructions about how to operate the air bottles. At a critical stage when the forward bladders were large enough to support the front of the trailer, the boat became strong enough to pull the rest of the trailer out into the water without any further assistance from the bulldozer. Jack cut the engine as he abandoned the machine. He let Carmen cover him while he climbed aboard the trailer to help operate the gas inflation while he also still commanded proper movement of the paddle boat. Carmen jumped from the roof of the bulldozer directly to the trailer from where she continued to put up a virulent defense. With the engine of the bulldozer no longer in operation, the noise level had dropped dramatically. Soon the situation calmed significantly. The trailer floated nicely after Jack had properly inflated all the bladders into complementary balance. Gloria had no difficulty in moving their prize out into the open water. They had accomplished their mission and it was time to start back for home. Chapter 10 The Merits While he wore his hydrophobic mech suit, Critias didn't mind that he sat out in the rain. Jack had moved into the mulch trailer's operator cab for the machine's hydraulic loading claw. He finished the stub of his mission cigar while he relaxed in the comfortable seat that was effectively nice and dry behind glass windows inside a closed door. Carmen didn't like being out in the wet weather, but she made no negative comments about it. She felt determined to stay by Critias's side for the duration of the trip home regardless of any discomforts she had to endure to accomplish that. There was also some duty that required their attention. They needed to bleed or add air to fuel bladders, which kept the machine at a level float. The process itself worked beautifully, as well or better than anyone had actually expected. They floated a machine the size of Big Joe's trailer and even made it seem almost easy. Gloria piloted them home at a modest speed made better since the current was at their back just as Jack had promised. She had a fresh sonar map to show the deepest channel in the water. The Thunder Child had set off for home with enough hours left before dawn to make it likely they would be able to get everything ashore at the castle before sunrise. As dark and stormy as the night proved to be, passing under all the bridges was thankfully uneventful. Alice spent the return trip on the ferry deck as part of the idle defense crew. The burden of guilt over the incident with the elk kept her active so that at the very least the others might not also think of her as being lazy. In actual fact, her youth and inexperience excused her from any recrimination, and privately most considered her more courageous and resourceful than a girl her age should be. They reserved their secret indignations for the guard Yeti and his cowardly response to the arrival of Saltback. Even that they kept to themselves since disunity would only breed more accidents. The radio conversations among the GNP took up as soon as the personal radios on the boat got in range of the city. The guard that fell in the lake felt no shame as he told the patrol back in the city about his amazing experience. He had already interviewed the others who were there so that he had a full grasp of all that had gone down. While he normally went by the name of Dan, the rest of the patrol often referred to him as Danny the Ear on account of him having lost one of his earlobes in a friendly fire incident that last winter. The name also differentiated him from Monkey Dan who was an armory technician that specialized in the manufacture of specialty gunpowder mixtures and reloaded spent ammunition casings like many of the community's subsonic rounds in particular. I nearly shit my pants when he grabbed my raincoat and then pulled me into the river, Dan reported proudly as few had ever tussled with a hunter and then lived to talk about it. This hunter was big, man, like a refrigerator with arms, I shit you not. Henry's first 308 is to the freak's heart but its chest is so thick that it doesn't even draw blood. The fucker just ignores it as if it never even happened, and then he goes after a little red eyes instead to squeeze the toothpaste out of her. That was when Bean jumped in front of that thing, waving his rifle like a matador, just asking for this killing machine to dare him a new one. A guard in the city asked, Bean picked a fight with it to save Red? Dan bragged, damn straight he did, and it broke his rifle in half lane into him. You should see his vest. There are rips in the Kevlar like somebody took an axe to it. Sister Milk says he has some cracked ribs is all. One lucky bastard if you ask me. GNP, baby, cheered another city guard. Looking good is good enough. Dan continued, so Henry busts another one or I tube side the fucker's head this time, knocking a chunk out of it, and the hunter only gets pissed at him for it, you know, eyeballing him like, you just fucked up real bad, because this hunter just don't give a shit about nothing, and so goes after Henry next. That's when Perkella comes out of nowhere with his dropkick putting both feet into this big bastard's head, stomping its face right down into the dirt, like boom, take that motherfucker. 
Another guard asked, so he shoots him one in the mouth. Over? No way, said Dan. The hunter lunges at him, but the thunder caller just thumps his fists into its head as he jumps right over the top to put the hunter's face in the dirt for a second time. He comes up with that big pig sticker knife of his, and says all common shit, get the others clear, Henry. This one is all mine. They start swinging around and Perkella knifes him a deep one before he chops off a whole big vest stripper hand, which just goes flying, but this hunter still isn't backing down. It comes in for more, tackling into him so that they both go over my head into the lake for some badass Johnny Y. Smiller crocodile strangler shit. So, everyone is waiting there on shore, ready to bust some caps into the thing when it surfaces. Only, the fucker comes up a floater with Perkella's pig sticker stuffed through his offbox, like, not even twitching dead, bye bye hunter. Took him out Tarzan style, a guard from the city praised. Violet one must be getting jealous that the old man is showing her some righteous moves. Dan finished up, we're coming home with full tanks, the whole job done right, and they even stuck up a gas and go. To top it all off, we got little red zelt draining on a hook. Delicious stew is on the menu for us. That's right, we bad. You can say it. Hearing how happy everyone was about the success, pleased Carmen, as she liked hearing Critias getting his appreciation. She wrapped herself snugly in her rain poncho and then climbed into his lap to spend the remainder of the voyage in his mesh-suited arms. Critias couldn't deny her for the moment, but he had other intentions. Once she was comfortable, he said, Jack told me earlier that he lost two daughters around Mandy's age. He also told me that they would have grown up by about now and that standing in as your father at our wedding meant a great deal to him that if something ever happened to me, you could count on him to look out for you. She cuddled closer, content where she was even if soaked by the cold rain. I don't have a father, not even a surrogate one, she needlessly reminded him. Engineers on an assembler station wrote my genome to bring form to your secret desires. Like a devil, my parents are your lust and their blasphemous plain god ambitions. The truth of it pleased her because she desired neither freedom nor death or any other progression of the human condition. You have yet to attain your full greatness, he advised her. Just as your first battle with Grendel could have gone better, you still have a lot to learn. Do not be so quick to assume you were born great. Knowing all the lessons such as you do makes you the greatest student ever at everything. The master must finally forget the lessons and become the teacher. That is not you yet. Some are born great, she whispered playfully. Some achieve greatness. Carmen squirmed until he held her tighter, and some have greatness thrust into them, over and over until waking and dreaming are the same place. Critias understood that she was right and that he would have to thrust greatness upon her, because Carmen was stubborn. To achieve that end, he said, for all you know, that girl you decapitated was one of Jack's lost daughters. Imagine if he had come upon you like that instead of me. She became rigid and then sat up, what have I done to make you say such things? For two reasons, he schooled her. First, I wonder how often Jack checks the faces like the one you showed me searching for ones he once knew. In some small way, I suspect they all are daughters to some father to him. Second, assuming that was one of his daughters that he lost to infection that attacked you, what would you have done differently? I made it quick and took no joy in it, she said in her defense. I did only what was necessary for us to stay alive out there, for his life too, and for his cruise. Wouldn't he forgive me? He asked her feigning doubt, why would he forgive you? Are you any less estranged or ungrateful than she was? Don't you both exist to bring joy to yourself, but not to others? Carmen looked at him as she found deeper understanding, to which she said, I am all the daughters of my father's house. In an elated epiphany, Carmen asked him, should we return to him a bit of what was lost? Perhaps having a face to put his thoughts to would take away some of the pain of his loss. I could do that. Even though his daughters are dead, and we cannot bring them back to him, that is only mostly true. I could be like a daughter to Jack, to love him and look up to him, give him someone to love in return. Grand Marshal Fat Jack is a great man, one of the greatest. It is a tremendous honor to me that he would even consider such a thing. I could even say that it is true. I who was born without a father would not be wrong to claim one of my own choosing, especially one that chose me first. He saw that she understood his intention, curing that kind of pain would require a most beautiful face. Carmen spent a moment to consider the strategic value of her face only to realize that he had told her that he thought she was pretty. She hugged her husband whom she adored. I want you to know I don't love you any less because I'm going to go sit with Jack for a while. Her warning amused him. If you are the first to run out of love for showing it too often, that really would be something. She pressed her forehead to his helmet as a kiss, and then got up to nimbly make her way to the claw operator's cab. Jack readily invited her in to escape the rain. 
the weather improved by the time the Thunder Child returned to port. Colonel Davis as grave walkers along with George and Tony Banjo's crews, had all returned home safely from their own duties to be on hand to help bring the Thunder Child in. With a lift capacity far in excess of the task, the barge crane had no trouble handling the large grinder trailer. The operator plucked it from the river and then placed it ashore. A team removed the flotation system before they hooped it up to the waiting Big Joe tractor. Andy drove it into the castle's garage tunnel for an extensive refitting. In addition to Gloria driving the milk wagon, other trucks stood by to tow in the two smaller grinder trailers, the loaded flatbed, and the thousand-gallon fuel carrier. The box truck transported in the remaining supplies and tools. At the end, Fad Jack got everything locked down. The work went quickly despite having to take place in knee-deep floodwaters. At times, the workers roped themselves together like mountain climbers in case one of them should slip. The others on the line could prevent the current of the river from carrying anyone away. When he finally had everything done, Fat Jack and his remaining workers returned to the castle aboard the box truck that had come back to collect them. Dr. Clara waited ready at the castle to take charge of the wounded man being the moment he came inside. A small army of decontamination workers swarmed the tunnel to clear the incoming team through an infectious wound inspection so that they could move on to hot showers. When Critias finished his entry inspection and Carmen came up next, he gave the male medic a scowl as the man was about to inspect her body. After he saw Critias' as expression, the medic suggested, how about I get one of the ladies to do this one? Splendid idea, Critias agreed with no patience for other men appreciating his uninjured wife, especially after such an exhaustingly long night. You do that. The topic made him feel something similar concerning his two nude daughters. Their city was practically nudist by nature, so Critias doubted he would be able to do much aside from some periodic demands for female attendance. Colonel Davis came up with his daughter Queen Jessica and one of their buddy teams from his crew, a shooter everyone called Peterson and his partner Giles who served as the man spotter and close quarters combat specialist. Hiram said, we saw something out there tonight you might find interesting. He held out his digital movie camera with a posable screen to show Critias a film that they had just recently recorded. The movie was out the window of a light rail train car as it was about to depart in the rainy night. One of the crew shined a bright flashlight to illuminate an extraordinary creature. A female hunter was about 30 meters out. It hung upside down from an overpass girder by using the grip of a prehensile foot at the end of its only remaining leg. The other leg was little more than a large bump at the hip being a thoroughly healed over amputation from long time past. The hunter's long arms dangled limply downward as blood drained from the gunshot head. The blood made a nasty sort of jelly waterfall as it saturated the long hair that joined it, as together they oozed down to the ground. By appearances, the hunter normally spent its time clinging underneath a bridge to snatch up unwary creatures that passed below. Even while dead, the anchor foot maintained its solid grip on the girder above. It suggested that it was possible that the hunter never even moved from that place, and that it had sort of grafted itself there like some kind of predatory inverted tube worm. We only saw it when it grabbed up a dog and we heard it yelping, Jessica said both appalled and excited over their gruesome discovery. It hunts that way like some kind of spider, nasty. A cunning strategy for a one-legged hunter, Critias said suitably impressed. I'll start looking up more often to not have something like that come at me off the ceiling. Who got the kill? Hiram went into detail, we were in no danger at the time and about to move out for home, so I decided to take my new 460 Magnum revolver for a little test drive. That sweet addition to my personal security I picked up from your Radio City body bag collection, which is especially nice by the way. Those Jersey boy lawyers had great taste in guns even if they didn't have the balls to use them. I figured it couldn't hurt for me to keep it handy just in case something like a Grendel hit us in a corner. I took the shot as a prime opportunity to find out what she could do, and as you can see, it got the job done. The recoil is not as bad as you might think, but it sure made some serious noise, enough to wake a few city locks. While the guardsman Yeti was still in line to get his clearance from decontamination staff, he listened intently to the conversation. That sounds like the handgun I need, he said. It would have come in handy back at the lake when the leather-backed hunter jumped us. Hiram's man Giles summed up Yeti at a glance and wasn't impressed with him enough to appreciate him jumping into a shock talk among proven operators like his colonel or a duly respected forager captain. He had said nothing himself and thought Yeti was far from his own equal. Giles asked Yeti, what did you use on that hunter out on the river that didn't cut the mustard? Yeti replied flustered since he didn't want to detail his inadequate performance, I never got the chance. Actually, I had to pull Bean to safety after the hunter got the better of him. Critias explained, our man Bean put himself under the hammer to keep the big ugly bastard off of little Alice. He got hurt, 
But we have high hopes it's not infectious because he had his vest on. He's a great kid with a lot of heart. I'll be keeping my fingers crossed for him. Big Henry was the man of the hour. If we hadn't needed to stay suppressed, he would have put it down on his second shot. It was solid to the head, but just couldn't penetrate. I heard you knifed him, Peterson said to cry he is sounding impressed. They must play rough where you come from. As Carmen came up in her robe on her way to the showers, Peterson pantomimed the tip of his imaginary hat to her in respect before he left, complete with an added polite, ma'am. A knife, huh, said Giles before he followed his buddy partner. I guess the next time I'm in a fight out there, I'll try calling out to God too, see if Perkella falls out of the sky to stab the thing through the head for me. Fajak came over to tell them, Jim called and says everyone did a great job out there tonight, and I second that. All the field teams are calling it a day, so you can get your showers, some food, and some sleep. We should be heading back to King's Tower sometime this afternoon. I just need to get my backpack, Carmen said before she went over to the flatbed trailer that held various parcels. When she looted the gas station, she also loaded up her own pack with various things that she planned to keep as her private compensation for having done all the work. To everyone else's eyes, it was just her field pack and nothing out of the ordinary. Carmen handed the pack over to Mandy so that the girl could decontaminate the contents and then return them to Carmen later. On his way to the first tunnel gate, Critias paused to watch as a team unloaded the box truck along with Nick the chef who was there with two of his kitchen staff to take charge of the elk carcass. Thank the heavens, the chef rejoiced when he saw that no one had amateurishly butchered the animal apart from when they hung it up from the crane cable to drain the blood. Nick confessed, I was dreading to see what a mess those ghoul choppers would have made of this beauty. I thought for sure they would have hacked it to bits and thrown out all the best parts. He sighed in some disappointment when he examined the head, the brains are a total loss, would have been delicious, but at least the tongue is still good. He rubbed his hands gleefully as he made plans to make the most of the animal right down to caping the hide. Another decontamination worker was about to throw away Bean's ruined bulletproof vest, but Critia stopped him, I want you to steam that and then have it hung up in fun land. Everyone should have a chance to see just what their GNP heroes go through when they're out there. As he was about to leave, Critias looked about for Alice, but didn't find her, so he asked Carmen to locate the girl. After she contacted the computer in Alice's Delta helmet, Carmen answered, she has already taken it off. She must have gone through ahead of us. Critias asked the gate controller, did Alice pass through yet? The woman checked her clipboard and then confirmed that she had already checked Alice's name off her list, yes, sir. She went through about five minutes ago. He continued on through the showers, and then after he got dressed, Critias made his way to the back hall for something to eat. He arrived to a fine scent of roasted meat that hung in the air as the promise of an exceptional meal. With so many people at work doing decontamination and most of the others still trying to make their way through the showers, the back hall was near to empty. One noteworthy occupant was Bean who sat at a table where he cut into what appeared to be a thick steak of beef. Critias went over to see how the young man felt. Carmen went along too to stay near Critias. She had also had a long stressful night and she looked forward to some cuddling comforts. As Critias sat down at the same table, he asked, Are you going to survive? Clara says just a lot of bruises, Bean answered. I think I got off a little easier than you did from when Grendel first said hello. I should be back in form in a week or two. He should get a sick nurse, Carmen suggested with some sly ulterior motive in mind. Unaware of her actual meaning, Critias asked. Are you volunteering? Catering the meals, she agreed, maybe even the sponge baths. I don't know about the blowjobs though. That might be getting a bit too adventurous at this early stage of our marriage. Critias frowned as he failed to laugh at her unacceptably crude attempt at humor. He still failed to realize that she had a larger scheme in play. Critias asked Bean, your name wouldn't be short for Vanderbeen, would it? The question was a great surprise to Bean, how did you know that? He was seriously in contemplation. Did you used to know me or something? I'm sure the last person who knew my name died like 18 months ago. He eyed Critias curiously, other people have asked me why I get called Bean, and I've never told them, the two people I arrived here with were calling me that and it just sort of stuck. They're dead now, so the truth pretty much died with them. Anyway, let's keep that between us. The revelation pleased Critias greatly, just a lucky guess on my part, I suppose. I'm glad you'll be back on your feet soon. I'm sure I'll bounce back quickly, Bean pledged. I never got a chance to thank you for showing up to rescue me when you did. I really owe you one for that. Except for you and Henry. I guess the rest of us proved why we're not foragers. Speaking of gratitude, said Carmen. 
I still don't see Alice anywhere. She poked Critias, you should go look for her. She might be upset about the incident at the lake. You know how dramatic young women can be. When he glanced her way, she danced her eyebrows at him to show that she made humor about her own prior outbursts. Then you order us dinner, he instructed while he got up to go search for the girl. After he first checked their room in the old South Theater, Critia searched the triangle corridors under the South Lake, and then he moved across the front hall to check the North Lake. He worked under the assumption that Alice had few other choices if she wanted privacy. His intuition served him well when he found her in the back hallway on that side. She sat with her back to a monument summit elevator. Alice was in a bout of depression. She didn't bother to look up, I know you don't need me for anything. You must have come looking for me to say that it's time to eat. Critias challenged, how would you know I don't need you for anything? Because I'm useless, she stated to the obvious. I can't fight or do anything useful at all. I can't even read. Very well. I know you didn't come here looking for comfort, so what else could it be? Anyway, I'm not hungry, so you can just go ahead without me. Since she was right about what he wanted, Critias said, I'm telling you to come eat then. He wanted to make her feel better, but accomplishing it was still a bit beyond his available wisdom. She declined, Jack said we had no more chores for the day. You're not the boss of me to tell me what to do every minute. Being God hurt saving your life, he lectured her. The least you could do is to go tell him thank you. You don't even have to eat. You can go back to our room and go to bed, or skulk back here if that is what you want. Since Alice would be a marshal, Critias treated her like one by using honesty, for the most part, you should be upset. You screwed up by running out there alone. You seem nearly as stupid as I do for putting you in that situation while I wasn't even around to keep an eye on you. Boo, -boo too bad for you. You have suffered worse before and lived with it. I sincerely hope this is the worst thing that ever happens to you, because this is nothing. Back home, I know plenty of great marshals with missing limbs. All you got was pushed down into the sand. She gave him a bitter look over that plan, you want me to thank Bobby Bean, the man I almost got hanged because we danced for him in our underwear? Why doesn't that sound like a great idea to me? Thank him for what exactly, being even dumber than we are? I don't have a life to save. Who would be out anything even if it had killed me? No one will ever want me around again after I froze up like that. I'm not sure I want to stay with you anymore either. I can't stand seeing the way you look at Carmen, and then the way you look at me. I'm nothing compared to her and never will be. Do you think I don't know that you don't desire me? It's not as if you do and you resist the temptation. There is a difference you know. Desire you? He openly mocked her. You mean like the way the president desired you, the way Rupert desired you, the way they desired Mandy? You have had more than your share of men desiring you. What has it ever gotten you? No, I don't desire you. You are not just a piece of meat to me. I offer you something better. I want to be there for you in every way that matters and take nothing in return. As far as you freezing up, what did you expect? I let you squeeze off a few rounds into a bucket and then you would magically become a hunter killer? You didn't run or scream. The settings your weapons had would not have stopped the thing anyway. No one is thinking less of you because they are too busy thinking I must be a complete idiot to take you out there without properly preparing you first. She demanded, then why did you take me? He gave her more raw truth, because you're the real deal. The world is at the end of the line and there is no more time to prepare. There are no safe places and people like you don't get the luxury of just being a kid. You needed to learn how to swim and swim fast. I believed in you, so I tossed your ass into a lake. You can blame me since I'm the one who did it. You either die or grow up hard and become a great marshal. At the moment, my estimation is you are well on your way. I don't dwell in the past. The only real question is, after what happened, is what you will do next time. Next time, will you run sooner, or remember that moment and make it work for you? and you will never back down from anything ever again. You have already faced the absolute worst ghoul. Now is the time for you to decide. Do you want to kill them, or spend the rest of your life hiding from them? Alice got to her feet to look at him more or less eye to eye, take me to your room and show me everything. If you want me to grow up fast and become all these things you say, then show me everything. He shook his head no, you know I can't do that. Not only did I give my word that it would never happen, I don't want it to happen. It hurts me that you even say that. I let you spend the night with me. In a world of shit, we shared something pure and innocent, now you throw this slutty Denver filth into my face. Part of me wants to say that I deserve better, only I don't. You came to me in Denver, and I tossed you out on your rear. I'm not even close to being a great man, as I would like to be. 
For a while there, I hoped we could teach each other how to rise above being just another selfish piece of shit. I know why you won't do it, she assumed she knew his true thoughts. The men who took their turns on me were so low to you that you wouldn't let one of them handle your fancy pistol just to look at it. You tell me how you are different, the first man ever who actually cared about me on the inside. You are willing to toss me into lakes full of monsters, but you won't do something as simple as making love to me. Critias readily agreed, yeah. His answer infuriated her, yeah, what? He said it as plain absolute fact, yeah, I will throw you into lakes of monsters to die if need be, but I will never make love to you. I lied when I said I would marry you. It was nothing but a lie, and I knew it when I said it. I wanted and needed you in my life, only not in that way, so I lied to get it. I figured that if I didn't, you would leave me. You're damn right I would have left you. Alice started to pace as she wondered what she was going to do. All this time, I thought you were just shy, or ashamed about what the others might say if you loved me. Now I see what they were all saying was true, you were just a soldier boy. You really believe all this soldier talk about honor and duty. I know something about soldiers too, you know. Where was all their big talk about duty when they took turns torturing and humiliating me? He felt more tempted to smack her than pity her, I'll tell you where it was, you ungrateful little snot. It was on the surface called Colonel Davis. It was in your king and in the rest of us when we flew out there to rescue you, and by hell, it is going to be in you if I have to kill you to get it. She sneered at him, I doubt your ability to put anything in. But then she abruptly shut her mouth because he had raised his hand to slap her one if she didn't. You're picking up bad habits from Carmen, he warned her with deadly seriousness, because she really was cruising for a good smack. You're a lady, and you will start talking like one. You are going to finish your schooling too. You will talk, dress, and act like a lady, and do it at all times. You sold yourself to me when we shook on it. I protect Mandy, and you do what I say. Furthermore, since you mentioned it, I am the boss of you to tell you what to do every single second of the day, so get used to it. Alice seemed doubtful of that, but said nothing because she had already lost her taste for being contrary. Critia told her, I prefer you to study while you continue your martial training, but if you prefer, I can just have Jim assign you to tasks like bookkeeping and supply inventory. You will learn letters and numbers well enough if I trap you into being a home buddy. I can't make you a ghoul fighter. No one can. She questioned, How do I become one then? He thought it was simple, when no one can stop you from being what you are, then you will have the right state of mind. So long as other people are doing the deciding for you, you won't have what it takes to stare down that hunter with the steady eye required to lock your helmet targeting. Alice offered her hand, are you taking me to dinner, Captain? Critias took her hand and then pulled her close to embrace her because he needed it. He wanted her to forgive him for when he failed her and Denver. He had failed the Virgil Ladis, and the Marshal Service, and himself. If he told the true story of his callous actions to them back home, they would feel sickened by it. They raised him to always be first to do what was right, especially when it hurt or even if it would cost him his life. If Critias could save Alice, it also meant he could save himself. The rest of the foragers had arrived by the time Critias returned with Alice. Most of them were up at the captain's table, but Tony Banjo was in the lower dining area to sit with the woman he picked up to keep company with while at the castle. Well don't you two make a darling couple. Tony told Critias with amusement. I heard the rumor, but now I see it is true. Have you shown her that sword you wear against your leg? I have seen it, Captain Banjo, Alice said on Critias's behalf, but I must admit I am still much too nervous to dare confront it. Tony teased her, a forager in training should not be intimidated by a little raging meat. I have some experience dealing with a little variety, Alice bodily answered while still seeming coy. Perhaps you have also heard that I have a bad habit of freezing up when confronted by an exceptionally big one. Many laughed over her clever retort that not only defended Critias's pride, but also put her incident at the lake into a disarming light. Critias wasn't offended by a good and deserved ribbing. He told Tony, by the fine aroma of roasting beef, my guess is that you already heard from the chef that you were supposed to stop shooting the cows and bring one home alive. Penny Welder laughed as she gazed down from the captain's table since it was Tony who had in fact brought home the beef. She joked, he hung his arm out the back of the truck waving grass at it for near an hour. You can't say he didn't try to bring it home alive. He was mighty disappointed too, added Tony's gunner wolf. When Tony pulls over at a corner, he is used to them jumping right in the sack for him. The attractive Denver woman who sat with Tony took offense over Wolf's comment that insinuated that Tony picked up street walkers. I'm not a whore, Wolf, she retorted. You're just jealous. Wolf shot back, I never called you one, sweetheart. 
Tony isn't going to be paying you when he kicks you out of bed this afternoon. If you do a good enough job, he may let you keep the toothbrush. If you check, you'll find he keeps a whole case of them under his bed. Tony put his arm around his girl, never mind him, my lovely flower. Wolf's idea of a romantic evening is a freshly headshot twitcher and a box of lubricated condoms. After this fine meal, we can retire to my room for some drinks and perhaps a tune of the wedding white. Nadia brought them their dinner plates from the kitchen that included thick juicy steaks of beef. Alice demonstrated that she was hungry after all by attacking hers like she worried someone would return to take it away. Carmen ordered herself a large bowl of the broth with reconstituted vegetables. Critias asked his wife, is that all you're eating? No, she answered after she wiped her mouth with a napkin. I took a jar of honey from the grocery shelf at that fueling station. When we get back to our room, I am going to have that for dessert. By licking it off here, she paused there when Critias cut her off with an alarmed stare over what she should be saying at the dinner table. Alice giggled, I like honey. Then take up beekeeping, Critias told the girl. It is entirely your fault, Alice said as she returned to her steak. The harder you make it for us to get you to laugh once in a while, the harder she has to hit you. Maybe you could just loosen up and let us care about you. After chewing a bit, Alice added, besides, it was not like Carmen was kidding. Critias nearly spit his tea when Carmen groped him under the table to prove that it was true. She really did have a jar of honey and a plan to make use of it. Since the topic was sex, Penny said, I can't wait to get back to the tower, I've been a virgin all day. I need Kevin to vibrate my cares away. He has seven speeds and his batteries never run down. By her grin directly at him, Critias understood that Penny confirmed that she knew Kevin was an android with an augmented physiology. Critias was actually unsure if the man could really vibrate, but he knew it was a possibility. Just when it seemed that things couldn't embarrass him any worse, Carmen asked Critias, when are you going to teach me how to masturbate? Critias nearly choked on his steak when she asked that. The conversational genuineness of her tone came across as unmistakable. I'm never going to teach you, Critias told her with his patented displeasure about uncouth table talk. If you want your honey, you will have to come to the dipper. It's my one sure way that I can always be sure that your hard-headedness will wear down sooner rather than later. I can teach you, Penny Welder volunteered. It was more of her inside jabs that she knew that Carmen was an android to, and as such she guessed that Carmen had been serious, which she very well may have been. Will you please stay out of this, Critias told Penny. You are not going to lay a finger on my wife. After he heard himself say that, he regretted his choice of phrase since now he was beating himself up. I wasn't going to, Penny giggled. I have toys for that sort of thing. Mandy came in from the showers, as did various other decontamination workers, mechanics, and patrol guards who had finished with their work shifts. The girl approached their table to join them. Before she could sit, Carmen got up to give her a welcomed hug. I'm so proud of you, Carmen told her. You did such a great job out there tonight. She put Mandy in the seat beside her much to Mandy's elation to be so intimate in her heroine's confidences. Another of the new... Arrivals from the showers was a local buxom decontamination worker in her twenties. She was a popular and gregarious beauty who worked hard when on duty and was profligate with her charms when off. She went by the name Roxana and had the distinction of being one of Tony's regular guests in his libertine lifestyle, such that she gave the captain an adoring wink upon her arrival. For the moment, it was the young and handsome Bobby Bean who had so recently distinguished himself with chivalrous heroism that she had her eye on. She was half again older than Bean was of Alice, but for them the age difference was socially irrelevant. Roxana stopped beside Bean's seat and then leaned in close to let him gaze down her blouse at her surgically enhanced cleavage. Oh, you poor thing, she cooed. Were you hurt badly in that terrible battle? No, ma'am, Bean nearly stuttered. I can get around okay. I should be back to normal in a week or two. I just got some nasty bruises. Call me Roxana, she invited with a seductive smile. Is there anything I could do to make you more comfortable? I would feel just terrible thinking you had no one to take care of you after you fought so courageously out there in that awful city. Roxana and many others noticed Bean's eyes shift to Alice as though he worried he might offend her if he even so much as appeared to show interest in anyone else. It was his clear admission of love for the girl since she was his first thought and Roxana's magnificent chest was not enough to dissuade his concerns. Out of jealousy, Roxana said to Alice, aren't you the young girl from Denver that he just rescued? Your name is Alice, isn't it? I heard the king arrange your marriage to the good Captain Critias, when enough years pass for you to come of age. She did her best to be sly as she reminded Bean that the girl was doubly unattainable while she also brushed her fingers on Bean's shoulder to let him know she was not only available, 
but also ambitious to medicate his troubles. Carmen shot her husband an anxious look that he should act quickly on the situation, only Critias remained oblivious to her intent. Yes, it was me, Alice admitted. While I am grateful to be alive, I still think he was foolish. He should have attended to his rifle, and not to my failure to do the same. It was bad enough for me to hesitate. I feel worse knowing that I disarmed him as well, and from that he nearly died for my mistake. Yes, well, Roxanne sort of agreed. Some might think that little girls should be playing with their dolls instead of with guns, but I'm no expert on soldierly matters. I'm sure that when you grow up, you will make a fine guard and an excellent wife to Critias. I'm going to be a marshal, Alice replied defensively, not a guard. If you say so, dear, was Roxanne's belittling retort. Carmen hurriedly spoke up to Critias, do you recall that Chief Justice we spoke about earlier? He nodded absently, yes, of course. What about him? Carmen informed him of a critical overlook detail, he was a woman. Only then did Critias piece together the various hints that Carmen had sent him. Bean was a Vander Bean. All right, but it was his future wife that took his name who had the destiny to become the legendary Marshal Chief Justice. After a distinguished career of field service, she would take up a courtly bench from where she would invest her senior years penning the veritable boilerplate foundations of King's Law. That scholarly work made her second only to King Louis himself in regard to laying down the code, and it made her first on the matter as the recorder of it for posterity. Critia said to Bean, as you may have gathered from my wife's earlier unbecoming commentary, I have some vigorous marital obligations to work out before we sleep. I was thinking that since you're injured and still not past your quarantine period, that Alice could stay with you this evening as your sick nurse. You need someone with some decontamination experience to care for you until your 24 hours have elapsed. She could at least show you some gratitude for her rescue since she finds it so difficult to speak any, and then Carmen and I could have some time to ourselves. This is the second time that Alice got you beaten up. It's the least she could do. Bean felt anxious to have that take place and yet he hesitated for various reasons already mentioned, namely her betrothal to Critias and her being on the opposite end from himself on the teenage spectrum. Well, I, he stammered uselessly. Roxanne only heard that Bean had a day to wait to prove he was not infected. She was mindful of disease in that regard, and as Critias had planned, it was enough to discourage a woman of her experience to wait at least another day before she seduced the young man for a mere trophy encounter. Perhaps another night then, the woman excused herself going away. I didn't volunteer to do that, Alice complained. Yes you did, Critias corrected her. Alice glanced over at Bean to weigh the potential benefits, what does a sick nurse do exactly? The usual, Carmen offered, food, sponge baths. And honey, Tony added to give himself a laugh. Alice shot a glance at Carmen to see how much of a joke that last part was to find Carmen give her a wink of approval. Then Alice looked to Critias, you want me to take care of him? He did save your life, Critias answered. You won't be sick nursing me, I have Carmen for that sort of thing. Make him comfortable, fetch things for him, and sleep on the floor tonight. It's not asking too much, is it? That young man did save your life nearly at the cost of his own, not to mention that he asks about you every time he sees me. He does? Alice didn't know that, and he was cute in her estimation especially after she learned she had the same chance of marrying Critias as she did of growing antlers. Carmen offered further reason, having the bed to ourselves would be appreciated. I do so love the sweet taste of honey. Sometimes I think I could just eat a whole jar, getting it all over myself in my excitement, and then I have to lick it off my fingers. She kept her eyes on Critias because it was a description that involved her plans for him after dinner. As the situation began to settle, Mandy frowned and shifted in her seat. She expected to be at the low end of the proceedings. Mandy imagined that she would have to sleep alone in the front hall surrounded by many strangers, and that assumed she slept at all, which she doubted. Carmen reached over to put an arm around her, you don't mind sleeping on the couch tonight, do you? I promise not to keep you awake. She gave a hungry look at Critias, I will be extra quiet and I definitely know my way around in the dark. Mandy's worries vanished instantly when she realized Carmen wouldn't abandon her. The couch is very big and comfortable. The girl stretched and yawned to show how quickly she would fall asleep for Carmen's benefit. This wonderful meal has me sleepy already. As an afterthought, she gave Carmen a beseeching glance. Could I take Virgil to bed with me? That was the name of Carmen's stuffed toy bear. Of course you can, Carmen kissed her cheek. I wouldn't want you to be lonely while Alice is away helping take care of our sick friend, Bean. Bean finished his dinner and then asked Critias, Are you sure this is all right? Sir? I wouldn't want anyone to be upset about her being, you know, alone in the same room with me, 
especially after what happened last time. I already have an arrangement with Jim, Critias told him. Alice gets her permissions from me. He gave Bean a level stare, Alice is like a daughter to me. If I learn you treated her disrespectfully, you and I are going to have some complicated issues to iron out. If it would help you to understand what I expect from you, then consider this a test of your character. As much as the warning look gave Bean a sense of sufficient trepidation, the one he got from Carmen was genuinely terrifying because he only saw the murderous devil behind her eyes for the briefest instant, and then she was all smiles and happy approval over the arrangement. Totally understood, sir, Bean confirmed the rules. I'd never think of doing anything improper. He gave another glance at Carmen because she planned on literally killing him if he did anything ungentlemanly with Alice. Alice hurried through the remainder of the meal while she took frequent glances of increased duration at Bean, and then finally she excused herself to take him away for recuperation. Before they departed, she gave Critias a kiss on the cheek that he hadn't expected. She asked, Do you really mean what you said, like a daughter to you? You're not lying to me again, are you? Critias comforted her, We have an extra room back at our tower apartment for you and Mandy. Carmen and I will be fixing it up for you the very first thing. Now, you don't rush into anything either. You have a whole life ahead of you for that. Bean can come to our door any time and ask me if he can spend some time with you with your approval of course and mine. Thanks, Dad, she grinned then shot a telling glance at Bean to say to Critias that she was aware that he had the same kind of sheltered naivete that Carmen often suffered. In a comparison of his age to the time of the downfall, it was quite probable that Bean was still a virgin. I'll be good. I promise. As Alice went off, Critias called after her, wear your own pistol as soon as it gets back from decontamination. Your gloves and helmet need to be near you at all times too. They need to be as familiar to you as your own skin. Tony and Critias discussed their evening's work as Critias smoked some after-dinner tobacco and drank a cup of coffee that Nadia had brought for him. Banjo's operation had been boring in a word without any ghoul troubles. Most of the time passed as Critias told Tony about the things they had done from the paddle boat. Soon enough, Tony departed with his date and Critias went back to his room with Carmen and Mandy. After Carmen made Mandy brush her teeth and then put her to bed on the couch in her pajamas with Virgil the bear, she joined her husband in bed wearing her own pajamas, and then she turned out the light. Critias wanted to wait for Mandy to fall asleep, but Carmen would have none of that. She squirmed and played difficult until he finally rolled on top of her to pin her to the bed. He didn't do anything more than mesh their fingers together and then settle his way down on her. She was still dressed in her pajamas when she wrapped her legs around him snugly to feel the press of him. Carmen thought about how he held her inside the striker APC during the lightning barrage, how much she loved him and how happy it made her feel to be his, and to have his weight upon her. Carmen was just so happy that the orgasm washed through her like the light of a profound religion. She whimpered, then sniffled, and then a moment before Critias was certain she was about to cry, Carmen fell into a deep contented sleep because that was the only thing left to make her life perfect. Carmen wanted to stay just as they were for all time. Critias wasn't entirely sure what had just happened as he carefully rolled off of her. He was certain that Carmen seemed totally happy and satisfied without him having even done anything to her. He shifted over to his side of the bed, and then called to Mandy, Come on, you scamp. Carmen fell asleep. She had a long day, and just couldn't keep her eyes open. Mandy was awake as he had suspected. She grabbed her bear and her blanket, and then crept over to curl up against Carmen. Mandy felt safe from the terrors of the world when at Carmen's side. Within only minutes. She too was out cold from her onerous night of working out in the wild. Critias laid back with his hands behind his head as he stared at the dark ceiling. He had a word for his life as he relaxed, swell. Chapter 11 In Books Lies the Soul Romeo walked through the grand architecture of the public library by candlelight. He knew his way around the aging palace of knowledge from his past life as a literary professor, and then again after his fall. He paused yet again to wait for his dawdling companion so they could share his small light. Come along, Judas, Romeo said impatiently. Verloc is expecting me. I don't wish to be late. Judas was another watcher of the city. He shuffled along with his head hung low refusing to hurry. It is fitting that I walk in darkness, he lamented. Even when in this last shrine to the dying light of all that was beautiful, not even the words of the poets you so adore can lighten my cursed heart. Even though he was in a hurry, Romeo waited. Judas had long been a friend to them and a trusted ally. That was despite the brooding remorse that perpetually consumed his tormented mind. You would be faster if you lightened your arms instead of your heart, Romeo spoke of the book Judas carried. It was a heavy Bible that was many centuries old. Judas protected the tome religiously, 
but not out of faith in its contents. Wrapped carefully in plastic, and then a soft towel besides, Judas guarded the ancient treasure even more fervently than he did the rest of the vast repertory of accumulated human knowledge. His written treasury continued to grow more splendid as he collected worthwhile works of literature and art from elsewhere in the city during his wanderings. Judas had faith, but not that God would ever grant him any reprieve from the curse of being alive. His faith oddly enough, was in the last dwindling population of men. I deserve to suffer, Judas bemoaned in reference to his discomforting penitence of carrying the book around whenever he was inside the library. His infected cells did not suffer acidosis or any fatigue in general short of what thirst or starvation could inflict. When he worked in the library, Judas only put the book down to task himself with some other caretaking for the place, and then he picked it up again to keep it safe. The ones who are still pure will return here someday, he promised Romeo, like when they came here before. They will take up more of these great works and make use of them as people did in the days when joy was not dead in the world. Perhaps they will find me and upon seeing that I have been so dutiful to the last hope, they will cast me into a great fire as a reward to my restless diligence. Would not a small fire be more befitting? Romeo joked in poor taste, but only because he felt annoyed by the tardiness his friend would cause him. His true love awaited him and to be late for her was a terrible thing by his measure. True, Judas agreed. A small fire is what I should get, a slow and painful burn like what this damnation already is to my intact soul, and even that is more kindness than I deserve. I must endure it to protect what little is left for I alone am still sane among the legions infected in their madness. Judas made partial exception for his friends Romeo and Verloc. While it was true they were raving mad, it was not a madness bent on destruction. He often felt ashamed that they helped moderate his loneliness because he did not deserve any reprieve from his endless punishment. Judas was also a carrier of the plague, and thus equally to blame for the ruination of the world. They came upon the small portable generator that Romeo had started earlier for Verloc. Its long electrical cord and the sound of music showed them the way into an adjoining media room where a projection machine played the 1946 film, Blue Skies. On the screen, Fred Astaire in a black suit and top hat with a cane performed his famous dance number, Putton on the Ritz. Verloc was on the open floor dancing. She wore a sweaty aerobics leotard while she imitated the great master's performance with perfect synchronicity. Her timing came from the musical attunement alone. She had no need to watch the film itself, since she had already memorized every nuance of it to the minutest detail. The only difference was that Verloc had tastefully choreographed the necessary improvisations that allowed her to use her antique but very real Italian dueling saber in place of a walking stick. Romeo took a moment to savor Verloc's lean muscular body that the leotard both concealed and revealed so gloriously. He saw that his arrival excited her as well. For the briefest instant, she was tempted to abandon her training session to rush into his arms and confess her love for him, but she was too professional to succumb to any distraction. At least that is what his own form of delusional insanity caused him to believe. There was an outstandingly diverse collection of films and diagrammed books about the room, which Judas dutifully collected from throughout the library and elsewhere in the great city. Verloc routinely watched her kung fu movies, swashbuckling action heroes, and gunfighters that were as real to her as were Romeo or Judas. The infection had been both a blessing and a curse on her mind, though she was incapable of distinguishing reality from fantasy. Verloc's regenerative health and inability to sleep had transformed the mechanics of her memory to a savant level. It was her relentless drive to train herself that capitalized on that gift. Like the heroic warriors she imitated, Verloc knew neither fear nor doubt, and she had an uncompromising need to better herself, worthy of any fictional Xiaolin disciple on a hero's quest for justice. She was beautiful, supremely skilled, and yet pitifully incapable of providing for her own needs. It was a fortunate fluke of fate that her madness had never led her into the belief that she could fly, or Verloc would have destroyed herself by leaping off of buildings long before. The sun is coming up, Romeo told her as he took her meal to a nearby table and then began to arrange it. He and Judas had already eaten in their kitchen so it was for her alone. The unwanted offal of their wild hog he had dressed was in the usual place in the adjacent city park. Romeo put those scraps to good use too in his singular meaning for life, bringing happiness to her, his one true love. Verloc wiped herself with a towel as she went over to sit down. She asked, have you heard from Mission Command? There was no such organization except in her mind and in the yarns that Romeo spun for her benefit. Romeo fabricated, they sent a priority message that Skull Incorporated are back in town. They want you to watch out because they believe Dr. Skull has sent some of his goons to put the bee down on you, to teach you to give up your crusade for justice. She liked the sound of his fairy tale. Verloc not only believed it to be true. She also fully hallucinated all of the auditory and visual components that allowed her to live the experience to her fullest. 
Verloc felt important when she knew that there was another crime gang out looking for her. While eating a piece of bacon, she said, we should have guessed that Dr. Skull was still alive and his death in the plane crash was only a ruse to throw us off his trail. Have you heard any news about those two new players? To draw attention to it, Romeo tapped the fully functional channel scanning radio that hung from his belt. He routinely listened to it with an earplug. Only bits and pieces so far, he reported information he had gleaned from the city of King Louis. His name is Critias, but he goes by the code name, Agent Perkela. His partner is Agent Carmen, but we believe her real name is Violet, Violet Wand. They just returned from successfully completing something they're calling, Operation Grinder. By the sound of things, it went well. According to the reports, they believe the success of Operation Grinder provided them the tools they need to, quote, clean up the city, unquote. From what little we have, it appears they are crime fighters too. Verloc nodded frequently with interest as she continued eating her breakfast. If Dr. Skull taught us anything, it is that looks can be deceiving. Professor Doomfinger was another master of deception. Right up to the moment that you killed him, Romeo praised her. She hoped for more, do you have anything else to report? They have a covert infiltration job for you coming up soon, Romeo lied before he added more that served his own happiness. They are zeroing in on the hotel that they think Dr. Skull is using as his headquarters. When they have it narrowed down for certain, they want you to go in disguised as a civilian to discreetly investigate and take him out if you see him. They said the plan is on hold until they can find a male agent good enough to partner up with someone of your talent level. Your cover persona is a top dollar fashion model with her new lover. They're staying at the hotel under reservations for a weekend romantic getaway. You know how long it can take them to find someone good enough to keep up with you. You tell them I can handle anything they can throw at me, she insisted sounding annoyed by her agency's unnecessary delay. Send a message that I'm ready to go right away, and I can take you along for my cover. I have used you as an emergency asset before, and it has always worked out. Verloc's professionalism was absolute. Since her cover story was to be in a hotel on a short vacation with her lover, then she would play her part to the letter even if that meant having hot secret agent sex with Romeo all night long. Since Romeo made up her jobs, it would definitely require lots of that. He would make certain of it. Romeo asked, how did your training session go? Did you find what you were looking for? She glanced over her table to find another movie that she offered to Romeo. It was the 1945 film, Anchors Away. Start this one, Verloc requested. After Romeo put the disc in the projection machine. She used the remote control to advance to where the legendary dancer Gene Kelly performed alongside the cartoon mouse. Romeo didn't fully understand Verloc's reasoning, isn't it Agent Carmen's fighting style that concerns you? Verloc dismissed that trivial aspect with a wave of her bacon, that was the easy part, her unarmed techniques are all textbook perfection. She uses that staff from what she stances. From what I've seen, there are clear indications from her footwork that tell me she will use that katana in the classical samurai styles switching to the secret underhand grip blind yakuza technique when she is surrounded by many opponents. The sword angel was drained by the best. The thought that Verloc might actually get herself killed by Carmen upset Romeo. He wanted to avoid that desperately, can you take her? She gestured to the dance performance, aren't you paying attention? Look at the athletic grace. She moves as if gravity has a loose hold on her. Against anyone else, she is invincible, a perfect assassin, except for her weaknesses, if you know how to exploit them. Romeo watched the performance of Gene Kelly and admired the masterful talent. What weaknesses am I supposed to see? Verloc schooled him in the elite art of death that was at her and Carmen's level of skill. The sword angel dances to the music, Romeo. She dances to the music. Our agent Carmen is reactionary. She sees and then she responds, with every move in perfect timing to the beat of the situation. He shook his head and shrugged unable to make any sense of her explanation. I am the beat of the situation. She told him like it should have been obvious. I don't dance to the music. I make the music. I am the drum, and it is for me that she shall dance, but always an instant behind the true rhythm in our small play. She is predictable, emotional, and reactionary. I will put her in the position that I desire, and then take her life. Romeo finally understood, it is the conductor that guides the pace of the orchestra. Verloc grinned with confident certainty, she will be Jean Kelly, but I will be Fred Astaire. The conversation upset Judas because they devised plans contrary to his own. You are letting your disease get the better of you, he told Romeo. We are the untouchables. The keepers of the dying light must not be harmed. He held out his heavy book at arm's length, who will come for this when they are gone. Go live underground with the bell ringer and his disciples of the filth if you wish to do as they do. 
you are not welcome here if you will not cherish the words in the last who are clean. Judas cradled the oldest of Bibles in one arm so he could use the other hand for viciously slapping himself upside his head. I hate you, he sobbed speaking of his own existence. I hate you. I hate you, useless disease-ridden garbage. Romeo went over and then grabbed the watcher's wrist to stop his self-abuse, calm yourself, Judas. They are not our enemies unless they come against us. Agent Shield is a force for justice, not wanton murder. The rain has stopped and the sun is shining, Judas said as his need to work helped him forget his lamentations. The vast old building had arisen in the time before the convenience of electric lighting. Because of that, the architecture had a purpose to bring in as much of the sunlight as possible to provide natural illumination. The thin radiance already seeped into the place, enough for them to move about without other assistance. I found more leaks during the storm, he said sadly. I must go patch them lest the water harm the treasure. He gave a sad look to Romeo, the clean ones will return some day. They will return and then take unto them all that was beautiful before the rot that we are consumed the people. This is our fault and we deserve to suffer. Judas held his book lovingly as he turned then walked out. To honor his past pledges to Judas for his valuable help. Romeo said to Verloc, the librarian is right. You have no just cause to battle those agents. Not yet, she agreed conditionally. Verloc was finished with her meal. She got up to gather her things and then leave the library. They would return home, which was the nearby military history museum that served as her base of operations. She said, fortune favors the prepared. That is how she will find me if it comes to that, prepared. While they are a friend to the good citizens of this metropolis, they have nothing to fear from me. If they turn to dark deeds, I will be there to stop them. Verloc took a warm bath down in their basement kitchen. She used water that Romeo had heated with the same fire that he had used for the cooking. After she dressed, they headed out. Romeo used his key to open the lock in the reinforced door. It was a door and lock that the first King Louis had installed to protect the library after he had visited years before to collect old maps of the city underground, as well as other books that contained knowledge integral to survival. After they carefully locked up behind them, the two walked down the great staircase to the street from where they would cross the memorial park on their way home. Just as he had planned, Romeo's kitchen scraps he planted in the park just ahead had attracted a group of local ghouls that appreciated an easy meal. Dozens of the fiends squabbled in the center over the fresh organs, skin, and head of the butchered swine. Romeo took cover behind an old car as if he wanted to hide. Dr. Skull's goons are trying to set up an ambush, he warned Verloc with well-acted urgency. Maybe we should retreat to the library where it's safe. Never fear, my friend. Verloc handed him her saber to hold. Agent Shield is ready to protect you. I'll teach these ruffians a lesson in manners. You wait here while I take care of this. She pulled on her leather fingerless gloves as she confidently walked ahead toward the mob of infected. I hope Dr. Skull pays his henchmen handsomely, she called out to them, because you're about to acquire some medical bills. Some of the ghouls recognized Verloc's voice and knew from it that they were at risk of a painful beating. Most of those who knew her didn't consider the pork scraps to be worth the price in suffering. They fled immediately in abject fear. Many of the other infected were transients new to the area. They took her human speech as reason enough to attack her for being an uninfected. The small remainder continued to gobble up the mead scraps as fast as they could while they had less competition. The first ghoul to attack Verloc was a tall male specimen of exceptional ferocity. Verloc intercepted his tackling leap with her flying knee into his face and then she rode him down into the ground to redouble his punishment. She instantly came up to catch the next two aggressors by their hair and then she banged their heads together with a clash of skulls. As more of the ghouls set upon her, Verloc didn't even need to parry away the attacks as they grasped at her with their filthy hands. Few of the infected managed to get past her flurry of defensive intercepting blows, and those that actually did manage to get off an attack within range of her simply missed entirely because of her astounding spatial awareness and agility. Verloc really was a master of the combative arts, and perhaps, if her exotic masters of dance plan was actually true, she could even defeat Carmen, if the time ever came for such a contest. As the ghouls wailed in pain, Verloc laughed gaily while she pummeled those feral infected into unconsciousness. One of her attackers, in her madness anyway, wore the black uniform of Dr. Skull. The man's shirt had the pirate's Jolly Roger emblazoned on his chest. It was standard garb for low-level thug minions of that dastardly supervillain whom Verloc considered an old nemesis. She bantered merrily, living out a Silver Rage comic, Are you the best that Dr. Skull has to throw at me? The minion snarled in her imagination, You have foiled the master's plans for world domination for the last time, Agent Shield. The thug punched at Verloc with a campy television boxing style that was clearly no match for her superior skills. 
it took only a moment for Verloc to beat him senseless. Verloc did not act with the concentrated, fury of a tiger as did Carmen. Such was the Watcher's blissful detachment from the hazards of reality, she possessed a calm and joyful ease that flowed effortlessly in her minimalist movements. Verloc's gift was worthy of an aged grandmaster monk long seasoned by transcendent meditations. Insane or not, Verloc was a true master with skills far beyond any mere mortal human. One of the wounded ghouls managed to recover and then leap at Verloc from behind. The female watcher didn't even look as she gracefully flowed like water with the incoming momentum. She threw the ghoul over her shoulder to crash crudely into a distant tree. Once Verloc had finished clearing the park of all the Dr. Skull minions, Romeo caught up to rejoin her for the remaining walk to their home. Once again, I see why they say Agent Shield is the best, he complimented her knowing how much she enjoyed it. Dr. Skull will think twice before he tries something like this again. They exited the park and then crossed the next street to climb the stairs of the paved plaza before their home residence. Two enormous Pegasus statues flanked the entry stairs going into the covered courtyard. The statue was of a noble woman of vision that held the bridle of her winged stallion as would a proud Valkyrie. It was ideal art for the aspirations of Verloc, and she paused to admire it as they entered. In her warped perceptions, it was a tribute to herself and the superheroism that was her defining ambition. Like the statue, she was eternally strong, forever beautiful, and fearlessly invincible. Romeo admired the other figure of the pair. It was a male with sword and helmet and mayor opposition to the woman. He also held a winged mount. Like Romeo, the figure was an ever-vigilant guardian of heroes. To ensure Verloc's well-being, Romeo was capable of anything however noble or despicable. Such trivial matters of morality could not compare in importance against his singular and all-consuming selfish interest to love Verloc. He hoped the untouched humans who had like frightened rabbits in their nearby tower would be wise enough to leave them in peace. It pained him to think that he would have to sacrifice the friendship of Judas if the time came when the natural humans forced him to destroy them all to keep Verloc safe. He also wondered if he would need the fictitious agency to inform Verloc that Bellman was secretly a crime lord in need of dispatching by her hand. If that lumpy-headed fool didn't relent in his antagonizing of the tower's inhabitants, he might touch off a war that forced just such an unwanted conflict. Romeo would keep Verloc safe and happy even if he had to kill everyone else in the process. He would gladly arrange the deaths of the humans and Bellman, Judas too, if it came to that. All their deaths were less than a small price for him to pay for her and their love. A ghoul dressed in dirty rags stepped out from behind a pillar at the top of the stairs where he had been hiding. The creature was most unusual because he carried a knife, the only untarnished thing about him because of the nickel content of the steel. Verloc noticed him immediately and took on a disapproving expression, I warned you to stay away from here, Cutter. Now I find you skulking at my doorstep. Didn't you learn your lesson the last time I shot you? She had put a bullet in his leg when he had failed to respect her territory. I bring a message from him. The filthy watcher lent excuse to his trespassing. I have been waiting a long time. The many shallow wounds he had inflicted on his own flesh with his blade attested to how he had spent the hours. Deliver your message then, Romeo demanded impatiently. Cutter was not really a malicious lunatic as was his master Bellman. It was Bellman who demanded a war, so in his master's name, Cutter his lackey would not hesitate to murder any person of the tower he found the opportunity to ambush. If that happened, more of the humans would come out seeking retribution. That was exactly the kind of trouble that Romeo wanted to avoid. The unkempt watcher had never divulged his previous life as a human. Romeo didn't know if he had been a violent criminal or a traffic court judge. What Romeo did know was that the infection had surely only worsened the man and his misbehavior. Wandering about as he was, in the service of the mad bellman, filthy, armed with a knife, and cutting on himself in his perpetual anxiety, Cutter was not welcome around them, especially not at their home. He asks that you attend a meeting of all that speak, Cutter said as he played messenger. He knows that those who dwell in the Devil's Tower plot mischief against us all. He says that you two are in danger. He tells of a great catastrophe that approaches and would hold counsel with you on how best to prevent it. Romeo realized that they would have to attend, if for no other reason than to keep abreast of what that reckless madman planned next. His doom saying is nothing new, Romeo complained dismissively. I don't suspect that this time will be any different. If he only wants to talk, we can spare the time, Verloc said since she felt slightly flattered to be receiving messengers. When and where is this meeting? Come to his home and next the moon arises full. The Watcher answered. He gives you his promise that he will make no treachery and provide you with gifts as well to reward your attendance to hear his position. We have a condition, Romeo bargained. He must stop with his attacks until we have talked. If he stirs up trouble again, there will be no value in listening to him. It will mean he has made up his mind regardless of the outcome of any council. 
The dirty watcher felt an itch on his arm, prompting him to pick at it with his blade, using the sharp point to dig out the imaginary cause of his discomfort. I will tell him all you have said, was the eventual answer. Now go home, Cutter, Romeo commanded. We will share your message with the bookkeeper. With nothing more to say, the knife-wielding watcher slunk away to easily mix among feral ghouls who would pay him no mind. 